Block 1 Made by Zephyr Road an audiobook Audiobook title, Gate, War of Two Worlds Part 01 Complete, Poor Falcon, United States, Earth Georgia, Fort Benning, Rangers Headquarters, January 27, 2025 First Lieutenant Sarah Rose is walking through the Ranger Headquarters Passing all the other rangers She is one of the ranger logistical officers who help manage ranger equipment requests, deployment operations and everything else rangers need when going into battle or training. Sarah heads into the officer lounge and sees First Lieutenant Charles Johnson, Captain Bailey Robinson, Captain Charles Casaus all sitting there. They are all enjoying their morning breakfast as they laugh at some story. I see all the boys sitting around while the lady doing your work. She said sarcastically. All three of them look at her and laugh. Morning Sarah, Johnson said. Do you ever sleep? You need to stop coming in so early to do your CO1 work, Charles said. Sometimes, she replied and then turns to look at Charles. And someone has to do it. He rarely leaves his office and when he is at our staff meetings he is not mentally there. I feel bad for you guys, Charles said and then turns to look at Johnson. They took away your command and replaced it with someone who is not a ranger. That is the brass fear. Johnson comments as he shrugs it off. Come on guys, Bailey said. Be nice to the Major. You always defend him Bailey, she responds with. Why is that? It seems like you two know each other. None of this makes sense. He shows up last month out of nowhere and we rarely see him. Morale is low within the unit. Sarah's right, Johnson said. I don't mind having my first command taken away. I'd just like a reason. I have no idea how a non-ranger takes command of a ranger unit. Bailey leans back into his chair and he responds hesitantly. I don't know him well, but we did cross paths once. Look, I am not defending the dude. The past month has been very unprofessional. It is just the one time I met him, he wasn't like this. Sarah listens carefully to what Bailey has to say. She comes from a long military bloodline, dating back to the Revolutionary War. She had learned from her father to read people, especially military ones. Sarah thinks back to when their new commanding officer for Vanguard 7, Major Jackson Shop, took command last month. At the time, it had shocked everyone in the unit. Almost no one liked him, and he had done little to address it. Sarah wonders if Shop wanted everyone to hate him. However, Nothing about Sharp makes sense to Sarah. She had tried to learn more about him and had come up with nothing. Sarah shakes her head, exasperated. Well I came here to remind you three that we have a staff meeting at 0910. Thanks, First Lieutenant, Charles said. As Sarah leaves the door, she hears the three officers making some strange commotion. Then she hears them calling her name. Sarah rushes back and sees them looking at the television. She looks at what they are watching, and her eyes widen in disbelief. Sharp finishes putting together his Colt M1917 pistol for the third time. It does nothing to distract his troubled mind. He places his pistol back onto his desk. He lets out a soft breath as he glances around his recently assigned private quarters. In one corner, there is a pile of unopened boxes he has yet to unpack. Unable to draw the will to touch them, Sharp looks back to his desk and picks up his Christian cross necklace. He watches it as it spins around slowly. He takes a heavy breath as he watches. You son of a bitch, Sharp mutters. Sharp then tosses his necklace on the desk and places his hand on his head. Son of a bitch. Why? Sharp then leans back and looks at the window. Sharp then hears a loud knock on the door. He looks to the door and glares at it. I will be at the damn meeting. Christ, get off your ass, Major, and get out here. Sharp knows the voice, First Lieutenant Sarah Rose. She had been on his chase since day one, and he does not blame her. He knows he has not been a good example of an army officer however he can't help it. He does not want to be here. The worst part is that he respects her, and so he hates himself more when he is rude. Getting up? Sharp opens the door. What is it, First Lieutenant? Follow me Major, Sarah states, Philadelphia is under attack. What Sarah had said took him completely off guard. The first possible threat that appears in his head is China. 
China attacking, they don't have the ability to invade us, especially Philadelphia cannot be Canada or the Russians. The United States and China are in the middle of a new Cold War. China has been spreading its influence around the world, spreading its version of authoritarianism, colonizing nearby local populations like in Africa and Central Asia. I don't think it is China sir, Sarah states in a concerned tone, just follow me. Sharp leaves his quarters and follows Sarah. The hallways are crowded as rangers rush to their respective areas, all trying to figure out what is happening. There is no way it is the Russians, he said as he tries to figure out what is going on. They're crazy bastards. But they don't have the abilities to invade the US either. Sarah glances back at him. You say that like you have experience, sir. And no, I don't think it is the Russians either. He glances away a little and ignores the first thing she said. But he can tell that she is onto him. He had worked with many logistical officers and personnel before, but she had been the best he had seen. While most see the position as just a job to do, she is passionate about doing the best she can. When they get to the lounge, he sees almost two dozen officers in the room, all eyes glued to the television. Both Bailey and Major Davis Stewart walk over to him as he walks inside. Bailey, Davis, he greets. Nice to see you out of bed sir, Bailey said with a smirk. What is going on? He asked. Davis looks back to the television. Philadelphia is under attack. Take a look for yourself because I have no idea how to explain this. He looks at the screen and his eyes widen. He cannot understand what he is seeing, but it is still happening. He sees a camera crew being attacked, murdered, and the female reporter being raped by what looks like a goblin. He sees this large beast that looks like a troll lifts this car and toss it into a crowd of people. Around it are all these monsters rushing around, slaughtering the fleeing civilians. The screen switches to a new live feed. This civilian is behind a police and SWAT 2 with some Minutemen militia behind a defensive line. They are all geared up, trying to provide a safe route for the civilians to escape. In front of the police and SWAT are thousands of men charging at them, all of which wear armor that reminds him of ancient Rome. The police and SWAT open fire but then a small dragon-looking beast swoops down and forces most of the defenders down to the ground. By the time most of the law enforcement get back up, the swordsmen are on top of them. Police and SWAT are cut down by swords as the attackers clash with the riot-geared police. It looked like the defenders could win but the live feed looks back down the street and sees another endless wave of swordsmen charging. It does not take long for everyone to be overrun and slaughtered. Look, someone said. The president declared a state of emergency and they are sending in the regular military. Not just the guard. This is a real big deal, another ranger said. He agrees with that statement. In the United States, it is illegal for the regular military to operate domestically. That is the National Guard's responsibility. However, that idea is based on the country not being invaded from within. Sharp hears the person commenting on what is going on while mentioning that the 10th Mountain Division and the National Guard Units 28th and 42nd Infantry Divisions are being mobilized and heading to Philadelphia. The problem is that it will take a few hours for them to get there in force, leaving the local law enforcement and militia alone for the next two to three hours. He already knows a lot of people are going to die before real help arrives. How is this possible? Sarah asked out loud. Did they fly here? But look, swords? Johnson comments. We are being attacked by swords? This. This. I don't know. That is when he sees a live feed from a helicopter angle. There is a strange mystical structure at the center of the main street. It is a three-story tall structure, taking up five lanes. Strange-looking pictures and writings decorate the surfaces of the structure. He sees thousands of soldiers still pouring through the gate. Human soldiers with all different kinds of monsters and beasts. The more he sees the more he realizes these creatures are like the ones from Lord of the Rings. He takes a deep breath. As he watches the slaughter on the screen, we are at War Rangers. Let's get ready. President Emily Potts address. February 6, 2025. My fellow Americans, as stated before, we still feel for the lives lost during the invasion of Philadelphia. Because of our brave law enforcement and the local militia groups holding off the aliens until the regular army arrived, untold lives have also been saved.
The battle was intense, but the military was able to push the invaders back to what we are calling the gate. Our latest count is a total of 10,000 dead from the attack. I know this country has struggled in the recent decade. However it is time for unity. Today we are not white, black, Hispanic, Asian, liberal, libertarian, or conservative. We all mourn and stand as Americans. As stated, before, the enemy who attacked us all matched fantasy type monsters and humanoids. Our confirmed types are humans, elves, orcs goblins, trolls and many more. What we once thought was a fantasy, a made-up story, has proven to be true and alive but more importantly, hostile. The size of the enemy who attacks has been numbed around 30,000 strong. We have taken about 5,000 prisoners and a detention center is being set up in Ohio under the control of the National Guard Unit 28th Infantry Division while the National Guard Unit, the 48th Infantry Division will be stationed around the gate. Our best scientists are continuing to study this strange and alien device, and all attempts to control or close it has failed. However, our drones have been able to go through it. We have discovered on the other side of the gate is another Earth-like planet. Grass, trees and sky. However, our recon drones also discovered a large enemy force on the other side of the gate. Currently, they are digging in but we believe they are planning a second attack. As you already know, there have been three separate attacks since the first invasion by this enemy. All on a smaller scale. We believe they were trying to gather intelligence and find out what happened to their army. My fellow Americans and the international community. I will not sugarcoat what is going on. We do not know who these people are. We do not know why they attacked us or what their intentions are. We don't even know what their name is. All we know is this one important fact. We are at war. As people, we always knew we would one day travel to the stars, meet new life, and maybe fight some interstellar war. But we never believed that this would happen in our lifetimes. Unlike all other wars, nations knew who they were fighting. This time we are going to war blind. We are fighting fantasy creatures who use swords, dragons, and god knows what else. But we will meet this challenge. We are a young nation however we have faced many challenges. And we always overcome these challenges. We have stood up and defeated every empire we have encountered. And we shall do it again. I have triggered the Monroe Doctrine which states any foreign threats that attacks the American continents are a threat to the American nations. Last week, I requested Congress to declare war against this new enemy and they have answered my call. Yesterday, I met with NATO, and we agreed to trigger Article 5, declaring this threat a threat to all in the Western world. I have commitments to our brothers across the Pacific. Australia and Japan have declared they will meet any need we need. With this authorization, we will send American forces through the gate to meet this new threat. With this new world, we will fight this unknown enemy. We will explore. We will make friendly ties with any locals who wish our aid. However, the number one priority is to prevent a second attack on our world, on our nation. As of now the United States and the rest of the free world is at war. The war of two worlds. God bless America. Three days later, Sharp is sitting at the conference seat in Philadelphia in one of the nearby buildings. He thinks back on what the president had said while he sees that a lot of the rangers and other soldiers are nervous, all wondering what they will face on the other side of the gate, he feels calm. Inside the conference room are dozens of other ranger officers, all sitting at seats or standing against the walls. The ranger leader, Colonel John Yang, with the head of ranger operations, Lieutenant Colonel Cason Forbes, are standing up in attention. All right boys and girls, Yang said as he stands up front. We finally got the go ahead. Operation Forward Dawn. We are going in with the 2nd Brigade of the 1st Cavalry as special units support. Our job is to provide support. Colonel Robert Barnes will be in command of the 1st Wave and 2nd Wave. 2nd Lieutenant John from the Vanguard 5 unit, Captain Bailey, raises his hand. Colonel, why don't we just go in and give them an ass kicking? What has been the delay? They have swords, and we have guns. Yang points to John. Good question. He nods at the lieutenant colonel, Kaysen. Kaysen takes a few steps forward. 
The problem is that this isn't a traditional war. This information has not been released yet, but we believe the enemy has magical abilities, besides using swords. They have dragons and trolls and god knows what else. When the president said we are going in blind, we literally are. Thank you, Kaysen. Yang said, when 9-11 happened, we were able to find where the enemy was and respond. Same with all the other wars, we are going in with no knowledge of what this land is like. We have no means to know who friend or foe is. After hearing that he hears someone say that there are only foes and that they deserves a bullet in the head, he looks over to that direction, hey, the last thing we need is to shoot someone who could help us. Major Sharp is correct, Yang said, I know emotions are high but the last thing we want to do is shoot a possible ally. We know nothing of these people, in our history. Allegiances of villages and towns usually switch to the conquer. We might be able to use that against the enemy. During the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, we needed local support to find and kill the enemy. Remember, you are rangers of the United States Army, not some bandits. As he listens, he hears Johnson and Sarah whispering to each other. He can tell they were commenting on what he had said. He glances over and then away. He had gotten used to his team whispering behind his back, showing their lack of trust. Johnson is a black man which reminds him of his old friend. Another black soldier, Avery Hogan, naturally calm and easily approachable. Sarah, on the other hand, he has struggled to understand. She clearly understands more than she lets on. For the first half a month, she clearly hated him like everyone else, but then four weeks ago, she suddenly changed her attitude towards him. He has never been good with the opposite sex, but this has puzzled more than ever. If we are going to do this, we need to do it right. Soldiers rushing into battle just for the sake of revenge will only hurt us, he comments. I actually agree with you Major, Sarah said. Yeah boss, Johnson adds, we just didn't expect you to say something like that. No offense, but we thought you wouldn't give a damn. He just ignores them and continues listening to the meeting. As stated, before, we know nothing of this planet, Yang continues, unlike on Earth, we will not have air support, none of our space assets, or any other assets. We will literally have to relay on what we bring until we can build the I infrastructure we need. That is why the Joint Chiefs of Staff picked the Rangers to lead the way in this war. To maximize efficiency, Rangers will be split into small 10 to 12 man size units, Kaysen explains. These units will explore this world, make contact with the locals, build alliances, scout for the enemy, and engage them. They will be the flexible muscle the army needs to wage war against the enemy. The program will be called Vanguard. As you know, you all have already been organized into your vanguard units. Sharp got this briefing five days ago. As said before, each vanguard unit will move around behind enemy lines and hunt for the enemy or find friends. This reminds him of the old television show he used to watch Dash Stargate, just like the show. The US Air Force would send small teams through this smaller gate to new worlds to do what the vanguards are doing. He wonders if the military is studying subjects like Stargate, Dungeons and Dragons, Lord of the Rings, Game of Thrones and any other material that might be able to help them understand this new world. As the saying goes, the brass usually plans for the last war. However, how could they plan for a war like this? There is no rule book for this kind of war, and he knows the army will have to rely on the best judgment of its troops. That is why he thinks the army picked the US Rangers to lead the way. Rangers are light infantry special forces, some of the most elite soldiers on earth. They are trained for many different situations, able to adapt and be flexible when needed. All right everyone, Yang said. See you on the other side. As everyone gets up, Sharp starts heading outside with Johnson and Sarah. Johnson, get everyone ready for the expedition. Once we leave. We will have no idea when we will get resupplied, he orders. Yes sir, Johnson said and then rush away. He stops and looks at Sarah. Lieutenant. Something wrong? Sarah stops and takes a frustrated breath. I wish I was going with you. Not your role, he replied. Sarah glances up at him, with that tone, anyone would assume you are a sexist. Luckily, 
I think I know better, I just wish you guys were going more prepared, no time, he said, ignoring the sexist comment, we don't need NW3 or the drones, either we kick their asses, or we die, Sarah looks at him, you might not care if you die but others do, we might have signed up, but that doesn't mean lives can be wasted blindly, the people under your command want to come home alive, he takes a frustrated breath and works hard to control himself, to the point she notices, he wants to respond but struggles to find the words, Sarah mumbles, she then salutes him, good luck major, he returns the salute and then walks away, he reaches into his chest pouch and takes out some anti-depression pills and takes two of them, as he walks, he can see the damage from the invasion, everything is still fresh, the large tower has holes from missiles, cannons, artillery fire, buildings still reek with a burnt, charred smell, even with that pungent, overpowering scent, he can still smell all the blood in the air as if it was freshly spilt, he looks over to the left and sees the army engineers clearing out destroyed buildings, making way to set up defenses and other army facilities, he stops and walks around this small crater in the street, these streets were intense battlegrounds, while the army was able to quickly push the enemy back within a day, it was a bloody battle, the only reason the army was able to stop that large of a force was because they had far superior weapons than the enemy, however, because the US still did not know what they were fighting, it cost many unnecessary lives, once he gets to his unit, Vanguard 7, he sees them all finish loading up supplies into the two M2 Bradleys, while the Bradley is a tough infantry fighting vehicle, able to provide much needed fire support for infantry, they can only carry half of a squad, unlike the striker family of armoured personnel carriers, however, the army wants the first wave to go in with heavily armoured vehicles, because they would not know what they will face, he sees his unit, 1st Lieutenant Charles Johnson, his second in command, he sees his highest NCO, 4, Sergeant Major Randy Dodson, out of everyone here, Dodson is the only other soldier who has combat experience, so Sharp knows, he will have to rely on him in combat until the other rangers gain some combat experience, Sharp sees his unit smaller than most other vanguard teams as the program is still new and being organized, According to their files all have passed ranger school within the past year or two, the unit medic, specialist Jerry William, private second class Marvin Scott, the team heavy weapons support, Corporal Andrew Steele, the team marksman and squad leader, and the team radio operator and female soldier, private first class Alicia Moore. Attention. Randy orders, all of them stop what they are doing and stand at attention, at ease, he said, he sees them all standing there, while they are all standing there in a professional manner, respecting the rank, he can see that none of them respect him, he knows that they all would rather have Johnson lead them into battle, the reason he did not want to be here with the rangers had nothing to do with them, he has served with rangers before like Captain Bailey and he has nothing but respect for them, the truth is, he does not feel worthy to lead them, but he knows he cannot tell them, he takes a breath and looks at them all in the eyes, all right rangers, listen up, I know we didn't get off on the best of terms, however, that ends right now, this was supposed to be a temporary assignment, but that is not acceptable, we are going to war against an unknown enemy, he continues, I will be giving it my all, and I expect you all to do the same. I know you all want to get some payback and everything around the gate is considered hostile, but remember, we do not know these people, so do not kill civilians, he stops for a moment to let them think, I don't know how many of you are religious, but some say this is the gateway to hell, I personally agree with those people, this door or whatever it is a portal to hell, and we are going to bring hell with us, load up and let's go, other side of the gate, the ride through the gate took hours, he can tell everyone is nervous as reality sets in, he looks over to Andrew, Steele, Sharp said, from what I understand you are into this fantasy stuff, Andrew looks at him with some confusion, sorry sir, Scott elbows Andrew's shoulder with a smirk, you should see his quarters, sir, he has anime girls everywhere, some are not decent, shut up Marvin, Andrew said, 
Don't call me Marvin, Scott said, I hate my first name. Andrew looks back to him, well yeah, I am into manga and fantasy. Played a lot of magic, scrolls, the witcher, manga, anime, you name it. Cool, he said, saw a lot of that in Japan. I know a little but if I have questions, I will ask you. You a nerd sir? Andrew asked in a shocked tone. He looks back to Andrew and reaches into his vest pouch. He pulls out a small but thick Optimus Prime with a big head. What is that? Scott asked, confused. Optimus Prime, man, Andrew asked, leader of the Autobots from Transformers. I never expected you to be a fan. Great. Alicia mumbles. The Major is a jackass and a nerd. He ignores Alicia and puts the toy away. I bring it everywhere. As they talk, he hears the driver tell him that he could see light at the end of the gate. He looks around and signals everyone to get ready. Right when the Bradley exits the gate, he can hear the first assault wave convoy open fire. The sound of cannon and rifle fire can be heard out loud outside as the M1A3 Abrams, M2 Bradleys, and Strikers open fire. First CAF soldiers and rangers get out of their vehicles and engage the enemy. The auto cannon from the M2 Bradley they are in opens fire. He suddenly hears a loud impact against the armor. What was that? Alicia asked, looking up in a nervous way. We are okay right? They only have spears. He looks over to her. It's probably a ballista that deflected across the armor. Stay focused rangers. The Bradley stops and the back door opens, forming a ramp to let his team outside. Similarly, other M2 Bradleys. M1126 30mm Strikers and M1283 AMPV, 4, offload their own troops, all right rangers, payback, engage at will and cover your sectors, he said over his team radio. While they do not have NW's full abilities, like using the HUD and cameras, he can still use the local radio to communicate with his team. It is quiet over the team radio network as everyone is excited and nervous at the same time. Most of his team had never seen combat until today. A billion things go on through everyone's head, at least until that first bullet is fired. However, the army trains its soldiers to be ready for the real thing, and most of the people in charge are experienced warriors from the war on terror. Everyone rushes out of their vehicles and heads to the emerging front line. He can see Randy keeping everyone in line, so no one leaves the group. He can see Vanguard 5 to his left flank and Charlie Company from 1st Calf to his right. He moves past an M1A3 Abram firing its main cannon into a line of enemy soldiers, using anti-personnel rounds. He sees about a dozen of the line formations suddenly get shattered. The soldiers around them stop in position, wondering what had just happened. He stops as he passes a trench and fires his M4A1, killing two archers. He looks down at the dead bodies and sees two humans. He finds the sight strange, being in an alien world and yet he is killing humans. While the other aliens like orcs and elves make a little more sense, humans completely throw any logic out the door. He hears rifles and machine gun fire. To his right, he sees Alicia. Andrew and Scott walk up after having cleared the trench. First trench secured sir. Alicia said. Sharp nods. Tell Johnson to regroup and order Bailey to secure the other end of the trench. I don't want these bastards sneaking up behind us. He then looks out and adjusts his next generation night vision goggles. The N slash PSQ 25. Unlike old equipment where the soldier had to choose either night vision or thermal goggles. The N slash PSQ-20 merges both goggles into one and removes the green color in old night vision goggles. This allows the wearer to find his targets faster. The brass believed that the best chance for success was if the first wave of the attack took place at night while using thermal and night vision to their advantage against the enemy. He sees rows and rows of fortifications, trenches, bunkers, and behind all that are enemy artillery. He sees fireballs and flame arrows moving through the air, heading to the US location. A soldier gets hit by an arrow, and his buddies start dragging him back. Another M1A3 Abrams drives up and stops, firing its 120mm cannon with the other tanks. Their combined fire obliterates the fortification and watchtowers. 
He then sees at his ballista shot far from a bunker. Inside, it looks like a Scorpio. According to the quick history lesson of possible weapon systems they might find around the Scorpio are men dressed in Roman-like armor. However, behind them is a larger, stronger beast loading it. While he has no idea what that beast is, he knows it is the enemy. His goggles identify five targets around the ballista. He notices about 30 more all around the fortification around the Scorpio, coming out of their positions to attack. Targets in range. Engage the closest one's closet. Don't let them get close, he orders. He sees Private First Class Alicia and Specialist Jerry on his left open fire on the incoming legions. Sergeant Major, get a rocket into the bunker. Scott and Andrew, suppressive fire. He sees this rocket hit the bunker, destroying the Scorpio. He takes his rifle and fires into the incoming swordsman as the enemy marches forward. The rest of his rangers engage the incoming force and pick it apart. 0 .50 caliber machine guns from the strikers and Bradleys mop up the rest. He is impressed by the enemy's discipline even in the face of impossible odds. Regardless of how many of their numbers fall, they continue to regroup and resume pressing their attack unyieldingly. If the American forces only had swords, he could see this unknown enemy as a major threat. Thankfully, firearms nullified the primitive's tenacity. As he finishes securing the first defensive line, he notices how tight the enemy infantry formation is. It reminds him of the Earth's ancient world on how the Roman triplex size or the Greek phalanx formation. When he learned how less advanced the enemy was, he made sure to do some basic research. Noticing this, he orders his rifleman to aim at the flanks of the enemy formation. He then directs his gunner Scott to aim for the center. The troops in the enemy formation compact closer together as they see the soldier falling next to them. That just made it easier for Scott to spray the enemy down. With the combination of his team, the machine guns on the tanks, and the hundreds of other U.S. soldiers in the area of the first enemy defense line fell with ease and the task force continued pushing towards the second defensive line. He can hear on the radio that the second wave has arrived and is securing the flanks, offloading more rangers and first calf soldiers, in the chaos of battle. He hears these loud roars through the rifle and cannon fire. He looks and sees these trolls charging up the hill and heading to their position. Seeing the threat, two tanks aimed and engaged the incoming trolls. Focused fire destroys the trolls and other tall monsters within seconds. Over the team radio, he hears Colonel Robert. All troops, the first wave secured, establish a perimeter for the strikers. Watch out for the enemy artillery, it looks like fireballs. Rangers secure left flank. Bravo Company establishes a defensive line up front until the second wave arrives. As he listens, he raises and fires his rifle, taking out a soldier that was running up towards them. He then hears Johnson, be advised, their armor is useless. Aim for their hard points, roger that. Move left and form a line, he orders his team. As he said that, a fireball hits the ground close by him. He then starts to move along with his rangers. All around him, he sees other soldiers of the assault force fighting, covering their tanks and other armored vehicles. Another fireball lands on top of an M1A3 Abrams tank, engulfing it in flames. The tank suffers no damage from the strike and fires its cannon at a line of enemy soldiers, destroying the first three lines in the formation with one canister shot. His rangers, other rangers, and other army soldiers all form a line up on the left flank. Through the night vision goggles, they saw 2,000 enemy soldiers marching up the hill towards them. He sees Johnson ahead of him, giving orders for everyone into a firing line. They all take cover by wooden fortifications, firing down the hill into the oncoming crowd. It seems like an endless wave of soldiers continue pressing forth even as they drop down dead. Sharp waves to his team to move forward. They move through all the dead bodies that litter the ground. It got the point where he had to pay more attention to the ground just to make sure he doesn't trip. He gets right besides Johnson and Niels. He sees his team regroup with the rest of Vanguard 7 and join in the engagement. Citrep Lieutenant Johnson looks at him. 
1st CAF Alpha and Delta Company along that flank there. Vanguard teams 3 and 5 are right down this path here. He looks around. He sees Alicia and Andrew Duck from Arrow Fire. Seems like it was wise to attack at night. Yeah, Johnson replied. It seems they can't aim at night. He peeks over the wood wall. He sees the enemy in pure chaos. The once organized line formations are scattered. The superior ranged weapons of the Americans prevent them from getting any closer to use their swords. He sees the bigger beast which has been identified as trolls. However, he has no idea what the other giant one with horns is called. It did not matter as a tank round shredded the beast. He sees the next objective which is the next line of fortification. He looks back to Johnson, all right, we are moving down. He then looks past Johnson. Private First Class Moore, get the horn and tell the other teams we are advancing. Sergeant Major Randy Dodson rushes up to his side. Sir, I think there are enemy forces at the tree line. He then points over to their left of the thick tree line. It looks like cavalry. Sharp pulls out his digital binoculars and switches to night vision. Where? All I see are infantry. Oh there. Holy shit. Yeah. It looks like a battalion size, maybe more. Randy said, looking through his own binoculars. Sharp looks around and thinks about what's going on. It looks like the enemy cavalry is trying to counterattack the U.S. advance and push the U.S. back through the gate. While the U.S. has far superior firepower, the current U.S. force is only 2,000 with another three still coming. He knows if their cavalry reaches and hits the U.S. lines now, the casualties will be high, and the invasion might be jeopardized. He grabs his radio contact Alicia through the NW team network to report to him. Within seconds, Alicia rushes over, Sir, contact Actual and tell Colonel Robert that I need the second wave over here now. Cavalry inbound, he said. Alicia nods and contacts the Colonel, Assault Actual, this is Vanguard 7 to Task Force Charlie Command. We have enemy cavalry on our flanks, battalion size, requesting support or we're overrun. Alicia reports, there is a short delay in the network, Vanguard 7 this is assault actual, two striker platoons from the second wave are inbound to your position, do not let the enemy in the perimeter. Sir, strikers inbound, Colonel said to hold the line, Alicia reports. Hearing that, he looks up past the wood wall. He then sees hundreds of horsemen bursting out of the tree line and charging up the hill. They pass the trees and move quickly towards them. He looks around and points to the firing line. Rangers, hold the line. Aim for the horses. He hopes that hitting the horses would knock over the horsemen next to them, creating more chaos. Everyone maintains a constant fire, raining bullets at the incoming cavalry. However, the enemy cavalry is moving so fast and there are so many. They are about two-thirds of a kilometers away until a few blasts hit the leading forces. He feels the ground rumbling and turns around. He sees parts of the third wave move up behind his position. First calf soldiers start pouring out of the backs of the Bradleys and Strikers. Heavy fire support from the Bradleys and Strikers rain down on the incoming cavalry. 50 caliber MK-47 striker grenade launcher, missiles, and 30mm chain guns begin to rain down on the enemy. The infantry rushes up to the ranger's position and engages the enemy, as the left flank is reinforced. Hundreds of American soldiers let loose with everything they have down at the incoming cavalry. All they can see is the massive horde of horses charging. It would be impossible to miss. The barrage of American firepower rips through the first and second lines of the enemy formation. After only a few minutes concentrated fire support, the first few lines of enemy cavalry are wiped out. The ones in the back begin retreating, trying to get away before they get slaughtered. It looks like the left flank has been secured. He hears over the radio on what is going on the other fronts. Third assault wave is engaging now. Have the 3rd Armored Platoon Guard Abrams begin bombardment of the enemy positions. Take out their artillery. Hillside Assault Actual said. Suddenly, they all see three tanks aim for the hillside a kilometer away. He can see fires on the hill, where the enemy forward operating base presumed to be. Massive explosions rip enemy artillery pieces apart. 
flames suddenly engulf the large towers and wooden fortress. This is assault lead to all commands, move out and engage. The enemy has retreated but do not let up. Secure the gate, Robert said. Hearing that he gets up and walks up the defense line, points to everyone and orders them all to move forward, stay behind the vehicles and engage, move up and secure the tree line. A mixture unit of strikers, Abrams, Bradleys and other vehicles move up steam rolling any remaining enemy lines. The infantry and rangers begin to mop up anyone else who tries to fight back. At that moment he turns around and looks out. All he can see are the flashes from his fellow American forces weapons. Fires everywhere from here to the nearby hills, where he assumes the enemy artillery has been. The screams of the enemy, either wounded or fleeing. He realizes that this is what this war will be like, in an alien world fighting an unknown enemy against many different types of mysteries, races, and most of all, the unknown. Reference, https colon slash slash shim dot wattpad dot com slash 112 ffb 3 f 50 f 2 a 3 b 165 c f 5 d 276 f 347 f 0 f 320 a slash 6 8 7 4 7 4 7 0 7 3 3 a 2 f 2 f 7 3 3 3 2 e 616 d 616 17 a 6 f 6 e 6 1 7 7 7 3 2 e 636 f 6 d 2 f 7 7 6 1 7 4 7 4 7 0 oh 6 1 6 4 2 d 6 d 6 5 6 4 6 9 6 1 2 d 7 3 6 5 7 2 7 6 6 9 6 3 6 5 2 f 5 3 7 4 6 f 7 2 7 9 4 9 6 d 6 1 one six seven six five two F four hundred and forty four C six six three six two D five six four seven seven six four F two D six F five two five three seven seven three D three D two D three seven three O three four three six three O three eight three O three seven three three two E three one three six three seven three two three two six four six five three two six two three one three eight six four three one six five three four three two three five three four three two three two three 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 eight three nine three seven three seven three four three nine three two two e six a seven thousand and sixty seven one co equals commanding officer two swat equals special weapons and tactics three net equals net warrior Integrated Dismounted Leader Situational Awareness System 4. AMPV equals Armored Multipurpose Vehicle Replacement for the M113 APC 5. NCO equals Non-Commission Officer 6 and slash PSQ-20 and slash PSQ-20 Enhanced Night Vision Goggle ENVG Discord HTTPS colon slash slash discord dot gg slash 7hjgv3s Gate War of Two Worlds Part 1 Sadra Royal District Imperial Senate Chambers February 17, 2025 Senator Kesso Itaiuli is standing in the middle of the Senate Chambers, engaging in the large debate that is happening on the floor. Being one of the most senior and powerful senators and coming from a long noble family line, he has the right to be at the center stage. What do you mean they're all dead? Senator Roras Das Dardanus said, shocked by the news of what happens on Alnus Hill. What about General Awadan? According to the messenger, General Awadan has fallen. Tyuli reads the note to the Senate. He was one of our best generals. We need to investigate the current situation, Kaisal El Tiberius proposes. We need to find out how the enemy killed General Awadan and his army. When he reads the note, he automatically knows it is not good. About a month ago, the Empire sent many of its greatest generals to claim the lands beyond the gate in the name of the Empire. After they went through the magical gate, only a few came back. At first, the news sounded great. Many riches and slaves were taken. That was what the first report stated. It sounded like the humans on the other side of the gate were weak and inferior, new lands and new slaves just ready to be taken. But then no one heard anything from the advance force. 
The new survivors who returned claimed the invasion force was slaughtered, shocking the Imperial Senate. The situation around the gate became strange as no one knew what to do. A few smaller warbands were sent to see what had happened to the main force but none of them returned either too. It was decided to send another army, a far larger one, through the gate. But the enemy came through and smashed the defenders. About one-tenth of the Imperial Army was sent to guard the gate and prepare for war. Investigate Cicero La Moltos asked angrily. We need to act. A dishonor like this cannot go unpunished. No one does this to the Empire and gets away with it. And don't forget about our vassals, Amulius Pallastis points out. If we don't act fast then our vassals might betray us. There is no way we can keep this a secret. Baron Monterey states, everyone in the region will know, the question is how we respond. He nods at what Baron had said, another respected senator, Baron always is careful about how he reacts respects, understanding the power of silence. However, even he is rattled by this news. We should send an embassy to these other worlders. He proposes, we clearly do not understand this enemy enough to continue to wage war. You are kidding Tyuli? We must send a counter-attack right now. A defeat like this must not be left leave unchallenged, Oras responds in an arrogant tone. This is war, not a game. We must send a force now and reclaim revenge our honor. He sees most of the senators clap and cheers for the proposal to send a counter-attack against the other worlders. Only a few senators don't, and his most trusted friend, Tiberius, lightly claps while he isn't against wars. He doesn't like the idea of sending more troops to die against an enemy that is clearly stronger than they were told. Are you kidding, he asked, who are we going to send? This is the second army to challenge these people and be defeated. Should we pull our forces from the east and let the dark races run rampant rampage? Recall from the west? Our army just defeated the Edra kingdom and it will take weeks for a wyvern to reach them and then months for the western armies to come back. This enemy is far stronger than we were promised. And we can't let the Tikherit dogs take advantage of our withdrawal from the West, Baron adds. We need to do this right. A short argument begins among the senators, clearly showing that the Senate is divided on what to do. The Empire has been around for over 600 years and has been through many crises, civil wars, and near defeats. But the Empire always finds a way to bounce back and slaughter its enemies. Some want to reclaim Alnus Hill and enslave these people who dare put up a fight against the Empire. Another group wants to do nothing it seems while another wants to negotiate. Others try to figure out the logistics, and others are scared of what their other enemies might do. Emperor Mold Augustus stands up from his throne. Everyone, please calm down. This is not a crisis. The Empire has endured far worse. We will overcome this challenge and we will become victorious. Many applaud him. But one of them steps out of the crowd. My liege, he said. If this letter is correct then our mightiest weapons couldn't even stop one of theirs. One hundred thousand dead in a night. One of our greatest and most respected generals was killed. We must assume the other 20,000 soldiers we sent through the gate are dead. While this is only a dent in the Imperial Army, I don't see pulling troops from other fronts to deal with an enemy we know nothing about to be possible. I have to agree with Senator Tyuli here, Palesti said, the issue isn't the losses we have sustained but that our core legions have been slaughtered. It will take time to rebuild our core legions and recall the frontier legions. Emperor Mold laughs at that point. If that is all you are worried about then we will call on our vessels. Send word to all the kingdom and lords that their emperor calls upon them for war. That will give us the numbers and time we need. He then sits back down on his throne. Very well your highness, he said. He then hears Marcus Catullus, the senate chamber managerial. His responsibility is to represent the emperor and to maintain order on the senate floor. This senate order is dismissed for today, Marcus yells. We will meet again tomorrow to continue the topic of the war. As the senators leave the chamber halls, Princess Pina Colada walks past them all. She had just heard about the recent defeat beyond the gate and the defeat at Alnus Hill. Hearing that news has angered her, and she cannot accept such a humiliation. She stops seeing Senators Kesoid Tiuli, Cicero La Moltos, 
and Kaisal El Tiberius talking. Senators, she said. She sees the three lightly bow, acknowledging her royalty. Hello your highness, Tiuli said. What brings you to the senate? I just heard about our defeats, she said. I want to know how this is possible and what we are doing about this. We are regrouping right now, Cicero said. We need time to rebuild our core legions, so our southern vassals have been called upon. She thinks about that and smiles, King Duran. I only heard his glorious stories about his time on the battlefield. It will be an honor to see him fight. I am sorry princess, but your father will never allow you to go to the front lines, Kaisal said. She looks up at him. Kaisal is one of the most principled and respectable senators she has ever met. His opinion has great value to her, and she knows what he means by that statement. It is because I am a woman, right? She asked, already knowing the answer. Of course, princess, Cicero said. I know of your rose knights. They're almost all noble women. What is the realm of men, not women? I know you think it is glorious, however. On the battlefield, all you will see is blood and are fallen. Her mentor and teacher, Graco Aldo, had said that many times. Even so, she still wants to go fight on the battlefield, lead troops into battle, and hear people tell stories of her glory, just like the war heroes and knights who come back from war do. I won't stand by as the Empire is losing a war, she said, I thank all three of you, but it is my destiny to lead warriors into battle, to serve my country, I will not let this opportunity pass me. Good day senators, as the three senators leave, she turns around, Hamilton, hurry up, coming, Hamilton said as she runs up, she turns around and walks into the senate chambers and sees her father sitting on the throne talking to senator Marcus and general of army Woody Caerilius. Father, she yells, this is an outrage, father. I demand to join forces with King Duran and help lead the counterattack. Mold looks down at her and chuckles at her boldness. He then rolls his eyes, every time there is a problem. You come in here and demand to be sent off. She stops after hearing that. Ah, yes. But this time it is a real crisis and we need as many knights and soldiers on the front lines. Stay calm my child, Moult said. We are taking care of this. These intruders will be dealt with shortly. Father, Moult glares right at her with a disapproving look. She adjusts herself and kneels. My apologies my emperor, I am just frustrated at on how this could have happened. Mold nods with approval they are from the other side of the gate. I have called upon our vessels for help. As she listens to her father, she thinks about when she created her Rose Order of Knights a few years ago. The Rose Order of the Knights is an honor guard of young female soldiers and retired men too old for actual battle. She has been asking for a real test of her order's worth. This war could be a good opportunity. She just hopes she can go to war and prove to all the men that she belongs here in this senate chamber, to be respected as a war hero like her bastard of a brother, Zorzlel Caesar. She is scared that she wasted her and her knight's time training if they never get to be used. Father, she said, please, I want this. We all want this. You need us to fight. To bring honor. At least until the main force can regroup. Mold looks at her. Woody whispers something into his ear and he smirks. We have a plan to take back Alnus Hill, however, I think your honor guard could help. There is a spark of excitement in her eyes when she hears that. She has been waiting for years to prove her worth and now the chance has arrived. We will serve the Empire with honor. Thank you, Father. Go and protect our interests from the enemies and I'll make sure our subjects don't rise against us. She nods her head and heads out. Princess Pina Colada walks down the hall and heads to the royal stables to grab her horse. Come on Hamilton, she said, we need to hurry. Shouldn't we wait for the others? Hamilton said with a worried tone. Just listen to me and hurry, she responds. We have a golden opportunity here and I will not pass it up. Hamilton is Pina's personal servant. Her father is a nobleman from Telta. He had given her Hamilton when they were both very young so she is someone she can depend on, anything she wants or needs, Hamilton provides, while being a servant that is just above a slave, Hamilton has proven to be the most loyal servant she has ever had, 
she has been the only servant that has been able to keep up. She cannot imagine life without her by her side. Since the day she created the Rose Order of Knights, she has been waiting to prove herself in battle. She has always wanted to show her father and her two older brothers that she isn't just some princess that can be married off to some backwater kingdom. She wants to be seen as a respectable warrior of the Empire. Pina leaves the palace and enters the royal stables. There she sees her mentor, Graco Aldo, and best friend and most loyal captain, Bozisco Palesti. Bozis rushes up and gives her a tackle hub. We did it, you did it, we are finally going into battle. Do not get too excited Bozis. Gray said, from the reports, the enemy seems strong. I fought for General Lulladan, and he isn't easily defeated. Bozis laughs and looks at him. You have become a warrior in your old age, Grey. The only thing I am worried about is us missing out before the Imperial Army and the Allied Coalition storm the hill. Yeah Grey, she said with a smile, I am sorry for the general. He was respected here in Sadra, but we are finally going into battle. Now I will prove myself. I will be treated with the respect I deserve. She thinks about when she comes back from battle, walking into the senator floor and being cheered as a hero. People will love and respect her, retaking lost territory and crushing the new enemy from the gate. I understand Princess, Grey said, it is good to be excited but don't let that control you. The first matter of business is, what is the plan? She places her hand on her chin and thinks, plan. I will go to Italica and establish a staging area there. There, I will gather the needed supplies while the rest of the Rose Order of Knights rally up. She then looks to Boses. Boses, get Beefita, and gather all the knights. Meet up at Italica as soon as you can. But Princess, Hamilton said, from what I understand the Imperial Army at Alnus was wiped out. Boses laughs hearing that. She places her arm around Hamilton and pulls her close, silly one. I don't believe that, did I hear the same rumors and a full army? Come on, it is true. Hamilton continues. The senators seem worried enough to call on our vessels. King Duran and the other vessels are attacking from the south. Even if they did defeat the army, we are the Empire, Boses said. Gray, your thoughts? Gray places his hand on his chin. That was an interesting report. I would guess maybe the army suffered many losses but the idea of a hundred thousand strong force being entirely wiped out seems to be too far reaching. I bet it is a translation error or a misunderstanding by the scribe who wrote it. It could be a panicking commander overreacting. However, Boses is correct. Hamilton, Gray continues, the Empire has lost battles before, even devastating ones, but the Empire has always come back to win in the end. We will beat this enemy, but we must be smart about it. Pina places her hands on her sides. See Hamilton? Nothing to fear. We need to hurry and join our comrades. Glory to the Empire. Princess. Grey said, I recommend we bring Norm with us. For extra protection on the way to Italica. She looks at Grey and frowns. Norm is a great swordsman, one of the Rose Knight's best. But he is a ladies' man, flirting with all the female knights. He is known to sleep around a lot wherever he goes. Peen relents at that advice, fine. But he is going to want to stop at a brothel on the way to Italica. She pulls out her sword and holds it up. For the Empire, we charge. Outskirts of Alnus Hill, Kilbury Woodland Forest. February 28th. 2025. Sharp hears the M1296 Dragoon Striker firing its 30mm Bushmaster turret into the enemy position. First cavalry soldiers swarm the area as they continue fiercely engaging the enemy. Johnson, take Scott and Jerry and move left, he orders, secure the ditch. Everyone with me. As he runs with his team behind him, he thinks back on the past few days. The night invasion lasted only 90 minutes with another two hours of mop-up. Once the battle was over and when the sun rose over the distant mountains to the east, he and everyone saw the thousands upon thousands of dead bodies everywhere. Bodies on top of bodies. The once green grass now covered in blood. After securing the gate on this alien world, some of the prisoners confessed the name of the hill the US is occupying. They called it Alnus Hill. 
They said that after their failed invasion, they built fortifications around the gate and were gathering another army to invade. This time, a 100,000 man force. The only reason their second invasion did not happen was because that the US attacked first. While he was not in those meetings, his logistical officer Sarah did the math. If there were over 100,000 soldiers around Alnus and the number of dead bodies they found, that meant that the US had killed at least 80%, maybe 90% of the enemy force. American forces only sustained about five casualties and seven wounded in the attack. Sharp wonders if that will become the norm in this war. After the US crushed the enemy army, some of the enemies retreated into the countryside. They did not want to give the enemy a chance to regroup and counterattack. Three cavalry companies with a vanguard unit were sent out in different directions to secure the surrounding area while the main force built defenses on Alnus Hill. Sharp stops by a tree and sees the rest of his team do the same. Over the radio, he hears 1st Cavalry Charlie Company advancing on the enemy. Their job is to push the enemy into one location by putting pressure on them. His vanguard team is supposed to bite at the enemy from the sides, preventing them from escaping, and then call in long-range artillery. Major, Andrew yells, 15 swordsmen forming up. He sees past the tree and sees the 15 Imperial soldiers forming up. He can see that they are trying to prevent them from advancing further. Andrew and Alicia each fire at the flanks. Squeeze them right. Scott, mowed them down. Engage, he orders. Sharp raises his rifle and fires, taking out the soldier with the fancy helmet which he assumed was the leader. Andrew and Alicia maintain a constant fire, picking off soldiers from each end. Scott fires his M240 machine gun, the 7.62x51mm NATO cartridge rounds tears through the enemy shields and armor like they are made out of paper. He hears a firefight happening to his left and sees Johnson's team engaging a charging enemy force. Just like with the ones he was fighting, they all fell dead before getting close. Rangers advance, he yells. He gets up from his position and rushes forward. His rangers are all around him, passing by the fresh corpses. In the distance, he sees a large stone tower. Major, Johnson said over the radio, Randy is reporting that he sees the main enemy encampment. Roger, he replied, I see a tower. Hold up here and engage. Calling in artillery. Regroup together and engage. He sees everyone stopping at the tree line and taking cover. As they approach, arrows hit close to them. Their weapon noises must have warned them. His rangers did not need any orders. They are some of the best the United States Army has to offer. They are trained to already know what to do and to do it efficiently. He sees the enemy trying to form up. Just like before, he sees one high-ranking man rallying everyone around him. Hundreds of these swordsmen form up behind their shields for protection. Hundreds of them start to march to his position. He aims his rifle and shoots. The 5.56x45mm NATO round easily goes through the shield and armor, systematically mowing them down like grass. The other soldiers around stop in shock, they're confused that their shields are so easily defeated as more of their comrades fall. Then suddenly, he sees a blue energy ball appear out of the tower and heads for Charlie Company. What the hell was that? Jerry asked. Do they have lasers? Scott yells in dismay. Keep your focus on the enemy, Randy orders. If you get distracted, we will be overrun. He looks over to Randy and is glad he is on top of things, a sign of his experience from the Iraqi war. However, Jerry and Scott asked a good question. Alicia rushes up and kneels next to him. Sir, I have Major Bronston on the line. He grabs the radio from Alicia, his team radio operator. Major Bronston. This is Vanguard lead, he said. Major, Bronston said. Captain Jace Baker just said one of his strikers got hit by this energy plasma bolt. That is how he described it. The front end of the striker is damaged and melted. Do you have eyes on it? He looks back at the tower. He could not believe that the energy bolt could damage a striker. While not the most armored APC the army has, it is still well protected. We saw the blast. He replied, it came from a stone tower within the camp. We are trying to figure out what it is. 
he then sees light coming from the top of the tower again and another energy bolt comes out, this time in bursts. It looks like they have a plasma cannon or some kind of advanced laser technology. Permission to speak sir? Andrew asked. Just focus on the enemy corporal, he orders. But sir, Andrew presses, I think I know what that is. He looks to Andrew, wondering what he is thinking. Stand by Major, Sharp then looks at Andrew, what is it, Corporal? Well, I think it is magic, Andrew said. Alicia looks at Andrew, you're bullshitting. You actually believe that report? Scott looks over, magic is not real. That is all bullshit. We know nothing about these people. That's probably some kind of heat reflecting technology or something. I mean it, Andrew said, I've seen this stuff before. In your anime, Alicia said, you watch too much of that stuff. And what? Andrew continues, getting annoyed, fighting elves and humans on an alien planet with trolls is more realistic to you? What Andrew said shut everyone up and he must admit, Andrew made a very convincing statement. Sharp motions for the soldier to continue. All right Andrew. Explain. Andrew turns around and looks at him. As I said, I see that all the time. It is an energy bolt. It is a basic energy attack from a mage. I bet anything that it's it. The major thinks about the idea and thinks about it right now. They know nothing of this world, and anything can be possible. If everything else seems like a standard fantasy world then why not magic, even though that should not be possible, Major Bronston. He said over the radio, We believe we discovered a magic user using magic attacks against your advancing force. Permission to take it out. Magic user? Bronston asked. Doubtful, that stuff is real? All right. You have permission to call in the rain. Roger. He replied and looks at Alicia. Take out the tower more. Alicia nods and calls base. Command this is Vanguard lead. Requesting artillery support. This is command. Request accepted. Sarah said. 2M1299 1R on standby. Firing single shot. He sees Alicia relay the coordinates to Sarah and then he hears the loud zoom of a single artillery shell. The shell lands and hits close to the tower. Alicia. Adjust fire right, he orders. He then hears the whoosh of more artillery shells flying over. A fierce fireball engulfs the tower but does not level the fortifications. As the fire clears, he sees a green, translucent sphere encompassing the tower like some kind of strange energy shield. This prevents the first shell from damaging the tower. However, the bombardment does not let up and hits the shield a few more times until it cracks and the last of the volley pierces through and destroys the tower. Stones from the tower scatter everywhere, destroying many of the makeshift buildings around it. Enemy soldiers scream, running away scared and confused about what had just happened. He hears Alicia adjusting the artillery again to be more effective. A rain of ordnance hits enemy positions, groups, and any other targets of interest. The enemy's once disciplined formation suddenly shatters as none of them understand what is hitting them. He hears Andrew call out, saying he sees Charlie Company arriving. He looks over and sees six different kinds of strikers with three Bradleys push right through a dense part of the forest and smash through a small palisade wall. They all open fire and crush the thousand strong enemy forces. Tow missiles fire from the Bradleys, hitting larger targets. The Solem 1128 mobile gun system stops and aims its 105mm cannon and fires destroying another major enemy formation. Hundreds of 1st Calf infantry follow behind and start advancing on the enemy, putting intense pressure. He sees the enemy break ranks and start trying to run away. They do not get far while well under the combined fire from the Rangers, Charlie Company, and the artillery. Damn, Andrew said. I think damn is an understatement, Scott replied. He looks at Scott and back at the M1128 mobile gun system. The 105mm cannon had melted off after that magic shot from the tower. Both of them are surprised that a primitive enemy took out an MGS striker. While the body of it is still intact, its primary weapon is gone. I guess magic is effective against our armor, he states. Clearly, Scott replied, but it is a striker. I'd like to see them burn through the armor of a Bradley or Abrams. We will see, 
he said and thinks, if magic is real in this world, then it could be limitless, depending on what kind of fantasy world this is. He turns around and looks back to the fortress that was just taken. The fact that we only saw one spell means that magic maybe is maybe hard to learn. And did you see? Whoever that mage was knew different spells. He thinks back to that tower. First, that mage used energy to attack Charlie's company advance, damaging two strikers. When Alicia brought down artillery, the mage formed a green energy shield, and it took until the third shell to break through it. Growing up, he had read many manga and played many games, so he is struggling to accept that what was once made up is now reality. He had been trying to think of a clear example of what media or story this world relates most to but cannot come up with one single example. The closest one he can think of are Lord of the Rings films. Even so, there are still many differences. What kind of magic do you think we will face? Scott asked. Andrew shrugs at Scott, I have no idea. That one example isn't enough for me to judge, but there are many kinds of magic so we should be careful. That is exactly what the Major said, Johnson said as he walks up. Hey LT, he said, what is going on? The last of the enemy has been defeated, Johnson said, these people don't like to surrender. I wonder if they are scared to surrender to us or if it's part of some zealot warrior code. Anyway, Johnson said, I was just talking to the Major, and he would like you to make a list of media that have good examples of magic and this style of warfare. Andrew looks at Johnson, confused, ah, sir, I am not a history buff guy. I don't read military novels and I don't know any textbook related to magic, we just discovered it. I meant your manga and anime shows. Johnson said, while the rest of us sat on our asses trying to figure what was going on, Sharp was impressed and now he wants to binge everything you know. You're kidding? He asked, surprised to hear that. I guess I can give him a list. He then looks back at the striker, because if this was our first encounter with magic, we haven't seen anything. He then hears Alicia over the radio. What is it? You guys want to come and see this? Alicia said. Did she finally find a date? Scott said, jokingly. I heard that you jackass. Alicia yelled over the net. We are on our way, Johnson said. All three of them walk over to Alicia, passing many still cooling bodies. All of them were humans. Surprisingly enough, the attack on Philadelphia had far more strange monsters, all from fantasy stories. But when they took Alness and took this camp, they had only seen humans and that is confusing him. The brass thought all these different races were one big, unified force, but now, the theory turned out to be wrong. He wonders if the relations between the races are different and segregated or that America had just invaded a human-dominated region. About time boys, Alicia said, always going slow when needed, just wanted to save what little time we had from your screeching tone Alicia, he responds, you brat. Alicia responds. She then points to the ground, look, he sees Alicia and three other first calf soldiers standing there. He looks down and sees a light-skinned elf laying there dead. He sees the pointy ears and the more feminine body structure compared to the human male's long dark green hair. His eyes widen, feeling the reality hit him that they are in an alien world, and he is looking at a real alien. It is strange looking at an alien and already knowing what he is. Scott comments. Andrew agrees with Scott on that point. When people think they will meet aliens for the first time they assume they would not know anything about them. But these aliens are humans and now an elf. All I can say is this, Alicia said. Thank God we have guns. Yeah, Scott said. I would hate to fight these people if we didn't. Suddenly, Alicia's radio goes off. Actual. This is Vanguard 7, report. Alicia said and lightly hits the radio. Damn, static. God, I miss satellite radio. Vanguard 7 this is Vanguard Command, Sarah said. Relay new orders to Major Shop. Fall back to Alness Hill. Andrew looks around the group, surprised to hear that. What about the enemy? We still have to hit the other camp in two days. Actual, are you sure? Alicia asked. Correct. Sarah responds through the static, all companies are being recalled back to Alness Hill, we detected a large enemy force coming from the south, reference, 
https colon slash slash shim dot wordpad dot com slash one hundred and twelve f f b three f fifty f two a three b one hundred and sixty five c f o five d two hundred and seventy six f three hundred and forty seven f zero f three hundred and twenty a slash six eight seven four seven four seven o seven three three a two f two f seven three 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 two e six hundred and sixteen d six hundred and seventeen a six f six e six one seven 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 three two e six hundred and thirty six f sixty two f seven seven six one seven four seven four seven o six one six four two d six d six five six four six nine six one two d seven three six five seven two seven six six nine six three six five two f five three seven four six f seven two seven nine four nine six d six one six seven six five two f four hundred and forty four c six six three six two d five six four seven seven six four f two d six f five two five three seven seven three d three d two d three seven three o three four three six three o three eight three o three seven three three two e three one three six three seven three two three two six four six five three two six two three one three eight six four three one six five three four three two three five three four three two three two three 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 eight three nine three seven three seven three four three nine three two two e six a seven thousand and sixty seven one M one thousand two hundred and ninety nine is replacing the M one hundred and nine family. Discord https colon slash slash discord dot gg slash x seven nnhs gate war of two worlds part one. Alnus Hill, American defensive perimeter, March second, two thousand and twenty five. When the Empire called on its allied kingdoms to arms, everyone came leagues away from Alnus Hill. An assembly is currently being held. King Duran Flelby of the Elbi fiefdom is seated at the head of the table, listening to the other younger kings and generals that are inside his command tent. The mood in the tent is incredibly positive and everyone seems overconfident. He had heard of the recent reports of how the Empire was recently defeated. Hearing that, he quickly mobilized his army and sent messengers to the other kingdoms to get ready for war. When he got the emperor's message that his army was needed, he was ready. He felt great honor to be called to lead the allied army against these other worlders. He was fought many wars, but he can tell this time will be his legacy. El Putis, he said. More wine please. He sees his head slave move over to him and pour him more red wine. As king, he has many slaves some to care of his chores and some for entertainment. However, El Patis has been his favorite. El Patis has always been loyal and good at his duties and in return, he gives him a good life. He looks around the war table and sees the other kings and counts. He sees the main kings of Algana, Mudwan, Timurin, and League Principality sitting there, looking at the map. He looks down at the table with the map of the area around Alnus Hill. The king from Algana stands up. He knows of him, King Daliuric Elwo Clayman. While allies under the imperial system, they have a long history of hostility. Out of all the other vassal kingdoms, Joran hates them the most. Our scouts' reports are true. Daliuric said and points to Alnus Hill. They have around 10, maybe 15,000 soldiers. That doesn't see, right? Joran said. How could such a small force defeat the Imperial Army? Maybe the Empire did more damage than the reports stated. His general said. Maybe, he mumbles as he thinks of the situation. Early reports had also stated that the enemy had strange war animals and constructed strange fortifications. The other kings and general saw this as an amateur enemy. Everything these other worlders were doing were wrong in the arts of war. While Duran agrees with their conclusion. His gut is telling him something is off. He was fought many wars to know when something is off. There is no way this enemy could have defeated the Imperial Army and then make basic mistakes like this, unless he is missing something. All right, here is the plan of attack, he said. 
breaking from his muse, Mudwin will take their force from this direction. Algana and their horde army will attack from the east with the intent of swarming the enemy position. We all will keep them busy. Unlike all other kingdoms, Algana found a way to domesticate some of the more barbaric dark races like goblins, trolls, and ogres. Being a much smaller kingdom, they use them as a slave army to fight their enemies. Durand plans to use that to devastate the enemy defenses while they march forward. He then looks to the rest. The Dimran army will attack from the west. The League army will take the gap between yours and my army. We will advance at dawn and overwhelm them with a combined force, he states. My dragon riders and wyvern corps will swoop into case a distraction and cover our advance. What about the Imperial army? The king from Mudwin asks. The latest message said the Imperial army will be advancing from the north, he replied. We will link our forces up and take the hill. He looks up at everyone and holds up his wine glass. Bring honor to yourself and glory to the Empire. Everyone cheers, all eager for battle. Alnus Hill. American Defensive Perimeter March 3, 2025 Nearly a hundred thousand soldiers from the five allied kingdoms march to the hill. It is still as dark as the sun has yet to raise. It was decided to begin the attack before sunrise, catch the other worlders in their sleep. By the time the sun rose, the allied forces would have been right on top of them with overwhelming numbers washing over them like water on rocks streaming through the lines and surrounding them. King Duran looks around the battlefield, confused by what he does not see. The enemy has yet to leave their camp and meet them in battle. He knows there is no way the enemy cannot hear their advance. There are too many soldiers. He wonders if the enemy is waiting for them to get close, but that will be suicidal. The other issue is that he has yet to see anyone from the Imperial Army. He was told that they would be here and they would take the hill together. Were they late or have they already been defeated? Either way, he must advance the allied army. He pulls out his sword and points it forward. Advance. As they march closer, he sees that the ground is completely scorched as if it had already seen battle. As the sun rises and he can see more, he sees signs of the previous battle here. He rides on his horse as his army marches towards the hill. Forward my men. The armies march and everything seems to be quiet as they move towards the hill. However, his gut tells him that something does not feel right. Are these intruders this dumb in the art of war? He mumbles to himself. I expected some guards or something out there to serve his lookouts. They continue marching, and everyone in the army sees a flagpole in the ground waving in the small breeze. It is the flag of the Empire. Around it is two dead bodies from the Imperial Army. They look like they have been here for weeks. The sun raises further, and he sees more bodies everywhere. All of which were from the Imperial Army who had been sent to defend the gate. Above, he sees his dragon riders and wyvern corps swooping in as planned. He then sees a strange glow quickly moving through the air coming from the enemy position. The object hits one of his dragons killing it instantly. Then he sees another, then another, then another of these objects, all taking out his air force until there is nothing left. Suddenly, they hear loud sounds in the distance, and then bright lights come from their left. He looks over to the kingdom of Mudwin's position and sees large explosions, flares, and flying streaks of lights belting their forces like unbelievably fast arrows. They are clearly being slaughtered. What is the meaning of this? He asks, dismayed. Is this dark magic? No. No magic can just kill off an army. How is this possible? That is when bright red lights shoot up from the hill and illuminates everything, exposing all of his men. He watches as the strange flare slowly falls, amazed by it. At first, he thought it was magic, but he realized it was not. How could they create miniature suns like this? He mumbles, trying to figure it out. Up ahead, he starts to see more flashes. His frontline legions are frightened from these flashes and hear these zipping sounds. His soldiers form up, getting behind their shields, but they keep falling like their shields are worthless. He hears large zooming sounds and then suddenly, large explosions erupt across his front line. He sits upon his horse, gaping in awe. Most of his first wave is gone. That is when he realizes what is happening. This unknown enemy already knew they were coming. 
they were far stronger than he was led to believe. In the order from the Empire, Emperor Molt mentioned how strong this new enemy was, leading Duran to believe Molt knew this would happen from the beginning. Damn you Molt, Duran mumbles to himself. He looks forward, seeing no way to retreat. He pulls out his sword and points it towards the hill. Charge! He bellows at the top of his lungs. All of his men start charging up the hill, trying to close the distance. Strange noises come from the sky. Then, more explosions appear all around his men. Dozens of soldiers die in the blast. Holes in the formations would befall in a matter of seconds. The flashes and zipping sounds coming from the hill tear through the rest of the forward formations. His soldiers unable to move out of the way because of all the dead bodies and the packed formations only making them die faster. Keep attacking. For the Empire, he yells, trying to keep the momentum. As he rides up the hill, an explosion blossoms next to him, knocking him off his horse. Major Sharp weaves through the trench. Soldiers all around him engage the incoming enemy army. Since the rest of the army had arrived, they had established a holding position around the thing now being called the gate. Normally, the army is an aggressive fighting force who takes the initiative, not waiting for the enemy to attack. However, this is not Earth. This new world is strange. They know nothing about it, so the US's number one priority is to prevent a second attack. Once the US feels that has been accomplished, then they can begin exploring this world and take the fight to the enemy. He continues rushing through the trenches, bypassing the hundreds of soldiers from the 1st Cavalry Division firing their weapons down the hill. He continues to rush up to an observer post. How is it? He asks the personnel within. There are four other officers at the post looking at the incoming forces. One of the officers is Colonel William, the section leader of this defensive line. Captain Griffin, base operations officer is here to coordinate artillery fire support. Major Bronston, the 1st Cavalry Division mechanized leader aides in the defense of this section. The last is the Ranger Commander, Colonel John Yang. He stops and turns around, feeling the tremors of the tanks moving up. An Abram drives up and then stops, right behind the trench. Both of its machine guns begin firing into the incoming horde. Private First Class Alicia Moore is right behind him holding her radio. This firecracker of a woman reminds him of a close friend he had, always aggressive and a big month. Inform Johnson we are at the op. Stay low, he orders her to relay. After saying that, the Abrams fires its main gun with a loud blast. Sir, Alicia complies and begins reporting to Second Lieutenant Johnson. As she speaks, an M2 Bradley and a few other heavy vehicles roll up. They begin unloading all their firepower. Bring hell on top of the enemy. Sharp walks into the sandbag bunker. Colonel, Sharp salutes. Both Yang and William look at him and salute. Welcome to the show Major, Yang said. Colonel, he said and then looks out into the meadow. He sees massive lines of soldiers marching up with explosions happening all around them. Major, welcome to the fight, William said as he looks through his binoculars. By God, how many are there? Major Bronston asks. Sharp looks to where Bronston is looking. Line after line of the enemy formation falls, but with each line that falls, another just appears, at least until they get wiped out. When I first enlisted and if you told me I would be fighting this, I would have thought you were on crack, Yang said. Or angel dust, Sharp replied. Back on Earth. The troops were told that the enemy would be using ancient armor and weapons. The most basic of modern weaponry seemed to be able to easily punch right through the enemy's armor. That is when Captain Bailey of Vanguard 5 rushes in. Welcome Captain, Yang said. Good job on taking out that nest the other day. Thank you sir, Bailey said. He then looks over, damn. They are still marching up. They are determined sobs one, he replied. See that ogre over there? The ogre then explodes from a missile strike. Well, what's left of him? Bailey said with a morbid chuckle. Yup, he replied. That ogre eats people alive. I would hate to get close to these people. If they are willing to march to their deaths, then we cannot underestimate them. Bailey gives him a pat on the shoulder. With your rep, I am glad you're here buddy. Shut up Bailey, he said and looks at him. This is like a bad joke, 
Bailey said as he watches U.S. forces slaughter the enemy. Alicia walks up behind them. Major, I just got word that we are losing our artillery support. Heavy cavalry is attacking the west flank. Sharp then looks at Griffin. I think that will be fine. Thank you. Private First Class, Griffin said to her. Sharp nods to her. Thank you Alicia. You said thank you this time. Didn't know you knew that word. Alicia said to Sharp in a smart-ass tone. He glares at her. She looks away smirking and then gets back on the radio. Are you going to discipline her major? Yang asked. No, Sharp responds. She reminds me of a friend, and honestly, I like smart asses. Keeps me on my toes. If you say so, Yang said, General Holland said I could trust you even though your record said you are a combat virgin who has had a desk job. I don't buy it. It is all true sir, Sharp said. Command got fed up with me and kicked me out to you. Holland never lies. We will see, Yang said. Still, this sight blows me away. I wonder if this was how wars were fought back then excluding the artillery raining down on them. Yang then walks up to the sandbags, standing by a ranger on a .50 caliber. He then pulls out his binoculars and zooms in. Well, there are enough of them. Bailey comments, at this rate, we are going to end this war just by depleting their numbers. As Sharp joins in to look down from the hill, he sees the thousands of Roman-like soldiers getting slaughtered by artillery, machine guns tank cannons, and rifle fire. You're right, but still. They don't even stand a chance. Watching this reminds me of kings and generals too, he said. King and generals sir? Bailey asks. It was a YouTube channel before YouTube shot themselves in the foot, he replied. They're on other platforms now. They study ancient warfare. Never thought I would see any of that in my life. I watch that stuff. William comments, good stuff. Sharp looks at William and then to Yang, Colonel. We should get all the Vanguard team's leadership to watch that stuff. They talk about ancient warfare and some history. If the enemy is using ancient tactics, it could help our boys fight them. I agree, Major, Yang said. Come up with a list and have Lieutenant Sarah deliver me the recommendations. Major Bronston looks over, overhearing the conversation. I saw that back in the day, too. I don't recall them talking about invading aliens planets and magic. All this reminds me of Stargate, William comments. Personally, I preferred Atlantis. But both were good. Anyway, stay alert, and do not get overconfident. It doesn't matter that they are using bows and arrows. All you need is one bad day, and a unit will be slaughtered. Sharp understands what William is saying. There is a good chance the enemy will not follow any human rights laws or Geneva Convention rules. There is a good chance they will be slaughtered if ambushed, and enslaved or murdered if they were captured. I fully understand sir, Sharp said. That is when they hear Alicia warning them, sirs, radar is reporting we have a second airborne raid incoming. They believe that it's dragons. She still is having a hard time believing all this is happening. That is something you don't hear every day, Bronston said. No worry, we have enough Shorad assist here to tear them apart. Shorad means short range air defense. When dragons came through the gate, it was decided to bring in and slash TWQ1 Avenger Humvees and the new Striker Mobile Shorad with them. Both are armed with FIM 92 Stingers anti air missiles, perfect for taking out dragons and wyverns. There is a short silence between everyone as they watch the show. Since the first battle, more troops from the United States poured through the gate. This hill had become more fortified than Fort Knox itself. They watch as the enemy lines break apart and start retreating. SAM missiles take out any of the airborne dragon threats that had arrived. By the time dawn arrived, the battle was pretty much over. Sharp stands there watching as the battle comes to an end. Most of the enemy army is dead and he wonders what else to expect in the coming weeks. This world seems like it has all different kinds of surprises, and he hopes he can meet those challenges. He hopes he is just worthy and can do things right. Reference, 
https colon slash slash shim dot wattpad dot com slash one hundred and twelve ff b three f fifty f two a three b one hundred and sixty five c f o five d two hundred and seventy six f three hundred and forty seven f zero f three hundred and twenty a slash six eight seven four seven four seven oh seven three three a two f two f seven three 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 two e six hundred and sixteen d six hundred and seven Seventeen A six F six E six one seven 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 three two E six hundred and thirty six F six D two F seven seven six one seven four seven four seven O six one six four two D six D six five six four six nine six one two D seven three six five seven two seven six six nine six three six five two F five three seven four six F seven two seven nine four nine six D six one Six seven six five two F four hundred and forty four C six six three six two D five six four seven seven six four F two D six F five two five three seven seven three D three D two D three seven three O three four three six three O three eight three O three seven three three two E three one three six three seven three two three two six four six five three two six two three one one three eight six four three one six five three four three two three five three four three two three two three 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 eight three nine three seven three seven three four three nine three two two e six a seven thousand and sixty seven one sob equals son of a bitch two kings and generals is a youtube military battle history channel gate war of two worlds part one cone forest april fifteenth 2025. Rory Mercury quietly jumps on top of a boulder. She looks down and sees five men around a campfire trying to stay warm. It is currently night. Two of the men have naked women on either side of them being held or laying on the ground out cold. She had been hearing sounds of battle from the west of the Roma River and had been wanting to investigate. She sees that the men around the campfire are well armed and equipped. All are using standard imperial weapons and equipment, so she knows they cannot be mercenaries or standard bandits. They are soldiers who had recently gone rogue. Man, I can't wait to get home. One of them said, Are you kidding? Do you really want to go back home after what we've been through? A bigger man said, They are just going to put you back into the army or enslave us for running away. A third man replied, and besides, we are free now, we can take whatever we want, rape anyone we want, no lord or king telling us what to do, another laughs, all the men chortle and clang their glass mugs together, besides, another said as he rips off a leg from the beast they had killed for food, we were promised riches and property if we enlisted, we are just getting what was entitled, he reaches over and pulls an elven woman closer to himself. She quietly whimpers. Rory heard enough and stood up from her cover. Why, hello boys, I see you all having a fun time. The men turn around, wondering where the voice came from. They then look up at the massive rock next to them and see the infamous Demi Goodness. Rory Mercury, a servant to Emery, the god of darkness, war, violence, and death. All the men look up at her in awe and start to tremble in fear, taking a few steps backward away from their camp. Rory the Reaper One man peeps out in growing horror. What are you doing here? Another man said, tossing the women on his lap away and grabbing for his sword. She smirks, jumps off the rock, and lands by the fire. She then flourishes her halberd behind her back, further intimating the soldiers. As she does this, she is humming a song she grew up with. It was such a childish tune, but when it was coming from the embodiment of the Grim Reaper herself, it was a song of death itself. I wonder what you have been doing, she said and glances to her right. There were three naked, dead women. She has seen this sight thousands of times. In this world, the strongest prey on a weak. That usually means that peasants get abused by the soldiers and their rulers. Rape and enslavement are the norm, and she has seen it all. But seeing the state of these women these men had left them in, dead or alive, just infuriates her. She finds no honor in such actions, soldiers taking and abusing whatever they want when they are supposed to be the protectors of the people. She glares at them. 
I was told some bandits attacked a small village nearby. They murdered everyone and took five young girls. I take it that it was you five. Before any one of them knows what to do, one of them charges her. Taking a swing with his sword, the girl chops him down without sparing a single glance. At the same time, two more charges at her, but the remaining two run away. Once she is done with her first victim, she rushes towards the two attacking her and slashes them in half with a single twirl of her axe like scything through grass. She briefly pauses to take a glance at the remaining victims fleeing as fast as their legs could take them. Her legs pump and she unleashes a blinding burst of speed, closing the distance in a flash to pass the closest one. Before he realizes what has happened, he falls down in two parts separated at the waist. Rory stops right in front of the last victim like a wraith appearing out of nowhere. He falls over scared to death, slowly back crawling away futilely from his doom. Please don't kill me. I didn't mean it. I was forced to. The man begs for his life as the reaper approaches ominously with a light neutral expression on her face as if she was disposing trash. Rory steps on his chest, preventing him from escaping. She looks down at the man. Begging, mercy, she said. I highly doubt that you gave them that honor. She cocks her head to the dead female corpses behind her. He had not made it any further than a dozen yards before being caught. He continues begging for her to spare his life, but she would not have any of it. Tell me what I want to know, she demands. You are imperial soldiers. Why are there so many around here? Why are you here? The bandit continues blithering like a fool until she not so gently persuades him to cease with a slight increase of weight to his chest. We. There is a new enemy in these lands, the man finally said. Our job was to hold the bridge crossing at the Roma River. We were slaughtered in the night. I don't believe you, she replied. I felt many souls pass through me, and I was not even close by. That means there had to have been a massive battle recently. I even heard the sounds of battle. The deathly terrified man nods. Yes, your holiness. On Alnus Hill, the gate appeared. These are the worlders poured through and slaughtered us. One hundred thousand soldiers died in hours. General Arwadan fell that night. This surprises her. General Arwadan has fallen. She has heard of him. Imperial soldiers usually represent who their general is and Dulra is known to be very respectable. He was one of the few generals she somewhat liked. However, that was not the most important thing she heard. Did you say the gate? Yes, the man said. The gate has opened, and invaders are attacking us. I was at Alnus and they slaughtered us. We tried to hold them on at the bridge but they were destroyed. Us. Nothing can stop them. They are pure evil. Not even the goddess Hardy and Syphilis can compare to them. She tenses upon hearing Hardy. Hardy is the goddess of hell and the underworld while Syphilis is the goddess of all acts of evil. For this man to reference both catches her interests. While she is no fan of the Empire, Having another faction that could be worse than the Empire is not in her best interests. If what this soldier is saying is true then she knows that she must investigate, as she thinks, she notices the man getting confused. I answered all your questions, the man said. Can I go free? For a moment she thought about letting him go free for answering her questions. While Emroy is the goddess of death, he isn't for pointless death. However, she glances back to the three dead bodies and the other three injured women all sitting there scared. She looks back at him and unceremoniously cuts off his head. Rory licks her lips at the sight of crimson foundling out of the neck. She enjoys the smell of death, especially from those who deserved it. Nevertheless, what he said was true. Over the past few weeks she had felt tens of thousands of souls bursting through her body creating a massive orgasmic experience she had ever experienced. For her god Emroy, she is a vassal for souls that die in battle when she is nearby. While she had experienced this for over 900 years, she had never experienced this many at once. She starts walking back and forth, thinking about what to do. I must go to Alnus and find out the truth. If they are hostile, I have to kill them. Oh, by the gods, I hope this will be fun. Things have gotten boring recently, she mutters to herself. She then hears a noise from the three women still alive. Oh, I almost forgot about you, she exclaims. Ah Rory. A young woman shakily said, 
terrified of the apostle and the slaughter she had just committed in front of them. What will you do with us? Rory places her hands on her hips and thinks out loud, if I recall. There is a village nearby. I will take you three to them, and they can deal with you. Small villages are usually nicer, anyway. Alness Hill, five miles away. April 25th. 2025. Three joint light tactical vehicles two or JLTV leave the American-controlled Hill of Alness. After the last battle, the Vanguard program went into effect, to go out and explore this new world, map the areas, make contact with the locals, determine who is and who isn't the enemy, and so on. The Ranger team, Vanguard 7, is on their first exploration mission into this new world. They will not be the only team being sent out. There are four other teams departing as well. Major Sharp sits in the passenger seat in the Command JLTV. Unlike the other versions, the Command version has more space in the back for equipment or personal. Right now, he is talking on the radio. He is speaking with one of the other teams sent out. Don't forget Bailey, when you die out there, I'll get your sports car, he ribs at him. Hell no, shop, I will send you a therapy book after I register a reading class for you. Captain Bailey shoots back, sarcastically. Alicia sits in the back, reading a book as she party listens in. She messes with the controls on her radio set and mutters, Boys, they never grow up. Be my guest, just make sure she is a hot teacher. Now watch your six, Sharp said back to Bailey. Your team too. Vanguard 5 out. The radio goes quiet as their convoy heads north. Once the conversation is over, Alicia makes a comment to her boss. You seem to be in a happy mood today Major. Sharp glances back. He knows what she means. Since he took command of this unit three months ago, he has not left a good impression. He knows that and regrets that, but he just could not help it. The only time he feels calm is when he is in combat. Well yeah, he replied always wanted to go into space. Well visit a new planet. Here we are. We are the spearhead of this grand discovery. He looks forward and glances to the right, and it's good to be back on the field. Damn right. Corporal Andrew Steele said, we're going to be in the history books for this. History books, my ass. Alicia said, annoyed as she works the radio controls once more. This sucks. No satellites no drones to bounce a single off, we're back in the fucking stone age, that is war corporal, Sharp replied in a commanding tone, in war, you might not be able to use your fancy toys, you must always be ready to fight without technology, if you must use a smoke signal, do it, I understand sir, Alicia said with some annoyance, that sounds like it came from experience, sir, Andrew speaks up, have you been in combat before, I mean, with how you acted in the invasion, and at that enemy camp last week. Alicia adds, Andrew looks at him. We all have been talking, and nothing sounds right. We have been hearing other rumors that, Sharp glances sharply at them, clearly warning them not to continue the topic. He sees that they got the message and stayed silent. He felt like crap after that, so he looked outside. He sees the trees and the mountains in the distance. It surprises him how similar this world is to Earth. After some time passes, he sees a fork in the road. All right Alicia. Tell everyone that we will be heading into that forest over there. I want everyone to keep a sharp eye out. There might still be strangers. Alicia speaks up. You don't sound confident in our mission. It is not that, he replied. Everything we knew, all of our rules and values are going to be tested to the extreme. We have invaded a Tolkien 3 like world. It looks like we are technologically superior over the enemy, but that does not mean we won't come out unscarred. Even if we think we have everything figured out, always remember the enemy gets a vote. But if we are not careful, this could end up like another war on terror. The reason why we are being sent out first for these recon missions is because we are the ones who will be making the rule book. Everything we do will set the standard for the foreseeable future, Sharp finishes, thinking about the situation. All right Steele, let's head that way, maybe that path will head to a town or something, he orders while pointing. As they drive, he looks at his little Optimus Prime toy on his dashboard. 
he had placed it there before they left. Prime is a noble leader of the Autobots in the franchise Transformers. Always noble, doing the right thing and a clear great leader among his troops. He looks at it to help remind him why he is here and who he is, hoping to be as strong as he is. Fort Alness, Alness Hill. April 25th. 2025 First Lieutenant Sarah Rose, Vanguard 7 logistical officer, walks around the newly constructed command building she will be working in for the foreseeable future. As she carries the box into Vanguard command building, she sees more construction equipment and supplies coming as the U.S. Army continues its build-up. The primary division operating that had been sent to secure this side of the gate had been the 1st Cavalry Division. Currently, she can see the Army airfield for the 101st Airborne being set up. She also sees a new motor pool and barracks for the incoming elements of the 2nd Armored Division and 10th Mountain Division. Over the past few weeks, there had been a large amount of construction on this hill. Contrary to popular Hollywood beliefs, a military cannot just appear somewhere and wage war. The only way to wage a modern war is having the infrastructure and logistics needed to support the boots on the ground. Come on Sarah, 2nd Lieutenant April said. She is Vanguard 5S logistical officer. To help the range of Vanguard teams being sent into the unknown alien world, each team has its own logistical officer to help with mission updates, logistics, and resources. They help make sure their teams have all the up-to-date information and equipment they need to carry out their mission and survive. Sarah heads to her office and starts setting up her computer. As she works, she gets a check-in from Alicia complaining that their commander is acting cold and isolated again. Sarah thinks back to right before her team left. She had tried to tell Major Sharp to be careful out there and be a good representative of Earth to the locals. He did not take it well. She does not understand what is wrong with the Major. His attitude and forced distancing are hurting the unit, and she is worried that he will screw up a first contact scenario. However, she is conflicted on that opinion. She can see in his eyes that he knows what he is doing. Sometimes, she wonders if he is punishing himself, and that is why he acts the way he does. You need to stop thinking about him, Sarah, April said. You think about him like he is your boyfriend. She looks at April. Well, take away the attitude. He is handsome looking, handsome and rude. April responds. Only a matter of time until the army boots him. Still cannot believe he oversees people. Sarah leans back in her chair and thinks. I think there is a reason why he is here. He kind of reminds me of my father a little. I think he just needs someone to believe in him. You are such a schoolgirl, Sarah. April teases, as she is working on her station, she sees the vanguard leader Colonel John Yang walk in. He is the head of the 75th Ranger Regiment in the Special Region. She stands up and salutes. Sir, stand down. Lieutenant Rose, Yang said. I just came by to see how the Major is doing. She takes a breath thinking about it. Major Sharp. He prefers to be called by his last name. When he joined the team, it was a rough start. He was very distant, quiet and he seemed to hate being in the Rangers. I got their last check-in about 20 minutes ago sir, she said. They should be entering the forest soon. Good, Yang said, we don't know what is out there yet. I want them all to get back alive. I understand, sir, she replied. I will remind him of that. Reference, https colon slash slash shim dot wattpad dot com slash 112 ffb 3 f 50 f 2 a 3 b 165 c f 5 d 276 f 347 f 0 f 320 a slash 6 8 7 4 7 4 7 0 7 3 3 a 2 f 2 f 7 3 3 3 2 e 616 d 617 17 A 6 F 6 E 6 1 7 7 7 3 2 E 636 F 6 D 2 F 7 7 6 1 7 4 7 4 7 0 6 1 6 4 2 D 6 D 6 5 6 4 6 9 6 1 2 D 7 3 6 5 7 2 7 6 6 9 6 3 6 5 2 F 5 3 7 4 6 F 7 2 7 9 4 9 6 D 6 1 
1676529F444 C663626 2D564776 F2D6F525377 3D3 D2 D3 7 3 O 3 4 3 6 3 O 3 8 3 O 3 7 3 3 2 E 3 1 3 6 3 7 3 2 3 2 6 4 6 5 3 2 6 2 3 1 3 8 6 4 3 1 6 5 3 4 3 2 3 5 3 4 3 2 3 2 3 3 3 8 3 9 3 7 3 7 3 4 3 9 3 2 2 E 6 a 7067 1 chapter 1 2 JLTV equals joint light tactical vehicle Humvee replacement 3 J R R Tolkien writer of Lord of the Rings Gate War of Two Worlds Part 1 Cone Forest April 25th 2025 as Vanguard 7 drove down the dirt road, it had been about six hours since they left Fort Alness. So far, their mission has been very uneventful. They have only passed a farmhouse with some kids working in the fields. While looking out the window, Major Sharp looks at the trees for anything that is suspicious. As Vanguard 7 moves along, they suddenly hear a loud roar. Before anybody could even speak. A large beast flew right past them with incredible speed. Sharp's second in command, 2nd Lieutenant Charles Johnson speaks through the team radio. Did everyone see that? How the hell didn't we see that sir? Private Second Class Marvin Scott said. It a fucking dragon screaming and flying around, Andrew said. It sounds like a big one. Sharp grabs his radio. Stay calm and keep an eye out. I think it went. He stops as he is interrupted by Andrew, stand by, sir, look to the left, smoke, Andrew said as he pointed in the direction, both he and Alicia look to the left and see smoke, it seems like it is only a few kilometers away behind a tree line, he thinks of every possible situation on why smoke is coming from there, it could be nothing, but it is most likely some town or village, if there is smoke, that usually is a sign of trouble, but so far, they have not seen anything, at least in that direction, it may be something worthwhile checking out. Sharp orders for the Vanguard teams to reckon the area, find out what is around Alness, and report back, if anyone ran into the enemy or found themselves in a dangerous situation, they would fall back to base. There is so little the US and Army knows about this world, they are literally writing the rules book as they go. Still, if that is a village. They seem to be in trouble, there is no way he can just pass that up. He speaks into the radio again. Rangers to our left there we see smoke. We are going to check it out. Stay sharp and watch for snipers. Snipers? Andrew asked. That is my job. An arrow can act as a sniper, he responds. The Vanguard 7 convoy heads in the direction of the smoke. While the team is separated into three vehicles, he can feel the tension among his rangers. Everyone wants to see something besides trees, maybe some action, anything to end the boredom. As they approach the location of the smoke, he begins wondering what happened to the dragon. Andrew had said dragons can breathe fire, and while that is only in fantasy stories, Sharp has no reason to believe that it is not true in real life. With this dense tree cover, if the dragon decides to attack, they will never see it coming. Once they arrive, all they see is burnt buildings. The ground is black, scorched from whatever that dragon did. Burnt skeletons are everywhere, both humans and animals alike. Everything in the town is destroyed, and the area is completely lifeless. We're not in Kansas anymore, Scott said over the net. Most likely making a pop culture reference and then making a smart ass joke comparing it to his current surroundings. Watch your language, Scott and show some respect, Randy said to him, working to maintain order. Sorry, Sergeant Major, Scott replied. My God. This is horrible. Alicia said, shocked by the destruction. Are we disembarking sir? Johnson asked over the radio. They hear another roar from the dragon before Sharp could reply. Based on the sound, it must be close. That's your answer. Lieutenant, he said. We keep moving. Hope we can get to the next village in time. Sharp looks back to see Alicia. Alicia, 
report to this and the other teams in the area, inform them we might have a fire-breathing dragon in the region. Alicia nods her head and starts working on her radio system, relaying his message. After that, they move out again, heading down the path. As they leave, he looks around, reflecting on the burnt bodies. As they pass, he sees three burnt skeletons. Based on the size and number of corpses, he assumes it was a small family. Everything good, sir? Andrew asked him. Sharp looks to Andrew. So far, he has grown to like Andrew. Shocked on how much they have in common, nerds for life, he supposed. I am fine, keep focused, corporal. Sorry sir, Andrew apologized, just noticed your hand tapping the door. Sharp looks to his hand and stops tapping. He did not even notice that, it has taken almost an hour until they get to the next town. The whole trip is quiet as everyone reflects on the devastation. Normally everyone is very chatty but not now as they see the horrors of war. Most of the rangers have yet to see actual combat until this war. While they are well trained, some of the best on earth, practice and training can only prepare someone so much until they experience the real thing. Be advised, we see buildings up ahead. Looks like another town. This one's alive, Randy said over the net. Thank God. Maybe we can warn them. Alicia replied. To all teams, we stop here unless they threaten us, he said. Do not let them get close to our vehicles, though. Help when needed. When they arrive at the town, they see the villagers stopping whatever they are doing and watch the rangers come in. The townsfolk are all wary and baffled by who they are looking at their JLTVs with some measure of awe. Sharp assumes they are all trying to figure out what kind of horses or wagons they are using, being something they have never seen before. All right everyone, he said, dismount and happy faces. However, do not let them get close to our equipment. Don't want anyone stealing anything. You heard the major, Randy said, Jerry and Scott, stay with the JLTVs. Everyone else is dismounting. The JLTVs stop and everyone gets out. Sharp gets out of his command JLTV and looks around. He sees Lieutenant Johnson and Sergeant Major getting out and ordering the team along. He sees an old man walk up, followed by a few other men. Unlike everyone else, this man looks important. Hello there, can I see who is in charge here? Sharp asked. Confused looks form on the locals' faces as they exchange looks with one another, silently debating whether they could trust him or not. It is important. We are friends. We mean you no harm unless you mean harm to us, Sharp urges. Finally, the old man steps forth and introduces himself. I am the mayor of this town, he said. If you mean no harm to us, then we mean no harm to you, either. Sharp nods, accepting the peace offer. He then takes off his helmet and signals to Alicia to do the same. Hello there. What can I do for you folks? The mayor asked, still somewhat afraid of the newcomers. He looks at the JLTVs. Impressive. Wagons you got there. Oh yeah, thank you, Sharp replied in a more friendly tone, playing himself off as a little dumb as to seem less dangerous. They are not wagons, we call them vehicles. So... I take it you're in charge here. Yes, now what brings you here? We do not want trouble, the Major asked, seeing the unknown weapons the Rangers are holding. He has no idea what they are, and that is only adding to the fear factor. Neither do we, Sharp said. My name is Major Sharp of the United States Army. We are from the other side of the gate and new to these lands. We are here to get to know your people and establish peace terms. But first, I need to ask something, are dragons common here? Saying all that makes him think about the science fiction TV shows Star Trek and the Orville. First contact episodes were always cool. Watching the ship crew make an interdiction to new, unknown people, all with the hope that good things come with that possible relationship. Sadly, that would rarely happen in the shows. He hopes he has better luck with first contact. Wait. You people are from the other side of the gate. So, it is true. The Empire's army was defeated? The Major asked, shocked by that statement. The Empire's army? Randy asked as he walks up. What exactly is the Empire? Sharp follows up. So far in the war military intelligence has struggled to find a name for the enemy. 
which only makes things more confusing. The mayor looks confused by the question, what do you mean what is the empire? They are the ones who rule these lands, they rule most of Falmart, he then looks at them, you really did defeat the empire, I mean in battle, damn right, Alicia answers, all energetic, they came, they saw, and we kicked their ass back to kingdom come. Randy grabs Sharp's shoulder and pulls him aside, so, the enemy is called the Empire? That seems weird, I read the report Sarah made, Sharp replied, the prisoners from Philadelphia said they were warriors of the Empire, we were confused why they never gave us a name of their country, because they don't have one? Randy adds, confused by that, what kind of country doesn't have a name? No idea, he shrugs. But that is why we are out here. Maybe we can get some good intel from this place. He turns back to the villagers to ask more questions but is confused by what the major is doing. The mayor is looking at Alicia with a slight leer. Are you enjoying the view, mister? Alicia said crossly, crossing her arms to cover her breasts. It's like you've never seen a woman before. The mayor looks back to shop. Why is a woman speaking to us men? You allow this? Without hesitation. Sharp moves his arm in front of Alicia to both defend her and stop her from pouncing the elder for that statement. Alicia is annoyed by him stopping her. He can hear her mumble, grumbling derogatory terms about the village mayor and sexism. Mayor, Sharp speaks up in a commanding, severe tone, glaring directly into the mayor's eyes. His free hand moves his rifle up and down slightly clearly implying something bad could happen if the mayor continued that train of thought. It is wise not to insult a member of my team, man, or woman. Do we have an understanding? He can see what he said impressed Alicia. She is surprised he would stick up for her. The mayor sees the implied threat and realizes he had overstepped. He nods his head, my apologies. Now, back to my question, Sharp asked, relax now. A dragon? The mayor said. We see wyvern and dragons once in a while, but they leave us alone. The only time they bother us is when they take our livestock. Sharp is glad to hear that dragons are normal. However, something does not feel right. The mayor does not seem worried about dragons burning his village down. Why do you ask? The mayor asked, confused. We ask because we saw a town was burnt down by one. Randy speaks up. These dragons? Do they normally burn villages to the ground? Sharp asked, continuing Randy's point. Johnson suddenly walks up, after giving orders to the squad. We heard that noise too. He points down a direction. There is a town up the road, that direction. Oh, that's Rolith, the mayor realizes. Wait, are you saying that Rolith was burned down? The mayor turns hysterical by the news. Oh god. Then it has returned. The legend is true but this cannot be, it should not have awakened for another 300 years, at least, we need to leave while we still can, travelers, I thank you for warning us, but we need to evacuate with utmost urgency, hold on, Sharp said, waving his hands in an attempt to placate the mare down, you just said that dragons are normal, yes, they are, but not this kind of dragon, the mare said, only one kind breathes fire, and that is the flame dragon, the beast of beasts, we are all going to die. The mayor immediately scrambles to give orders to the townsfolk. Everyone starts rushing around in a frenzy to gather their most valuable things to evacuate with. Sharp can feel the gravity of the situation. These people are terrified by this flame dragon. Major, Johnson said, we should leave before we are attacked. Our orders say we should fall back if we make contact with the enemy, and if this flame dragon is a big deal. We are not equipped to handle it. Sharp looks to Johnson and knows he is right. They do not have the manpower or equipment to deal with this situation. Contacting the base will be hard in this dense forest, so there is no reliable way to get help. Besides, it would take a day or longer to get help without helicopters. He looks around the village and takes a breath. He then looks at the Angstheim mayor. We can help. After saying that he then looks to his men, Johnson. Divide the men. See if we can speed this up. Get Jerry to form a medical wagon. Good chance there will be some sick or old people. Good call. There is always something, Randy comments, 
supportive of his decision to stay. Johnson nods and then walks over to everyone else to relay and carry out Sharp's orders. Sharp turns to the radio operator. Alicia, try and patch me through with command and get Lieutenant Sarah on the horn. I need to report this. Oh, yeah, I can try. We are pretty far out though, she said. She then rushes to the JLTV and starts patching into the radio net, trying to get a signal back to Alness. 37 minutes later, the evacuation seems to be going very well. The townsfolk gathered whatever they could while Vanguard 7 helped wherever they could to speed up the process. Major Sharp walks along the town to make sure no one is left behind. Growing up, he read and watched the book and movie, We Were Soldiers, and Young by Hal Moore. After that, it became one of his major sources to base his morality and soldiering on. During the Vietnam War, Lieutenant Colonel Hal Moore said, We leave no one behind. The United States Army has adopted that phrase, it is a phrase Sharp lives by sometimes too closely. When he is done checking out the village, pleased that no one is left, he starts to head back to his convoy. As he is about to head back, he sees three men in what seems like military robes rushing away. Everyone else is on the east side of the village, yet these people are going in the opposite direction. They do not look like they are from the village. He was going to let them go, seeing that it was not worth the interaction. He is alone and doesn't want to risk turning the village into a battle zone with all of these civilians. However, something dissuades from him ignoring them any further. The sight of a 10 to 11 year old girl tagging along catches his intrigue. To his shock, she is naked as she is being pulled by their wagon, bound by ropes around her hands. Before coming to this world, the brass warned the soldiers that they might see things they might not understand or agree with. This world's culture might be vastly different, but they should be respected. Regardless, the idea behind that order was because the brass had no idea what the culture of this world was. They did not want their troops to get involved in things that they didn't yet understand. The army did not want to go into another failed nation building project like in Iraq and Afghanistan. They only had three objectives, keep the war simple, keep the US safe, and defeat the enemy. Before Sharp could react, the wagon and the three men moved around a building, leaving the town. He knows he should let them go following orders and focus on getting the town's folk away. However, for some reason, he just cannot let go and stops them. Hey, he yells at the three men in his commanding tone, what are you doing with her? The three men stop and turn around. None of them look afraid of Sharp. They pull out their swords, chuckling darkly at him. Mind your own business if you know what's good for you, one man threatens. The girl turns around and looks at him. She has a cold, scared, and defeated look in her eyes. Sharp could easily gun them all down with his M4A1, however, he is worried that might risk hitting the girl. He would not have the time to aim since he is so close to them. He pulls out his M1911 Colt pistol. He gives the belligerent men a defiant glare, showing he means business and that he is not afraid of their size nor numbers. Drop your weapons and back away, Sharp orders with a stern glare. As Sharp said that, one of the men attacks him with a swing of his sword. He dodges easily, his reflexes and training taking over. He moves around the bigger man to gain some distance and shoots the man directly in the chest. The man falls backwards from the shot, dead before he hits the ground. The second man charges shortly after hearing the shot, wildly stabbing his weapon at the American. Sharp steps out of the way, tripping the lunging man. In the corner of his eyes, Sharp sees the third man attempt to blindside him. He ducks under the wildly flailing sword and steps back to regain his distance once more. The other man gets back up and joins his comrade. Sharp finds himself facing two opponents now. It is no big deal to him. There are odds more worse than this. He has been trained and served with the best the United States Army has to offer. He is confident of his skills and knows his limits. Meanwhile, he sees overconfidence in his enemy's eyes. The Imperial men grin. 
thinking they have him cornered. Shah prepares for them to attack but notices they are just standing there in a defensive position. He is confused by why they will not press their numerical advantage and maintain their close combat advantage. But if they want to give him a free shot, he will take it. He aims his pistol, planning on ending this now. However, his gut screams to him that something is off. Glancing down on the ground, he sees a moving shadow, a massive shadow, one bigger than his own. Realizing someone is right behind him about to swing something heavy down on him, Sharp leaps over to his right. A massive axe just misses him. At this point, he doesn't have to think. His muscles and reflexes are running purely on automatic. He sees that this newcomer isn't a real man but some kind of hybrid lion-human. He had seen pictures in the report of these beasts but still takes seeing to believe it. Two-legged, lion-headed. A body almost double the thickness of a human man. And it was angry. While Sharp is down, the lion picks him up and tosses him into the mud. Sharp rolls his landing and quickly recovers without much injury. As he gets up, a man charges at him. He quickly deflects the sword with his knife grabs the man's armor and judo flips the man over his back and onto the ground before the man knows what had just happened. Before he can recover, Sharp shoots the man in the head and starts prowling to the left, trying to maintain some distance between himself and the anthropomorphic lion. The lion charges once more, letting out a loud roar but this was a distraction for the remaining Imperial to reposition himself to charge at Sharp's flank. Sharp knows the lion is the greater threat and must be taken out now while he still has energy. Seeing the other man flanking him, he flips his pistol around so he is holding the barrel and knocks one of the swords to the side, deflecting it. He then grabs the man by his armor and swings him away into the ground, stunning him. The fight returns to being a one-on-one -on -one skirmish with Sharp planning on dealing with the Imperial later. The lion charges at him. Sharp flips his grip on his knife, holding it by the tip. He then throws it at the lion, hitting it in the shoulder, just missing the throat. This slows the lion down enough for him to react and aim. Sharp aims his colt and fires three times at the lion, forcing it to drop its axe. To his surprise, the lion keeps coming even though it has three large holes in its body. The lion grabs Sharp by the burlistic vest and lifts him up like he weighs nothing. The lion also grabs for the hand holding the pistol, finally recognizing the threat the black object possesses. With his other hand, Sharp grabs the knife in the lion's shoulder and yanks it out. He stabs it right into the jaw of the lion. The lion lets go of him and lets out a painful screech. It stumbles back and pulls out a knife from its jaw. At the same time, Sharp lands on the ground and rushes towards the lion. With all of his force, he rams into the lion's stomach, knocking it over. While it is down, he aims at the lion's head. It freezes up upon staring down the deadly muscle of the diminutive weapon of death. Sharp pulls the trigger with no warning. As his adrenaline winds down, Sharp takes a breath before remembering the last man. He whips around to face the last threat and sees his foe charging at him and a sword flying mid-swing at his neck. Without warning, they hear the crack of a bullet passing through a skull. The charging man dies instantly and barrels over sideways to the ground, the sword losing all of its aim and passing over Sharp's head unmolested. Sharp turns to his left and sees Alicia standing there with her still smoking rifle at ready. Alicia lowers her weapon and notices that Sharp has no reaction to his near-death experience. Are you okay, sir? Sharp merely ignores her. He wipes away the blood on his knife with his uniform sleeve and resheathes it back on his person. He then checks his pistol for any damage, reloads and safes it, and holsters it back on his hip. As he did so. He looked at the frightened girl standing by the wagon, her hands still in bondage. He notices that she has the most beautiful blue eyes he has ever seen. Her hair is dirty but it is clear that she has smooth dark brown hair. He can see the fear in her eyes. She is probably scared of him after witnessing him take on these four Imperials and killing three of them, one of which being a lion almost twice his size. She is probably wondering why he did that and, probably from her experience, she is assuming he is claiming her body for himself. Sharp takes a deep breath and forces a kind smile. 
He walks over to her and kneels in the mud. I mean you no harm. My name is Sharp, and I am an American. He brings out his knife again and begins cutting the ropes off of her. In the background, they hear another roar from what they believe is the dragon. He realizes he is wasting time and that the convoy needs to leave now. He finally frees the girl from her bondage. Seeing how weak she is, he picks her up and starts carrying her in his arms. He can see the girl is more frozen with fear as he is carrying her. He doesn't want to scare her, but he doesn't know what else to do. She looks like she has been walking for weeks, and based on the blood and stains between her legs, those sick men have been raping her. He honestly is impressed that she was able to walk at all. Alicia rushes up to his side. Sir? Alicia said, still shocked at what had happened. What the fuck was that? He ignores her question. When we get to the vehicles, can you find something for her to eat and wear? And can you clean these stains on her? I don't want the others seeing her in this state. You are kidding, right? Alicia said wearily, but what about Jerry? Shouldn't the doc check her out? No time right now, he replied. There are too many people as is. Jerry will have to check her back at base. He starts walking back to the vehicles but pauses briefly and looks back at Alicia. Also don't tell Sarah, he adds. I'd rather not have command know what happened. Oh. Hell no. Alicia said, these bastards deserve it. He does not respond, just heading back to the vehicles. It only takes a few minutes for them to get back to the main road where everyone is at. It looks like everyone is about ready. Randy, Scott, and Johnson rush up to him. Scott speaks first. We heard gunfire. Alicia ran off. He stops upon seeing that he is carrying someone. Who is this? Doesn't matter. Go do your jobs. We are leaving. Sharp said to them. They salute in acknowledgement and swiftly return to finish their remaining work. Sharp heads to the back of his command JLTV and nods for Alicia to open the back door. He then sets the girl down in the back. Once he sits down inside, the girl moves away slightly, trying to find anything to hide behind. Understandably, she is still afraid. He leans in, look, you will be okay. I am here to help all these people. There is a dragon. Now, he motions to the woman next to him. This is Private First Class Alicia. She is going to help you. Can you be nice with her? Stop doing that, sir. She is scared enough as it is. Alicia reprimands, standing right there. He takes a deep breath and nods. He then walks away to get everyone moving. Reference https colon slash slash shim dot wattpad dot com slash 112 ffb 3 f 50 f 2 a 3 b 165 c f 5 d 276 f 347 f 0 f 320 a slash 6 8 7 4 7 4 7 0 7 3 3 8 2 f 2 f 7 3 3 3 2 e 616 d 617 17 A 6 F 6 E 6 1 7 7 7 3 2 E 636 F 6 D 2 F 7 7 6 1 7 4 7 4 7 0 6 1 6 4 2 D 6 D 6 5 6 4 6 9 6 1 2 D 7 3 6 5 7 2 7 6 6 9 6 3 6 5 2 F 5 3 7 4 6 F 7 2 7 9 4 9 6 D 6 1 one six seven six five two F four hundred and forty four C six six three six two D five six four seven seven six four F two D six F five two five three seven seven three D three D two D three seven three O three four three six three O three eight three O three seven three three two E three one three six three seven three two three two six four six five three two six two three one three eight six four three one six five three four three two three five three four three two three two three 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 eight three nine three seven three seven three four three nine three two two e six a seven thousand and sixty seven gate war of two worlds part one cone forest april twenty fifth two thousand and twenty five it has been over an hour since everyone left the village there are hundreds of wagons traveling in single file in this makeshift single lane dirt road. 
The Vanguard team is currently be escorting the caravan. Once Sharp's Vanguard team got out of the forest, he was able to report the situation to Vanguard Command. He informed them that a village was destroyed, and he believes that these people are the next target. When he made the report with Sarah and Yang, he expected to get an earful, especially about the girl. Not that they disagreed in saving her and the village but for getting involved and putting everyone at risk. All the colonel said was that he agreed with his judgment on the field and to remember that they might look human, but they are aliens. He needs to be careful not to get the unit killed because of it. That last part did bother him, however. To his surprise, Sarah did not yell at him either. To his confusion, she seemed shocked and pleased. Since he first met her, she has been on his ass on every occasion including the most basics of command, god damn it, I fucking hate this, I left California to get away from the traffic, Andrew said, frustrated in how slow everyone is going, hey, Alicia yells, watch the language, we have a young guest remember, the girl that helped to save from those four men, who might be some kind of slave traders, he took her back to the JLTV to keep her safe during this situation, he asked Alicia to find something for her to wear, so she will not be naked anymore. The only clothing available there are extra adult military shirts and blankets. While it is not enough it is to do until they get back to base. He shakes his head. Be nice, both of you. Also, we should be there by nightfall. They did say the next village wasn't too far. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Andrew said, just frustrated on how slow everyone is going. I do have to say boss that was pretty cool. He looks at Andrew with a glare. What does that supposed to mean? You thought I was a monster like those men? Sorry sir, Andrew said, caught off guard by his reaction. Calm down sir, Alicia said. He's just saying that it was cool what you did. Most officers wouldn't do that. He turns around to look at Alicia and then back to Andrew, realizing his mistake. I am sorry and thank you. It's just cool. Andrew said again. Sharp can see that they think of him as some bland officer of some kind. He knows he has not had the best image, but he cannot believe that saving a kid from rapist pedophiles was an achievement. He did not realize how low his reputation is. Some time passes and he adjusts himself from the boredom. In the boredom all, he can think about the new girl he saved. He takes a nervous breath and leans between both front seats, looking into the back of the JLTV. How is our little princess? She looks better. The girl is just sitting there in a seat. She is wearing his spare military shirt. It is long enough to cover her whole body. She is always wrapped in a blanket to stay warm. Alicia did a good job of cleaning the mud, blood, and other stains off her. He must admit she looks cute all cleaned up. Alicia is leaning against the door, holding her legs like she is trying to protect her body. Her eyes still say that she is scared. Seeing her in the position confirms his worst fears. Whoever those people were, they have beaten and raped her. Just imagining that fate angers him but he controls himself and forces a smile. Alicia looks at him. She is fine. I was about to clean her up. She still needs a real bath to get some of the stains off, but she is a good looking lady. And a lady shouldn't be that dirty. He chuckles at that comment. You're in the wrong career then. Alicia shoots him a glare. I never said I was a lady. She then looks over to the girl but she hasn't said a word, probably scared to death. I bet we look very scary with our uniforms and weapons. I can't even imagine what she has been through. He looks over to the girl. This was not the first time he ran into a situation like this. Once fighting drug cartels in Mexico and Southeast Asia, there is a lot of bad back on earth, but he wonders if they could do something good here. Deep down inside he just has this strange deep urge to help her. He has had it since he first laid eyes on her. While it would have been right to walk away and not get involved, he didn't know the situation, context, the culture, or whatever the other million reasons there could have been. Every pulse in his body could not just walk away but wanted to help. He can see that Alicia is right. She is scared to death. To how he and his soldiers must look scary, looking all different than the local clothes. What he and his people consider normal is very foreign to her. Just like the reaction by the mayor when he saw the vehicles, he did not have a word to describe what he was seeing. He takes a deep breath, 
lost on what to do. He looks to the little Optimus Prime figure that is tapped on the center of the dashboard. That little toy has been with him for a long time now, always something to focus on when in doubt. Right then and he comes up with an idea. It is a stupid idea but when he was stationed in Japan, he had to learn the local culture. It helped bridge the gap so he could work with them easier. Without warning, he opens his door and gets out. The convoy is not going fast so he could just get out and walk. He then opens the back door and hops back in. As he gets in, he holds his index figure to Alicia, warning her not to jump down his throat for doing that. He then sits down by the girl. He takes off his helmet, so he looks less threatening and sets it down next to her. He sets it down on the floor and looks to her. He reaches down into his pocket and pulls out his cell phone. He takes his arm and wraps it around her. He can see she is getting worried as her body closes, holding onto the blanket more tightly. It is okay kid, he said as he pulls her closer to him. He then shows her his phone. The girl looks at him confused, not understanding what the device is. He then goes into a download video app and plays an episode of the 1980s Transformers cartoon show. He then shows her the screen as he plays the show. This is my favorite show. I love everything about it. He then points to his eyes and then to the screen, showing her to watch it. As he starts to watch, he hears Andrew speak up in a thrilled tone. Boss. Really? You really are playing Transformers? You are a bigger nerd than I am I love it. Wait. Before you answer that, Alicia comments in the conversation. She looks at Sharp with a confused shock. You are telling me, out of everything you were allowed to bring here, was that? He looks at them and then back to her. Ah, I also brought Beast Wars, the Netflix version, and some other films. Classics. Andrew burst out laugh and Alicia shakes her head smiling, looking away, enjoying learning a little about their boss. My boss is a child, God help us all, Alicia said chuckling. Wow, wow, wow. Come on, Transformers is the greatest thing of all. All kids love Transformers. And besides, I don't know what else to do, he said in a proud tone. The girl is sitting on this semi-conferable seat, being far softer than sitting on wood. She finds this wagon very strange, the same with everything else these strangers have. She stares at all three adult soldiers. They start to argue about what is on that strange small object that the man next to her is holding. But it seems they are having fun. Well, close to being friends at least. But everything about them all is strange. All this seems strange. This weird metal wagon is nothing like she has ever seen before. The clothes they wear look different. They are not like robes or clothes she has ever seen either. On top of that this device in his have is also strange. It has what looks like moving pictures and sound coming from it. These people in this motion picture device are so small and moving but they do not seem to be wearing anything either. She was given to these slave traders three months ago, being sold by her kingdom's noble class to the empire. Since that day she was forced to travel thousands of kilometers sometimes on land and other times on the river network. Suddenly, she is trapped with these people. That man who is holding her next to her killed her slave traders, which is highly illegal by the slave guild. To her surprise, the female soldier cleaned her body up to the point she enjoys her own smell again. No more dry stains and stickiness all over her body, especially between her legs. They then gave her this big shirt, blanket and some food. She is confused about why they are helping her, wondering if they know who she is or do they have hidden motives. So far, she noticed that they have no idea who she is, and her heart is telling her she is safe for the first time in a long time. She just hopes that this is not a lie like last time. What is confusing her the most is that they are clearly soldiers and yet they're not like soldiers. Soldiers usually take what they want from their enemies. They kill the men and take the women then rape them. They steal the livestock and any wealth they can get. Many times, soldiers go and take the ones they conquered as slaves. This is allowed under the right of conquest. She looks back at the man, trying to figure him out. He looks and acts scary. How he killed her owners. Only a professionally trained killer could do it. As these people talk to each other, 
she looks at the strange small box with the strange looking people in the small object. One blocky red man fighting another silver blocky man. And then, there are humans on there too. Is this all real? How can they fit in this small object? She reaches out, wanting to touch the device, see if she can touch the people on it. But then she realizes that man holding it turns his head towards her and then smile. You like it? He asked, looking at her. Here, you can hold it. It is a great show. She won't understand any of it. It is kind of pointless. Maybe try something else. Alicia points out. She can see the frustration in his face. It looks like he is trying to make her happy. I know you're right. I am just. The man next to her said, taking a deep breath. She remembers that he called himself Shop, after months of being brutalized and enslaved by those four mercenaries, for the first time in an awfully long time she feels safe, even though she saw him kill them without any issue. Looking back at the screen and seeing that this man called Sharp likes whatever he is showing her, she reaches out and tries to take it, wanting to see why he likes it so much. The girl takes it and looks at it, turning it around as she studies the phone. She is amazed at how light it is. She does not see any way to get inside it, so how are those people in there talking? That is when she notices that the people inside are just talking to each other and interacting with each other, kind of like those theater shows back home. She then looks back at him and speaks very softly. What is this? That takes everyone by surprise like they were not expecting her to speak or something. Ah, I didn't know if you could understand us. Sharp said and then smile. This small thing in my hand is what we call a phone. It allows us to talk to each other at a far distance. It also can hold moving pictures like this. This is my personal favorite one called Transformers. It is about robots tall metal people from another world. Right then Sharp begins to explain the basics of the show, who are the leaders and factions, and what is going on. She tilts her head a little confused. He seems to be very into this show. She then looks at the phone and back at him, pointing to the people on it. Are they alive? She said in a broken, tired voice. Both him and the female soldier chuckle. The woman named Alicia speaks first. No dear, that is just a show. Entertainments for children. But when she noticed her glancing at the leader, children of all ages, Sharp looks at her. You're not going to let this go, are you? I'm your boss. A boss who brought children shows with him. Alicia makes her final point and looks away, chuckling. Greatest shows ever, Sharp said with a proud full tone. Before she could say something, a sudden loud roar is heard. She sees that talking box on Alicia station and the dashboard begins to speak. But this time, they all look serious suddenly. He speaks into this other strange device, having a conversation with someone who is not in the metal wagon. Amazed by that she wonders if the talking boxes are magical is some kind. Roger that, we are on our way, Sharp said like he is talking to himself. Alicia, stay here. One of the wagons broken the accident is blocking the caravan. Steel, you're with me. After he said that, they grab those long grey looking sticks and leave the metal horse. She looked over to Alicia. Alicia, right. Again, in a broken, tired voice, Alicia looks over at her and then smiles. Yes, that is my name. What is yours? She hesitates to say her name. They are strangers and do T feel comfortable yet to say who she is. Why did that man help me? Am I his slave now? Alicia looks to her, thinking about her response. No, slavery outlawed in our country. We consider it a mortal sin. But why? She tries to say and coughs. Alicia hands her a water canteen. It's water, drink. She takes it and drinks. The reason he saved you us because what those four men were doing was wrong. Alicia said, no child should be a slave, especially to a cute girl like you. She thinks for a moment on what Alicia said. She looks down at the phone, seeing that show continues to play. She looks back up to Alice. My name is Selena. Alicia smile at her. That is a cute name. I like it. Do not worry, you are safe with us. Also. You don't have to watch that. She looks at the phone and sees the tall red color box man that Sharp called Optimus Prime speaking about something. Clearly, this thing is important to him, so she wants to see why. 
This looks interesting. Can I still watch? The convoy has been going slow with all the wagons and the number of people being escorted. It is like a massive traffic jam. Major Sharp plans to help these refugees get to a safe location, away from the village the dragon destroyed. However, it is taking far longer than he thought and he is concerned that the dragon might appear soon. As the wagon convoy moves, he cannot help himself from looking at the mirror, with the angle towards the back of the JLTV. In the mirror, he sees that young girl. Alicia told him that the little girl calls herself Selena. As Sharp looks back B feels very dumb now showing her that show. She probably had no idea what was going on and he wonders if he simply scared her more. That is when over the radio, 2nd Lieutenant Johnson calls out. This is Vanguard 7 Alpha, contacting Vanguard 7 lead, over. He notices Johnson urgency in his voice. However, though. This could just be a regular update like last time when a wagon broke down. He looks away from the girl Selena and picked up the radio. This is Vanguard 7 lead. I am reading you. There is a short delay in the reply, with some static. What the hell is that? Andrew asked as he leans forward. Sir, we have a bogey. I think the dragon. Then the radio goes silent. Johnson sharp yells at his radio. But then they all see a large fireball up front of the convoy. The dragon wiped out many wagons. What the fuck is that? Andrew asked, leaning closer to the front window. They all watch the giant inferno. Appear. The flames consume six wagons in one blast. Suddenly, Sharp can hear Johnson M2 Browning.50 caliber and MK47 striker from Randy vehicle. Andrew speaks first. I think they are still alive. His voice sounds like he is struggling to speak. I hear weapons fire. That is when they see the massive dragon that flies past, letting out another breath of fire burning everything in its path. Another three wagons suddenly caught ablaze, killing everyone around them. As all three of them stare out the window at the blazing inferno, he points to his left to an open field. Andrew, head to the open. We have to draw the dragon away from the convoy. The JLTV gets off the road as Sharp reaches for the radio. Alicia, grab the stinger. I will tell Randy, team, to set up the javelin. Johnson and we will act as bait so they can kill the bastard, he said in a calm tone. Roger Major. Alicia said and go into the back of the JLTV and grab the anti-air weapon. He looks at the open field as he explains the plan to the rest of the team. Studying the landscape, he sees that they have room to move around so they are not pinned down here. The JLTV moves off the road and into the nearby plains. The vehicle bounces around because of the rough drain. He gets out of his seat and head into the back. He then opens the hatch that is on the ceiling of the vehicle. He then opens it once it is unlocked. Move aside dear, Alicia said to Selena. She moves to him and begins to hand him the FIM-92 stinger. He grabs the stinger from Alicia but then looks over to the little girl. He can see that she is terrified of what is going on. No worry kid. I do this all the time. Go sit in the front seat next to Andrew. Now, Selena starts heading up front to get out of the way. As Selena gets into the front passenger seat he looks out and sees Johnson vehicle. The 50 caliber is going off. The vehicle is bouncing a little as they start to circle the field. He hears the flame dragon give another roar as it does another flyby. Sir look. Andrew yells. He looks to the left and his eyes widen with amazement and fear. He sees this massive red beast land on the ground. At first glance, he assumes the flame dragon is one and a half football fields, maybe two. All right, he said. Alicia opened the top hatch. I am going up top to take a shot. Tell Johnson that. Rory Mercury jumps out of a wagon she was riding in. She sees the legendary flame dragon, amazed by the fight. In the 961 years she has been on this world, she has never seen the flame dragon before. As she looks around. She sees many wagons on fire and the people that got caught in the strike screaming as they burn to death. She looks back at the flame dragon. The legend said that nothing can beat it. Nothing can kill it. All it leaves behind is ash and death. Out in the field, she sees two of the strange otherworlders wagons driving around, fighting the flame dragon. She cannot believe that they are trying to fight the monster. 
she wonders if they do not know nothing can kill it, however, she realizes these other worlders are not normal, they have strange equipment and she saw what they did back in the village, helping these people she is guessing maybe they could pose a challenge to the flame dragon, Rory is standing there watching these strange warriors fight the dragon and their metal wagons, watching as they fire these loud rapid arrows from their wagons, it is clear though that whatever weapons they are using is not having any effect, all the refugees around her are panicking but also watching the fight, she then looks over to her left and sees the other one of the metal wagons, she sees these two strange soldiers come out of it, one holding this long looking tube, the two strange looking soldiers are yelling at the people around them to get back and give them some room, she sees them setting something up, she looks back at the battle, from one of the metal wagons, this massive arrow looking weapon came from one of the horses and heads straight to the dragon, the dragon moves away but the large arrow follows it, she thinks it's an amazing magical ability, but then the dragon uses its fire breath to destroy it, Rory thinks about what is happening, she was able to sneak onto one of the wagons when they were leaving the village, she was planning on killing them there but was wondering why they were rounding them up, at first, she thought they were enslaving them, but it looked like the villagers were going willingly, instead of killing these strange looking soldiers right away, she decided to hitch right and see what happens, seeing this was a good chance to get some good intelligence on these other worlders before revealing herself, if anything, they should take her to their base camp, there she could kill them all at once and end this, the flame dragon arriving changed her plans, as she watches the battle, she is impressed with what is happening, their weapon they are using, and the green metal wagons are nothing like she has seen before, everything about these people is strange, for some reason, something is telling her to help them, that they are not the enemy, a voice, she then looks over to the two soldiers, hey, can your magic arrows kill the beast, one of them looks over to her, ah, I don't know if the missile can kill it, that thing is huge, but it will do some serious damage that is for sure, but it seems that it will just destroy the missile before it hits, this older, more experienced looking man walks up to her, we need it not to move, it is barely in range as it is, she smiles hearing that, leave that to me, she realizes that the dragon just needs to be distracted enough for the missile arrow to hit, she then pulls out her halberd and charges down into the battle, damn, Alicia, do we have another missile, sharp comes down from the open hatch, he fired the missile, but the missile went off in a wild direction. A stinger missile is an infrared homing surface to air missile. He is wondering all the intense heat coming from the flame dragon might be messing up the sensor, making it useless. Ah. Yeah. Just one. Alicia said nervously now. She pulls the last missile out of the box and hands it to him. What are you planning on doing with it? it is worthless against that thing, he takes the missile and thinks, Andrew, slow down for a second, Alicia, contact Bravo to fire when I distract it, they should have the javelin ready by now, just like the stinger, the FGM 148 javelin is an infrared homing missile, however, it has a far better tracking system allowing it to hit its target, he is hoping the more advanced guidance, control will be able to bypass the intense heat around the flame dragon and hit it, all Randy needs is one good shot, if the dragon takes off again then they are all dead, the javelin is not an anti-air missile and they are already pushing the range of it, before Alicia could say anything, he then opens the back door and jumps out, when he hits the ground, he rolls around on the ground and recovers himself, once he is recovered, he gets on one knee and sets up the stringer, lining up the shot, the dragon currently is facing away as bullets from the other JLTV be firing at it, then he fires the missile, the stinger missiles move through the air but as it gets close it steers away, unable to track through the intense heat, it explodes close to the dragon head, spreading shrapnel all around, the dragon lets out a roar as it feels the shrapnel hit its eye, he stands up and drops the stinger, being useless now, he grabs his radio, spread out and concentrate fire until the javelin is ready to fire, I will keep the bastard on me, the flame dragon ignores the .50 caliber fire from Johnson JLTV and looks directly at him, 
He looks up at the flame dragon, seeing that he got its attention. He can tell that the dragon is pissed now, and he is perfectly fine with that. The goal was to distract it, not knowing what else to do. He then pulls out his M1911 Colt pistol, that being the only ranged weapon he is on him. He aims it and fires, trying to keep the attention on him. He can see the three bullets he fires did nothing to its scales. The dragon lets out a painful roar and then release another long fire breath all over the ground. The blast gets closer to his position. Oh shit, he said as he falls back on his ass from the blast. He closes his eyes from the heat as the blast gets closer. The blast goes right by him. The heat is intense, feeling some burns on his arms. The fire breath goes out and then Sharp looks around. Confused about what just happened, he knows he should be dead, no way the dragon could miss him. As he looks up and around, he sees right in front of him is this strange looking field or shield around him. It reminds him of that shield he saw at that Imperial Camp 1 but this time it is protecting him. It looks like some kind of magical field from some fantasy game or film. Either way, it just saved him from burning to death. The strange shield disappears and he looks behind him and sees this blue-haired girl in green dress while holding a staff. Both her and the staff are glowing, clearly showing that she did some kind of magic something that saved his life. She then falls to her knees as she breaths heavily. Hey boy, this feminine voice said. He looks to his right and sees this small-looking girl standing there, about the same size and age as Selena. Kid, what the fuck are you doing down here? This is dangerous. One. The girl said, holding out her index figure towards him. Never call me kid. I am hundreds of years older than you mortal. I am Rory Mercury, the apostle of Emroy. The demigoddess of war, death, darkness, and love. Rory then looks at him and smirks. I am impressed, mortal. I talked to your friends and they told me what to do. I will take it from here. As he sits there, he sees Rory spinning herself. Watching her is making him dizzy but he cannot believe how fast she is going. She has picked up so much speed that he cannot see her anymore. Just a blur. Rory then stops, tossing her halberd towards the flame dragon. It flies through the air as the flame dragon begins releasing its fire breath. The halberd hits the lower mouth of the flame dragon, forcing it to release its fire breath into the sky, away from anyone. He cannot believe what he just saw. A 12-year-old girl just tossed a weapon at least two kilometers away and hitting the monster hard enough to deflect its attack. He realizes how little he understands this world. He sees the javelin missile from the Vanguard Bravo team flies. The missile explodes close to the dragon's arm. The blast tore the right arm off the dragon. The flame dragon lets out a loud and painful scream. Besides continuing the fight, the dragon extends its wings and flies away. Sharp starts to laugh. He cannot believe that they have beaten that bastard. I don't believe it, Rory said. You actually defeated the flame dragon. Not even I can defeat such a monster. Good old US tax dollars there, he replied. He then looks at the girl who called herself Rory. As Rory walks up to him, she looks to be 12 or 13 year old. She is wearing this black dress with red frills, black stocking supported by garters, and a red boot. Sharp slowly gets up, leaning on his good knee. Thank you miss for the help, you're a brave young girl. She licks her lips and smile. You and your people were the brave ones here though, and you look good. He looks to Rory confused by that. R, okay. He then looks to the blue hair girl and I am happy to assist strange sir. My name is Lelai La Lelina. Lelai said, you did that strange shield thing? He asked. I don't understand. Lelai asked. Who else would do the shield? I am the only mage here. Mage, he said, confused by the term. A magic user. Cool. Thank you. Both JLTV drives up to them and they get out of the vehicles. Major Sharp, he said to them. My name is Major Sharp, leader of this unit. Alicia walks up first, before he could say anything. She slaps him in the face. Never do that again sir or I swear I am going to kill you myself, she said angrily. I will be the one who has to report your death and that will not look good. Ouch. You know I could court martial you for that, he replied as he places his hand on his cheek. 
She points right at his face. I dare you to. Now get in the jeep. 33 minutes later. Vanguard 7, the mayor, Rory, and Lelai are gathering around his command vehicle. They are all taking notes on the damage from the battle. Major Sharp is currently sitting on the back of the wagon which is right next to his vehicle. Specialist Jerry Williams is currently treating his leg from when he jumped out of the JLTV. Ouch, he mumbles. Stop moving sir, Jerry said. The damage is very bad, the mayor said. I think 130 people dead? 30 wagons have gone. It is hard to tell. Well there wasn't much we could do, Randy said. The dragon came out nowhere. We should be lucky that was all who died. This man is correct. Rory said. All of you could be dead. Johnson walks up. Everything checks out sir. We should be ready to go in five. The mayor takes off his hat and takes a deep breath. We can no longer follow the old plan. What is that? Johnson asked. We have sustained too many losses, the mayor said. The path seems to be more dangerous now. If we are going to reach Merrill's then we must leave the old sick, and wounded, he could not believe what he just heads. So, you are just going to abandon these people? We have no choice, the mayor explains. Anyone who doesn't have a wagon has to find their way. We do not have the means to transport everyone anymore. If the dragon comes back, we all will die. He thinks about that, not liking what he is hearing. He was about to say something, wanting to chew him out and lecture him about responsibility. But right then a sharp pain goes through in his wounded leg. Jerry treats it and applied pain to prevent him from speaking freely. The mayor thanks them for protecting them and walk away. Alicia walks over holding the radio. Vanguard command is on the horn. They want to speak to you. It is Lieutenant Sarah. Perfect, he said as he takes the radio. He just risked his unit lives just for the Major to morally betray him. Therefore, the army said don't get involved. Johnson get everyone secured as best as you can. This is Major Sharp, he said. Major, Sarah said. I just for Alicia report. Your orders are to detach from the refugee convoy and head back to base. A sap. He thinks about it and looks around. The mayor is leaving us right now. However, he is leaving about a hundred people behind. Sarah takes a breath. I know you are trying to help sir however orders are to wave them off and head back to base. Do you acknowledge it? He looks at everyone as they listen to the conversation. He sees the refugees that been abandoned walking over. He sees Rory and Lelai standing there looking confused about what is happening. He looks over to his vehicle and sees Selina looking through the window. He takes a deep breath. Order confirmed. Roger that, Sarah said. Rory speaks first. What is happening? She said, all happy and confident. We have to leave you all to. Alicia said, not happy by the order. You are kidding? Jerry said, sir, rules of war say that we are responsible for these people. They all look to Sharp for an answer. He looks back at them all seeing that everyone waiting for his order. Sharp then hops off the wagon and look around. He sees all the remaining family members. Many are parentless children or just families with nothing. Based on what he just saw, leaving them will result in certain death. There is no way he could accept that. He raises his hand and waves at everyone. As he expected everyone. The refugees and his ranger look confused. There, I waved at you all. Now we are heading back to base. All of us, rangers, gather up, and roll out. You think command would allow that? Johnson asked, speaking freely. Not if we tell them. But we are not abandoning anyone. Get ready to leave in five. Sharp quickly responds. Johnson and the other under his command give him a salute and then head out to get everyone ready to leave in their vehicles. Reference https colon slash slash shim dot wattpad dot com slash 112 ffb 3 f 50 f 2 a 3 b 165 c f 5 d 276 f 347 f 0 f 320 a slash 6 8 7 4 7 4 7 0 7 3 3 8 2 f 2 f 7 3 3 3 2 e 616 d 617 
A17A6 F6 E61777 E632 E636 F6 D2 F7761747064706161 D6 D6564696126127 D7365726963 F5 F7279496 D6167652 F444 C6636 2D56476464 F2 D6 F5253773 D3 D2 D373 O three four three six three O three eight three O three seven three three two E three one three six three seven three two three two six four six five three two six two three one three eight six four three one six five three four three two three five three four three two three two three 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 eight three nine three seven three seven three four three nine three two two E six A seven thousand and sixty seven 1 Chapter 2 Gate, War of Two Worlds Part 1 Fortalness April 27, 2025 Major Sharp is sitting at a desk, waiting for the brass meeting to begin. Everyone in the briefing room is an officer from the 75th Rangers besides the General. He yawns as he gets little sleep, only getting back the other day. He never knew helping refugees would result in so much paperwork. Thank God he is his team assistant First Lieutenant Sarah Rose to help. When he got back, he thought she would be angry at him for disobeying orders. To his surprise, she did not bring it up. While she did not talk to him, she did help get living quarters for the refugees. When he got back, from his mission, some of the brass was not that happy about him bringing all those refugees back to base. They said that the military is not in the position to aid these people as they are busy turning Alnus Hill into a fortress. They also express the concern that one or more could be spies for the enemy and they have no way to confirm that. Luckily, he was able to make an argument on how they need local support to understand this world. They need people who know the land and the monsters of this region, like the Flame Dragon. To his surprise Colonel Yang and the General agreed with his point of view. One of the officers up front suddenly yells attention. Everyone stands up as the head of the expeditionary force in the special region. Lieutenant General Charlie Stanford walks in. Please have your seat, Stanford said, as he takes his seat. Everyone in the room does the same. Stanford begins to speak first. I want to start off and say a good job to everyone. Our recon team so far have suffered no casualties. Vanguard 2 was able to establish good relations with a nearby village south from here. Major Davis, I want your team to follow up on that. Yes sir, Major Davis Stewart said. Stanford looks down on his sheet. On topics to discuss. Vanguard 3 ran into the Empire Troop, if your report correct? He looks over to Sarah who to his right. She already knew what he was thinking and slid over a document. He takes it and glances at it. It said Vanguard 3 engaged a company sized to the west. They were heading to what they believe might be a town. They were forced to pull back however they gave the Empire a massive bloody noise in the engagement. Captain Charles Cassows halfway raises his hand. Yes sir. We had a brief engagement, but I decided to disengage. It seems like they were on a patrol, but we did not know if there was a larger force coming. The general nods from that response. In this case, the right decision. We will figure that out later and see where they are camped. Colonel Robert will send a recon in force to search and destroy that patrol. Just as a reminder Rangers, Yang said, until the airfield is built, we are all going in blind. There are probably Imperial troops all over the place that we cannot detect yet. Our technology far superior than theirs however. All you need is one bad day and an ambush. Now for the matter at hand. We all know what happened with Vanguard 7, Stanford said. Everyone already knows what happened. Vanguard 7 brought over refugees back to base and fought off a dragon, nearly getting everyone killed. I want to make it clear, Stanford said. As we go out, we will make friendly relations with the local population, but we are not here to change their ways. 
Our mission is to prevent a second attack on the homeland. We are not the Salvation Army one. That is when one of the officers raises his hand. When he was called on, he disagreed with the general. Sir, what is the point then? We should help these people as much as we can. At least as a secondary objective. That is when another officer speaks up. Nope, that is not why we are here. Does anyone remember Afghanistan? We won the war but then we stayed around for 20 plus years. Are we going to do that again? We couldn't change the culture of a group of people on our planet. How can we do it with aliens? They are not aliens. They are humans. Someone he cannot identify said. The same officer counters the point in a professional manner. Not all of them. There are dragons. As Major Sharp dealt with. They are elves. Goblins. Hybrids of humans and animals and God knows what else. This is not our world. The rules do not apply here. That shut everyone up for a minute. That officer has a good point. This is not our world. The United States is not here to social engineer these people. How could the US do that when there are still issues back on Earth? As he listens to everyone speak. Everyone is clearly debating the actions that he helps set. His hands lightly rapidly tap on the desk. He then feels a light touch on his tapping hand. It is Sarah's hand, stopping him from taping his hand. He looks over. If you have something to say, speak up, Sarah said quietly. You don't have to remain quiet all the time. He looks at her and then looks back at the conversation. He used to not be so quiet. Used to be active and open with his opinion. The phrase walk the talk. He always believed in walking and talking. That is how a man should live by. After some thought, he decided to speak up. He is right, about changing them. We are here to protect our world. He is then interrupted by another officer, making the point he was the one that brought this refugee issue to them. But someone else shut him up so he could continue. But this is where I disagree, he said speaking his mind. We cannot abandon who we are. We cannot abandon our principles and our values just because this world is scary and different. We must show we are not here to conquer them, and we are an alternative to the empire. We are different. Being different has always been our advantage. We are Americans and we cannot forget what that means. Not again. Everyone understood what that last part meant. In the last 20 years, Americans preferred to tear each other apart forgetting who we are and what we believe in. The term American is not a race but an idea. A list of basic principles, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. He glances over to Sarah and sees her reaction. She looks confused and impressed at the same time, like she was not expecting that. He just ignores her and focuses back on the meeting. Colonel Yang replied to him. That is a very interesting point of view Major, all of yours. We wanted all of your feedback since you're going on the field. The question is, what should we do with the refugees we have now? One of the Vanguard team leaders speaks up. Well, we can send them away, if they run into the Empire though, they will probably be killed. Why do we have to take care of them? Another officer said, what do you mean by that? Captain Bailey said, we took them in, it is our duty respond. That is not what I mean. We are here acting like they are unable to take care of themselves. They clearly can support themselves. All we need to do is provide a hand. They don't need us to babysit them. That last officer responds. Assuming if our goal is to sit here on our asses, he adds to the debate. Let's speak plainly. Let's pull out our Wikipedia and see what's around here. While we are at it, Yuba eats anyone. Sharp hears a few chuckles from that. He was not trying to be funny. But he enjoyed that. My point is, we know nothing of this place and world. We have what, 55 different researchers just in the US alone trying to figure all this out? Everything we have on Earth isn't here. We need allies. Farming peasants, Lieutenant Colonel Kaysen asked in a threatening tone. Sharp looks forward to Kaysen. He has not known him long, but he can read him. He is a desk officer and nothing more. He has run into his type before and they never get along. Last time I checked peasants defeated the British Empire. He responds in his command tone. We need allies and people who understand what this world is. We do not even have a map. There is no rule book. 
We are all literally making this up as we go. That didn't work out last time. You are talking about those two kids you picked up? Captain Bailey asked. Yes, he said leaning forward, and I wouldn't consider them kids. Lelai the blue hair girl knows magic and said she wants to stick around. She saved my life with whatever energy shield that was, and it seems she knows a thing or two about the region. Maybe but what about the other girl? Riley, Kaysen said. I believe it is Rory Mercury, Yang corrects and shoots Kaysen a glare to back off, and I believe she is an apostle of Vemroy. Is that how you say it? What is what she said in the interview sir? Sarah states, Rory Mercury, he said and thinks back on how she helped. He was amazed by her abilities with her halbert. Rory explained what an apostle is, that each apostle serves the will of their god. They have supernatural abilities, the best term he can think of is a super soldier with faster, stronger, and unnatural abilities. She helped in the battle, allowing his team to use a javelin to blow off the dragon's arm. She did not have to help and yet she did, and for some reason, he feels that she means good. I will vouch for Rory, he said. She didn't have to help but she did, can we trust her? Yang asked. As you said Major, we know nothing of this world, for all. We know she might be working for the Empire. You don't send your muscles to do recon, he said. You use heavy hitters to bring down the door. And I didn't say we don't do basic security, but she helped out. Trust must be earned, but it was hell at the start. We need allies. He then looks back at Sarah sensing her reaction. Have you seen combat before sir? Sarah asked quietly, confused by his tone. His tone made it sound like he has experienced everything he said, not to rookie. He looks away, ignoring the question. Stanford speaks up. I agree, we cannot hold everyone's hand, if we are going to help people, they need to help themselves. We will work on details on setting up a location for them to call home. However, though, this is not an invitation to bring everyone you see, only people who are willing to aid us or are facing persecution. Any questions? As everyone settles down a little, knowing the plan, there will be no new questions on this topic. All right, Yang said. The final part of today's brief is that some of our fellow NATO allies will be coming. The Canadians and the British Royal Marines will be here in a week. The French and the Japanese will be arriving by the end of the month. As the general stands up one of the officers yells attention. Everyone then stands up and salutes and the meeting ends. After the meeting, Major Sharp is heading out of the building. Captain Bailey is by his side. Nice job sir. Glad you can still be a smart ass when you want to. I think I pissed off the Lieutenant Colonel, he said. Bailey pats him on the back. What else is new? I just cannot believe you took on a lion in hand-to-hand -hand combat, said Bailey. That fight was all everyone could talk about at the officer lounge. You should come by once in a while. He can picture the conversation. They all must be trying to figure out how they may be walking and talking lions. Plus fighting one. Major, both stop and see Sarah walk out of the building and come towards them. Looks like you are in trouble, Bailey said with a chuckle. I know you struggle to integrate but I'm glad you are here sharp. We need you. He watches Bailey walk away and then look at Sarah. Yes, Lieutenant. Sarah stands tall and looks directly at him. I need to get this off my chest. When you decided to bring the refugees here, why didn't you tell me? Don't you trust me? He takes a breath as he tries to think of a response. If I reported my situation and requested to bring them back it would have been denied. You heard the lieutenant colonel want one would want to take the burden. Most likely, yes but I am asking you why you didn't tell me? Sarah asked again. I can't help you if I don't have all the information. If you leave out details, then I cannot trust you. That will put the team at risk, and I will not allow that. He could not disagree with anything she said. He has the same rule and he broke it. It was not about him not trusting her. I apologize Lieutenant. Good, Sarah said and then smiles. By the way, I approve of what you did and said back there. I just wish you gave me the chance to show that. Now I have to go, Sarah said. I recommend you go check out your new friends. He then sees her walk off, not allowing him to say anything. As he watches he grabs his shaking hand. He then shakes his head, damn it, sharp. As he leaves, 
he gets a message from his medic, Jerry. Sir, Jerry said, I am done with the girl Selena. She is weak but will be fine. He takes a relaxing breath. That's good. Good job specialist. He then wonders why he called him over the radio. Is everything okay? I am ready to discharge her sir, Jerry said. But who do I discharge to? Sharp did not think about that. She has no parents or guardians to take her in. Right now, she is an orphan. He thinks about leaving her with the other refugees, but the idea does not sit well with him. She is a weak girl who has been abused. While he does not know much about tribal society, he doubts the refugees will watch her. They might agree just to show a positive face but long run she will always be an outsider. He then thinks about the girls he met. Rory and Lelai. From what they told him Rory is a traveler and Lelai only went into town to get supplies. He wonders if they will take care of her until he can figure something else out. Specialist, he said. Keep her there. I will come and pick her up. Lelai La Lelina is in her tent. She is standing by the door looking up at the ceiling. Wow. When the convoy got to Alness it was late at night. What is called the army engineers set up these wooden shacks for the refugees to live in. Inside the shacks are beds and changing areas. An hour ago, the army installed a light bulb on the ceiling. They said they can flip this switch at night, and it will lighten up the room. She had no idea what that meant. The engineer assumed that she would understand what the term means. I think it is evil, Rory said, looking at the light bulb. It is not evil, she replied. They all have this light in their buildings. It is like a torch you can flip on, but without the fire. At least the fire keeps you warm, Rory replied. She then looks out the window. I have been to many places and seen many different things but this. These people have so many strange things. As Rory talks, she flips the switch again. When she flips the switch down the light turn off. When she flips the switch again the light comes on. She is trying to figure out how it works and nothing she has learned from her teaching from the city of Rundle can explain this to her. The light is baffling, confusing, and amazing at the same time. I don't understand. She mumbles as she gazes at the light. How do they master this? It reminds me of when staff starts to glow before a magic spell. Rory said. I thought so, she responds as she flips the switch again. But I don't think each one of these bulbs is orbs. There are too many of them. At first, Lelai thought the light bulb was an orb like the blue orb on top of her staff. After a short debate in her head, she decided that could not be. She came to the conclusion that these people don't seem to know what magic is, which is baffling to her. Their world does not have magic which she is struggling to understand how that is possible. Hey Lelai, Rory asked as she checks out the bed. What do you think of all this? She thinks about the question for a moment. I have been a student at Runtel for a long time and I have never seen anything like this. If the research sages were here, I do not think they know where to begin. I mean metal moving horses. Even their clothes are so different. And their weapons, Rory adds. What they call missile launchers was amazing. I have seen many kinds of blister but nothing like that. She looks at Rory. I saw that. It took off the flame dragon arm like it was nothing. I was very impressed by that too. Rory replied. I wonder what else they might have. I saw those armored wagons. I think they call them tanks. She corrects. Yeah. Rory continues. I have been wondering what else they might have. If that missile launcher is for their basic infantry, then by the gods what else do they have? She looks at Rory after hearing that question. Up to this point, she never considered what other possibilities these other worlders might have. The city of Rondel is considered a wealth of knowledge. The smartest minds on Falmart live there doing research and yet these people have an understanding beyond them. She then hears a knock on the door and looks over. Hey, Rory. It is the Major from the battle. She then walks over and opens the door. She sees Sharp standing there and in his arms is that girl he saved from those slave traders. Is everything okay Major Sharp? Yes, Sharp said. Can you two keep an eye on her? She looks at the girl and sees bandages around her. She looks tired but clean. While she didn't see it, she heard that this man saved this girl from becoming a slave. Every town she went to, passing traders, mine, 
and so on has slaves in some manner. Even Rondel has slaves, very few compared to most cities but even they need them. She cannot believe that Sharp would free a slave for no reason. I will be happy to. She then turns around and looks at Rory. Is that okay with you Rory? Rory walks over and looks at Sharp carefully and then at the girl. What is your name? The girl looks at her. Selena, she said in a tired voice. Rory then lets out a big smile. You are among friends here little one. She then looks up at Sharp. Yes, she can. Sharp walks into the shack and walks over to an empty bed. He then lays Selena on the bed. All right, just lay down here and relax. She walks over. Don't worry. We can watch over here. Sharp turns around and looks at them both. All right. Is everything okay? I know it isn't much, but it is the best we can do. You are kidding? Rory asked as she places her hand on her hip. You consider this basic? You have glowing orbs that we can control. <laughs> Sharp said, and he glances up at the light bulb. I guess that is cool, but okay. If there is anything you need just ask. The mess hall is that building over there, past that barracks there. It is open from 0900 to 1800. I have no idea what that last part means, Rory said. She looks at Rory. It is a set of time. You see the numbers represent us of the day by the digits they use, and how he said those numbers also implied that. I am assuming you operate flare up to flare down like us so that means 0900 is in the morning and 1800 is in the evening. The only thing I don't understand is the arrangement of the numbers. Sharp looks at her impressed. Damn. You pay attention. She smiles hearing that. Glad to get a compliment from him for some reason. My goddess is La, the goddess of learning. I can learn things quickly if I try. Ha, huh. could have used that back in high school, he said. We will have to talk about these god stuffs soon. But right now if you need anything just ask me. Stay away from the military equipment and just stay inside the refugee camp. Will do major she replied. But I was hoping to see more of your people. Everything seems so different. Sharp is hesitant to respond. I will see what I can do but remember, this is a military base. Sharp then turns around and looks at Selena. And you. They will keep an eye on you. No one is going to come and take you. Sharp looks back at Rory and her and nods. Thanks. He then walks out of the shack. She watches Sharp leave and closes the door. What a strange man. I agree. Rory said. She looks over to Rory and she is in deep thought. She has never seen an apostle before, let alone sleep in the same building. Being 16 years old she does not have a lifelong experience like Rory does. If there is anyone's opinion, she can trust it should be her. Rory, what do you think? Are we safe? Can we trust them? Rory looks at her and then at Selena. I have seen many things. Many people, many cultures. I don't fully know but my heart tells me something is different. Rory then walks over to Selena. She sits down on the bed and places her hand around Selena. She then moves some hair off Selena's face. Life is always the strong ruling and dominating over the weak. That is the law of nature. Even the kindest of hearts obey that law. That is just how it is. She then looks into Selena's eyes. But yet these Americans put their lives at risk. I don't expect purity, but these people seem to have broken the law. Only time will tell. But the real question is, can we trust him? Reference, https colon slash slash shim dot wapad dot com slash 112 ffb 3 f 50 f 2 a 3 b 165 c f 0 5 d 276 f 347 f 0 f 320 a slash 6 8 7 4 7 4 7 0 7 3 3 a 2 f 2 f 7 3 3 3 2 e 616 d 617 17 A 6 F 6 E 6 1 7 7 7 3 2 E 636 F 6 D 2 F 7 7 6 1 7 4 7 4 7 0 6 1 6 4 2 D 6 D 6 5 6 4 6 9 6 1 2 D 7 3 6 5 7 2 7 6 6 9 6 3 6 5 2 F 5 3 7 4 6 F 7 2 7 9 4 9 6 D 6 1 
F444 C66362 D56476464 F2 D6 F5253773 D3 D2 D373 O34363 O383 O373332 E31363732326465 E6 A7067-1. Salvation Army is a U.S. domestic donation group. Gate, War of Two Worlds Part 1. Fort Alness, April 28, 2025. Sharp wakes up all sweating and breathing heavily. He takes a look around and sees that he is in the passenger seat. He looks around as he tries to remember where he is at. He looks at his watch and it said 0147. He then sees the strange glow from the gate. It is not bright or distracting. Just an alien like glow. Damn it. He grabs his helmet and gets out of the JLTV. He sees his rangers in their beds asleep. The only one who is awake because he is on guard duty. Morning, sir, Scott said. Morning, Scott, he replied. You are up early, sir, Scott comments. Is there anything you need? He looks at Scott and then looks away. Stay on guard duty. If anyone needs me, I will be on the western line. He walks through the base. While the only source of light is the half moon and the power generation lights everywhere it is dark. Besides that, it is pretty dark. He passes the British and Canadian sections of the base as he heads to the refugee section. They are the first NATO allies to arrive in this world and are establishing their base of operations. He gets to the refugee section and sees the building he wants to check on. He nearly got to the door but stops himself. Don't get attached sharp. He then walks away, heading to the western outer perimeter. Currently, the outer perimeter is made up of a trench system around the gate, three kilometers out in one large circle. This style of defense is only temporary until the military is ready to build a more permanent base. He gets to this spot on the line that is being guarded by two second division soldiers. Good evening sir, one of the soldiers said. It is morning corporal, he responds. How is the line? Boring sir. The corporal said. Good, he replied. Keep a good eye out there though. We have no idea what is out there. Now excuse me. He starts walking down the line until he finds a spot where he is alone. Once alone he then takes off his helmet and sits down. He looks out and only sees darkness. The only light is the moon and stars. He can feel his hand tapping his knee as he feels stressed out. I don't know if I can do this again. He takes a deep breath and pulls out his M1911 Colt pistol. He holds it in his hand and looks at it. Rory Mercury looks out the window of the shack. It seems like my little soldier is awake. But he seems to be struggling. She sensed Sharp coming over but saw him leave which confused her. She has been curious about this man's sense of the town. She looks over to Selena as she sleeps. While she is not one of her worshippers, she has made a vow to protect her. She thinks back to the town. While Sharp thought he was alone she watched him confront those four men. She thought he was crazy to fight them, especially a lion. All for a slave girl too. She decided to watch and see what happens and she was impressed by the results. Watching him carry Selena away in his arms she thought he claimed her as his property. However. That idea did not sit well with her because she felt something was different. He ordered his team to help the people evacuate when he had no reason to. Time to get the truth. She mumbles. She leaves the shack and then jumps. She lands on the roof of the next shack. She then jumps again. Passing four shacks and softly lands on another roof. Being an apostle, she has superhuman abilities like enhanced strength, speed, agility and regeneration. All are needed in the name of her god Emroy. She gets to the last building and sees a large gap between her and the line. Now where is he? She closes her eyes and places her hand on her chest. She then starts to feel for him. After a few moments she finally senses his soul, but she does not like what she feels. The presence of Palapan, the god of revenge, 
she rushes over to his location. She sees him sitting there looking at something, but she can tell that something is wrong. While it has only been a few days since she met him, she has already learned a lot about him. He prioritizes other people's safety and well-being over himself. He is brave to the point of fault, and what she finds interesting is that he is a soldier, but he is independent. He finds ways to obey his orders or do what is right. In all her time in this world, she was found it interesting that battle brings out the true side of man. She sees phony people all the time just living their lives but a soldier who is putting everything on the line, she has seen their true sense of who they are. She walks up behind Sharp and sees the gun in his hand. She saw him pull that weapon out and fired it at the flame dragon. It did not affect the dragon, she is not even certain the projectile even hit the beast. But it did show her that he did not fear the dragon. She walks up and then jumps on top of his lap without warning. Ouch, Sharp said, shocked by what just happened. She looks at him, studying him. Are you an agent of Palapan? Sharp looks at her, confused by the question. Who the hell is Palapan? Answer the question, Major, she replied. She looks closely into his eyes wanting to see how his soul said, how can I answer the question if I don't know who Palapan is Rory, Sharp said, she sees that Sharp tries to push her off, she grabs his hand and stops him, she can see the confusion in his eyes, how a young looking girl like her ability to overpower a well trained adult male, I want to know if I can trust you, she responds, Rory watches Sharp now looking at her, very directly, to her surprise, he looks at her like he is in control of this situation. She wonders if he still does not understand what an apostle is or if he doesn't care. You want to know if you can trust me? Sharp restates the question. The answer is no. She is surprised to hear that response. She was expecting him to say yes and give her some standard reason on why he is the good guy. Trust is something that needs to be earned, Sharp continues. People like to give out trust like throwing candies but when real issues arrive, they fly like fleas. Trust needs to be earned, built from the ground up so when you are in the trench, surrounded by the enemy, the person beside you will still be there. So, you cannot trust me because we just meant just like I cannot trust you. Your question should be, should we learn to? She blinks, surprised by that answer. She thinks about his response. If you don't trust us then why did you save all those people? Your world attacked mine, Sharp states. My people want payback but that doesn't mean we have a free pass to do what we want. What is the point in coming here if we are just going to bomb everything? I want to win but I want a victory that matters. The only way to do that is to be better than our enemies. Better? She asked. What is the point of winning the war if nothing changes? Sharp continues. So, let me ask you this. You are a fine girl who can take care of herself. Why are you here? Why are you not fighting against us? She smiles. Because I do not support the Empire. They have reigned over these lands for long enough. She then let go of his hand and places it on her chest. Long ago when I was twelve, I was chosen by my god Emroy. The gods of our world cover many responsibilities. You said that before, Sharp said. What does that mean? Emroy is the god of darkness, war violence, insanity, crime, execution, love, and death in all related in what I said, she said, arms crossed as she smiles, I go around my world spreading the will of Emroy. Interesting, Sharp said. She then takes a breath and looks away. Let me guess you think I am evil or something. She thinks that because she is known as Rory the Reaper, death follows her wherever she goes which does not bother her. However, it is a reason why she usually travels alone. Many people see her as someone who brings death to her. While she believes Amroy represents the reality of the world and she chooses to see it in a positive way, most see her in a negative way. That is why she is known as the Reaper. If you want to see it like that, Sharp replied. She glares at him. Why don't you ever speak plainly? Because it isn't Tuesday sweetheart, Sharp replied and gives her a wink. Most would see all that as an act of evil but those same people who rarely have to fight or put themselves on the line. Stating the obvious but I am a soldier. You must be insane to leave a warm bed and food to go fight in another country. You do what you must to protect the ones you care about. She giggles at him, 
avoiding the word love. All her life she always found it strange that men avoid terms like that. She always heard that words like that were not too manly enough or dumb excuses like that. She finds it interesting that Sharp's world is similar. Do you mean to protect the ones you love? She corrects. That and more, Sharp replied. You? As I said, she replied. I want to help people in my world, not the powerful, not the nobles or the royals, just the people. I think you people have the same goals as me. I think you have the same goals as me. Rory looks at him closely, feeling the presence of Palapin fading. She can sense a conflict in him, a deep pain. While she does not know she can fully trust these people, yet she can see that she can trust his actions. Sharp is not an agent of Palapin, not because he does not know who Palapin is but his actions. However, she does wish to know who he is an agent of. She then hears footsteps coming and looks over. Two soldiers walk up, both being Alicia and Scott. Sir, Alicia said. Command is on the horn and needs. What is going on here? Are you two doing it? Scott asked. She looks up at Scott finding it a strange question. She then looks at herself and then sharp, realizing that she is sitting on his lap. From their point of view, they look like they are getting a little too intimate. She then smirks as she gets an idea. She places her hand on her forehead and leans back. Oh, thank you. This man wanted to thank me in the battle, but I think there was something in the drink he gave me. I think he seduced me and the next thing I knew I was here on his lap. Sir? Alicia said. Sharp looks to his rangers and then at her with a smirk. All true. I seduced her. To be honest I didn't even have to try. The easiest seduction I ever had. I even got bored. Too easy. Hearing that she slaps him across the cheek. You prick. You were not supposed to agree with me. You were supposed to beg for forgiveness and beg me not to tell anyone. Sharp places his hand on his cheek. One. Ouch. Two. If you cannot stand the heat. Get out of the kitchen. I play to win. Sharp then winks and her and gets up and walks past his rangers. She stands up. Unable to believe that he challenged and defeated her at her own game. Prick. I was supposed to win. This is war. What the fuck just happened? Scott asked, confused. Rory Alicia said in a concerned voice. Do you need help? Did he assault you? If he tried to assault me, I would have easily killed him. She responds, brushing off Alicia's concern. He just won this round. Ah, shit there are two of you now. Alicia mumbles. I'm going back to bed. Reference, https colon slash slash shim dot wattpad dot com slash 112 ffb 3 f 50 f 2 a 3 b 165 c f 5 d 276 f 347 f 0 f 320 a slash 6 8 7 4 7 4 7 0 7 3 3 8 2 f 2 f 7 3 3 3 2 e 616 d 617 17 A 6 F 6 E 6 1 7 7 7 3 2 E 636 F 6 D 2 F 7 7 6 1 7 4 7 4 7 0 6 1 6 4 2 D 6 D 6 5 6 4 6 9 6 1 2 D 7 3 6 5 7 2 7 6 6 9 6 3 6 5 2 F 5 3 7 4 6 F 7 2 7 9 4 9 6 D 6 1 one six seven six five two F four hundred and forty four C six six three six two D five six four seven seven six four F two D six F five two five three seven seven three D three D two D three seven three O three four three six three O three eight three O three seven three three two E three one three six three seven three two three two six four six five three two six two three one three eight six four three one six five three four three two three five three four three two three two three 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 eight three nine three seven three seven three four three nine three two two e six a seven thousand and sixty seven editor Arai Gate War of Two Worlds Part One Fortalness April thirty first two thousand and twenty five Lela is holding what the Americans call a blueberry muffin. It is a soft, fat, and fluffy bakery food with berries in it. When she first arrived in Rondel long ago, 
she could not believe all the amazing design of bakery product there. She was born in the Ryudo nomad tribe. Everything had to be hunted and cooked back then. Her people did not believe in settling down in a single location. So, Rondel had so many luxury foods she never could imagine. But now, she finds the American bakery is even far more luxurious than the best Rondel backer. Rory said to herself, enjoying her muffin. How do you think they make it stand so tall? She asked as she analyzes it and make it so fluffy. Dark magic. Rory responds, enjoying herself. She looks at Rory. Do you think so? Rory looks at her and burst out laughing. Of course not. Just eat it. It is tasty. As she eats her muffin she looks around as she waits for shop. He asked them all to be here by the gate did it being midday, or these other world warriors call it, 1035. It has been three days since Vanguard 7 escorted the refugees to Alness Hill. When she got there, she was amazed by what she saw. They have massive, armored weapons called tanks, so much of their equipment made from this strange metal, showing how wealthy they are. The other thing she noticed was the area around Alnus, thousands of bodies and beasts all over the place. It is clear Alnus Hill became a bloody battleground. Based on the Americans' appearance and lack of concern, they did not suffer many casualties. With her time with Sharp fighting against the Flame Dragon, she can believe how deadly their weapons are. Having these people as enemy seems like suicide. And then there is Major Sharp. What he did was very brave, helping those people. That was very out of character for most people in Falmart. He and his people are soldiers, but they do not act like soldiers. For some reason, she feels safe around him. She looks to her left and sees Selena standing there. While they are the same age physically that is where the similarities end but she still agreed to watch over the girl for shop. It is the least she can do for helping the townsfolk and giving her a place to sleep. It is fascinating isn't it? Selina, Rory asked, referring to the gate. Selina looks at her. She still looks nervous and slightly scared. That is how they come here? That is correct, she replied. The legend about the gate is true but I am surprised that the gate has appeared. My master Kato L. Altestan has told me stories of the gate, she said. Stories about a gate that appears, and life or death comes through it. I never thought I would ever see such a thing. Yeah but smaller than I expected, Rory responds. But yeah, all good things are usually smaller than expected. She looks at Rory, trying to understand the hidden meaning. All she sees is Rory chuckling, as she is standing there by the fence watching as the soldiers bring cargo through the gate, as a thank you from Major Sharp for helping in the battle against the dragon, Lela and her were given their own tent with some special rights on the base. Selina was also assigned to their shack, so I could protect her while he was not around. Selina tugs on her blue and green rob and then points to the large boxes. Yes Selina, she said, I noticed a lot of those recently. I think they are cargo boxes. It looks like these people are moving in to stay, Rory points out. But I don't think they are ready for our world. She looks at Rory confused. What do you mean? They seem to have so much power. Rory looks at her. They are probably the most powerful force on Falmart right now, but power isn't enough. These people are new to these lands and our ways. They are also angry. I was talking to Sharp and he didn't even know who Palapin was. I see what you mean she said. I also noticed that they don't know the basics of our world. I was talking to the big man named Randy and he said there are no monsters in their world, just humans. Correct, Rory replied. While I am admiring their bravery, they seem to be like children. They didn't even know what magic was until a few days ago, she added. But what are you saying, Rory? Rory looks over. I have seen good men before. Even the Empire has good men. However, even the best of men can be corrupted over time, especially when they face the unknown. I do believe these people when they say they want to help but Sharp was right. Rory continues, how can they help if they do not know this world? What is basic for us is so foreign to them. I bet they say the same about us, she adds. Should we help them? Rory hesitates to respond, gathering her thoughts. If they let me I will. I cannot allow their age for the empire to turn them into another empire. 
they need guidance until they can learn and understand our world. So, they are like big children? Selena asked, trying to be part of the conversation. Rory laughs hearing Selena say that. Yes, for now, though. She then sees Major Sharp and this other woman walks up. Hello girls, Sharp said. This is First Lieutenant Sarah Rose. She is one of my co-workers and if you need anything while I am off base you can get to her. Hello girls, Sarah said. You must be Lely. You must be at Rory. In revealing clothes, I see. No wonder the Major tried to play a fast one on you. She laughs and poses a little. At first sight of me, men just lose all control. You know I am standing right here, Sharp said. I know, Sarah responds. She then lowers herself to Selena's height. And you must be Selena. You are so cute. Are you feeling better? Selena nods her head and then shyly glances up at Sharp. What is the plan? She asked. You are welcome to come inside, Sharp said. The Colonel and General would like to have a word with you two. Please follow us. She grabs Selena's hand and follows the two. Major, she said. What are those metal things over there? Those are helicopters, Sharp responds. Black Hawks, part of the 101st Division. Helicopters allow us to fly through the sky, Sarah adds. It is like a flying wagon, she thinks for a moment after hearing that. So. It is like a wyvern but metal. Like everything else they have. Very interesting. She could not believe what they said. The Empire specializes in such abilities as its wyvern core and dragon riders. It is one reason how they became the dominant power of Falmart. It takes years to train a wyvern to obey human commands and only a select few can ever be able to fly. Even in her long life she has only flown a few times. Based on how calm Sharp and Sarah responded it sounds like the flight is normal to them. She also sees about ten soldiers standing around a box, all dressed very well. She sees them pick up the box and start loading it into one of the vehicles. She also sees a flag over the box, stars, and strips. What is that over there? Sharp looks and looks at her. They are sending back one of our fallen soldiers. I don't have the details, but the soldier walked into a monster nest. Bad way to go. You value the dead bodies? Rory asked. We leave no one behind. Dead or alive, everyone has the right to go home, Sharp said. Lieutenant Colonel Hal Moore, 1966. And what is that flag? She asked. That is our country's flag, Sarah adds. Our country isn't a normal country. It is a union of 52 one states, all united under a republic. The stars each represent the states in our union, showing we are united. The 13 strips have two meanings, Sharp continues. The first 13 colonies or as states today. Red represents valor and strength, white represents innocence and purity and blue represents perseverance and justice. We out the flagged and honor our fallen as they go home. Rory liked that a lot. During battles, I collect the fallen souls of soldiers who died. I help guide those souls to Emroy so their souls can be protected by the other gods, so they can rest in peace like a warrior should. I find it respectable how you treasure the fallen. She sees these two men standing there. They seem to be talking about something important but she cannot tell what. Once they arrived Sarah introduced the girls to the two me. One being Lieutenant General Charles Stanford, the leader of the newly established NATO Expeditionary Force. The other is Colonel John Yang, leader of the Rangers here. I like to say thank you for helping Major Sharp and his team out there, Yang said. You are all welcome to stay here until something better. Stanford said, I must ask you all to remain in the refugee zone until we can clear out a new area for you and the others. Hold up, Rory said as she holds out her hand. I am not going to sit around and do nothing. I will go crazy. I want to help. You need me. I had a feeling you were going to say this, but we cannot, Stanford said. For one this is the US Army. We don't accept kids into our ranks and with all due respect General but I am not a kid, Rory said, crossing her arms. When I was 12 Emroy picked me but that was 960 years ago. I am stronger, faster, smarter, and let's face it, prettier too. There are threats to this world that you do not understand. You think I am the only one of my kind out there? She takes a step forward, 
Excuse me but I am not a child. I am 16. My master is Kato L. Altestan and I am his student. My upbringing was a nomad life, so I know how to pull my weight. And I notice you do not have mages, so I think you need me. It is not that we don't understand what you are Rory, Yang said. It is more that we cannot be seen putting people like you within our ranks. While I understand your gifts my people back home will not. To put it frank we need time to see if there is a role for you, Stanford said. She then sees Sharp look to the officers, about to say something. Stanford looks at Sharp and holds out his hand, warning him not to speak. Look, Major, Stanford said. I understand your feelings. You of all people know we do not act as rogue agents. We do need locals help but putting them into combat side by side shouldn't be the way. As she watches the debate, she is baffled by the age part. She does not understand why these people brought up her age and Rory's size. She has been working and in danger since she was born. She has seen children in legion, knights, and militias all the time. Now that she thinks about it, she has yet to see a child here within the American ranks at all. Everyone is an adult. The only odd thing is the number of female soldiers she sees. While still a minority she is impressed by the large amount. Based on the conversation it sounds like the two commanders just do not know what to do with Rory and her. As Rory said before she is starting to see the immaturity these people are. She can tell they come from a wealthy and safe place. As she looks around, she notices extra activities by the gate. She sees one of the big cargo trucks suddenly driving backwards into a wall of crates. About four crates start falling over in three directions. Soldiers all around start to panic and run. She holds up her staff. The orb on it glows blue. The falling crates stop right before it hits the ground. There is this blue enemy flow around all four crates, hovering. She moves her staff guiding the crates. She is sweating as she feels the stress and weight of the crates. What is in those? Rory. On it. Rory said. Rory then quickly rushes over to the crates. She grabs the largest one and lowers it. She keeps doing that until everything is on the floor. She takes a deep breath, as she feels the stress gone. Suddenly she sees this canteen in front of her. Good job kid, Sharp said. Drink up. She takes the canteen smiling. She starts drinking and can see them all talking. Sarah, Yang, and Stanford, plus everyone in the area is looking at her with these shock eyes. What? Those were high explosives, Sarah said. They could have killed us all. What did you do? Yang asked. She looks around. The only one who isn't in pure shock is Sharp. She sees him give a supportive nod, signaling her that it is okay to speak. I just used my telekinesis to stop the crates. You're kidding? Sarah said, shocked. You mean mind powers? You can just look at something and take control of it? That is a crude way of saying it Lieutenant Sarah but close, she replied. But don't worry I cannot just control you. Controlling a living person's movement is way too hard. Only the most skilled dark mages can do that and even then, it is a large mana drain. Yang then looks to Rory as Rory walks back over brushing her hand soft. Rory glances at Yang and Stanford and smirks. I love to see your big brave soldier boys do that. Those had to be like 500 pounds, Yang said. Maybe more. Did you lift them so easily? Superhuman strength Colonel, Sharp said and walks between everyone. He looks towards the girls. Thank you very much. Sharp then looks to his superiors. Looks as we need help. I know it isn't standard protocol but what is standard right now? Are we here to win or are we here to show off for 20 years? She can see Yang and Stanford looking at her and Rory. From what she can tell that they both left an impression on them. All right Major, Yang said. We will do it your way however they are your responsibility. Sharp salutes and nods. Thank you, sir. I will even do the paperwork. Oh please, Sarah said. Sharp looks at her and smirks. What? I am. This will be fun but don't worry, I won't do any edits. I rely on you for that. She blinks, not fully understanding what is happening. So, we are allowed to help. Sharp smirks. Yes. Both of you can tag along however you have to obey my commands. Do we have an understanding? She smiles and nods. Yes, Major. I guess I can listen. Rory said, 
When I feel like it, well I better start getting everything ready, Sarah said. Good day to you all and welcome to the team. Reference https colon slash slash shim dot wattpad dot com slash 112 ffb 3 f 50 f 2 a 3 b 165 c f 5 d 276 f 347 f 0 f 320 a slash 6 8 7 4 7 4 7 0 7 3 3 a 2 f 2 f 7 3 3 3 2 e 616 d 617 17 A 6 F 6 E 6 1 7 7 7 3 2 E 636 F 6 D 2 F 7 7 6 1 7 4 7 4 7 0 6 1 6 4 2 D 6 D 6 5 6 4 6 9 6 1 2 D 7 3 6 5 7 2 7 6 6 9 6 3 6 5 2 F 5 3 7 4 6 F 7 2 7 9 4 9 6 D 6 1 one six seven six five two F four hundred and forty four C six six three six two D five six four seven seven six four F two D six F five two five three seven seven three D three D two D three seven three O three four three six three O three eight three O three seven three three two E three one three six three seven three two three two six four six five three two six two three one three eight six four three one six five three four three two three five three four three two three two three 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 eight three nine three seven three seven three four three nine three two two e six a seven thousand and sixty seven one guam and puerto rico are states in my story gate war of two worlds part one fortalness may third two thousand and twenty five Major Sharp is in his makeshift office in this large tent. All around are the other Vanguard teams, both the leaders and logistic officers. To his left is Second Lieutenant Charles Johnson and to his right is First Lieutenant Sarah Rose, each doing their paperwork. He is typing on his laptop, making both Rory Mercury and Lelai La Lelina becomes officially part of the team. He does not fully understand why he went along with it. Just the other night he wanted to stay away from the three girls. He is convinced that they stay around him they will end up dead. Rory said that she cannot die, being an apostle, that her body can regenerate and reattach body parts. However, he instantly came up with a dozen ways for her to be tortured without killing her. All of them worse fate than death. But after Rory and him spent that night together on the perimeter one the other day he feels like he can lead this team. For three months he has had confidence issues in his leadership abilities and now for the first time, he feels like he has a chance. He sees his inbox and find it full of messages. He opens it and sees some memos, most from what is going on in the war. He sees some personal messages by some friends which he ignores them all. He looks up and sees Sarah walks up, carrying a box. Sarah drops the box on his desk. Damn this is heavy, what is in here? He looks at the big box, I could have gotten it. I might have a pretty face major but that doesn't mean I cannot lift things. Sarah said with a smirk, what is in it? Books, he replied. What kind of books? Sarah asked. He leans back in his chair and looks at Sarah. Some history books. Ancient China Europe Cultural books like guns, germs, and steel I have heard of that book, Sarah said, by Jared Diamond. It is about how two different civilizations make contact. He explains how if one civilization is able to produce more goods, being more advanced, is able to beat and control a less advanced one. Whoever can make more goods usually wins. Good pick sir. I read it once at West Point back in 2013. He responds, I figured I should reread it while I am here. I didn't know you were an intellectual sir, Johnson asked, leaning over his desk. He looks over, those are fighting words lieutenant, no way in hell I am one of those pencil pushers who make millions of dollars to write books, totally, Sarah said in a sarcastic tone. You just jump out of airplanes on six grand a month. Yup, he said that with pride. He then glances away as he realizes how dumb that arrangement is once you put thought behind it. Anyway, if we are going to deal with these people, 
best to get educated on their ways. Assuming those books are correct, Johnson said, all their examples are based on earth, not this world. True, he mumbles, still better than nothing. Harper always said be smart. Sarah opens up the box and then pulls out a manga. This is educational material? I also asked Andrew to give me a list of material I should look at, he responds, never know what might come in handy. Sarah skims through the book and then shows him a picture of a mostly naked female knight. Educational material? He shrugs never know lieutenant. Johnson laughs and then he starts laughing. Sarah rolls her eyes but chuckles too. Am I bothering you all? He looks past Sarah and sees the blue hair girl Eli. No. You are not. Come on in. He sees Johnson getting back to work and Sarah leaving to sit down at her desk. Leli walks up and the first thing she notices is the books on his desk. What are these? They are books, he replied, confused by the question. Leli picks on up, amazed by them. There are stories in these? Yes, he replied. Wow, Leli said. My older sister is a part-time scribe. She has to use ink and write everything by hand. She then opens one of the books. How do you people write so perfectly and so small? I have never seen so much perfection in writing before. These must be a fortune. You must be rich. No Leli I am not rich, he replied. If I were, I wouldn't be on an alien planet. And no, those are made by a machine. The stories were written by people but printed by machines. She is amazed by how amazed Leli is by this. It makes him think about how much his people take things for granted. Something so simple as a book must be a treasure for her. The book in your hand is Tigana by Guy Gavriel K, he said. Keep it. I have plenty of other books to catch up on. Leli takes the book and holds it close. Thank you. He nods. So, what brings you here? Everything okay? Leli nods in response. Yes, sir. I just have a question. What is it? he said. Why haven't you collected the dragon scales off the battlefield? Leli asked. He looks at her confused. We've already collected some scales, equipment and other items of interest. They all were sent back to Earth for research. Dapa 2 is running tests on there. But that is it. Why are you asking? Tests? Leli said. They are very valuable, and I see hundreds of them out there. He thinks about that. He is not an economics major but from what he knows the scale has no real commercial or industry value back in the states. Maybe as an exotic luxury good once the war is over. Sarah, from the recent memo we have already went out there and collected everything we wanted, Sarah said, as the major said most of it was sent back through the gate for research. As for now, we have no economic need for these scales. Are they of value? Does that mean I can go out and collect them? Leli asked. That will be okay, right? I don't want to steal. He thinks about the question and smiles. Well thank you very much for asking. If you want to go collect some, be my guest. Thank you, Major, Leli said. Can I ask you something Leli? He said. What are you going to do with them? Well, there is a town up north, Leli said. It is about a five day ride by wagon. What is the town? He asked. You don't know it Italica. Oh yeah. You wouldn't. Leli said but then corrects herself. Italica is a famous trading town. They are an especially important trading town within the empire. Then no Leli, he said. He is confused by why she wants to go to an imperial city after joining his side. If they know you are with us then you're dead. I don't think so, Leli said. Unlike most of the empire. Italica is known to be exceedingly kind. They treat others with far great respect. As long as we don't come with the intent to fight, they will open up their gates to trade. Colt Formal is an honorable man with an honorable house. Also, Leli continues, if they know we came to trade dragon scales they will want to collect them. And you said your mission is to make contact with more towns. Italica will be a good start. He leans back in his chair and thinks. He is impressed by Leli's logical mind. He has started to notice that she thinks through everything, almost to a fault. Everything she said makes complete sense. All right, Leli, spend the day collecting your scales. We will all go to Italica to make the first contact. He then looks at Sarah. Lieutenant starts with the MRF3. 
I like to leave in two days. All right Major, Sarah said. In will have it done by the end of the day. He then looks to Johnson. Lieutenant Johnson. Get two of our guys to escort Lely out there. I don't want them going out there alone. Thank you, Major, Lely said, as she is about to leave. She stops herself and looks back at him. One more thing. I am going to start taxing your questions and requests, he said, joking. What is it? Selena has been wanting to talk to you, Lely said. She has just been too shy to speak. She wanted to come in here to say hi, but she got scared and walked away. He noticed Selena by the gate with Rory and Lela yesterday for, he noticed that she did not say a word like she was hiding. While he does not want to say it publicly, he has been avoiding her, not because of her, more because of his reasons related to himself. Thank you for telling me Lela, he said. I will go see her, okay, Lela said. I am going to go with Rory and head out to the field. Alicia and Andrew will meet you at the gate tomorrow at 1430, Johnson said. They will be your escort. Thank you, Lieutenant, and Major, Lely said. Are you going to go see her? Sarah asked. Sharp thinks about that question. He has mixed feelings on the matter. For one thing, he is an officer of the U.S. Army who is at war. He could die at any point and the last thing he wants is to get involved in Selena's life just for him to be snatched away. On top of that, he does not feel like he could be a good influence or role model. She is going through a hard time in her life and he has no idea how to help her. He also sees that he will be the death of her, so the best chance is for him to maintain distance, for her safety. However, some part of him wants to keep an eye on her to help her and be there. He has been around many kids while during his time in the army and he has never felt this need before. And he does not want to lose this feeling. Yeah, he said as he stands up. He grabs his cap and glasses. For some reason he sees Sarah smiling, strangely looking at him. Lieutenant? Nothing sir. Sarah responds as she looks back at her computer. I will take care of everything for you. You brought her here, so you do have some responsibility towards her. Only until I find someone who will adopt her, he said, making sure she understands that point. Contact me on the radio if you need me. Fort Alness, Refugee Construction Zone. May 3, 2025. Selena is standing by the internal base fence watching what is going on outside, in the nearby field within the Alnus perimeter. She is watching these big monster machines tearing down trees and clearing out a large area. She is continually amazed by the wonders these people have. Back where she is from, it would take days if not weeks to clear out that much land and hundreds of men to do it. They did it in so much faster and with just only a few dozen of them. As Selena watches those soldiers work, she hears a voice coming from behind her. She turns around and sees Major Sharp arriving. Hello there Selena. Mind if I join you? He asked her, wanting to get permission first. He does not want to put her through any more stress than she has already been through. Not knowing what to say, she nods her head shyly. Her body locks up, feeling insecure next to him. Not that she is afraid but, honestly, she does not know how she should feel. But it is just not fear. He walks up to her side and just stands there. For a few silent moments, both just look at the machines and engineers working. Sharp is the first to speak, breaking the unsettling silence. Do you want to know what they are doing? They are clearing up that area. She said quietly to his question. Ah. Are you going to do something there? Yes, you know those refugees that we brought Sharp responded. We decided that they could stay here. For their safety of course. We're clearing an area outside the base, so they could move freely. Yeah, but why? She asked, confused by the motivation. Sharp replied. Well, we can't just keep them in the base. This place will end up like a prison and was not just going to send them back out there. He stops being interrupted. She looks up at him, but her eyes refuse to look at him directly. No, I mean, she tries to say, struggling to say what she wants to say. Why did you help them? This has been bothering her since the day she was freed by him. She thought she was going to become his personal slave, just like all the other men she has seen and been with. A part of her is still struggling to believe that she is free again. Sharp looked very intimidating at first, 
killing those slavers. She has not seen war, but it was clear he knew how to fight, and he is good at it. The men he fought were highly trained imperial mercenaries. On top of that the equipment he wears and the clothes that blend in with the forests, the strange-looking weapons, it is the law of nature. Her father told her many times that the strongest controls and dominates the weak. If you do not rule from strength, then someone stronger will always come and control you. Everything in life is about the power of strength and if you can, you should before your enemies controls and dominates you. Sharp looks at her confused, trying to figure out how to answer the question. He then put his arm on his side as he thinks. Well, they are not our enemy and they needed help. We are at war with the Empire, not its people. But we are not here to conquer this world, just to help and protect. Sharp thinks for a moment, just realizing the meaning of the questions. And about you. Sharp gets onto his right knee and places his hand on her shoulder. He then looks directly in her eyes, smiling, trying to show some positive support however struggling at it. She looks a little nervous, still trying to understand him. What those four men were doing to you was wrong, said Sharp. There is no excuse to enslave a person, especially a child. I don't know what children do here but where I am from kids about your age should be playing with dolls, picking on boys, playing sports, watching TV, and getting good grades in school. You are not a prisoner and you can leave whenever you want, Sharp continues. When we figure out where your home is, we try to get you there. But, as long as you are with us, no one will hurt you again like that. I will personally guarantee it. Hearing that made her heart feel warm. All she wanted to hear was that she is safe now and the horror is over for good. Okay. She looks at him and sees him smiling. Hey, Sharp said. I got you a gift. She watches Sharp pull a box from his bag. It is a long but thin box. Suddenly he hands it to her. Open it. She opens the box and sees a dress in it. It is white with yellow flowers around it. It is a sundress, Sharp said. His hand goes behind his head as he looks embarrassed. I didn't know what to get. I am not good with clothes. The army picks out my clothes usually. It is okay if you don't want to wear it. She looks back at the sundress and thinks it is pretty. Can I wear it though? Sharp smiles. Of course, it is yours. So, you don't have to keep wearing baggy military clothes or rags. She then starts taking off her clothes to change. She then feels Sharp's hand on her arm. Hold on, Sharp said in somewhat of a panic. Not in the open like this. Come to my tent and you can change in private. She had to think about it for a moment but then she realized what she was doing. I, I am sorry. She mumbles as she starts to cry a little. Sharp holds her close. Not knowing what to do. Let us go to my tent. Then you can show off your dress. Sharp stands back up. After that, we can get something to eat at the mess hall. I can get something special from the head cook. He owns me anyway. He said with a chuckle. Thinking of a memory. She begins to realize she can trust him and these people. Maybe even more than that. She smiles, tearing up a little and hugging his leg. She wants to say thank you for helping but the words do not form. But the message is clear. A few moments pass and both start to his tent. As they walk, she holds onto his pant leg. Holding onto it tight. Oh yeah, Sharp said. Tomorrow we are heading out to Italica, 1000. Rory and Lel I need to sell some dragon scales. You're welcome to come. Sharp offers her. She nods, accepting the offer. The desire to learn who he and these people are, why they are so different from the kingdoms of this world and maybe, just maybe they could help her people. Reference, https colon slash slash shim dot wapad dot com slash 112 ffb 3 f 50 f 2 a 3 b 165 c f 5 d 276 f 347 f 0 f 320 a slash 687 47 47 0 7 3 3 a 2 f 2 f 7 3 3 3 2 e 616 d 617 
A6 F6 E61777 E632 E636 F6 D2 F7761747 D6 D6564696126132 D7365726963 F5374 F72794 D6167652 F444 C66362 D56476 F2 D6 F5253773 D3 D2 D373 O3436303 O383 O373332 E313636323264652 E6 A7067 1 Chapter 8 2 DAPA equals Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency 3 MRF equals Mission Request Forms 4 Chapter 9 Gate War of Two Worlds Part 1 Fort Alness, Outer Perimeter May 4, 2025 Private First Class Alicia Moore is walking along with Corporal Andrew Steele. They are escorting their two new comrades. Rory Mercury and Lelila Leilina. Second Lieutenant Johnson contacted them and ordered them to protect the two while they are gathering dragon scales. Is it just me or does everything smell bad? Alicia asked as she passes this stroll corpse. Well, they've been dead for a few days. Rory responds. What did you expect? It is just. There are a lot of them, she replied. I just never seen so many dead before. I have. Rory states at least 30 times probably 50 how is it being so old Andrew asked standing there as he keeps looking Rory lifts a body like it is nothing and tosses it so Lelai can get to the dragon corpse it is its ups and downs I spent most of it traveling around she looks at Rory and can tell she does not want to dive into her past she understands that they only met this week let it go, Andrew. A lady is allowed to have secrets. A lady? Andrew said, looking at her. What about dudes? She, Rory, and Lelai all collectively say no at once. She chuckles and looks around. So how long will this take? Normally removing scales takes hours for each dragon, Lelai said, but I have a spell that allows me to remove them quickly. She watches as Lelai points her staff at the dragon corpse. She sees this purple glow and then this beam hits the corpse. She sees the scales begin to vibrate and one by one scales come off. Impressive. Damn right. Andrew comments as he watches. She looks back around. Just making sure no one sneaks upon them. She knows they should be safe however this is war and war have many unknowns. So far, they have harvested five dragons and there are three to go. So, what do you do with these scales? They are mostly used for magic, Lelai replied. They are used to help enchant items. To help forge swords and armor. There are some powerful spells where you need dragon scales, plus, some medicine and potions. Some warriors think dragon scales make good armor, Rory adds. Some warriors want it however it is so expensive the benefits don't seem good enough. Interesting. She mumbles and looks around. She hears this loud sound coming from the base. She looks over and sees three missiles being fired, hearing northwest. She looks over and sees both Rory and Lelai freaking out. What was that? Lelai asked nervously. We are under attack but where is the bastard? Rory yells as she looks around. She chuckles see this. Don't worry. It is friendly fire ladies. What was that? Rory demands. It is an M142 HIMARS, she answers. Probably firing MG M140 attacks. First CAF is engaging the Empire and local allies to the northwest. Friendly fire support. She watches Rory slowly lower her halberd as she gets used to the missiles being fired from Alness. If you say so. Let's hurry up, Andrew said. I don't like being out here in the open. Roger that Andrew, 
She responds, she feels way to open right now, she does not want to die for some dumb scales, as everyone gets back to work, she sits down to fix her boot laces. Once she finishes, she looks over and sees Rory standing there, with her weapon ready. Rory? Rory Halbert spins in the air and goes right past her, hitting this beast that is behind her, she jumps up from where she was sitting and aims her rifle. What the fuck is that? It is an orc. Rory yells as she rushes up and grabs her weapon. Contact. Andrew yells as he fires his M401. She aims her M4 and fires at an orc she sees. She kills one but sees two more ducking behind some bodies. I am going after them. Rory said, eager to fight. No, she said. I am calling in a mortar strike. Just cover me. She gets on her knee and pulls out her radio. Alnus command this is Vanguard 7. We have Rouge Orcs out here inside the perimeter. Requesting a danger close mortar strike over. Request has been granted Vanguard 7, Alnus command said. Mortar rounds inbound. Danger close. She stands up after giving the coordinates. She sees two Orcs in the distant taking cover. Then this explosion hits next to them. Then the second mortar round hits exactly in their position. Confirm hit, Alnus command said. Hit confirmed over. She responds. What are they doing here? Andrew asked. They are orcs. Lulai said. Stronger than goblins. Some are smart twi lovers are dumb. Depends on the type. However, Lulai Rory interrupts. They wouldn't come over here like this if they were alone. Unless commanded they are cowards. There has to be an imperial scout nearby. She looks around, trying to see where a scout might be. Andrew, what do your eyes see? Andrew looks through his scope, being the team marksman. If I were a scout, I would be in those bushes there. All the dead bodies are creating cover for them to sneak around. What about our thermal sensors? She asked. Thermal should have picked them up. Dragons see heat. Lelai said. Many animals have skin that absorbs heat to hide and protect themselves from dragons and wyverns. Scouts and hunters often wear those skins as cloak for the same reason. Interesting, she said. Okay, Rory, flank those pushes. We will march forward. She watches Rory run to the side at great speed. She is impressed by her speed, seeing nothing like it. Back in Ranger School, she has seen many fast men but she could easily beat them all with no sweat. Lela you are our support, Andrew said. Just stay beside us. Let's go. Both her and Andrew start marching forward. Their rifles aimed at those bushes. Talk to me Andrew, she said. My thermal doesn't show anything. Wait, Andrew said. I see something. It is faint but someone there. She then sees an arrow coming out of the bushes. But Lelai takes out the arrow with a deflection spell. They hold their positions and open fire at the bushes. She cannot tell if they are hitting anything, but she sees Rory moving around. Hold fire. Right then Rory bursts into the bushes and two males get tossed out. She rushes forward with Andrew by her side. When they get close, she holds her rifle at the man getting up. Stand down. Stay down. Andrew yells. Rory walks out of the bushes like it was no effort. Here are your Imperial Scouts. She sees a human and a dark elf. Both males. Both are not in the standard Imperial armor but wearing cloaks made out of animal skin. If you move, I will gun you down. Don't dry me asshole. Now what? Lelai asked. A response team should be here any moment, she said. They will take over. And we go back to base. Andrew said. Enough fun for one day. I have enough scales anyway. Lelai said. Rory swings her weapon to the human's neck, grinning evilly. You are lucky. I would have just killed you too. She turns around and sees three vehicles coming. Two are Humvees and the other is a striker. Once they arrive the soldiers get out and take over for them. She stands there as she watches the soldiers take the two in the striker. All right let's go. Mess hall. Rory Mercury walks away from the food line. She walks past all these soldiers in a different color of green and brown colors. She has been all around Falmart, seeing many different kingdoms and towns. Each place has their version and style of armor and uniforms, but these are different. From what she can see they have no concept of personal armor. As she walks, she sees Vanguard 7 sitting at their table. She walks over and sits down. Hi boys. What about me? 
Alicia asked. She was correct, Scott states as he eats. She watches Alicia knock him on the head and laughs at the fight. These people seem very genuine on who they are, a sight she does not see often. Hey Rory, Randy said, please have a seat. She takes a seat and looks around. She watches as the team goes around and share stories. Rory, Randy said, it looks like you have questions on your mind. I do, she replied. You people are so different from anything I have ever seen. I just don't understand some things. We have questions too but what are yours? Andrew responds. I noticed during the battle that none of you wear armor, she said. I thought you guys were scouts but when I arrived here, I noticed none of you had armor on to your vehicles. Looked well protected but why not your soldiers? I thought you didn't value life. But your commander proved that theory was wrong. You're kidding right? Alicia asked. The Major doesn't care about our lives, Scott said. Before the war, he came to our unit. We rarely saw him for what, a month? Really? She said, surprised by their hostility towards their commander. That only one who likes him is Andrew here, Scott adds. Because they're both nerds. Alicia said with a chuckle. Nerds rule the world, Andrew said casually. Not on this world. Alicia responds. I see, she said and thinks of the past few days. I guess you are right. Your leader jumped out of a moving wagon to face down a legendary dragon. Rescued a girl from a slave trader and helped refugees. She looks around and notices their silences. But it is not my place. Do you mind answering my question? Randy looks at her. About armor? We do use armor. Just not like the enemy of this world. That is correct. Scott adds, our armor is the improved outer tactical vest. Inside the vests, we have these small plates that we can swap out. While this is an oversimplified answer, we call it Kevlar. Scott here is right, Randy continues. On Earth, we don't use swords anymore, only knives for self-defense. What she just heard shocked her. Swords and bows are the standard weapons on Falmart. While there are different types of each weapon the principle is the same. She specializes in her halberd weapon. While strong and sturdy, it is still a melee weapon. If what Randy said is true, his world no longer uses swords but this version of a bow. Is that true? Rory asked. Everyone in your world uses weapons like yours? Correct, Randy said. Hi, Rory. She looks away and sees her new friend Lelila Lelina. She is a mage in training who helped out during the battle with the flame dragon. Hi, Lelai. I figured out the name of their world, it is called Earth. Really? Lelai said as she walks over and sits down. Attention, Randy said. She looks around as all the rangers stands at attention. She then sees Johnson walk up to the table, then tell them to sit down and enjoy themselves. From this interaction she can tell they do have formalities. Sharp explained that the United States does not have kings or emperors. The fact she has yet to see any nobles or royalties is confirming that. So, your world is called Earth? Lelai said. Correct, Randy responds. So, what are your plans here? She asked. I mean your people. I understand the Empire picked a fight with your kind. She sees Randy look to Johnson, showing a chain of command with these people. You already know the basics, Johnson said. As of right now, our mission is defensive until we learn more about this place. She did not like that answer so she starts looking around. Where is the Major? I will get an answer out of him. He is with Selena, Lelai said. She wanted to watch what you Americans call cartoons on his communication device again. Lelai then looks at Rory. I am finished counting all the dragon scales we counted. We collected 278. She looks at Lelai. Eyes widened from what she heard. 278. We are rich. He gave you two approval to go harvest some. Andrew and Alicia. I want you to go out there and help. The last thing we need is the guards thinking they are sneaking upon us. She looks at Johnson. Why would they think that? Would they really shoot us? If they are smart, they would. Sharp said as he walks by the table. The guards job is to engage anyone who gets close to this position. Our number one priority here is to prevent a second attack on Earth. Everyone is still trigger happy and we're rangers. We do this properly. Sharp then looks at Andrew and Alicia. Good job out there. 
It looks like they have been spying on us for a week. All four of you, they had it coming, Alicia said with a laugh. It just shows we have to be careful, Randy said. We might have superior weapons but all they need is a good opportunity and you are dead, and that is why we took on a dragon right? Alicia said in a sarcastic voice. She hears the team laugh from that. She looks to Selena who is standing by his side with one hand holding onto his pants. She is the same height as her, with blue eyes, and brown hair. She sees this nice, clean dress she is wearing now. Hi, your holiness, Selena said in a shy tone. She smiles and gives her a warm hug. Everything is okay, was he being mean to you? Selena looks at Rory and shakes her head no. That is good, she said. By the way, nice dress. Thank you, your holiness, Selena replied softly. You don't have to call me that, she responds. In her younger days she enjoyed those titles but as she gotten older, she grown to hate them. I cannot, Selena responds quietly. It is not appropriate. You are a representative to the gods. She rolls her eyes after hearing that. This apostle business sounds important, Andrew asked. Are there more of you? Yes, she said. There are many, but we rarely work together. We all travel around doing our thing. They are scattered all around the world, representing their gods. I only just arrived back to Falmart six months ago. She then looks at Selena, and you can call me Rory. You all can. None of this holy crap. I get enough of hat at the palaces, and these titles like holiness only goes straight to your head. I rather live a humble but beautiful life. She sees many of the rangers compliment her on her new dress. She knows what everyone is doing. They are trying to boost her self-esteem, to give her some love. She makes room by pushing on Scott who is sitting next to her. She uses her supernatural strength and easily pushes him to the side. She then lets Selena sit down next to her. She then looks up and sees the team leader Major Sharp sit down at the end of the table, close to her. Major, what are your people's plans here? She asked, testing him. That is simple, Sharp said. As I said, our primary mission is to prevent a second attack, and now we know who the enemy is, that being the Empire. We are going to find them and destroy them. She takes a light nervous breath, wondering what he means by that. What about the people? Sharp looks at her confused. What about the people? What do you plan to do with the citizens of the Empire? She asked again. She wants to know if she is trading one evil Empire for another. Nothing, Sharp said. Rory, Randy adds. We do not attack civilians, as long as no one takes up arms against us. We have no ill will to the people. The sergeant major is correct, Sharp said. There are rules in war, and we follow them. While mistakes can happen in the fog of war, our job is to protect civilians. Otherwise, we are no better than the Empire, whoever they are. I have a question, Lelai leans forward and asked, looking directly at Sharp. I am a bit confused on one of your terms. Why do you call yourselves rangers? Sharp looks to the other rangers. Any of you want to take that? I think you got it, sir, Randy replied. Sharp looks at Lelai and then Rory. You understand they're different units in an army? Well yeah, she replied. You are not the first military I dealt with. You just a fancy at toys. Okay, Sharp said as he collects his thoughts. We are part of the 75th Ranger Regiment, a Special Forces Light Infantry. We are some of the bests within the army. We act as a reaction force on Earth. What he means is when people want to start something the army sends us to clean it up. Alicia said with a chuckle. Correct, Sharp said. This is the first time we ever been to a new world. We do not have a rule book for this. Every day we are writing the rule book. So the Rangers created the Vanguard program, a side unit within the 75th. Our job is to explore this world. I understand, Lelai said. You send the best to deal with the unknown. Interesting. She thinks about that and likes the answers the Major said. While she has a lot to learn before she decides she wants to stay with these people, her heart is telling her to trust them. To trust him. Before she can continue, she hears the table get slammed. She looks at Andrew and sees him frustrated. Okay, Andrew said. I have been waiting long enough. He then looks to Lelai. Can you show us some magic? Oh yeah, Jerry said. You used some kind of force shield to save the Major? Lelai blinks and looks around. 
I just used one of my spells to help deflect the flame blast. I had to use all my mana to do that. I am happy it worked. Leli looks at them all confused. Do you don't have magic? No, Andrew replied. He is right Leli. There is no magic where we are from. Sharp adds. During the invasion of Philadelphia, we have reports of these wizards doing something that looked like magic but we never could properly confirm it. Too much was going on. She sees all the rangers look at Leli now. They all look like children about to see something new. Right then she realizes these people are just as baffled about her world as she is with theirs. As Leli explains what magic and how it works she thinks about the situation. These people came here before they were attacked. They are like children and do not fully know what to do in Falmart. They have good intentions. She already knows those good intentions can only go so far. She and everyone else on Falmart understand how brutal these lands are and it is clear these people do not fully understand that yet. Sharp said that they do not kill the innocent but how long will that last if they do not understand who is good and bad? She looks up and sees Lela using her telekinesis to lift this tray. She sees the amazement in their eyes as more items on their table start to float up. She giggles and pats Selena's head giving her comfort. Reference, Gate, War of Two Worlds Part 1. Fortalness, May 8, 2025 1. The clock is 0953 and Ranger Team Vanguard 7 is currently getting ready for their mission. Doing their final checks and making sure they have all the supplies they need. They will not be the only team getting ready, Vanguard 3 and 6 will also be preparing. There is also another team there, called British. Rory is sitting on the hood of one of the JTLV. She is watching as the soldiers putting supplies into them. She sees Major Sharp and Lieutenant Sarah talking to the other team leads. It is interesting that in their world everyone is human, but they name themselves based on their respective kingdoms, or as they call it, nations. The ones she has been dealing with call themselves American, the so-called leader of the free world. The British are supposed to be their closest ally. Same with the Canadians and the French who have arrived. She also finds it interesting that in their world these Americans are the dominant power, just like the empire of this world. She has yet to get to spend a lot of time with these other nations that are coming through the gate, but it seems there is this mutual respect between them. She wants to find out if these Americans are just like the empire or different. In her 900 years, she remembers a time before the empire. They started out from a small city called Sadra 600 years ago and expanded from there, brutally conquering nearby lands and kingdoms. The vassals they have now are more like slave states that the emperor can use at will. She finds it funny that the empire is the most powerful power in this world. They have expanded far and wide, conquering not just human cities but other races and creatures too, goblin kingdoms many different elves tribes, the warrior bunnies and other hybrid races. And right then, a loud noise comes there that they call speakers. Attention, this is Lieutenant General Stanford. As you all know today is June 6, 81 years ago, an allied force invaded France in the largest assault in human history. Over a hundred thousand men stormed the beaches, dropped from the air to begin the greatest crusade against the Axis who wanted to engulf the world in darkness. This was the beginning of allied forces pushing back against the forces of evil and tyranny. Since that day, the flame of liberty has stood tall against the Red Menace during the Cold War. It defeated the evil empires of communism which had the sole goal was to enslave the world. Today is a new chapter in the course of liberty as we enter this new unknown world. Just like our great-grandfathers who storm beaches and our grandfathers fight against communism, you are the first to visit and explore this alien world with all its wonders and mystery, facing the unknown, fighting against a new threat the likes humanity has ever seen. Just like then, we stand together with our great allies, preserving the free world from a second attack of Philadelphia. Remember the courage of the brave souls who fought 81 years ago on that day and when you are out there exploring this unknown world, either facing the legions of the empire or building relations with the common locals, just like every step they took on Normandy.
Every step you take will create history. Let us always remember our values that were guaranteed on that day and let them guide us through this new chapter. Stanford out. She hears this and then jumps off the hood. She looks around and sees all the soldiers from that world standing tall, saluting, or celebrating. The message clearly was some kind of historical moment point to them. A time in their world's history that seems like a turning point in their history. She looks over to Randy. The team pathfinder who was right next to her. Hey Randy, what was that all about? He looked over after hearing his name, putting his M4A1 down. Today is D-Day, the day of days. The war the general was talking about is considered the largest and most deadly war in our history. Specialist Jerry William leans over the gunner port on top of the vehicle, overhearing the question. Yeah, over 75 million died in that conflict. 70 million? She said in shocked because of how high that number is. She would give a big smirk, thinking how her god Emroy would have loved that. She then looks back at them and sees that they looked a little concerned and afraid of her. Good, always good to keep them a little afraid of her. Don't worry boys, but what happened? They look at each other and then back at her, kind unsure what to do. Randy then speaks breaking the sudden silence. R. Well there was this alliance of nations called the Axis, like your empire you can say. They were trying to conquer and enslave the world and install a racial hierarchy. Yeah, after nearly five years of fighting, an alliance of nations, led by us, the Russians and the British. We invaded the continent Europe and liberated them from the bad guys. Jerry would add to that. Interesting. Is that how you see yourself today? Here? She asked all happily. That is way above my pay grade ma'am, but I will say this Mississippi. Rory. We are not conquering. We are liberators. We make mistakes like anyone one else, but we do not conquer people. Randy states as he finishes the final preparations on his vehicle. Before the conversation could continue, they hear Major Sharp start calling out. All right everyone, we don't get paid by the hour. We got a job to do. Load up and roll out. As everyone loads up into the vehicles, she gets into the one with Sharp, the command vehicle. She could tell that these groups of people are going to be incredibly fun, with a lot of adventures and battles. On top of that, there must be a reason why they are here, and why has the gate has opened now. Reference https colon slash slash shim dot wattpad dot com slash 112 ffb 3 f 50 f 2 a 3 b 165 c f 5 d 276 f 347 f 0 f 320 a slash 6 8 7 4 7 4 7 0 7 3 3 a 2 f 2 f 7 3 3 3 2 e 616 d 616 17 A 6 F 6 E 6 1 7 7 7 3 2 E 636 F 6 D 2 F 7 7 6 1 7 4 7 4 7 0 6 1 6 4 2 D 6 D 6 5 6 4 6 9 6 1 2 D 7 3 6 5 7 2 7 6 6 9 6 3 6 5 2 F 5 3 7 4 6 F 7 2 7 9 4 9 6 D 6 1 one six seven six five two F four hundred and forty four C six six three six two D five six four seven seven six four F two D six F five two five three seven seven three D three D two D three seven three O three four three six three O three eight three O three seven three three two E three one three six three seven three two three two six four six five three two six two three one three eight six four three one six five three four three two three five three four three two three two three 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 eight three nine three seven three seven three four three nine three two two e six a seven thousand and sixty seven note hello happy d day i wanted to write this one like this to celebrate this special day let us always remember what they have done then so we can live like we do today one holiday note Holidays will not match the story calendar. They are considered holiday specials. The events in the chapters are canon, just the real life dates are not. It is for fun and the special moment. Gate, War of Two Worlds Part 1. Lawsis, May 8th.
2025 in the town of Lorsis. Princess Pina Colada is currently in a tavern, together with her R. Grego Aldo, Normico Idlu, and her servant Hamilton Unoror. The four of them are warriors of her Rose Order of Knights unit. They were forced to stop in this town because of sudden heavy rain, as it had become too dangerous for them to continue. Well, I hope this does not slow us down tomorrow, she said, just speaking what is on her mind. It would suck to miss the war because of some rain. Do not worry princess, Hamilton replied, the rain is only a delay, it will only be a matter of time before we get to Italica, said to her, trying to reassure her, I know Hamilton, but this also means the rest of the Rose Order of Knights will be delayed too, if we are going to ride these intruders from the other side of the gate, we will need all of us. Every day they occupy Alnus Hill is an embarrassment for the Empire, she states. Grey walks up and then sat across her. He then took a sip of his beer from the mug. Do not worry princess, the battle will come. Do not let your eagerness get the better of yourself. She glances at Grey as she takes the mug. Grey has been in her life since she was ten. He was her first and longest mentor. He helped start the Rose Order Knights Academy and trained her in the arts of war. I know you want to prove yourself and your knights to your father, Grey said before looking to his side, becoming annoyed. Yes. She mumbles and then takes a drink. She quickly spits it out. That tastes nasty. Grey chuckles. It is the common people drink, princess. People down here cannot afford the luxurious drink. She looks at her beer peasant drinks. Very nasty. She hears Norma flirting at the next table. While she knows what he is doing, she glances over out of boredom. Norma is laughing with one of the female humanoid cat people, slapping his hand on her butt. Hey kitty. He then gives a flirty me out to her. She rolls her eyes at the sight. That is the third tonight. Plus, the other ten from the other towns. I am shocked he doesn't have any bastards. Grey glances towards him. That is not professional for a knight. Well, he is still our best knight. She mumbles. She thinks back to her training. While the Rose Knights are dominated by daughters of noble families, there have been some men. She beat them all like Herm Castle. That made her think that she was the best. That was before they betrayed her to suck up to her older brother Zorz. Then Norma came around and he berated her in a duel. This was the first time she lost in training and he said that he was not going to go easy on her because she is royalty. That was when she figured out that she and her knights were not being taken seriously as real knights. That everyone was letting her win and since then, she wanted to prove herself to everyone that she is a real knight. Norma just waves him off not caring about his objection. Ah, it is a bit of fun. It is why I joined the Rose Knights after all, all the pretty ladies, he said, winking at Pina. Norma laughs a little after saying that. He takes out a coin and puts it between the Catwoman breasts. I am in trouble right now but later we can continue this fun. Okay my lord, the Catwoman said with a giggle. She watches him make a fool of himself. I just don't understand men. They fall apart at the sight of boobs. Even the most honorable and mannered of men fall apart at the sight. Women have a powerful effect on men, Princess Grey said. However, what Norma is doing is not professional. At least he respected me when it counted. She mumbles. After her first duel four years ago, she offered him to join the Rose Knights. While he joined for not the noblest reasons. He never treated the female knight as less. Norma walks over and sits across Pina and please, don't worry. We will crush these new enemies, chase them back to their world and conquer the ladies. Norma, this is serious, she comments. We have one chance at this. If we fail, the Rose Knights will be a joke forever. Grey jumps into the conversation. We should focus more on the enemy than your reputation. The only thing we know about this enemy is that they defeated the invasion force. Also, the hundred thousand force that was defending the hill. We still haven't heard from any news from our vessels. Hamilton adds. This is definitely an interesting time for the Empire. Yeah, yeah. You're acting like they haven't lost anything either. Didn't our latest scout report that the hill only lightly manned? They have to be at their limits, Norma stated as he looked at some other women. Before anyone could comment, they would all hear a laugh coming from a nearby table. 
A man with a big mug is looking down at the table. You act like victory is certain and yet you haven't faced them in battle. They have no honor and they give none. Here that Pina stands up, getting angry. Watch how you speak peasant. We will defeat this enemy. The empire will defeat them. We never lost a war, against all the races of our world. The man just laughs. He starts to mumble nonsense. This man's attitude angers her. How can this commoner be so insulting? Watch your tongue, she said. I am the princess of the empire. I will. Gray places his hand on her shoulder, to calm her down. Soldier. I take it you were at Alnus Hill? She looks at Gray confused. She looks back at the crazy drunk man and notices he is wearing an imperial uniform. That is when she realizes that this man is an imperial soldier who has abandoned his ranks. The drunk soldier takes another long drink and looks over to them, clearly not caring about their status. I was there. I am all that is left of my unit, he said, collecting himself. They came in the middle of the night. These monsters were in armored, moving siege engines. I don't know what they were. But they came and just slaughtered everyone around the gate. I remember watching the carnage. One of our firebombs from our trebuchet hit their armored wagons and... Nothing. No damage. All these others. War engines came through and their warriors came out of them, firing some kind of invisible magic, killing all of us. Our shields, our armor was worthless. We were better off naked one he said, taking a long drink until his mug is empty at their table. It became quiet as everyone tried to understand or believe what he was saying. Norma spoke first. How many did you kill? How long was the battle? The man shakes his head, reliving the memories. I still do not understand. The battle lasted for an hour, maybe two. Everyone was dead. I remember seeing General Eldan taking his cavalry, flaking. There were so few of the enemy. And yet we were all just wiped out. The man continues talking, splitting between talking to himself and their table. He and his three thousand horsemen got the closest but were slaughtered. And how did you end up here? Hamilton asked him. He just looks at her and then laughs again. He stands up, clearly drunk. We're all going to die. And then he starts to wobble off, drunk. She stands up angrily again. Hey. Get back here you deserter. How dare you say something like that. Norma, go get that man so he can be crucified. Gray takes a sip from her beer and then sets his hub down hard, clearly wanting their attention. Calm down princess. Let him be. She looked at him confused. Why? He is a disgrace. We got everything we needed to know from him. He is no longer of any use for us. He is just a drunk sad man now. Leave him be and let us focus on tomorrow. Gray said, thinking about the new information. She thinks about what the deserter said. She sits down and debates if what he said is true. Her nerves are high as she sees this her big chance to become famous. While her brother Zorzel gets everything. He wishes with no effort, she has had to work and push for everything. Finally, she will get to see battle and have a name for herself. That man is full of it, Norma said. He looks at the three and sees how serious they look. You don't actually believe a word he said right? He is crazy. Crazy yes but he is not lying, Gray said. I have been in war, I have seen battle. Battle can do that to someone. Watching your men get killed all around you can break a soldier. Now I do not know how much of what he said is true but that is not the point. The lesson is this. We are facing an enemy that directly threatens the empire. Reference https colon slash slash shim dot wattpad dot com slash 112 ffb 3 f 50 f 2 a 3 b 165 c f 5 d 276 f 347 f 0 f 320 a slash 6 8 7 4 7 4 7 0 7 3 3 a 2 f 2 f 7 3 3 3 2 e 616 d 616 
Chapter 1 Gate, War of Two Worlds Part 1 Italica, May 10, 2025 Italica is a major trading hub for the Empire. Two of the Empire's major highways connect to the city. One is the Appia Highway that goes east to west, crossing the rich farmlands of the Greater Elias region to Sedra, the other being the Roma Highway that follows the Roma River. It moves south from Italica to the port town of Butum on the Blue Sea. These two highways are the heart of connecting the Empire. Italica sits right at the joint of these two highways making it one of the crown jewels counts within the empire. 5,000 imperial citizens live in Italica. Most of the population is human however Italica has a decent size of command races like elves, necos or cat people, lions, bunnies, and more. While not one of the largest cities within the empire it is one of the wealthiest towns and has been a target of large hordes and bandits. Normally the empire would have at least one legion defending this important city however. Most of the men were sent off to fight the enemy from the gate. Since the war with the warriors from the other side of the gate, most of those soldiers have either died in the battle of or deserted into the countryside. Also, there have been reports of survivors forming outlaw gangs and raiding parties, raiding towns for food, and promised riches. It has been two days since Princess Pina Colada and her three fellow Rose Order Knights reached Italico and in those two days, the situation has fallen apart. A massive horde of outlaws attacks the city on the second day, nearly overwhelming the defenders. These were not normal bandits but deserters. This made them well equipped and well trained. Her comrade Norma quickly took command of the wall defenses, barely repelling the attackers. After killing dozens of them, the outlaws withdrew back to the forest line. This isn't good, we don't have the manpower to withhold another attack, Gray said, looking at the city militia. Most of these men are traders, farmers, sailors, and other non-combat trades. None are soldiers. Norma is cleaning the blood off his sword, just arriving from the wall. He is all serious, not in his usual cocky self. Yeah, I bet some of the outlaws regards to this place. They seem to know the city defenses well. She walks along the eastern wall as she thinks. She looks down and sees the women tending to their wounded husbands and sons. She notices many of the men are older or younger. The Count, Colt Formal took all the fighting men to the other worlders and died in battle, she states. This means we are probably the only professionally trained fighters. And let's not forget that full Colt outlawed the guilds leaving no one to hire for help. Norma states. Hiring mercenaries have never been an ideal thing, Gray said. I found trusting soldiers who only value money usually ends badly. Friends today and enemies tomorrow. After listening to how bad the situation is, she asked, well, what is the plan then? She somewhat regretted saying that out loud as she noticed some of the peasants overhearing her. She is the princess, after all, she is supposed to have all the answers and lead her troops not running around scared to death and asking questions. She is already seeing how different the world is outside the city's tall wells in Sedra. She has been outside the city before, however never far without being heavily guarded. Grey looks to her and speaks up first. Nothing right now. 
They were just weakening our defenses, Princess, Norma, and I will go to the wall and see to the situation. You and Hamilton go get some rest in the palace. She takes a deep breath and nods. Few hours later, Princess. Princess wake up, we have a situation. Pino awakes as someone speaks into her ear. When she wakes up, she is seeing her servant Hamilton. What is it? She mumbles. She then quickly raises up and then gets a sudden jolt of energy after realizing the context of her situation. Are we under attack? Her sudden burst of energy scared Hamilton. She has always been a fragile girl, easy to startle. She jumps back to the end of the bed. Wow. Our princess. I. I do not know. We have a situation at the south gate. She rubs her eyes, waking herself up. Once feeling awake. She then looked up at Hamilton. I don't understand. Are those bandits attacking or what? Hamilton gets off the bed and walks away to grab Pina some clothes and armor. Once she grabs them, she brings them over to her. Ah oh, no, it is someone else. Three strange looking, wagon things, came up to the south gate, and there are a few strange looking people wearing weird green clothes. Gray needs to speak to you about it. They are just sitting there. With Hamilton's help, she gets into her armor. Once ready, both rush to the south gate, as they walk through the town. You can feel the stress and fear in the air. Some of the people, trying to get ready for the next battle but most others are simply scared to death of the coming attack. Most of them are probably not going to survive the next attack. Once she gets to the gate, one of the remaining guards guides her to the peephole in the wooden gate. She sees these strange green looking metal wagons. Where are the horses that pull them? We didn't see horses, Norma said. They rode up like that and stopped. That is when she sees one of these people on top of one, manning some grey pointed tool. There are two more, standing by their green wagon, looking at the city. They seem to be talking to each other. Interesting. They must be from the gate. So, they seem to be human. Princess, what do you think they are going to do? Are they going to attack? Hamilton asked, scared of the situation. She looks at her, a little surprised that she is scared but then thinks about it. Right now, all they know about these people are rumors about these people. Also, from that drunk soldier from that tavern one was only half true she knows she should worry about them. We are in no position to fight another enemy right now, she said. The bandits could attack any time now. We should attack them before they attack us. Do you think they came to attack us, princess? Hamilton asked. Why does this have to happen now? I don't know. I only see three of these wagons and only a few soldiers. Not an attack. Ing force. Oh my god. She replied but then loses the ability to speak for a second after seeing what she just saw. There is at this short blue haired girl with a staff. A young magic user. No problem. But the next girl she sees is Rory Mercury. She takes a step away from the peak hole seeing Rory. It is Rory Mercury. Why is she with them? Are they allies? What? Hamilton yells in pure shock at that news. What is she doing with them? Why would she even help the gate soldiers? I don't know. But we are dead. We cannot fight the bandits, the other worlders, and Rory. She comments in a nervous tone. Princess, Grey said, take a deep breath and look at the situation. Do not allow your mind to add information that is not there. Judge what you can see, and work from there. She takes a new breath to calm herself down. She counted only three enemy soldiers and three of those green wagons. They did not look that big so they cannot be holding armies in them. So far, they have not acted aggressively, and they came from the south, not the east where the bandits came from. Maybe they are working together. Those bandits might be helping the gate people too, Hamilton stated trying to make sense of the situation. No, she yells as she gets an idea. She looks through the peephole again, trying to make sense of the situation. The bandits attacked the east gate. If Rory and her new friend are working together then why didn't they fight with them? There are so few of them and there is a magic user too. Maybe they came here for other reasons. As she said her theory, she begins to see two of those stranger looking soldiers and the two girls walking down this way. They're coming. Two of them plus the magician and Rory. Hamilton thinks of those facts. 
How can we be sure? Are they going to ask us to surrender? She then thinks of what it might be like to surrender to these gate soldiers. If the rumors are true on how brutal these men fight, she can only imagine how becoming their slave would be like. Would it be like living under the goblins or more like the centaurs? I don't know however we need to do something, she said as she thinks. If they are as brutal as the deserter said then they would have just attacked. Maybe they were attacked by the bandits too and need help. You are not considering working with them? Norma said, not liking the idea. We cannot fight on two fronts right now, she replied. What if they are here with peaceful intentions? If we attack now, then we are the aggressors. But princess, what if they are here to attack us? Hamilton asked, worried. She knows that could be a risk. It is a 50-50 situation and she does not know who is right. It does not matter if they are hostile. We cannot fight a second attack against the bandits anyway. We are screwed no matter what we do. Our best and the only hope is that these are the worlders will be friendly. After looking away from the people, Pina looks around the area and sees that everyone is waiting for her to make a decision. There is just no way to tell what their intentions are without more information. If she assumes wrong, the city will fall. However, the city is going to fall anyway when those bandits come back. If they come with peaceful intentions, we cannot afford to fight another enemy right now. As she hears them walking up to the gate and hear their voices, hearing the blue-haired girl talking about the history of the city, the male who seems to be in change seems to be taking interest in the topic. He is wearing these strange uniforms, with all these strange pockets all over. Out of all the towns in the empire, Italica is known to be the most. What is that L word you use? The blue hair girl asked. Liberal? The man replied. It is not liberal, the term is classical liberalism too. Yes that, the blue hair girl said. I found that topic interesting. Italica is close to something like that. Being more open to different people however they are seen as wealthy but backward people to the rest of the empire. When they get close, she pushes the gate door open with much excitement, wanting to make a good first impression. Welcome to Italica Travelers. Please. Ah. Wah. As she looks, she realizes one of the soldiers on the ground, holding his head. Right then, she realizes she just pushed the door into one of the soldiers. Ouch. That hurt, the man said as he slowly sits up. Reference https colon slash slash shim dot wattpad dot com slash 112 ffb 3 f 50 f 2 a 3 b 165 c f 5 d 276 f 347 f 0 f 320 a slash 6 8 7 4 7 4 7 0 7 3 3 8 2 f 2 f 7 3 3 3 2 e 616 d 616 17 A 6 F 6 E 6 1 7 7 7 3 2 E 636 F 6 D 2 F 7 7 6 1 7 4 7 4 7 0 6 1 6 4 2 D 6 D 6 5 6 4 6 9 6 1 2 D 7 3 6 5 7 2 7 6 6 9 6 3 6 5 2 F 5 3 7 4 6 F 7 2 7 9 4 9 6 D 6 1 one six seven six five two F four hundred and forty four C six six three six two D five six four seven seven six four F two D six F five two five three seven seven three D three D two D three seven three O three four three six three O three eight three O three seven three three two E three one three six three seven three two three two six four six five three two six two three one three eight six four three one six five three four three two three five three four three two three two three 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 eight three nine three seven three seven three four three nine three two two e six a seven thousand and sixty seven one chapter twelve two classical liberalism is a political ideology and a branch of liberalism which advocates civil liberties under the rule of law with an emphasis on economic freedom not to be confused with the term liberal. This is the core foundation of all Western civilization. Gate, War of Two Worlds Part 1, Italica, May 9th.
2025. After a short alteration at the south gate, the city guards agreed to let the strangers through the gate. Sharp stands inside the gate as he watches Sergeant Major Randy Dodson bring in the three JLTVs. In front of him is Jerry, the team media. You should be fine sir, Jerry said. Good thing you have your helmet on, just don't make this a habit. Leli walks up, looking directly at him. Your helmet is impressive. Because of how light and lack of metal I honestly didn't think it would be useful. At least we know his head can take a beating, Rory replied. Some of the rangers laugh at Rory's comments. He looks over to the woman who opened the door. She looks like the leadership of the city. Her assistant called her Princess Pina Colada. She apologized many times, scared that she just started a war. I am so sorry about before, Pina said begging for him not to get angry. Rory responds first, don't worry princess, he probably deserves it. Having her hand to her side, she then gives her a death glare, implying not to dare to do anything again. He watches them both, it seems like they know of each other in some manner. Rory is clearly laying down the law. When Rory told her that apostles are usually respected, and their presences bring great weight. This is the first time he sees this outside of Alness. He finds it strange seeing a girl in a 12-year-old body giving orders and adults obeying. Pina nods in agreement. There will be no problem with us Mistress Rory. How long have you been with these people Rory? Let me think. Rory mumbles and places her figure on her chin. About two weeks now, it has been horrible. They have so many tasty sweets and drinks. Their beds are so comfy I think it is torture. Rory, he states in a commanding voice. He glares at Rory. Be nice. Rory giggled at him and fist bumped Alicia. Okay Major Sharp. Whatever you say. He sees Pina and her three knights look at him and Rory in disbelief. What? Are you saying that Rory takes orders from you? Hamilton asked baffled by the thought. Of course, he said in a commanding voice, making sure they know who is in control of the situation. I am in command of this unit. My name is Major Sharp of the United States Army, Vanguard 7 of the 75th Ranger Regiment of the NATO Expeditionary Force. Sharp takes his helmet and places it between his arms. He looks back at Pina. But, yeah, someone somewhere would agree with that statement. He said about getting hit on the head, wanting to relax the situation. He finishes thinking about memory. Sharp points to his team that is standing with him. This is Rory Mercury, Lelai La Lelina, Private First Class Alicia Moore, Specialist Jerry William, and Sergeant Major Randy Dodson. He then joins. That's a mouthful. Rory points out with a giggle. Sharp. Everyone here knows who I am. I am the Apostle of Emery after all. Rory comments but was surprised and pleased that he included her in the introduction. Pina takes a deep breath. She straightens herself up and looks more royalty. We should make this more formal. I am Princess Pina Colada, leader of the Rose Order of Knights. I am currently in charge of this city. It is good to meet you. Hamilton walks to Pina's side, scared of their strange equipment. What brings you all here, to Italica? Are you here to take our souls Rory? Not right now, Rory said. He shots Rory a commanding glare, giving her a warning. Sorry. Rory mumbles and looks away to study the town. Leli, she said. Leli looks at him for approval. Are you sure you don't want to? When she gets an approving nod, she looks back. We came here to trade. My friends wanted to see cities and economics is life in this world. What kind of trading? Hamilton asked. Before Leli responds he places her hand on her shoulder, so she does not reply. That is our business right now. We notice the town was attacked. Pina nods. Correct. We are under attack by bandits. Wait. You came all this way just to trade? She suddenly asked, shocked by what he said. Out of all the things he could say, that seemed to be the most unlikely. Yes ma'am, he responds, in his regimental tone. Is there a place we can park our vehicles? Vehicles? Americans? Pina asked herself. You call wagons vehicles? Ah yeah, Hamilton. Oh yes, you can park those wagons at the market square. There should be enough room there, as long as the bandits attack there shouldn't be much market activity, 
Hamilton answers in a hast. She then looks at the metal wagons and then back to Sharp and Rory. Do. Do they need any food? There is a small chuckle from the rangers, thinking what she said was funny. No. They do not eat food, Lelai responds, being the only one who did not chuckle. Okay, he said. Can we go into the city princess? R. Yes. Pina replied. He nods at the approval to come inside. He and the other three start heading towards their vehicles. Alicia, tell Command that we are entering Italica. He orders Alicia as they walk away. As the other worlders walk away, Pina takes a deep breath and leans against the wall. She watches as their armored wagons start to drive away without horses, heading into the city. Well, that was a near disaster. Actually, I thought you handled it very well, Gray said as he walks up to her. Really? Pina asked as she looks up at Gray. The first contact we had with those Americans was me hurting their leader. Maybe the Senate was right. I am just a hopeless woman. Hamilton rushes over to her and kneels to her side, holding her hand. No princess. We are here. Everything will be okay. I believe in you. Listen to Hamilton princess, Gray said. It seems like they understood the mistake and they don't seem to be worried about us. I think they mean what they said, coming here to trade and to learn. They must be just as confused as we are. It might be because Rory is on their side. Hamilton adds as she stands up. Why in the world would she do such a thing? I have no idea, she replied as she places her hand on her forehead as she thinks. That changes everything. If they converted Rory to their side this will be harder than I thought. We will need the full might of our regional forces to fight her and them. That is when Grey walks right up to Pina and speaks into her ear. Did you see who was in those wagons? She glares at him. No, I did not. I was a little busy preventing a war. Take a look, Grey comments. She signs and then forces herself to look over to the vehicles. In one of the vehicles, she then sees this other girl sitting in one of the chairs. So, it's some child. Why is that so shocking to you after today? I am not completely sure, however. I believe that might be Princess Selina of the Edra's kingdom. Grey said, thinking. Pina looks again and her eyes widen after coming to the same realization. Wait. Of the Edra's kingdom? We conquered them already and their nobles agreed to be our vassal. She should be on her way to the capital city as a gift to my stupid brother right now. Why would she be with them? I do not know but while they are here, we should try and find out. Maybe they have formed a secret alliance. Grey responds. Until then, it will be wise to keep this to ourselves. She begins to have a headache. The situation seems to have completely fallen apart. Edras is a six-month journey on foot. There is no way these other worlders could know about them yet. According to the blue hair girl, they didn't know about this place. She takes a deep breath. We can't deal with them right now. We have to focus on the bandits. After that, we can worry about these Americans and find out the truth. When our friends arrive, we will outnumber them. Hamilton said, they should be a day or two away. She nods as she thinks. Her knights should have been here by now however the seasonal heavy rain delayed them. She knows her priority right now is surviving, and once the rest of my rose knights arrive, we can betray these other world as Americans, she said as she reflects on the situation. Maybe Rory is pretending to work for them, gathering information. Good idea princess, Hamilton said, but they do have strange and scary equipment. She places her hand on her head and catches her breath. She loves Hamilton but sometimes her fear gets the better of her. That is why she has always been her servant than a true knight. Do not get so scared Hamilton, she said. She then looks at her mentor Grey. He does not seem pleased with her plan. The princess is correct, Grey adds. We don't know much about their equipment, but I did notice they don't wear armor. Just these strange thick clothes. Still. I recommend against any betrayal against them until we know more. If they just came to trade and turn them into an enemy right now, we will be undone. And you are assuming Rory is acting as a spy. If she is not the Rose Knights cannot stop her off. I understand, she said as she takes a deep breath. I just want my first mission to go smoothly. I just want to win. This is war princess, Grey said as he places his hands on her back. There is no such thing as a smooth mission. 
and victory must be earned. Selena is sitting in the back seat of the Command JLTV, right next to Rory. On the drive here, taking two days, she heard the Americans saying it should have taken only seven hours. However they got stuck in a rainstorm. Lela states that these rains were common this time of year. Even though the trip took an extra day as planned, Lela did state it usually would take four to seven days to get from the Cone Forest to Italica. She was impressed by the speed. On the trip she has been watching more of Sharp shows on his tablet device. Right now, her personal favorite has been the Transformers show, mainly because he loves it so much and that was the first thing they did together. Once they got to the city, she has been very worried about the Empire's army, the memories of being forced back into slavery by those legionnaires. Edras is far to the west for people here to know who she is, however Pina is royalty too and royalty seems to know each other. She remembers those six months of walking here, still having nightmares about how she was treated during that trip. The only source of comfort right now is that these people she is with will not allow them to take her. It is okay Selena, Rory said to her, noticing how nervous she is, if anyone lays a figure on you, I will cut them down, you are one of my underlings now. As they drive through the city, they see the townsfolk all looking at them, wondering who they are and what they are in. They all seem dirty and scared to death, they also seem to not know what to make of the Americans. All right people, let's get to the market, remember though. We are here as guests, but they are still the enemy. Do not engage unless engaged yourself. Stay out of trouble and no one goes alone. Major Sharp tells his men over the radio. Johnson and Randy, once we get to the market, team meeting, listen to the Major. Randy adds, I have seen this situation back in Syria and Afghanistan. During a crisis, you never know what someone will do. Stay together. Once he is down talking over the radio. He leans back into the vehicle to face the girls. Selena, as long as we are here, I want you to stay close, got it? I don't want you going out alone here, stay close to me, or Rory. She smiles, feeling far more comfortable and safer now. While his tone seems harsh, she already has seen what he would do to someone when he freed her. Yes, sir. She then smiles back at him but then they hear Alicia speak out loud. Oh God. This place reminds me of an HBO or Stars show, Alicia comments as she looks out her window. Like Spartacus, Andrew asked as he drove. That is the show I was thinking about, Alicia said. This place is disgusting. When they get to the marketplace, they will see normal market things like food, drinks, tools, etc. But they will also see men and women of all ages as slaves, standing on tables or locked in cages. She looks around and sees not just human slaves but other races. She has seen this sight hundreds of times. She sees Lelai and Rory and they look numb to the sight. However, she can see the horrific look on the Americans. They seem to be struggling to understand what they are witnessing. I thought you said this place was more like us? Alicia asked Lelai. That is correct. Lelai answers. Alicia. Rory adds, this is far better than most places I have been to. Most places are far more brutal as those societies consider themselves better. Lelai nods, in Italica, you are not allowed to abuse their slaves. You must feed them and cannot remove children from their slave parents. It is imperial law that you cannot outlaw the institution. Wrong is wrong Lelai, Andrew states, it doesn't matter if you beat you, wife, with a fist or with a stuffed animal. It is still wrong. Look at that though. Those over there are not human. Steel comments. That looks like a cat and that looks like. Well I don't know. That is a bunny? They have bunnies? Yes, Lelai said. From what I understand, on earth it is just humans who live there. Falmart has dozens of different races. Humans and elves are the most common, but you will see many others like cat people, fairies, deer people, and more. While it is not common some interbreed. Andrew eyes a cat Baroznup before getting nudged by Sharp to stop. Sorry, they look like Nekos to me. Nekos? Lelai asked, confused. It is the Japanese term for cat people, Andrew explains. It is like this in every anime. So why are most of the slaves cats or Nekos? Alicia asked. Cats are considered the most exotic of all the races. 
Rory states, unlike most other races they are weaker and not warlike, they were easier for the empire to conquer and do as they like, most people with wealth like to have them as a maid or as a sex slave, being more exotic but recently bunnies have been taking over that market in the past few years. This is depressing, Alicia comments, she can feel this horrible feeling coming from inside the Americans in the vehicle. Is this really not normal where you come from Sharp? He takes a deep breath hearing the question. Not in my country. Well not in most countries. Our world banished slavery about 150 to 200 years ago, but there are still some bad places who try to do it. We try to stop them though. Alicia speaks up afterward. We ended slavery a few hundred years ago, starting with the British Empire. It took nearly a hundred years and lots of wars but most of the world has banned it. She thinks for a second. So yeah, in our world we do not like the subject. Wait, if you are the dominant power of your world, why don't you just force everyone to stop? Lela asked. There is this country called Libya, one of the major hot spots of slavery back on earth, Sharp replied. It is our fault they became a slave state. Back in 2011 one. The French, British and we overthrew the dictator hoping to bring in peace and democracy. He then looks at Rory and Lely. We easily won the war however it all fell apart. Power does not mean we can force our values onto a people. You have to be careful with such power. Don't forget that Al-Qaeda too killed our ambassador there three. Alicia adds. That really screwed up our plans to help them. I remember watching that when I was a kid. Because there are billions of people in our world. And while we are the dominant power, we also cannot be in every city everywhere. That would spark another world war. We do try though. A rude group about 10 years ago called ISIS-4 and they were trying to recreate the Islamic slave trade. We were able to push them back, stopping them. While the institution is still on earth, it is mostly supported by Rouge organizations. As Andrew drives, he adds to the conversation. Sir. Weren't you in Mexico fighting human traffickers? He looks over to Andrew but remains quiet, not pleased by the question. He then just points out the front window. Park there. What is Mex? She was about to say before feeling a hand on her right shoulder. She turns around and sees that it is Rory. She looks at her, confused by seeing her shake her head, placing a figure on her lips telling her to be quiet. Clearly. Rory did not want her to continue the subject. The JLTVs roll up into the marketplace and stop. Everyone then gets out and begins to set up camp. Sharp gets out of his command vehicle and takes a good look around the town and thinks about his options. Both 2nd Lieutenant Charles Johnson and Major Sergeant Randy Dodson walk up to him, reporting for the team meeting. Johnson takes a glance around. So, what is the plan? We hold up here with them, he said. Sir, why didn't we just turn around? Why are we involved? Randy asked, confused about why he is getting us involved. Because our mission is here, he said. And more important is that there is a large enemy force out there. If we were attacked while out there, we would be surrounded. But sir, Johnson said, confused. We have superior weapons and their arrows cannot penetrate the JLRV's armor. The Major is correct Lieutenant, Randy states. We are a small unit. If a few hundred attacks us superior weapons won't be enough. He can see Randy combat experience kicking him. He is glad that he sees things his way. This city is scared and is struggling to hold back these bandits, he said. Based on the smoke at the East Gate they are coming from that direction. They must have been in the thousands if they can overwhelm this city's defenses. He then glances up at the smoke in the distance. Because of the smoke that means their scouts probably saw us. If we leave now there would be no way. We will survive. The roads need time to dry. Truth is. This is the safest and only option. He sees Johnson impressed. That is very well thought out sir. Especially off the top of your head. He smirks. He has heard his men gossiping that he has seen combat. I have had enough kings and generals five. History Marker 6 shows about ancient warfare to have some basic ideas. On top of that, this is a big PR7 mission. The brass wants us to help people in need. Randy adds, but what do we do? I don't know yet. I need more information. 
Lieutenants take control of the convoy. Keep everyone here and safe and be ready to pull out if we need to. See what information you can get from the locals around here. Sergeant Major was going to go check out the East Gate and figure out the situation. Take Jerry, Andrew, and Lely. We leave at five. Sharp orders. Both then salute and head off, carrying out their assignments. That is when Lely walks up. He looks over to his left and sees her. What's up? I take it you overheard our little meeting? Before Lely responds she looks up. I see three dark clouds, but they are leaving so I don't expect any more rain. He laughs hearing that. He likes to make smart-ass comments like that but what he loves about Lely is how genuine she is, not understand the context of what he said. Yes, I was just coming over to see if I could provide any help, Lely asked. I see you want me to come along already? What could provide your soldiers couldn't? Your ability to pay attention to details, he quickly replied. I noticed that back at the gate, you already know a lot about us. And you know how to explain things to others very well. You have proven yourself in my eyes. But I can't force you. I should ask you first. Lely thinks about what he said and then smiles. She enjoys feeling valued on their team. With all their power and advanced weapons, she can still be useful. I would be honored to help. Reference, https colon slash slash shim dot wattpad dot com slash 112 ffb 3 f 50 f 2 a 3 b 165 c f 5 d 276 f 347 f 0 f 320 a slash 687474707333a2 f2 f7 3332e 616d 617a6 f6 e61777 32e636 f6 d2 f7761747461617 2d6 d6564696126132 7367266963 d one Libyan civil war, 2011, NATO intervened to assist local rebels to overthrow the government, to Al-Qaeda. Islamic terrorist organization that is anti-West. 3. 2012 Benghazi attack where Ansar al-Sharia killed U.S. Ambassador J. Christopher Stevens. For Islamic State of Iraq and Syria. U.S.-led war combined joint task force, Operation Inherent Resolve. 5. Kings and Generals is a YouTube battle history channel. 6. History Marker is a YouTube battle history channel. 7. PR equals public relations. Gate, War of Two Worlds Part 1. Italica. May 9, 2025. The Ranger team led by Major Sharp reaches the city Eastern Gate. Once they get there, they notice how bad the situation is. Everything is pure chaos. Bodies are being taken away in wagons and new barricades being rebuilt. My God. What happened here? Jerry asked, speaking more out loud than a direct question to anyone. He looks over by this building and sees people that are sick and wounded. Many of them are just boys who were called upon to defend the city. Sir? He looks towards Sharp, wanting permission to help them. Go, Sharp said to him, knowing what he is about to ask, but don't get carried away. Stay in sight and don't go crazy on your supplies. We will need them later. Jerry nods and dashes off to where some wounded men were at. Lely watches as Jerry rushes off to a group of wounded people and then looks to Sharp. Jerry is the team medic. Why is he going to help them? 
They are your enemy. Because they are our enemy, that does not mean we do not help the civilians. We have a treaty called the Geneva Convention back on Earth. It is a guideline for war. We do not intently attack civilians, prisoners, and wounded, if we can. We help. He then looks at her with limitations of course. But why? What benefit is it to you? Lelai asked, not fully understanding it. I am not a soldier. However the rules of war say you either kill or enslave your enemies. Or are you planning to make them your subjects? Randy holds up his hand to get Lelai's attention. Because we want our enemies to treat our people with good care if they become a prisoner. With some form of basic care. Yup. It is not perfect, but we do what we can, he adds. You see, we are not barbaric. There need to be some rules in war. What we do to the enemy they will do to us. On top of that, the character and manner of the soldier matter greatly to us, and we separate civilians from soldiers by law. We do not intently kill civilians. They are not combatants and deserve to continue to live their daily life. He finishes, and she looks around. So, what are you going to do here? Lelai asked him, wondering what he is thinking. Still figuring that out. Lelai. At the end of the day, my people's safety is my first priority, not these people's internal issues, he replied and then begins walking away. He is heading to the princess, seeing her over by a building. Lelai looks to Randy. Your world is confusing but interesting. I find it interesting how complex your rules are and that so many nations can follow them. Randy chuckled after hearing that. It is nice but not perfect. It did require millions of dead bodies to come up with these rules. What is a natural part of life? Lelai said, that is one way magic became widely used. War needed magicians so schools were created, which I attended. Randy then nods to what she said. Sad truth, war usually is the tool for progress. Truth to that, he replied. Once he gets there, he gets a good idea of the situation. He then sees this red hair girl in a maid uniform. To his shock, her hair is made from snakes. Hello otherworlder. The girl said, My name is Aura. I am one of the four maids of Italica. I have been sent to bring you to the palace to meet the countess and princess. He looks at Lelai. Lelai looks at her. I think you can trust her major. The maids of Italica are known to be good. As long as you don't threaten the city. He is finding the customs of this world strange. Being greeted by children. Slavery is a second thought to these people, demigods, flying dragons. The only sane thing he sees in this world is the war. So far Lelai has not given him a reason to question her judgment. Roger that. He then looks to Randy. Randy stayed here with Jerry. Give Johnson an update on what is happening. If you need to have Scott to support, you too with me. He then looks to Aura. Take us to your leader. The other two head to him to talk with the princess. Italica, Eastern Gate Command Post, May 9, 2025. Sharp walks through the city as he heads to the Eastern Wall. He finds the building designs to be modest. It brings him back to the history books and time games like Oblivion. He follows the snake hair girl who Lelai called a Medusa. She is taking him to where the Rose Knights and the leaders of this city are at. He looks forward and sees this purple cat person and an orange bunny. They are both in a maid's outfit, taking him to Princess Pina's position. He is finding it hard to accept that there are walking and talking animals right in front of him. While it is normal for these people, his mind is struggling to accept the new reality. The princess is up on the wall, the cat woman named Persia said. As he heads to the wall staircase, he is stopped by the orange bunny named Momona. She places her hand on the hall door and looks directly at her with a knife in her hand. If you try anything let me inform you. Me and the other maids, are master assassins, Momona said in a threatening tone. He looks at the bunny and then smiles, getting a sarcastic thought. Master assassin, you say? Then you must know Batman. Tell him I say hi next time you see him. It's been a while. After saying that he opens the door and heads inside, he glances back and sees this baffled look on Momona's face. He finds it hilarious leaving people confused like that. While they are trying to figure out what he just said he is already thinking about the next issue, helping him maintain control of the situation. As he walks in, he sees Princess Pina standing there looking around. 
She looks nervous making him wonder if she is inexperienced in these manners. He also sees this young girl, looking at Selena's age. She is in nice robes so he assumes she is this Count Aura I mentioned. She looks terrified of the situation and him. Persia stops and points. Greetings, Princess Pina Colada and Countess Mayui del Formal. Here are the other worlders you summoned. He leans closer to Lelai and whispers, Tell me about these titles. Princesses are female leaders, usually of kingdoms but Pina is the princess of the empire, Lelai said. She is one of the political leaders of the empire but why she is here I do not know. They rarely leave their castles or cities, especially for war. A count is usually a leader of a city that is not part of a kingdom or larger governing body. I see, he replied. He then looks up at the two. He did not know he was dealing with one of the head leaders of the empire. Right now, that changes nothing as he has to focus on surviving today. At least he understand their chain of command. What is going on princess? Actually, is there something else I should call you? He asked. You. Hamilton pointed towards him. You will respect your princess. You do not approach or speak unless called upon. He looks at the brown hair girl with some surprise. Back at the gate. She seems more of a submissive shy girl but now he is wondering where that fire came from. He quickly figures it out. She is the princess servant and protective of her. A part of her respects that. Andrew takes a step forward, providing protection for him. With all due respect, you don't speak to the major like that. We are here helping. He places his hand on Andrew. So he knows everything is okay. Princess Pina raises her hand to her servant Hamilton after hearing that. It is okay Hamilton. She then looks at him. Normally that would not be the proper thing to tell someone however you people are different. You can just call me Princess Pina. He looks up to the left and sees Grey and Norma, talking about something. Most likely on how to defend against the next attack or judging him. He watches and is amused by what he saw. He looks back to Pina, who are the attackers. He asked as he looks up at the wall, analyzing it. Being a little confused, Pina looks at him. Ah, we are assuming they are Rex Legion heirs. How many are there? He asked, just being very direct this time. You cannot speak like that to your highness. Hamilton interrupts again. Getting angry about this common enemy soldier not respecting royalty. Again, Pina calms Hamilton down and looks back at him. She is confused about the way this soldier is acting now. Looking around, at roofs, the gate, the people, I don't know. About 500 attacked us yesterday but Sir Grey believes that was just an advance force to weaken our defenses. I agree, he comments and then looks back at her. Thank you. He then looks to the girl standing by what looks like a townsfolk military officer, not wearing the same armor as the Rose Knights. And you must be Countess Mayui Formal. You're in charge of the city. Yes, Mayui said in a scared tone. She is trying to act tough but struggling to do so. There is no shame in being afraid, he said. He can see Pina and Hamilton confused on why he is talking past them. There is no greater test in facing death in battle. The unknown factors of what the enemy will do, the fear that this will be the end of the city. But do not fear, he said. It is the end only if you choose it to be. Now, can I get a good view of the wall? I like to get the layout of the field and city. Why are you not asking me? Pina asked, annoyed that she has been cut out of the conversation. I am in charge, and she knows the layout of the city, he replied without looking back. Yes. Mayui said. Up those staircases, the south you can see most of the city. The man next to her said. Who are you? He asked. This is head knight Brolet Daluos. Grey answers. He is the head knight of this city. He has been helping us organize the peasants. Most of the fighting age men have fled, are dead, or joined the bandits. I notice, he said. Thank you, ma'am. You all can follow me if you like. Andrew contacts Randy and gets him up here. I want his point of view. He then starts to walk away, heading to the staircase that leads up the palace balcony. Andrew and Lelai follow close to him. He can hear Andy call over the radio. Pina, Mayui, Hamilton, and Grey walk up behind him. All of them seem confused by his attitude. They also seem confused about what Andrew is doing. 
When he gets to the top of the wall, he notices he has a good view. As he expected the city is dense with buildings everywhere. The only open place is right before the east gate where the militia can make a stand. Outside the gate is a wide open field, just like the southern gate. There is no natural defense the defenders can use. Gate, small, two ops, he said, talking to himself. He then gets to the top of the wall and starts looking around. Hey, Norma yells as he storms to him. What are you doing up here? Your kind is allowed here peasant. Why are we wasting time with these people when we have a crisis happening? Norma, Pina said. Calm down. She then looks at him. However, you are not in charge here major shop. I am and you will do as I command. Sharp ignores them and walks right past them, deep in thought. He then points out the tree line and then looks back into the town. Okay, that Norma marches over, his hand on his sword handle. Hey, I am talking to you, I will not tolerate your disrespectful attitude, get the fuck back. Randy yells as he gets on top of the wall. His hand is on his M4A1, ready to use it to defend Sharp. What? You do not get to speak to me like that. I am a noble knight. Norma yells back to Randy. That is when Grey save your energy, Norma. Let them be. The rumors are correct, Brolin said. You people have no honor. That is when Grey looks at him. What brings you up here and disrespect our leader like that? I disrespected no one. He responds as he thinks about the situation. He then looks at them as both Randy, Andrew, and Lelai walk up to his side. He then walks right past both knights again, looking around. We can do it. We need to hold the line right there, but this can work. He again, speaking to himself. What are you doing? Norma demands, not liking that his enemy is freely walking around up here. He looks at him. We are going to help defend this city until the cavalry arrives. Help defend this city? Brolin asked. There are so few of you and the only real worry you have is Rory the Reaper. However, there are too many of the enemy. Your numbers will not be enough. Grey points down the wall. The bandits were trained by the Imperial Army. They will flood over this wall like water. Brolin is correct. Even Mistress Rory cannot be everywhere at once. You eight are not enough to supplement our numbers. So, it is hopeless? Mayui asked. After listening to that he looks to Grey. So, what is your plan? We are working on that now before you show up, Gray said. There are no real soldiers here left. A few guards but not enough to hold this city. Only the peasant, Gray replied. He then looks down at the crowd and looks at all the confused and frightened people. The people are scared, sensing there will be no tomorrow. Many are struggling with the most basic soldier tasked. They are not soldiers. They are too used to the protection of the empire. Their moral is gone and they can barely muster the will to fight to know they do not stand a chance. We can't rely on the peasant, Brolin said. Our warriors were sent to your world, but none returned. This is your fault on why we are defenseless. It is our fault for killing your men when you invaded us. Andrew points out, maybe next time don't invade other countries. This is your mess. Calm down corporal, Randy said. He signs after hearing that. He looks down at the people down below and sees the same situation. He realizes the leadership of this city is currently worthless. Bull. He then looks to Randy. Sergeant Major, get everyone's attention. Randy then nods and then walks past the two knights. Hey. Gets to the inner edge of the wall. Lelai, mind using a flesh spell? Lelai nods after hearing that but is a little confused by the request. She walks up between Randy and Sharp, raises her staff, and for a short moment glows brightly, catching the people's attention. Everyone below stops what they are doing and looks up to the wall. Right then Randy yells at the top of his lungs. Attention. Your god emperor is about to speak. He looks at Randy after hearing that and gives him a WTF look. He has been given many nicknames in the past. But this is out there. He sees down below that the townsfolk are looking up at him. Many are confused about what Randy said however he got their attention. Randy just wink back at him. Troops are rallied, sir. He just shakes his head, chuckling a little. He then looks back down, seeing all the peasants looking at him. My name is Major Sharp of the United States Army. I am not going to lie to you. This is a bad situation we are in. 
We are facing a well-trained force coming to take this under the defended city because of the situation. We are going to help, he said in a command calm tone. I see some of you are scared of the up and coming battle, that you are not soldiers, not trained for this. In other words, common folk, do not feed that fear, do not think of yourself as less than the enemy. He then holds up his hand, points his figure as he makes a point. History has shown the common man can overcome the great crisis, defeat great armies and even topple empires. Let me make this clear, all we must do is hold for a day. All we must do is wait for our cavalry to arrive. I have full faith that you are capable of defending your homes, your families, your city. If we do this together, we will win. Orders will be given soon so be ready. Let God be with you. After speaking to everyone, he walks away from the edge of the wall, grabbing his water from his belt. After taking a drink, he will mumble, God, I hate speeches. He then looks over to the two knights and sees both confusion and anger, mostly from Norma. They all seem to not like the part about peasants toppling empires. What are you doing? Pino asked. You cannot lie to them like that. That is no lie princess, Randy said. Two hundred years of kicking empires asses. We got a lot of work to do. Let's go, Sharp said to them. Who put you in charge? Norma demands. You did when you didn't have a plan, he states. He looks at all of them, making sure that they all understand the new situation. Then Mayui walks up to him. Okay, I have no choice. You have my blessing to take command of the city defenses. He nods at Mayui. He can see the pressure off her shoulders. However she is still scared. Roger that. He then waves over Lelai and Randy to come off the wall. Truth is, he was never really going to accept a support role with them. Americans are leaders, not followers. Once he gets down there, he will see some spirits lifted in the townsfolk. Reference, https colon slash slash shim.wapad.com slash 112 ffb 3 f 50 f 2 a 3 b 165 c f 5 d 276 f 347 f 0 f 320 a slash 687474707333a2 f 2 f 73332e 616 d 670 17 a 6 f 6 e 6 1 7 7 7 3 2 e 636 f 6 d 2 f 7 7 6 1 7 4 7 4 7 0 6 1 6 4 2 d 6 d 6 5 6 4 6 9 6 1 2 d 7 3 6 5 7 2 7 6 6 9 6 3 6 5 2 f 5 3 7 4 6 f 7 2 7 9 4 9 6 d 6 1 one six seven six five two F four hundred and forty four C six six three six two D five six four seven seven six four F two D six F five two five three seven seven three D three D two D three seven three O three four three six three O three eight three O three seven three three two E three one three six three seven three two three two six four six five three two six two three one three eight six four three one six five three four three two three five three four three two three two three 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 eight three nine three seven three seven three four three nine three two two e six a seven thousand and sixty seven gate war of two worlds part one fort alness alness command may 9th 2025. A few hours later at the command center of Fort Alness of the NATO Expeditionary Force, Lieutenant General Stanford is sitting in his chair that is in his staff meeting room. He is not alone, there being three other officers in this meeting, Colonel Thomas Anderson of the 101st Airborne, and Colonel Harold Kurt of the 1st Cavalry. They oversee their respected rapid response forces. The other is Colonel John Yang, the head of the range of vanguard teams, the man he wants is Kurt's sister brigade, Colonel Robert from the 1st CAF but Robert forces are busy engaging the enemy to the west. Robert is an aggressive but cool-headed commander, and he can trust him to resolve the situation and make a message. Recalling him is not possible though, that is not to say the officers here are not up to the task, but this mission has some urgency. 
Anderson is the head of our airborne forces, all units from the 101st Air Assault Division. He can currently field a full infantry company and close air support with his helicopters wherever our field teams need it. He is a level head colonel, prefers seeing the big picture, and is careful to use his forces. Kurt from the 1st Cavalry Division on the other hand has been itching to get into the fight. His aggressiveness is a good thing but in this unknown alien world, it also could become a curse. The current strategy is to wage a limited scale war, focusing our attacks. Yang was part of the second wave during the Battle of Lens Hill 1, his rangers helped achieve the great success in taking the hill. It was his idea to divide his rangers into recon teams and begin exploring this world, besides sending basic soldiers out there have highly trained soldiers that can adapt to any situation. As you all already know, we got an SOS from Vanguard 7. Their mission is in the memo that was sent out, read it if you have not. The basic point is that they say they are under siege at the city called Italica and are requesting support, he explains. What is the full situation there? Kurt asked. Lieutenant he said. Sitting behind Yang is Vanguard 7. Logistical Officer First Lieutenant Sarah Rose. She stands up and walks up to the desk. At 1833, Major Sharp sent out an SOS to Alness Command. Sarah said, the city of Italica is being besieged by ex-Imperial soldiers. Ex-Imperial soldiers? Kurt asked. You're kidding. I am not, sir, Sarah said. The Major was informed that they are part of the units we decimated last month. They are deserters. How did an elite unit get stuck inside an enemy city? Kurt asked. By the way, being besieged by the same enemy. Let her speak Kurt, Yang said in an annoyed tone. Major Sharp does not fully know enemy strength, Sarah continues. Right when they got there, the city was just attacked. He is afraid to take his unit outside the city wall. Without knowing the enemy's makeup, Kurt leans back thinking. Aren't rangers supposed to be fearless? Our weapons should be able to overcome anything they have to throw. Yang looks to him and speaks up. Stupidity is not the ranger way. For all. He knows they might have 5,000 horsemen. One good ambush and everyone is dead. Plus, you already know about the heavy rainfall yesterday. Sarah adds, it seems rainfall is heavier on their world, or at least here. There was no way for them to come back to Alna's safety, being forced to help the town defenders. Colonel Yang and Lieutenant Sarah are correct, he said. We still don't know much about these people. We are not there and must take the SOS seriously. This mission is to reinforce our forces on the field, provide any support that is needed. The city of Italica safety is the mission. After that, we will determine the city is a threat to the war effort. H finds the context of this mission strange. He is sending soldiers to protect an enemy city that is being attacked by its own forces. He graduated from West Point in 1997 and served in Afghanistan, the occupation of Iraq, and Operation Inherent Resolve too. While he has seen many strange situations in war, never one this twisted. However, he sees a chance to gain some ground without laying siege to a city. Seeing US troops coming to the defense of an imperial city besides attacking it might sway some opinions in the city. He wonders if Major Sharp is thinking the same thing, trying to create an opportunity or this is just dumb luck. Everyone nods and then again Kurt speaks. My forces are ready to go. When they see our tanks roll up should scare them away. Not good enough, Anderson responds. The memo made it clear time is not on our side. I agreed with Anderson, he said. It will take hours for ground forces to reach the city and as Lieutenant Rose stated before the highway is covered in mud, if it took the JLTVs an extra day to get there, then it might take you too. Our only option is an air assault, he continues. Besides Kurt, until the 2nd Armored Division arrives you are our backup reaction force. I understand sir, Kurt said. We will get into the war another day. Colonel Anderson, get your boys into the air ASAP, he orders. Yes sir, Anderson said. Everyone nods and leaves to carry out their orders. He sees Lieutenant Sarah Rose leaving after all the colonels. Lieutenant, 
Hold up for a moment. Sarah stops and walks up to his desk. She then stands at attention. Yes sir. While being very professional he noticed that Sarah seemed nervous that her team is under siege. He understands the feeling of sending soldiers into battle while staying safely back at base. He also heard the drama of Vanguard 7. As a general, he knows what is going on and knows Major Sharp was not respected by his troops. Sarah's concern shows something different. You seem, concerned lieutenant, he said. Worried about your team? Of course, sir, Sarah replied, confused. They are my team after all. He nods, understanding the feeling. It is not easy to send your team while you stay safe, never knowing they will come back. Even the most elite warriors have a bad day. Sarah takes a breath, with respect sir but I am not that worried. He looks at her. Why is that? I know your team has struggled with your new commander. Rocky starts usually builds stronger bonds sir, Sarah said. Interesting response, he said. You passed West Point with a 4.0, at Ranger School. While you did struggle with the physical section you asked all the schooling. With your mind, you could have done anything in the army, but you stuck being a Ranger. Why is that? My dad was an infantry captain in the army. Sarah said, going the easy route is not in my nature and besides, I want to be with the best. If I can help the best win then I did my part. Soldiers cannot fight the enemy if they do not know who to shoot sir. And Major Sharp he asked. I know you two don't get along. I wouldn't say we didn't get along sir, Sarah replied. Just differences. He can tell she is being careful about how she responds. Explain. Sarah stands there getting a bit frustrated by the questions. Most saw him as a prick sir when he took command. The situation seems very odd for the army. However, if he was everything the rumors say, then he wouldn't have helped those refugees or stay in the city to help. So, you do think this is intentional? He asked. You don't think this is just a coincidence? You think he actually cares? I had a choice to stand by my new commander or bitch about him sir like everyone else, Sarah said. At and I don't know what your mom told you but mine always said. Don't listen to what a man said, watch what he does. He chuckles. Good dating tips. Should have listened to it sooner sir, Sarah replied. If you are asking me what I think about Major Sharp then it is this. I think he just needed someone that believes in him. I am Vanguard 7 XO. So it is my responsibility to support him. Sarah looks at him directly with a firmer tone. If you are asking me if he cares about the mission or if you can trust him then the answer is yes general. To take one of his silly sayings from his shows, I do think there is more than meets the eye with him. And I am going to do everything I can to encourage it. Sir, he taps on his desk, finding her response interesting. Thank you very much, Lieutenant. You are dismissed. Sarah salutes and leaves his office. He leans back in his chair and thinks. Mother always said to trust a woman's intuition. Italica. May 10, 2025. For the past few hours, the Rangers of Vanguard 7 have been helping the townsfolk get ready for the coming battle. They are helping build makeshift barricades and other types of defenses. None of the defenses are of great quality however it is the best they can do on short notice. Major Sharp can tell that this has been annoying some of the nobles and that young knight, seeing these Americans getting dirty and interacting with the peasants. It is clearly showing a big difference between the two groups. He filled his team on a new plan. Alicia, the team radio operator contacted Sarah and reported their situation. Sarah said that Alnus command is sending in the 101st. That is when that old Knight Grey walks up to him. Hello Major Sharp, I don't believe we have properly introduced each other. He is currently helping the villagers set up the wagons into a defense line around the gate. His pants and gloves are all dirty from helping, gaining respect with some townsfolk. He has noticed the knight's armor clean, to the point someone could eat off. He can see how top down this society is. He wipes off the sweat from his forehead and looks at him. He looks at him with a skeptical look but nods. He sees this as a chance to learn more about these people and get some intelligence. Okay, my name is Graco Aldo of the Rose Order of Knights. I am the second in command here, Gray said. Mind if I offer you a drink? He agrees to his offer. He can see that this man is trying to figure him out. 
He also wants to figure this man out too. If he is close to the Imperial Princess and a veteran soldier, any intelligence he can get will be useful against the Empire. They walk over to a nearby table. Grey then grabs two mugs of water and then hands it to Sharp. He takes the mug, gives it a quick sniff, and takes a sip. That taste. Good. He said as this stale, dirty taste of water goes down his throat. So, what is it, Grey? Grey takes a drink from the mug and then looks at him. I take it you are the leader of your unit. I figured it would be good for us to have a short chat, before the battle. Makes sense to me. He states. I have some questions. Gray nods as he thinks. To the point. Okay. First I wanted to say thank you for inspiring the people. This takes him by surprise. He never expected a thank you by any of these nobles or knights. He met everything he said. The United States was born based on peasants raising and gaining their freedom, something nobles and royalty would not like. But it seems like that annoyed them. None needed. If they don't believe they could win then we already lost. I mean it, Gray states. The situation here becomes dire. But they seem to believe they will survive the next day. But why are you doing it? We are stuck here too. Either fight or die, he explains. Trying to be careful one what he said and doesn't say. He can see that Gray is trying to figure out his motivations. To see if he has honorable intentions or not. You could have turned around and left right when you learned of the situation. But you stayed, Grey asked again. Grey then looks over and sees that young girl that has been traveling with them. You have three of our people traveling with you. One being Rory Mercury. Somehow you were able to convince her to be on your side. None of them said they were Imperial citizens. He states as he takes another drink. Grey takes another drink. I see. Maybe not Rory but the magic user and that young girl are following you. He looks at him, putting together what he just said. First, Rory Mercury and Lelai Lelina chose to come with us. They wanted to hang around us after the fight with the flame dragon. They can leave any time they wish. They are not my prisoners or slaves but comrades. He then looks away and sees Rory helping some of the peasants. He is surprised that she has all this power and yet she is still so humble with the people. I get the vibe I can't force Rory to do anything anyway. And yet she obeyed your orders at the gate. Grey points out. True, he said and thought. What point are you making? Grey thinks about what Sharp just said. It is remarkably interesting. Clearly, Rory sees something in these people for her to decide to help them. It is very well known she does not like to work for a kingdom, preferring to freelance herself. I know you are here looking to recruit people to your side. Not in means of war but in popular support, Grey said. He looks at him, thinking, maybe, or I am just looking out for my people. I believe that, but I have fought many wars, been in many battles. We are from two different worlds. Yet the warrior spirit appears to be the same. Your eyes betray your motives. Sir Sharp, you are helping because you want to help. That is why you are helping those two girls. That is why you are here. Grey said, finishing his long through. I don't think your highness will like you having this conversation. I do what I can when I can. Genocide is not something we like where I am from. We came to learn about this town and trade. All that is true. But I know I can help, he said. He does not know how to reply just said what was the first thing on his mind. I think we both know someone's status on the battlefield is meaningless. Ray responds. So, I understand the magic user and Rory. But why do you bring along the young girl? You both seem attached. I take it you helped her in some manner? Hearing that question. He is having a hard time forming a response. He is used to fighting his enemy to death rather than having a friendly conversation with them. It already has been a long day. When he saw Selina there was this big urge in his heart, forcing him to intervene when he saw that. Well, we ran into these slave traders transporting her three. The short answer is, I freed her. No child should be a slave for anyone's pleasure. Until I find someone who can take care of her. I guess I am acting as a guardian, he replied. Gray thinks about what he said and nodded. Interesting. That is when Johnson's voice comes through the radio. Sir. Can you come to CP? Over. Grey looks at the device with great interest. A human voice came out of that black box. What is that? He presses the NW box on his vest, 
that controls his headphone and replied, Roger. He then looks to Gray, I got to go, but this is a radio. It allows us to talk to each other over long distances. An interesting chat should do it again. And then he leaves. Gray finished his water and then headed towards Pina thinking Pina is in the main courtroom of the city palace. She is very frustrated with the situation. She feels like she has completely lost the situation. She is the princess of the empire and she allowed an enemy soldier from the gate to take command of the defenses, defending against her own legion heirs. Stay calm Hamilton, she ordered as he looked out into the town. The doors open and Grey walks into the room. I agree princess, what he said and did was very disrespectful. Once the battle is over, we should capture them all and show them who is in charge. Hamilton will add, agreeing with her. Sharp seems to be an important man among his people, she said, speaking out loud. He must be a noble of some kind. Maybe if he captures him, we can trade him for something. That won't be a good idea, Gray said. They look at Gray as he approaches. Speak Gray, give some wisdom during this crisis, she asked, desperate for his opinion. These Americans are quite different. We need to be careful with how we interact with them. Right now, they are willing to help us, and he said his people are coming tomorrow. Gray explains. She does not fully understand what Gray means. She can tell that they are different, but they cannot be that different from the Empire. It is normal to take a nobleman hostile and ransom him for money, slaves, or something. How though? They only just got here unless they are a scout force, she asked. And let us not forget we are at war with them. Once our truce is over, we should take advantage of them before they do that to us. Gray listens and thinks. However, that man is a warrior. He is not here with ill intent. He could be a great enemy or ally. An ally? She asked confused. They are the enemy. The only reason we are working together is that we have a common enemy. Did you forget we are at war with their people? She takes a deep breath. And let us not forget our honor is on the line. This is our first mission. This will be our only chance to prove ourselves. Assuming we even survive this battle. If I lose this then everyone will see my father's daughter coming back for his protection, like a child. It will prove that I will never be able to stand side by side by my brother's princess. Hamilton said as she placed her hand on her chest. Your Highness, Gray said as he kneels. I believe you need to relax and stay focused. In war, you must focus on the matters at hand. Mighty generals have fallen because they try to reach out for more before they are ready. I am not saying you are not but if you think about what the Senate will think of you, then you will lose now. And right then they all hear the city bells ring. They are the city warning bells, which means the outlaws are back. Sharp gets back to his vehicles, where his team is now. Most of them have been helping around but since it got late, they came back here. Mainly for safety reasons. Alicia walks up. Sir, so what is the plan? Everyone looks at him. I have been thinking about it. We know they are coming to the east gate but there is a chance they will attack the south gate too. To prevent escape, we are splitting up into two teams, is that wise sir? Second Lieutenant Charles Johnson asked. Can't be helped. Selina and Lely I want you to stay here with the vehicles. Johnson and William stay here too. This is our fallback position, if the city is going to fall, we get the hell out of here. Take our bets, he explains in his command but confident voice. Everyone else will go to the east gate. We hold as long as we can. When the airborne gets here, we will coordinate our support, he orders in a calm tone. Everyone nods their heads after hearing the orders and then goes get ready for the battle. For a moment they all look surprised by how he calmly is giving orders. None of them expected him to be able to act during a crisis. All the rangers rally and follow their orders. Selina then walks up and smiles. She has his helmet in her hands and then holds it up to him. He smiles at her and takes it. Thank you. Good luck and be safe sir, Selina said in a soft voice, trying to look tough even though she is scared. She looks nervous. He puts on his helmet and smiles. Thank you. And no worry kid, this is nothing compared to one of my many missions in the Philippines. He then looks down at her and sees she has no idea what place he is talking about. Never mind. That is when they all hear the bells ring. 
At the gate, there is smoke and flames. Everyone. This is it. Randy begins to yell, gathering everyone. That is when Rory starts laughing and then bursts out of their minicamp, rushing to the east gate. Reference https colon slash slash shim dot wattpad dot com slash 112 ffb 3 f 50 f 2 a 3 b 165 c f 5 d 276 f 347 f 0 f 320 a slash 6 8 7 4 7 4 7 0 7 3 3 8 2 f 2 f 7 3 3 3 2 e 616 d 617 17 A 6 F 6 E 6 1 7 7 7 3 2 E 636 F 6 D 2 F 7 7 6 1 7 4 7 4 7 0 6 1 6 4 2 D 6 D 6 5 6 4 6 9 6 1 2 D 7 3 6 5 7 2 7 6 6 9 6 3 6 5 2 F 5 3 7 4 6 F 7 2 7 9 4 9 6 D 6 1 one six seven six five two F four hundred and forty four C six six three six two D five six four seven seven six four F two D six F five two five three seven seven three D three D two D three seven three O three four three six three O three eight three O three seven three three two E three one three six three seven three two three two six four six five three two six two three one three eight six four three one six five three four three two three five three four three two three two three 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 eight three nine three seven three seven three four three nine three two two e six a seven thousand and sixty seven one chapter one two operation inherent resolve is the u.s led war against isis three chapter five gate war of two worlds part one italica Palace Balcony May 10, 2025 Princess Pina stands on the palace balcony watching over the battle. She tries to count the number of bandits out there but is unable to figure out the total number. She cannot believe the size of the force attacking the city. Princess, Hamilton said in a scared tone. There are so many. I know, she replied. All her life, Pina wanted to be a female knight on the battlefield and now she is going to die on her first mission. This. This is what war is like. She looks at her servant Hamilton and sees the fear in her eyes. She then sees Countess Mayui Formal standing there, looking out onto the battle. A part of her is angry at her for allowing the Americans to take control of the city defenses. She thought about enacting her royal powers and stripping Mayui of her powers in order to take direct control of the city. Why did you give the Americans control of your city? She asked. Because he was correct, Mayui replied. You didn't have a plan to protect my people. My father died for the Empire and the Empire returns that favor by abandoning us. We didn't abandon you she replied, I am here, risking my knight's lives, my own life, and don't forget, they killed your father, in your invasion, Mayui replied, he died in your invasion of those people, and that man spoke like my further one, now she wished she had used her powers to strip Mayui of her counties, but it is too late, she looks around and sees soldiers clashing on the eastern wall, it looks like the bandits are making one massive push to overwhelm the gate. She can hear screams and cries throughout the city. Princess. Hamilton said, shuddering a little. I think you should escape. She looks at her servant. She has been very loyal, serving her since when they are young too. Grey is still out there. I promise to defend this city and I won't let these Americans take the glory. A part of her wants to run, knowing she can escape from the north to the Rose Stream but she knows her knights are coming. They will come too late but when they arrive, they will be slaughtered by the horde of bandits. Italica, Eastern Gate. The attack came out of nowhere. None of the sentries that were on the wall noticed the small sneak attack. Some of the bandits were able to get on the wall, distracting the city militia, allowing the main force to advance against the East Gate uncontested. Vanguard 7 is rushing to the western gate after hearing the battles. Sergeant Major, take Alicia and guard the gate. Everyone else with me, we've got to hold the wall. Sharp orders over his radio. Everyone acknowledges his order and splits up into the assigned teams. 
It takes some time to get back to the wall as many of the townsfolk are getting in the way. Everyone is panicking and the little discipline that was left vanishing. He sees the ranks forming up, but they are sloppy. Randy is a war veteran from the Middle East, and Alicia's record in ranger training shows that she specializes with close combat. He hopes they will get to the militia's position and rally them to hold the line. The sun begins to rise, peeking over the mountains to the east. He stands there and looks at the view. He finds it surprising that they attacked this early. The nights in this world are darker than on Earth. He wonders if that is because there is little light pollution or something related to the planet's orbit around its sun or as Lelai calls it, flare. Knowing that the enemy does not have night vision, he wonders if they have some way to see in the dark. Maybe they are species that can see at night so they can organize without torches. Once they get to the stairway that leads up the wall, the situation looks like it is falling apart. Suddenly, a bolt of lightning shoots out from a crowd of the attackers. Sharps Rangers finally gets up on the wall and take cover by the wall's battlements. They begin opening fire on the bandits below. Trying to present as small of a target to the archers shooting volleys of arrows at them. Holy shit. There are a lot of them. Andrew comments, looking over the wall. He looks to where Andrew is staring, and his eyes widened at the sight. There must be thousands of them, far more than he expected. He sees where that bolt of lightning came from and assumes it is a magic user like Lelai. This is like the Battle of Helm's Deep 3, Andrew mumbles. This is the first time he even thought about there being an enemy magic user. The only time he has faced one was clearing out that Imperial staging area for so the idea of it hasn't become normalized for him. That is something he should have expected given what world he is at. He is still fighting like he would fight a modern military on Earth and must check his bias. He starts to wonder what else might be out there. Scott, hold this position and provide suppressive fire orders. Scott is the unit support gunner, using an M240 machine gun. Sharp then rushes down the wall, Andrew right behind him. Fighting is happening all along the wall as more and more bandits keep climbing up siege ladders. They must have set them up during the sneak attack. To their right one of the militiamen gets hit by an arrow, falling off the wall. The militiamen around him start to panic and the attack comes. Stay away from the edge stay low. Don't get sniped, he orders as arrows fall around him. After the two of them kill three bandits who were on the wall, he gives the hand signal to Andrew to throw a grenade. They toss a fragmentation grenade towards the base of the nearest siege ladder backslash R. Once that was done, they could hear the screams of people dying after the small explosion. All right, we will work our way down and frag these bastards he said. Andrew nods as he fires his M401, before they could start moving into position. They hear Scott yell incoming. Both look out over the battlefield and see a large boulder flying towards them. They jump for cover as the boulder hits the wall, causing some damage to the wall. What the fuck was that? Andrew yells confused about what just happened. Don't think about it and get back in the fight, Sharp tells him. He is forced to use his rifle as a shield when one of the bandits that got on the wall attacks him. That is when the bandit was split in half before his eye by a large halberd. No dying on me today Major, Rory said to him in a flirtatious tone. She then winks at him. She holds out her hand and helps him up. He looks at her hand and takes it, being pulled up. Both look at each other in the eyes, giving a respectful nod to each other. Then. Another boulder flies towards the city, smashing the wall again, taking out a mixed group of militiamen and bandits. Seeing that, Rory bursts out a laugh in a sadistic tone and then charges forward, slashing anyone in her way. Blood and body parts are spraying all around as she cuts them down. He stands there watching, never having seen anything like that before. Note to self, never be on her bad side. He said to himself as he raises his rifle and covers Rory, the fighting seems to be stabilizing, until he sees another boulder moving through the air. This boulder looks different compared to the others. It seems to be glowing with some kind of magical spell. This time it hits the gate, smashing it wide open. Sharp stands there as he witnesses hundreds of them charge through the broken gate, 
the bandits outside the wall all cheer and start storming towards the barricades that were set up. Sounds of screaming and death can be heard as both sides clash down below. He then hears Norma yelling at the fleeing militiamen. Don't run. Hold this wall. Cowards. Fight. Ah. The city militia begins to flee for their lives, after seeing Norma get stabbed through the chest. As everyone watches as that young knight gets executed, the people of Italica begin to lose faith that they can hold the wall, or the city for that matter. He sees the execution and sees the militiamen abandoning the wall from the overwhelming force, the men inside the walls giving ground. On the verge of breaking, he knows once the plaza falls, the battle is over. It does not matter if they hold the wall, these bandits will storm the city unchecked, killing everyone. He looks at Rory and yells, Rory, get down there and hold the line. He then sees Rory jump down from the wall, land in the middle of the bandits, and begin fighting them off. She keeps talking about how special she is, so he must trust that she is telling the truth. She could be able to help hold the plaza, however, she is outnumbered. There is no way she could take them on alone. Even with her superhuman abilities, she cannot be everywhere at once. Even if she could, they are still pouring through the gate. Seeing this, he rushes off the wall and quickly gets to the barricade. Once he gets down there, he sees both Randy and Alicia firing their weapons into the enemy crowd, but he also sees the town's militia running away. He rushes to what is left of the defensive line. Hold the line. Hold the line here. He gets between them and the attackers, trying to inspire the townsfolk to hold their ground, letting them know that they are not alone. Rory laughs as she slashes her halberd, killing five bandits. A big man with an axe appears right behind her. He screams as he swings his axe down at her. She just smirks and jumps up and lands on his shoulders. Rory just giggles that the man thought he could kill her, and then winks at him, cutting his head right off his body. She looks at the large mass of bandits in front of her, some of them seem to be scared of her, but others look way too confident, she has seen this before, they know they cannot kill her, but the thrill of battle can cloud a man's mind. So far, winning is all they are thinking about, which is fine for her, more souls for Emroy, we can take her if we all attack at once. Charge. One of them yells, clearing acting as one of their leaders. The large horde of bandits rushes towards her. She slashes as some of them get close. With each strike, she is slashing off their arms, legs off and other body parts. She sees two more of them by her side, ready to strike. That is when both die from bullet wounds. She looks over to see who shot them and sees Alicia. Alicia is yelling as she stabbed another of them with her knife that is on the barrel of her weapon. She pulls out her pistol and right over her head killing another. She looks at her and smiles. Alicia sees her and smirks. Both give each other a nod and begin killing everyone around them. Randy rushes over to Sharp. Sir, we are being overrun. Should we retreat? Sharp looks at him. There is nowhere to retreat to. There are thousands of them out there. He then looks out and watches as the two girls kill everyone around them. They have the center covered, gun down anyone on the flanks. We must hold here. Sharp orders. They stand by the barricade, shooting anyone trying to flank both Alicia and Rory. Another boulder hits the wall, which forces Andrew to drop to the ground for cover. Andrew, get back here. Scott yells as he fires at the bandits chasing him. He rushes back to where Scott is. Once he gets there, he takes cover by some barrels and opens fire at the bandits. They keep on fighting, even with their advanced weapons. Hundreds are still swarming the wall. A stray arrow hits Scott in the helmet, making him fall on his ass. Scott Andrew looks behind him, checking up on him as he still tries to provide cover. I am okay. Damn. That hurt. Scott said, feeling up his helmet with his hand. The arrow did not hurt him, but the impact was still hard. That is when they hear a roar come from the sea of soldiers. They both look over the wall's edge and see this massive troll charging towards the wall. The troll jumps and lands on the wall, its hands grabbing the edges. It begins pulling itself up, working on getting over the wall. Both look at it in horror, trying to figure out what to do with a beast like that. This is the first time they have encountered a troll. A big-bellied, 
massive naked beast, the troll sees them and lets out another roar as it lifts a large axe, planning on striking the two rangers. Right then, the troll explodes, sending a shockwave knocking them both over. Reference https colon slash slash shim dot wattpad dot com slash 112 ffb 3 f 50 f 2 a 3 b 165 c f 5 d 276 f 347 f 0 f 320 a slash 6 8 7 4 7 4 7 0 7 3 3 a 2 f 2 f 7 3 3 3 2 e 616 d 616 17 a 6 f 6 e 6 1 7 7 7 3 2 e 636 f 6 d 2 f 7 7 6 1 7 4 7 4 7 0 6 1 6 4 2 d 6 d 6 5 6 4 6 9 6 1 2 d 7 3 6 5 7 2 7 6 6 9 6 3 6 5 2 f 5 3 7 4 6 f 7 2 7 9 4 9 6 d 6 1 one six seven six five two f four hundred and forty four c six six three six two d five six four seven seven six four f two d six f five two five three seven seven three d three d two d three seven three o three four three six three o three eight three o three seven three three two e three one three six three seven three two three two six four six five three two six two three one three eight six four three one six five three four three two three five three four three two three two three 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 eight three nine three seven three seven three four three nine three two two e six a seven thousand and sixty seven one chapter seventeen two chapter two three battle of helms deep is a battle in lord of the rings four chapter two gate war of two worlds part one above rumors highway may tenth 2025, Colonel Thomas Anderson is in his UH-60 Black Hawk helicopter. He is leading a company-size unit of airborne infantry with three AH-64 Apache escorting the two CH-47 Chinook and other Black Hawks carrying the rest of the company. The sun has just risen, which allows them to see the city that is under attack. One of the escorts saw a massive beast that is identified as a troll charging towards the city wall. Target destroyed. One of the female Apache pilots said over the radio. He grabs his radio. All right everyone. Target all contacts outside the wall and clear the area. Once complete, proceed to land, and begin cleanup operations. First and second platoon land outside. Third platoon, retake the wall and secure the city. Everyone acknowledges the orders, and they all begin to fly over the engagement zone. All right boys. There are a bunch of them, one of the Apache pilots said over the radio. All three of them begin forming up around the ground force. All right. Light them up. The three Apaches opens fire at the bandits down below that are outside the wall. The helicopters begin firing their anti-personnel Hydra 70 missiles and their 30mm chain gun into the enemy ground forces. The other helicopters are providing support fire as the soldiers inside are firing down on the bandits. As the missiles hit their targets, explosions begin to appear all over the battlefield as the attack helicopters do their strafing runs. The Apache, the United States main attack helicopter, the king of the helicopters, it has been the workhorse and one of the most feared weapons of war. Just one of these could kill hundreds back on Earth. And today, these bandits are learning that same lesson. His task force begins raining hell down on the enemy with their superior firepower. He looks to his left and sees his Black Hawk providing support fire on the wall, protecting two of the rangers that seem to be pinned down. Angel 3, do you see those five bandits? He said over the radio, Roger that. We got contacts on the wall going after that AA battery. Take it out, one of the Apaches said. He then sees one of the Apaches fly over to it. These bandits are trying to load what looks like a spear into what seems to be a burlister. One of the Apaches flies over to it and then fires on one of its missiles at it, obliterating the burlister and all the men around it. He sees this bright light out of the corner of his eye. He sees a lightning bolt coming from the ground. 
most likely one of the mages he has read reports about. Be advised, we have a magic user shooting lighting from the ground, a pilot said. I see that, he said. Take it out, roger that, a female Apache pilot said. Ma making fried chicken tonight boys, he sees Angel 2 fly over, dodging an ice spear magic attack. The Apache fires a Hellfire missile at the magic user position, killing him and the surrounding warriors. Once the threat is gone and seeing the ground forces unable to fight against their helicopters, he starts to see the enemy retreating. All right, begin phase two, begin to clean up. Everyone on the ground is looking on in pure horror, all trying to understand what these things are and watching as they just slaughter the enemy. Most do not know what is happening. Sharp and Randy ignore their allies' air support and continue to engage the enemy that is within the walls. He can hear the Apaches giving them enemy hell on the other side of the wall. He wishes he could witness the fight, but he is needed here. However, Sharp notices the bandits inside the city are not retreating. He does not know if they feel forced to continue the attack or if they do not know what is happening to their comrades. They're not retreating? Randy shouts confused by that sight. It seems like the men inside the city are still committed to the fight. Don't think about it. Just he said before being interrupted by his radio. Vanguard 7, this is Angel 2. We are beginning cleanup operations. You have 10 seconds to clear the courtyard. The pilot of the Apache attack helicopter said over the radio. He hears what the pilot said and then looks up to see the situation. The Apache flies over and then hovers above him. He sees the chain gun under it getting ready to fire. He grabs his radio. Alicia, Rory fall back. He hears nothing. He can see them still fighting. They are too engaged in the fight to see what is happening around them. We have to get them out of there, he tells Randy. Both rushes into the enemy and forcibly grab Rory and Alicia. What are you doing? Alicia yells as Randy flips her over his shoulder and then begins running back to the barricade. Rory looks confused as she gets picked up in Sharp's arms. She looks up at him, shocked that a mere mortal would rush over to save her. What are you doing? Air support, he replied. Once they get back to the barricade, they all stop and look over to the bandits that are on the wall. They reform their lines and are marching forward, all behind their shields. That is when they all watch as the Apache above them opens fire. In one strafing run, the chain gun lays waste to over 200 bandits. Their shields prove to be worthless all being shredded into pieces by the chain gun. As Rory lays in Sharp's arms, she watches in pure shock as the bandits just tore apart, watching hundreds of them get slaughtered within seconds, their armor being completely useless. This is the first time she witnesses the true power of these Americans. Courtyard clear. Begin perimeter patrol, the Apache pilot said. Princess Pina and her longtime servant friend Hamilton are standing there on the balcony. Since the beginning of the battle, they have been here watching. They are looking at this strange flying thing just hovering there, witnessing it killing hundreds of men in seconds. Her brain wants to tell her that it is a metal dragon, but it is not. It's a monster, Hamilton said, terrified. Her body is shaking at the sight of it. What is that? Mayui asked in a horrific voice. She is unable to find any words to express what she is seeing. As the flying monster flies away, she watches as the other of these flying beasts fly all around the city. She sees another one hovers over the eastern gate. She can see people inside them, either coming out of them once they landed or sliding down on ropes. Just past the wall, she sees these massive explosions happening in the distance, slaughtering the retreating bandits. The Empire has artillery that fires pots which can explode into flames. She has seen explosions before from their firepots and flame magic however this is on a far greater scale. This is the cavalry Sharp was talking about? Hamilton asked, making that connection. This is the American military she heard of. This is who we attacked the other side of the gate. This is who killed hundreds of thousands of our soldiers at Alnus Hill. In only a matter of minutes. The bandit force was wiped out by just a couple of these Americans. This is who we went to war with. That soldier from the tavern was completely right. She realizes Mayui made the right choice and the most likely she will be spared by these people. 
she sees the battle coming to an end. Only minutes ago, all hope looked lost, and now it is a massive victory for the Americans. She can feel her bones shaking, unable to process what she is seeing. We are finished. Rory Mercury stands there and watches the American reinforcements start to land and attack the bandits. While American troops start to offload from their helicopters and begin to secure the area. Once the soldiers land, they form a circle to protect the Chinooks and Black Hawks. They open fire at the bandits, picking them off with ease. She has never seen anything like this before. She has seen large battles before, sometimes in the hundreds of thousands. However, she has never seen a smaller force be able to easily wipe out a larger force like this. Watching the airborne soldiers landing wherever they want and attacking where the enemy least expects. This is the first time she has seen the American military fight outside of Vanguard 7 and she is not disappointed. She watched as all those bandits died from the rain of bullets. Their body armor was completely useless, as if they were standing there naked. She looks back up at Sharp as he looks around, making sure his people are okay. She smiles at him, enjoying that he ran into danger to get her out of the line of fire. Not many would do that, especially for an apostle. She knows she would not have died from their attack and she knows he knows that. If she was still there, she would have been full of bullet holes however she would have regenerated within minutes. Maybe longer because of how much damage these helicopters do. But that is when she realizes that even though he knew she could not die from such an attack, he still wanted to protect her from unnecessary harm. The first man to ever do that in an awfully long time. That is when she feels his hand in an interesting position. She then looks down and realizes his hand is on her breasts. She can see it is not intentional, just the position she is in when he went to save her from the battle. She knows it is an accident. However she cannot help it. She looks up at him and sees the sweat coming from his helmet, the grey eyes and the shine of the sun bouncing off his sunglasses. She cannot believe this man just went out there, into danger to get her. She told him that she cannot die until her 1000 years is up. She cannot believe he would save her even though she explained that she could not lie. She could recover through her regeneration abilities. While she cannot read his mind, she believes they could have escaped when they learned the city was about to be attacked, but their escape would have resulted in the slaughter of this city. He could have ordered them to leave, since it would have been the safest and correct decision, and the thing is that she could not have judged him less if he did. That is war, but it is not their war. Italiku is an imperial city, not an American city. They have no responsibility to protect these people, but she can see he wanted to. She is the apostle of love, and she can see in his eyes he loves life and war. The question is, which one does he loves more? Then Sharp looks down at her. Are you okay Rory? You're not hurt, right? She looks at him, enjoying that he asked her that. She then giggles and then smacks him on the head. Thirty-five minutes later, Sharp is outside the wall with his team. The airborne soldiers are policing the bodies for any intelligence and gathering any prisoners or wounded, there are a lot of dead bodies littered everywhere. He wonders if this was anything like back in the old days of Earth after a battle. Some airborne soldiers bring over some prisoners and set them down. To his surprise, some of them are women, though the vast majority are still men. While most of them are humans, he sees some elves, orcs and some other races he has yet to see. This one female looks like a hybrid of a female human with bird legs and feathers. He begins to wonder how many different kinds of hybrids there are in this world. It is interesting how many different hybrid species are there. That is when Alicia walks up to him. Does your face still hurt? She asked, chuckling. She is not alone. Two others of his rangers are with her. Checking out the prisoners. Yes. He mumbles, slowly. Why did she hit you? Alicia asked, enjoying the subject. I have no idea, but who knew a 75 pound girl could hit so hard? He said. That is what happens when you mess with a demigoddess, boss. Andrew replied. Indeed, he responds. He then looks over to the prisoners. Colonel Anderson asked him to find some prisoners to bring back to base. Hey, soldier. He yells. One of the airborne soldiers rushes up to him. I want those four there. Those three there and those two I guess, he orders. Sir, 
The soldier acknowledges the order and then he would gather a few more to take the prisoners he picked to the Chinook helicopter. He then hears Alicia talking again, with an interesting tone. Boss, why are they mostly women? Got some evening plans? Alicia said, implying something more, but also in a joking tone. Still, kind of weird hearing her imply that. Excuse me sergeant? He responds in his regimental tone. Oh, nothing. Alicia said, walking away chuckling. I know why, but I couldn't resist. He looks away. Rory said she knows the bird won, so I am doing her a favor. Randy walks with four other soldiers. Major, the colonel wants you at the palace, meeting with the princess. Roger that. Everyone continue cleaning up operations. Gather supplies too. We are pretty low. And with that, Sharp starts walking away back into Italica, being escorted by three airborne soldiers. Reference https colon slash slash shim dot wapad dot com slash one hundred and twelve ffb three f fifty f two a three b one hundred and sixty five cf o five d two hundred and seventy six f three hundred and forty seven f zero f three hundred and twenty a slash six eight seven four seven four seven o seven three three a two f two f seven three 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 two e six hundred and sixteen d six hundred and 17A6F6E61777326F62F7767327326F62F6E61777326F6E61777326F6E61777326F6E61777326F6E61777326F6E61777326F6E61777326F6E61777326F6E61777326F6E61777326F6E61777326F6E61777326F6E61777326F6E61
Will they send me their leader or just toss me with the other whores since we're so far below them? She said, rambling again. I don't think it will be that bad. Mayui states again. They never acted threatening. You realize that because of how young you are, you will probably be worth the most, she states. Did you see Major Sharp with that young girl in his wagon? I think he has a thing for girls your age so you should be worried. I cannot believe it is over. Hamilton said. Our first battle, our first mission. Such a humiliation. She stands there and takes a deep breath. That is the rules of war. We should embrace our fate. That is the rule of war. The victor gets to claim what they want the strong dominating the weak. Over the past 600 years the empire has grown and taken over many kingdoms. That is the nature of things. She thinks back to all the times the empire had conquered lands, enslaved the local population. The men would be taken to work in the mines or for personal sport. The women taken to become servants or trophies to the legion heirs. In all 19 years of her life, she never once considered that one day she might end up as someone's trophy. Her stature was supposed to protect her, as she ponders on every scenario that might happen to her. One of the palace maids comes through the door. This one is a humanoid bunny with long ears named Momina. Your Highness, the leaders of the other world as has come to visit you, Momina said. Let them in, she orders. To her confusion Momina seems relaxed, like she does not fear these other worlders. Hamilton stands up and walks over to her princess side. No matter what, I will be by your side. Pina looks at her and nods, smiling at her. Thank you. Hamilton, you have been a great servant and an even better friend. It has been an honor. She then looks to the maid. Let them in. It is time to face fate. Momna walks up to Mayui and stands by her as Mayui sits on her throne. She allowed Mayui to sit on her throne wanting to stand up to face these Americans. She wanted to stand there with what little pride she had left. As the highest ranking imperial officer, she must deal with the terms of surrender. The other reason is that she does not fully trust Mayui right now. Mayui has shown some sympathy towards the Americans and she is scared that she will try to create a separate agreement. She sees a few American soldiers walk in. Four of them wait outside the room. They must be their escort. Two men walk in after the maid escorts them to the door, one of them being that major shop. These two must be the leaders of their army. To her surprise, that blue hair magician will walk in with them. Major Sharp speaks first. Colonel, this is Princess Pina Colada. She notices that Colonel looks older than Sharp. She assumes that this man is Sharp's superior. She rules out that Sharp must be a noble. The colonel then looks towards her. Hello Princess Pina Colada. My name is Colonel Thomas Anderson of the 101st Air Assault Division. Under the command of the NATO Expeditionary Force. Do you mind if we have a seat? She takes a deep breath. She did not understand the meaning behind those words. But she understood the message, that this man is clearly important and high up their military. She could guess that he is even higher than Major Sharp. Yes, we can Colonel Thomas Anderson. She responds, trying to maintain her cool. Both her and Hamilton takes a seat, both nervous. The other three take their seats too, settling in. She looks up at Anderson and Sharp. Both are wearing the same style of strange uniform. There are many kinds of green colors all over it with all these other devices all over their uniforms. What looks like a small flag is on their shoulder. Just call me Colonel Anderson, thank you, Anderson said in a calming tone. Okay, Colonel Anderson, she said. I want to start off and say thank you and your comrade for helping in saving the city. She is planning to appease them hoping that they might be more lenient on her and the people of Italica. Sharp speaks first. Wait a moment. I want to set the record straight. We never would have held it if it were not for the people of this city. They deserve a lot if not all of the credit themselves. That is true, Anderson said. When we flew overhead, I was surprised by the size of the enemy. They were very well prepared. He then looks to Mayui. You should be very proud of your people Countess. Thank you very much. Mayui replied, trying to look tough. She looks to Sharp, confused by that statement. Why would he give the peasants credit? It was their strange flying dragons or wagons which saved the day. His team stayed and defended the wall. 
She wonders if they are trying to form a wedge between her and Mayui. This was exactly what she was trying to prevent. She wonders if this was related to what he said in his rally speech about common people able to raise up and topple empires. She cannot imagine the people of Falmart wanting to or being capable of overthrowing the empire, but maybe something like that happened where he is from. But the peasants would have fallen if your people weren't here, she replied. Sharp shakes his head. Nope. There were thousands of them. We would have been slaughtered, but the people held the line and he stops seeing Anderson look to stop talking. Then Anderson then nods, agreeing with Sharp. Credit isn't that important. The battle is over. Our people and the city is safe, he said and then he reached into a briefcase and pulled out a piece of paper. Princess, we do have a list of terms. He then hands the piece of paper to her. This is it, the fate of her and is on this paper and there is nothing she could do to change their demands. She wonders how much treasure they want or how many slaves they want from the city. Or if they are going to demand that she surrenders to become Sharp's or Anderson's sex slave. Or maybe as a gift to their superiors or to be ransomed to get money from her father. The more she thinks about it, the more she wonders if her father would even pay for her release. She nods to them and then looks at the list. You write in our ways? No. Miss Lelai La Lelina helped us in the translation, Sharp said giving Lelai complete credit. She sees the blue-haired woman with the staff. Lelai. This confirms her theory from yesterday one. The Americans have recruited locals to help them against the Empire. Okay. She continues in reading the terms. By the time she is done reading it, she is very confused by what she read. There are only a few terms. 1. Allowing trade between Italico and Alnus Hill, duty-free. 2. That NATO be allowed to establish a diplomatic outpost in this city and protection for the personnel there. 3. Protection to any trader from Alnus Hill and protection to any of the prisoners that they are not taking themselves. On top of all that, the Empire recognizes that Alnus Hill and the radius of 30 leagues is now a territory of the United States of America. There are some other small details but nothing in here even gets close to her best case scenario. Actually, these terms seem like them surrendering to her. Whereas the offering of slaves, or tribute or anything, the only part that makes sense is claiming the land they already occupy, and she knows there is no way they could ever take that hill back. Is this a joke? She asked. Do you think you can pull a fast one on me because I am a woman? What are you talking about? Sharp asked confused. She looks at them and she sees the two men looking confused. It is probably her face that also looks confused. What is the meaning of this? I don't understand your terms. Is this a trick? Both men look at each other and then back at her. I don't understand Princess Pina. What is wrong? Colonel Anderson asked. It has nothing to do with you being a woman, Sharp said. He then points to Lelai. If it did then why would Lelai be here helping us understand your world? She now feels silly bringing sex up. However, nothing makes sense. But, you ask for nothing. I don't understand. These terms you ask for. This is something you ask for when you are surrendering. Lelai looks at Sharp. May I explain Major? Sharp looks to Lelai and gives her permission to speak. Pina, these men do not believe in what you are thinking. In their world things are different. The idea of ownership of a person is considered barbaric. They also do not charge money for tribute or claim to take other people's property. Lelai explains, speaking very frankly. She clearly doesn't care that she is speaking to a princess of the empire. She cannot believe what she is hearing. Everything this girl is saying defies the laws of nature. Everything she was told growing up. How can a civilization operate in such a different way? She also noticed how Lelai did not use her title, showing no respect towards her position within the Empire. The Empire attacked their home and killed their people. They are here in self-defense, but they are interested in finding a peaceful resolution to the conflict. If there is one, Lelai finishes saying. She looks over to the two soldiers and receives a nod of approval from Major Shop. She smiles from the nod, enjoying the approval. She then sits down. What about these prisoners? You say they should get protection? Hamilton asked. Now that she is looking through the terms. Lelai looks at her now. Yes, in their world. 
a prisoner of battle is given fair treatment. Once the enemy soldier surrenders, they are no longer the enemy and no harm can be done upon them, they consider it civil, the laws of war, in short, you cannot sell them off as slaves or force them into slave labor. Sharp added to what Lelai said. Here is an example, we have about 5,000 of your people as prisoners of war back on earth. When the war is over, we would be glad to bring them back, no catch. And if you have any of our prisoners, we expect them to be treated with respect and returned back to us. Sharp adds, Anderson leans forward, do you have prisoners of ours? Hearing that amazed her. They have that many of her people and they have done nothing to them. No, the Empire doesn't have what you call prisoners of war. Can I have a list? I know people who crossed the gate, she asked. Anderson thinks for a second on that request. That could be arranged, but for right now I can't promise that. I will have to bring that up with the State Department, one of our governing bodies. But I do not see an issue in releasing a couple before we leave. If you don't mind providing a name list so we can see if we have them, thank you Lelai for your help. Anderson said, looking towards her. Lelai nods her head, acknowledging his thanks. Anderson then looked back at the princess. So, do we have a treaty? She looks at the paper again and thinks. This is very strange indeed, maybe they do not know what they are doing. That is when she remembers that flying beast slaughtering hundreds of those bandits in a short period of time. No. She cannot assume they don't know what they are doing. It sounds like she can refuse this treaty however. What is the alternative? It is clear this war will destroy the Empire no matter what. We cannot come close to competing. Trading a thousand of our soldiers from every one of theirs. We all will be undone. The fact is they are offering a peaceful resolution of the current situation. She looked back at them. What about this diplomatic outpost here? What are you considering? She asked. Anderson answers the question. It is to allow both yours and mine side to remain a diplomatic channel. So, we can talk and work out deals and agreements. There will be a few guards there for security, but it is not an occupation if that is what you are thinking. Our ambassador will cooperate with Countess Mayui Formal. She will act as your envoy to us. After thinking about the treaty proposal, she decided it would be the best to accept the treaty. They are actually being far better than she ever thought. I accept the terms. We shall have this treaty. Delilah is standing on the roof as she looks down. She was preparing to flee before she saw all those flying wagons. The battle looked lost but then when those flying wagons came it whined in moments. The 5000 army was slaughtered in minutes. She thinks back to her country three years ago. It was a peaceful and beautiful land where only warrior bunnies lived. Warrior bunnies, an almost all-female tribal society, being 99% female. Then three years ago the Empire invaded and conquered their lands. Crown Prince Zorzlel Caesar tricked Queen Tyul with a fake peace treaty which lowered the guard of her army. When all the bunnies were celebrating the end of the war the Imperial Army went in and quickly defeated them. The ones who were not slaughtered were raped, tortured, beaten, and worse. She. Momina and a few other bunnies were able to escape slavery. While Momina arrived here two years ago she only got her less than a year. Italica has been the only sanctuary for warrior bunnies and other demir humans like her. While Italica is not perfect, the formal family has a lighter touch compared to most imperial citizens. I see you stayed, Momina said as she lands next to her. She looks at her. I wanted to see what will happen. She then hears the other world as soldiers moving around. She looks down and sees the healers running around. Since the other world as reinforcements arrived they have been helping the townsfolk wounded. She is struggling to understand the sight. I see you are confused, Momina said. Yes, I am, she replied. Nothing is making sense. I have seen humans so nasty things, but I have never seen an enemy force help another enemy force. I understand, Momina comments. You should have seen that bitch of a princess. She is more confused than you are. I think she hates that major sharp man. Who is that one? She asked. The one who made that speech, Momina responded. Interesting. She mumbles, the leader of that first group who came yesterday. She remembers seeing them arrive. 
Besides the strange metal wagons, they had taken little interest in them. She cares little of human affairs and if humans want to kill other humans, she does not want to get in their way. But listening to that human male named Sharp, she felt like something was different too with these people. Sharp talking about the common people toppling empires. That is a phrase that she never heard before. She is telling herself that he was just saying that to get the people to fight. However that does not make sense. The other worlders did not have to stay and fight. They had no stake in it. And they fought bravely. Her eyes are showing her that they are helping. I don't know if I can trust them. Not after what humans have done to us. You know me, Momina said as she crosses her arms. I trust no one outside the formal family. I do wonder what God bless means, she asked as she thinks about the speech. I wonder why he didn't phrase it let the gods be with us. I have no idea however I doubt he misspoke, Momina answers. She takes a breath as she collects her thoughts. But you should have been in the meeting. It was very interesting. It is human things, she states as she watches a helicopter fly by. I mean it, Momina replied. They talked about something called the Geneva Convention 3. Apparently, Slava is illegal on their world and they are required by law to treat defeated armies with honor. She looks at Momina, not believing what she just said. Even if half of what she said is true then there is something to them. At least enough to have some faith again. Maybe they are what we need to save our people, she said. She looks at the other world as soldiers on patrol. They seem to be handing out supplies treating the wounded, gathering the bandits so they are no longer a threat. She sees Sharp and the other world as leader walking through the city as they talk to the people. She can see that they have no noble standards. Noblemen and royalty maintain some form of separation from their people, to remind them who is in charge. She understands that is needed in a military chain of command however this is different. Maybe, Momina said, but as I said, I trust no one. It is my job not to. As you said, they are human after all. She thinks on that as she watches the other worlders walk through the streets. We might not be able to get back home but if they are half of what they seem, we might be able to save our people. I do not want our people to end up like the cat people and the succubus. Both of those races cultures and domains were destroyed by the empire. If nothing happened the warrior bunnies would just be this exotic group you find at the slave markets or in the slums of a brothel. I think I will go to Alness and see what these people are like, she said. Maybe one day we can save Tyul. She then sees a group of other worlders. It is the same ground that first came. She jumps to the roof in front of her and then on the street. She lands in front of some other worlders. Hello, my name is Delilah. Thank you for saving my city. The soldiers look at each other. Then one of them leans in. Cool. You are a bunny. And an unchained one too, the female soldier said. I thought this place was just going to be an HBO show. She has no idea what HBO means but this confirms what Momina said about them. It seems the standard imperial oppression is not the norm for them. My name is Corporal Andrew Steele, US Army. I am Private First Class Alicia Moore, US Army also. Alicia said, it is nice to meet you Delilah. What can we do for you? Andrew asked. I was wondering if I could go to Alness. Reference, https colon slash slash dot wattpad dot com slash 112 ffb 3 f 50 f 2 a 3 b 165 c f 5 d 276 f 347 f 0 f 320 a slash 6 8 7 4 7 4 7 0 7 3 3 a 2 f 2 f 7 3 3 3 2 e 616 d 617 17 A 6 F 6 E 6 1 7 7 7 3 2 E 636 F 6 D 2 F 7 7 6 1 7 4 7 4 7 0 6 1 6 4 2 D 6 D 6 5 6 4 6 9 6 1 2 D 7 3 6 5 7 2 7 6 6 9 6 3 6 5 2 F 5 3 7 4 6 F 7 2 7 9 4 9 6 D 6 1 
1676521F444 C663626 2D56476464 F2D6 F525377 3D3 D2 D373 O343630383 O373332 E31363732646465 E6A 7067 1 Chapter 14 2 Chapter 16 3 The Geneva Conventions comprise 4 treaties, and 3 additional protocols, that establish the standards of international law for humanitarian treatment in war. Gate, War of Two Worlds Part 1 Hello everyone, this is a short update of this story. I first want to say thank you to everyone who is enjoying this story. This is my first big story I ever written, and it has evolved in ways I did not expect. I am excited on where it is going now and all the potential it has. A few things going forward. I am planning on using the original storyline more as a guideline. Loosely following that plot. I personally have a lot of ideas that I came up with and I think they will be fun to write down. I currently have three big campaigns, operations planned out and maybe more down the road. I also have a few more new characters coming in. I also plan on diving into the political reality, like the manga did. In the story, seeing how this fantasy world might affect our world. However though, my focus is on the fantasy world first. As I said, this fan flick has grown far bigger than I expected. I figured it would get 300 views max and I would peak out at 5 chapters. One thing I realized is that it is taking far longer to flesh out scenes, Siege of Italica lasting 7 chapters now. I don't see that as a bad thing. If it takes that long then so be it. I rather focus more on quality and feeling natural than forced and rushed. One other major thing I am doing now is archiving everything. This story has grown far bigger and there are way too many characters to mentally keep track of. Some of them are beginning to have far more depth and it has become harder to keep track of it all. Again, I don't see that as a negative but a fun challenge. I don't plan on releasing 5 chapters a week. I've been wanting to get Italica done so I could move on to other plans. In addition, I am begin to go back on past chapters and fix them. No plot changes, just grammar and spelling. Some minor structure changes based on what I learned but what you know now will still be the same. Thank you all and enjoy. I enjoy feedback, tips and ideas. All this is unknown territory for me, and it has been an amazing experience. Gate, War of Two Worlds Part 1 Fort Alness, Vanguard Headquarters May 10, 2025 For the first time in weeks, everything is quiet at the base. Well relatively quiet for an army base. The military base at Alness Hill, now being called Fort Alness has been a buzz of activity since the invasion one. Most of the Vanguard teams, which are made up of Ranger from the 75th Ranger Regiment, are out on missions. When Major Sharp's unit called in reinforcements, the bulk of the airborne forces were deployed. It is nice that the base is quiet. The rainstorm yesterday cancelled many missions, leaving the base with a strange sense of peace. First Lieutenant Sarah Rose is walking between two buildings, carrying forms, mission reports, and other paperwork. She had just finished a staff meeting and now she is heading back to her barracks, Vanguard 7 Barracks. She is the logistical member of Vanguard 7. While they are out on their missions, I get the necessary resources and information for the next mission, and if necessary, work with the other Vanguard staff members for joint missions. She looks up at the sky and smiles. What a beautiful world. The sky is so blue. Looking up at the sky. She would begin to think about her team that she is responsible for. She got her team SOS and sent it up the chain of command too. From what Alicia said the situation sounded bad. She was glad to see that the general took the matter seriously. She knows the 101st went there but that was the last she heard of them. They will be fine, she said out loud, speaking to herself. If what I think is true and he gets out of his head they should be fine. 
She stops for a moment to relax. She takes a deep breath and smiles. I do love how clear the air is here. Reminds me of home. She takes a moment to think about Wisconsin, living in the suburbs. She walks into the Ranger Vanguard Command Center and sees the other Vanguard logistical officers. Each one leading a small team with the sole purpose of supporting their teams while they explore this mostly unknown alien world. As she sits down at her desk and gets caught up with what happened at Italica, she begins to think why Major Sharp is allowing those three girls to tag along. They are locals and can help navigate this world, but I seem strange that he would. On Earth, he was so distant with the team, almost like he hated joining the Rangers. But something always seemed off about that and now he is working with Lelai and Rory. Plus, he saved that little girl Selena. And now he is protecting a city from an attack. I had a feeling he was not a real dick. Italica. May 10th, 2025. After the treaty was formalized and signed, Colonel Anderson and Major Sharp are walking out of the East Gate. Are you sure you don't want an escort back to base? Anderson asked him. We got it sir, we still have to complete our original mission, he responds. He looks around as they leave the city walls. There are dozens of airborne soldiers guarding the Black Hawks and Chinooks. Soldiers loading up a dozen prisoners into a Chinooks for integration. Besides all that, there will be dead bodies everywhere. Something on your mind Major? Anderson asked. Just thinking sir, he replied. I was just wondering if battlefields were like this back in the day. Back in the day, where large armies would meet and clash in hand-to-hand -hand combat. You would watch it on film or read it in some history books but seeing it with his own eyes is an eye-opener, he finds it unreal. Modern wars are brutal but compared to this, they seem different. Don't know if it's just the difference in technology and culture but all this just seems strange. It feels like going back in time, seeing yourself in the mirror. One of these days some professor will figure this out, find some answer, he comments, probably. But I don't think they had flying horses two and a half thousand years ago, Anderson said looking out in the sea of bodies. He looks at him and watches as Anderson looks back at him. He then starts laughing. Who knows sir? Right, Anderson replied. We should get back to the base before it gets dark. Both shake each other's hand and then the colonel starts walking away, barking orders to his men, telling them to load up, before Anderson leaves. He looks back at him. Shop, by the way, what is your mission here? He was about to answer the question but then he stopped himself from speaking. After thinking on the question for a moment, realizing what his mission was and that they all came close to dying for it. It made logical sense just yesterday but now, he will be back as the colonel. Shopping sir, teenage girls. Shopping saying that out loud made it sound even dumber. Anderson laughs out loud like he does not fully believe the reality of it. Well, not the worst thing dying for. Shopping. Yeah, teenage. Yeah, just be glad they don't have credit cards major. Girls are very expensive. Trust me I have two of them. See you back at base major. Good luck. Was going to say you owe me a beer, but it seems you got the short end already. He chuckles and gives him a quick salute. He then walks away as the cavalry unit begins to leave Italica. As he heads back into the city, he reflects on his difference this war is compared to what he has come so far. Selena is walking along the streets of Italica. Growing up, she was told stories of this city. An amazing hub city with many riches from around the known world. Too bad her first time here was during a battle. Most of the city seems to be closed as the townsfolk work on recovering from the battle. She is not traveling alone but with Lelai and Rory. Lelai is taking the lead, seeming to know where she is going. Coming here was her idea after all. I take it you've been here before? She asked, staying close to Rory. Even though the city seems appreciated for their help in saving the city, at the end of the day they are still subjects of the Empire and that scares her. So staying close to Rory brings some felt of safety. Only a few times, never for a long period of time though. We rarely stayed in one place. Lelai comments, I don't know what the big deal about this place is. Just looks like another city to me. Rory said out loud, yawning as she speaks. She seems to be a bit tired, 
that would not be surprising though after everything she had killed. I don't know, I heard nothing but great things about this place, she said back to her, yeah, after living 900 years and I have found that most towns pretty much start looking the same. Rory comments, not caring. Lolai suddenly stops and then opens the door to this shop. Good. It is not close. They all go inside the merchant's store. Once inside, they see all this pricey merchandise all around the store walls and tables. Lelai walks straight up to the merchant and begins to talk to him. Rory just wanders around, looking for anything that looks interesting. She starts to go looking around, seeing what the Empire has to offer. Most of it is items she sees are unimpressive. Back in her country, they had had beautiful pottery. A textile that was second to none. That was until the Empire started burning villages down and causing so much destruction. As she walks, something catches her eye. It is a small wooden figure dressed in the ancient army. It looks different from the other wooden figures all over this shelf. That is when Rory walked up. What do you have for Miss Alina? She said in a cutie tone, implying there might be a hidden message. She gets startled for a moment and then her face blushes a bit. Ah, oh, so cute. I didn't mean to startle you kid, Rory said and then looks down and sees the figure. Interesting choice. She looks down at it and then back at Rory. Why is it? Who is it? He looks different than the others. He was an ancient warrior general before the Empire existed. Way before. Rory said, recalling the information in her head. His name was Kesozura. It was during the Dark Ages, thousands of years ago. At least I think so. It has been 700 years since I heard that name. She nods her head. I heard that story before. My dad once told me about it. When demon creatures attacked, and they were defeated by the races of this world. She thinks about that thought. So, it was this man? I thought it was just some old wise tale for the boys to pretend to be soldiers. Yes. Legend foretells a man that rallied the races together, human, hybrids, beasts, ever orcs, and goblins, that they were able to defeat the demons and drive them back through a doorway, Rory said. Doorway. Like what is happening now? She points out, making the two connections. Rory thinks about that. She always assumed that this doorway was just a historical text description of something. If the old texts are true, maybe the demons came through a gate just like the Americans did. Something to think about. But the far more interesting fact to Rory is why is she so interested in this toy figure? She sees Rory smirk and then gets confused and scared, not knowing which one to be. Ah. Why? Rory places her figure on her lips. So why are you so interested in this? Are you into historical text or want to be a great warrior? Or are looking to get something, for someone, she finishes in a teasing tone, already knowing the true answer, she blushes, ah, no, well, not at first, she moved Rory's hand away and saw her laugh, I don't know, it just reminded me of that, what did they call it, she thinks about the name of the toy that Sharp had on in the dashboard, a bobhead Optimus Prime figure, Rory rolls her eyes and smirks, apparently, Boys from all worlds love their toys, boys will be boys. In that Earth show, Optimus Prime is some great leader that always knows what is right, she said. I figured this might be inspiring too, but that's. Rory places her hand on her shoulder to stop her. Let's get it. Should be fun. They head to Lelai. Once there, both are shocked by the number of books and scrolls Lelai bought. There goes being rich. Rory said, why did you get all that information? Events are happening and I want to know why. See if this has happened before. Lelai said, also, some of these books are rare and advanced. I never could have afforded them before, or ever. Well then, it is only fair if we can get this little figure, Rory stated. Reference, https colon slash slash shim dot wapad dot com slash 112 ffb 3 f 50 f 2 a 3 b 165 c f 5 d 276 f 347 f 0 f 320 a slash 6 8 7 4 7 4 7 0 7 3 3 a 2 f 2 f 7 3 3 3 2 e 616 d 616 
Chapter 1, 2 Chapter 17 Gate, War of Two Worlds Part 1 Roma Highway May 10, 2025 Vanguard 7 spend most of the day at Italica, completing their original mission. After that they left Italica with a hero's departure. Major Sharp was surprised and pleased that the town was so thankful for their help. His intention to show a positive side worked. Countess Mayui del Formal was incredibly grateful giving a short speech thanking Vanguard 7 and their American friends. Princess Pina Colada on the other hand was more pleased that they were leaving. The 3JLTVR on the road, heading back to Alnus. The mood in the vehicles is high, after a successful and stressful battle. It would be good that they are happy because things could have gone far different. The radio is alive with team members talking to each other, all arguing about the new topic of the day. I am telling you man, this is the future. It is to be, Andrew said in a confident tone. Randy speaks up next through the radio. That is stupid man. This is not the future. No, see, it makes sense. That is why there are hybrid humans all around. Nuclear winter changed everything. Andrew explains. At least three rangers are speaking over the radio, all trying to explain how dumb that was. This is not Planet of the Apes Andrew. Alicia comments. No. This has to be an alternate reality. Andrew replied, forcing his idea out there. What if we are in a movie like the last Action Hero 1 film? Scott asked. Does it really matter guys? Do you honestly think you will solve it right here? Jerry said the radio will go quiet but then what seems like everyone will yell yes it matters. Alicia sits back down crossing her arms. Men, how about this idea? What if the gate is a portal into the matrix? Andrew adds to the topic of the day, throwing out random ideas. That one is bad, Selena asked in a nervous tone, looking at him. Right? What he said was silly. He looks at her and nods. Correct. As Andrew drives. He looks behind his seat with a confused look. What? Steel, you just got put in your place by a little brat, he said with a chuckle. Is a brat a good thing? Selena asks in confusion. He smirks from the question. A brat is the highest of honor. I was called that many times growing up. That explains a lot. Alicia mumbles. Do you even know what I am referencing? Andrew asked. Selena shakes her head no and then looks at him. I don't know what a matrix is, but it just sounds dumb. Been around you guys long enough know the difference between a smart and dumb ideas. He, Alicia, and Rory begin to start laughing at what Selena said, making fun of Andrew. Sharp explains the story over the radio so the whole team and they all begin to rag on him over the net. Who needs enemies, Andrew said, smiling a little. Out of everyone, Lelai looks very confused. I don't understand. Why are they fighting? They're just being stupid. One of the rangers started a betting pool to see who will be the first to figure out what your world is. Too complicated to explain. Alicia replied to her question. He leans backwards, facing the back of the JLTV from the front seat. It is interesting that this world not only has humans but other intelligent creatures too. People on Earth have always thought a world like this was just a fantasy one. You guys have magic. Monsters, 
fantasy races, it seems everything. I always thought it was made up, he explains and then reaches for his personal radio. Nah, this has to be another planet, cannot be time travel. Lelai thinks and then pulls on Sharp's jacket. You said your people believe magic is make-believe. Maybe it is because your people lost the ability to imagine it, so you lost the knowledge. That is, it. Andrew suddenly yells and then speaks through the radio. Lelai figured it out. We're in imagination land. Don't start corporal. I love that episode. Don't ruin it for me. Johnson orders over the radio next. He thinks about Andrew's idea. Imagination Land is a three-part episode from the show South Park. It is where the kids go into this world that is full of their imaginations. Everything that was created ended up there. Every story, every friend, every idea and thought. Then he gets a scary thought. Humans have very twisted thoughts at times, both the good and bad or depending how a person thinks about it. The more he thinks about imagination land, the scarier it becomes to him. Lelai now looks confused, not understanding the reference. Sometimes she has a hard time understanding earth human humor. There is no way this can be imagination land, he responds. And why is that? Someone will say over the radio. Scott finally jumps into the conversation and said what he was thinking. He started this whole mess and then stayed quiet, using everyone for his own personal show. Because everything would be perverted and gross. Let us be honest. We already have an imagination land and it is called the internet. We all know what is on there. That is when the radio will go dead quiet. Now everyone imagination all their darkest thoughts. For the first time since they left Italica. Truth be told, living in a real imagination land would be very, interesting to say kindly. Right then everyone would agree to end this topic and move on. What is this internet? Lelai asked, confused. Is it bad? Well, Alicia replied. If you are looking to explore your dark side then yes, it is bad. Rory will burst out laughing, thinking how that was funny, understanding the full context behind all of it. Oh, thank the gods, I was beginning to think you were all these purists but no. You're all perverts. This is going to be fun. Shut up, Rory. Alicia tells her. The conversation continues for a bit, all throwing out different ideas. Most of these ideas are to just blow off steam and bond with each other. That is when the first JLTV stops, which is Johnson's vehicle. Sir, I need you up front. We have contact with what seems to be cavalry. The convoy stops as ordered. Roger, on my way. And all teams stay in your vehicle, do not act hostile. He gets out of his JLTV and walks up front. When he arrives, he sees dozens of horsemen and women. He notices the Rose Order banner, like the one Grey and Pina had. As he walks up, he pulls out a piece of paper, that being a copy of the treaty from Princess Pina. Who are you and where are you going? One of the women in blonde hair demands. Are you coming from Italica? Wow ma'am, calm down. My CEO is coming. We're friendly. Johnson said, speaking from his window. As he walks up, he sees a decent amount of these knights, at least a platoon worth. He notices the flag which has a red rose on it. They must be part of the princess outfit so this should be easy to fix. To his surprise, almost all of them are women. He only sees one, maybe two men in the group. Not that he has anything against that. What is usually fought by men? Ignoring the part that men are on average stronger, in most society men have always been considered more expendable, to be thrown into battle if needed. Still, give someone a gun or in this case a sword, that quickly evens the playing for everyone. A bullet knows no different. Everyone equal to its steadliness. Hello there. My name is Major Sharp of the United States Army. I am in command of this unit. What is the issue ma'am? He asked. All of the female knights look at him with this pure hatred in their eyes. So, you're the enemy leader. I am not impressed. Why are you coming from Italica? And where are you going? The blonde hair lady will say. Hold on. Here, he said and then hands her the document. We were visiting the city. We are on our way to Alness Hill. We have permission. Hearing that name Alness enrages these knights. You're the enemy from the gate. Warrior, prepare for battle. A darker hair woman yells, holding out his sword. Wow. Wait. 
He raises his hands, trying to calm them down. We have permission to travel back there. We mean you no harm. This document is from Pina. Then he realizes he should have added Pina's title. Then why is there smoke coming from Italica? You attacked them. The yellow hair women say, not listening to him. Sharp turns around and sees smoke coming from the city. It did not even dawn on him that smoke was coming from the city. It makes sense if she is assuming. They attacked it. Ah shit. Attack. The blonde haired woman yells. Open fire. Johnson yells over the NW2. He realizes the treaty is about to fall apart. Everything his team just did in Italica would be for nothing if the treaty falls apart. His superiors will have no choice but to attack it also if the treaty falls apart, turning them into an enemy. He would hate to come back here and kill those townsfolks for a misunderstanding. He thinks about letting the M2 Browning.50 caliber take them out however they are so close it might result in a few friendly casualties. Plus, he just made some inroads with the enemy leader and killing her own unit is not a good way to build on that relationship. He understands what a unit is. It is like a second family, sometimes first. He turns around to look at his unit. Hold fire. Fall back. Back to base now. The first vehicle, Johnson vehicle backs up, ramming into the other then turns left and, drives away. The other two also drive away, following it. He knew they hated leaving but he always knew Johnson would obey his order. And right then everything goes dark as something hard hits him in the back of his head. Hours later. Why the hell did you leave him behind? Alicia asked, yelling at Johnson. Stand down private. He gave a direct order. Johnson said. Alicia stands down, about to burst out angry but then manages to control herself. Yes sir. Vanguard 7 drove away and is now out of sight away from any road, they would be holding up by the tree line, close to Italica. Why did you leave your commander behind? You could have easily killed them. Lel I asked Randy. Randy has his arm crossed, clearly not liking the situation. It's politics, kid. If we open fired, then the treaty which we just signed would be worthless. Italica might retaliate which means we would. The Major understands what happens when a small event escalates into a big one and wants to avoid it, and 2nd Lieutenant Johnson looks over, overhearing them. On top of that, we weren't in a good position to fight. All trap inside the vehicles. So, are we heading to base as ordered? Alicia asked. No, gear up, we're going light, in and out. Johnson orders, Italica, May 10th, 2025. Boses go Palesti. One of the Rose Order of Knights' greatest warriors, one of Princess Pina's most loyal knights. All her life she has sworn to serve her princess, waiting for the day to prove her loyalty. For years she has known Pina has been wanting to prove herself to her father and bring honor and glory to the Rose Order. She looks to that other world dweller called Sharp from the other side of the gate, while riding on her horse, heading back to Italica. She looks back at that strange man. When he woke up, she took him back to one of our wagons and had two of our knights beat out information from him. Well, at least they tried. She must admit, he is resilient on torture. Sharp is currently tied to a robe that is connected to a wagon. He has a black eye and bruises all over. Strangely, he is currently humming some strange song, something about a highway. It is strange. He told this story about a flying beast killing all these bandits, saving the city. There is no way that can be true. We are close to the city and yes it looks damaged, but they were the ones that came from it. That is when Beefeater Ekati rides up to her side. Has he given any information how he got this fake treaty? Nope. Still saying that the princess just gave it to him, she said. Impossible. There is no way she would give a treaty like this to them. Beefeater said in a confused tone. She then looks at the document that is currently rolled up in her hand. But the terms do seem to be like they surrendered to her. Maybe she already defeated the people from the gate. And they were the last of them. That is when she pulls out this knife that she took from that man. I bet. Look. This is their primary weapon. This dagger. How can cut down a man with this? They must be stupid from where he is from. She looks at that man again. Hey. Answer this question. Why would your people attack us with such weak weapons? You thought you could defeat us with this? 
she holds up his knife, Sharp looks at it and then at her, yeah, pretty much, he then coughs, needing water, we thought about coming here in sandals, but we thought that would have been, too stupid, that answer just infuriates her, is Sharp just mocking her or what? You, you will pay for your sins, attacking the great empire and for mocking me. She then hits him hard in the chest. I don't understand what the fuss has been about. Your people abandon you at the first sight of trouble. If all of your people are like them then taking Alnus Hill will be easy. Beefita adds. Too easy. We will never earn glory with such a weak opponent, she comments, not impressed by these people. Well then, why not you do it then, Sharp said in a sarcastic tone. That would just turn him a hit in the gut from a large wooden bat-like object. Once they got into town, she expected to be met with celebration by the townsfolk. That all the people would be happy that the Rose Order of Knights were able to drive the enemy away and capture their leader. But it was all quiet once they got there. They notice that some people are giving them these disrespectful glares and then walk away. Beefita quietly speaks to her. Is it just me or is something off here? It seems everyone is upset with us. Maybe they are still shocked from the recent battle, she replied, guessing on the matter. As they walk through Italica she can see the peasants staring at her. She gets the feeling that the Rose Knights are the enemy, not the other worlder. While they are well trained and armed, if they decide to attack them, they will have no chance. Maybe we were late. Beefy to guesses. We did get stuck in that rainstorm and had to go around. That is when she again looks at Sharp again as she hears children run up to him. She sees these two little boys and a little girl giving the soldier some bread and water. Sharp waves at them and tells them everything will be okay. He keeps reassuring the kids and the townsfolk not to worry. Witnessing that confused her more. A deep feeling that something is completely wrong sings in her gut. She starts to wonder if the city did surrender to this man, if so, then why would not have they attacked and ran away? Yeah, Beefita said. Something is not right. Has the city rebelled? You know the formal family, she replied. They are soft people. Cow pies have more integrity. If it was not for their wealth they should be purged for their backwards views. Being soft on the enemy, just like the bunnies, as they ride through the city. They keep getting the same reaction for the townsfolk. She hears many of her knights whispering as they try to figure out what is going on. Some think they are traitors, while others start to guess that maybe the other worlders were correct. That is when she sees a wagon full of dead bodies. The city clearly was attacked, and the people are in the middle of clearing it up. They keep getting disrespectful glares and back talk. She starts to feel like she is marching like she is the one conquering the city, not saving it. When the Rose Knights reach the palace, they form a line. Knights, dismount. Beefeater orders. Both Beefeater and she takes the prisoner along with them, with six of their fellow knights as guards. Their male knight Jalen is the one holding him, so he does not escape. To their surprise he has not resisted once, only back talk with these strange references on the way to the throne room, assuming where Pina should be. While walking there, they jokingly talk about all the things they would do to him. Should they just enslave him to punish his ego, crucify him here or in front of his comrades, whore him out for some quick coin? Lots of fun, lots of choices. They walk into the chambers and see Princess Pina sitting on the throne. Countess Mayui del Formal is standing there as they are talking about something. Pina's personal servant Hamilton is standing there, recording everything they said. She starts to say something related to the city, mentioning the number of casualties the city suffered. All three of them look exhausted. The three of them look like they have this huge relief was just lifted. That must be how they won the battle against the gate people. She feels like she will be able to lift the princess spirits with their prisoner. He must have been the one who attacked and looted the city. The three of them looked to Beefita and her, all happy to see them. I am so happy to see you all here. I cannot believe it. Oh, thank there. Who is that? Pina suddenly asked with her concerned voice. She begins to feel a huge amount of pride within her. My princess, today we rose knights brought great honor on our first victory and glory. While on the way here we faced and caught one of the warrior's leaders who attacked Italica. 
I also have to report that once we entered the city the peasants here have been very disrespectful towards us, Beefeater explains. They provided food, water, and kindness to the enemy prisoner while ignoring us. She looks at my Yui. I know the peasants of this city have been through a lot however treating imperial knights with such disrespect is a crime. I will deal with it. Now show me this prisoner. I wish to seek my revenge on him for daring to attack us. She signals two of her knights to bring up the other world as prisoner. They drag him and set him down on his knees. Princess Pina, she said. This is the enemy we intercepted outside of Italica. She can tell something is off. She can see Mayui panicking, like her world just came crashing down. She then notices the same reaction from Pina and Hamilton. Even the maids look scared. Right then, Hamilton's mouth drops wide open, not believing what she is seeing. By the gods, Mayui sits down and holds her legs, taking a deep breath. The head maid walks over to ease her stress. Sharp looks up and smirks. Hey, your highness. Long time no see, he said in an exhausted voice. He then gives her a wink. Reference, https colon slash slash shim.wapad.com slash 112 ffb 3 f 50 f 2 a 3 b 165 c f 5 d 276 f 347 f 0 f 320 a slash 687474707333a2 f 2 f 73332e 616d 617 a 6 f 6 e 6 1 7 7 7 3 2 e 636 f 6 d 2 f 7 7 6 1 7 4 7 4 7 0 6 1 6 4 2 d 6 d 6 5 6 4 6 9 6 1 2 d 7 3 6 5 7 2 7 6 6 9 6 3 6 5 2 f 5 3 7 4 6 f 7 2 7 9 4 9 6 d 6 1 Six seven six five two F four hundred and forty four C six six three six two D five six four seven seven six four F two D six F five two five three seven seven three D three D two D three seven three O three four three six three O three eight three O three seven three three two E three one three six three seven three two three two six four six five three two six two three one one three eight six four three one six five three four three two three five three four three two three two three 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 eight three nine three seven three seven three four three nine three two two e six a seven thousand and sixty seven one last action hero film 1993 2 nw equals net warrior network gate war of two worlds part one italica count palace may 10th 2025, Princess Pina stands there in pure shock, while staring at her two Rose Order leaders, Beefita Ikati and Bozisko Palesti. They have been her most loyal comrades for years, even being some of her closest friends. But right now, her mind is scrambling to figure out what she is witnessing. This war was supposed to bring glory not only for herself but for her knights too, for showing that they belong in the realm of men. Now, Everything seemed to be falling apart. Italica was attacked and almost destroyed. Then, she discovered that the enemy is far more powerful than the Empire and would face certain death if they fought. She thought she was able to secure some form of peace, hoping to take credit for bringing the war to a quick end. Seeing Major Sharp on his knees there, she is ready to pass out from the sight. Her mind could not take the sight, after his people saved the city and became heroes of the city. They gave favorable treaty terms, saved her from slavery and they asked for nothing in return. And this is how the Empire returned their kindness. It hasn't even been a day, she mumbles in disbelief. She can see them both looking confused, realizing they did something wrong but still cannot figure out what it was. Both gets on one knee. Your Highness, what is the matter? Are you not pleased with our gift? Beefita asked in a confused manner trying to impress the princess. Yes, we ran into those warriors from Alnus, three leagues outside the city. Their forces scattered without a fight. Boses said in a not-so-confident tone this time. 
trying to show off her achievement however still trying to figure out what she did wrong. Pina places her hand on her head, trying to deal with a growing headache. All she could think about is the capital city of Sadara in flames as those flying metal beasts laid waste to everything. Boses and Beefita, and the rest of her knights will be the reason Sadra burns, because of their incompetence. That is when Major Sharp spoke up. Ah yeah, can I jump in? He said weakly coughing. Jump in, you are bound. You can't move. How can you jump? Boses said towards him, shooting him an evil glare. Sharp just ignores her Boses and just keeps looking at her. She can see no fear in his eyes. She cannot tell if he knows his people will come for him or knows she will not do anything to him. The fact that he is not scared scares her more. She can tell that he is trying hard just to stay sitting up. Yes. Major Sharp. All the Rose Knights in the chamber raise their eyebrow, shocked and confused that she knew his name. One. No two things. Sharp mumbles with a cocky smirk. One. Don't worry about anything. Just a misunderstanding. Nothing as bad as the cartels and North Koreans would do. Or the Legion of Doom one. Especially those blisters. Blusters. I. I don't know. He said, slurring his words a little. Seek dot dot n. Two bed please? He will finish. A little breathless. Hamilton. Pina yells. She would not have to say anything else. Hamilton would just rush to him and hold him up, removing the bounds. Can I get some help? Hamilton asked. That is when my Yui orders Momina and Persia rushes over. She sees her knights look at each other with confusion. They do not understand why Hamilton and the maids are helping the enemy. We will take it from here, Persia said. You knights have done enough, Momina adds. She sees them take Sharp up the stairs. Princess, what is the meaning of this? He is the enemy. Boses yells in frustration, not understanding what is happening. Hamilton turns around to face her fellow knights. Are you girls stupid? She yells. Watch your mouth Hamilton, Panache said. You might be a rose knight but remember your station as a servant. She can see everyone shocked that Hamilton raised her voice. She has always been the shy and submissive one in the group. She would never speak ill to any in the rose knights. Stop right there. She yells at her old friend Boses. Do you know that you all just did? We just signed a treaty with them this morning. This damn morning. Hamilton might be a servant but clearly. She is more intelligent than you all combined. She can see this fear across all their faces. They all figure out the gravity of the situation and know they all screwed up. Beefita begins to get nervous. She knows what Pina is talking about. Your Highness, I believe I have the treaty you speak of here. She reaches down and pulls it out of her bag. That man, Sharp, gave it to us. She could not believe what she just heard. That American even showed them the treaty that she just signed, and they ignored it. Are we that inferior that we cannot even honor agreements? You. You saw the treaty and ignored it. We. Boses speaks up first but then calms herself down. She got back on her knee. We thought it was a fake. We saw smoke coming from Metallica and thought they attacked the city. The terms made no sense. Yes. They are the enemy mom. Why are you helping that man? We are at war. They have no honor. They abandoned their own. Beefita said before being interrupted by the princess. They saved the city from certain death. We were attacked by bandits. If it were not for them, everyone would be dead or enslaved. You fools. The people from the gate saved us all. She yells at them, still struggling with what is happening. Everyone in this city sees them as heroes. Hamilton yells when they left. They were given a hero's honor. You brought him back in chains which was a spit in the face to every peasant in the city. We might have to deal with their revolt now. She adds, frustrated with the situation. She crosses her leg and thinks, trying to regain control of her emotions. All my life I was told that women had no place in war. That the battlefield, honor, and glory are the realm of men. That women did not understand the meaning of honor and couldn't understand the weight of the situations. That we are too emotional and soft-hearted. She said, repeating what she has been told growing up. I created the Rose Order of Knights to prove all that wrong, and on our first mission all this happened. She leans forward and places her hands on her cheeks, 
horses ass I can't believe this. Did everything they say was true? That we cannot handle this? Our only place in this world is to be married off to some nobleman and have babies? She sees all her knights kneeling there none of them able to respond to her question. She wanted to yell at them more but didn't see the point. She leans back and takes a deep breath. She begins to explain what happened and how his people flew here in metal flying wagons and destroyed the enemy within minutes. How they defeated the enemy, but then asked for nothing in return. Everything in the treaty was their idea. And then she went off on a massive rant about how the Empire will be destroyed by their overwhelming weapons and that she just secured a line of hope for peace, maybe, just maybe saving the Empire for certain defeat. But they just might have ruined it all. Pina gets angry easily, especially when she is told she cannot do something, but she rarely explodes on her own people. She is always an example to her people, but this time she let everything out on these two all day. These feelings and the stress of the situation have been growing in her and she finally let it all out. They tried protesting at first but then they realized that they screwed up. I am sorry your highness, Boses said, trying to keep herself from bursting out. Please let me make it up to you. She drops herself back into her throne, crosses her legs, and thinks. You, I need to think, I will deal with you all later. The team reaches the southern gate. The three guards were knocked out by the rangers, who snuck up on them. They all are wearing their night vision devices which allow them to see in the dark. Rory stands there thinking how strange the way these people are moving is. They are running around like children playing some hiding games. They are heroes of this city. Why are they acting like this? To the right is Lelai, having the same reaction as she is. She seems confused. To her left is Selina. Also looking just as confused, Second Lieutenant Charles Johnson, the dark-skinned soldier of the team, seems to take full command. It is funny how many titles these people have. The nobles of this world have all these names and titles to make them feel more superior to the common folk. But these people, they have a title for a title, which is funny and strange at the same time. Originally, he wanted to split the team into two groups leaving some of their vehicles to babysit Lelai and Selina. To everyone's surprise, Selina protested, and she was not going to let it go. Rory thought it was adorable and agreed to watch over her during the lieutenant's mission. As the soldiers move from building to building, slowly heading towards the palace, the three girls just walk down the middle, watching them do their soldier thing. As they get close, they run into a female neko looking human in a maid uniform. She is standing there, looking at them. Ah, finally, I was beginning to wonder if that smell was not you. My name is Persia, I will escort you back to the palace. All the rangers will look at each other, clearly confused. Smell? Scott asked. Yes, Persia said and looked at Scott. Well, I mainly smelled you. Good sir. There is some laughter coming from the other rangers. Persia looks at them with a smile. Yes, out of all of you, he smelled the nicest. The laughter ended hearing that. Andrew and Alicia smelled themselves, wondering if they smelled bad. Lelai walks up to Persia. She is a cat humanoid or what Andrew said before, a nego one. Her kind has a great ability to smell and hear from long distances. She probably knew we were coming before we got to the gate. You're kidding? Randy asked, shocked by that. She sees Persia waves to her, and she waves back. Hi there, it has been a while, nice to see you again. Once Persia finished saying that, she noticed all the soldiers looking right at her. Johnson asked that she knows people here. Of course, I know lots of people, she said all innocently. She is Rory Mercury, the Apostle of Emroy. She smiles and looks to the lieutenant, recognizing that he is the new leader. I have your commander. We are treating him. You are all safe. Please follow me. Bose's go palace is walking down the hallway of the palace. Today has not gone the way she wanted it to. She thought that capturing the enemy leader would bring her honor and glory, but it became the greatest humiliation of her life. But well now comes the second worst humiliation of her life. Her and Pina had a very long talk about what she could do to make things right. 
and now her highness wants to offer herself to earn that man's forgiveness. Do whatever she has to do to fix this crisis. Lay, please, or even marry if he demands. She hates every bit of it, wanting to marry someone she loves, not because of some diplomatic relations issue, especially with an enemy of the empire. What a disgrace. However, she has always been loyal to her princess. They have been friends since they were children and highly respect her. She was one of her first students and joined her Rose Academy, even if her father hated it. If this is what she must do to earn her place by her side again, she did it. As she gets close to the door, she hears all this noise coming from the room. It sounds like music, but it sounds so hard, loud. It does not matter. She has a duty to do and will fulfill it. She opens the door, taking a deep breath. Once she opens the door, she sees all these people all in there. They are all the same people she saw before. In those strange metal wagons, plus Rory Mercury, some blue-haired girl, and another dark brown-haired girl. Hamilton is here too, playing some game with paper cards. She sees some of Mayui's maids here joining in the fun. Persia, Maya, and Aura. And that is when she sees that man called Sharp, sitting up on the room bed. Sharp is shirtless, bandages covering some of the wounds I personally gave him before. It looks like he is enjoying the fun with everyone else. He is playing with his knife, flinging it between his fingers, showing off to this little girl. What is the meaning of this? She demands. Boses? Hamilton asked. What are you doing here? The sight angers her so much. Today has been her most humiliating day in her life and now this Pina wants her to have sex with him to please him, so he does not go back to his people and report what happened. She has no idea how to do that with all these people and besides, he is the enemy after all. Risking a pregnancy to please the enemy in this manner angers her to the point she is ready to explode. That is when she hears her name, coming from Hamilton. She waves over to her boses. Why are you dressed like that? You, you bastard. She takes her slip off and throws it at that man and storms back to her room. Reference, https colon slash slash shim dot wapad dot com slash 112 ffb 3 f 50 f 2 a 3 b 165 c f 5 d 276 f 347 f 0 f 320 a slash 687474707333 a 2 f 2 f 7 3 3 3 2 e 616 d 616 17 a 6 f 6 e 6 1 7 7 7 3 2 e 636 f 6 d 2 f 7 7 6 1 7 4 7 4 7 0 6 1 6 4 2 d 6 d 6 5 6 4 6 9 6 1 2 d 7 3 6 5 7 2 7 6 6 9 6 3 6 5 2 f 5 3 7 4 6 f 7 2 7 9 4 9 6 d 6 1 one six seven six five two F four hundred and forty four C six six three six two D five six four seven seven six four F two D six F five two five three seven seven three D three D two D three seven three O three four three six three O three eight three O three seven three three two E three one three six three seven three two three two six four six five three two six two three one three eight six four three one six five three four three two three five three four three two three two three 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 eight three nine three seven three seven three four three nine three two two e six a seven thousand and sixty seven one chapter fifteen gate war of two worlds part one italica countess palace may eleventh two thousand and twenty five Princess Pina Colada is walking down the palace hallway later that night. After yelling at her friend Boses after failing her a second time within a day, she decided the only way to form any peace is to take matters in her own hands. She is terrified that Major Sharp will go back to his people and tell them she broke the treaty. When that happens, she knows they will come back to Italica and kill everyone. Any good grace that was achieved will be lost. She cannot believe it was only two days ago that she was plotting on betraying them after the battle was over. Now she needs try anything she can to please them. 
she prefers to do it through reason however, he is a man, she gets to the door that Mayui put the other worlders in, she sees two italic knights standing there on guard. She is not worried that they will stop her, being an imperial princess. She has only known Sharp for a short period of time, but the warrior language crosses all species lines, in our world and hopefully in their world. That is what Grey told her during the Rose Academy. She decided to dress in her armor, wanting to try to connect on what they have in common, being a warrior. Then, if she needs to, seduce him if all else fails. All her life she has seen some of the most respectable men in Sadra fall to their knees after seeing a little cleavage. To her surprise, Rory opens the door. Oh, hello there. What are you doing here? Rory asked smirking at her princess that left an uneasy feeling in her body i am here to see ah sharp rory finished for her chuckling clearly she can see how nervous she is yes him the major i want to talk to him about the treaty she said making sure the princess understands that she is in control and in authority here there is a short pause from the conversation as rory thinks she then gives this big smirk oh he is not happy about that. After what happened, she glanced up, placing a figure on her chin. I have to say, assassination by slipper, very creative. Not that effective but creative. And I was wondering when you were going to show up. What do you mean? She asked, confused. Countess Mayui was here. Rory said she came and thanked them for saving her city. And that they are welcome guests and under her protection. Clearly she is doing a better job than you. Rory then chuckles, not caring about her title. Also, if your knights try anything you will have to face Countess Mayui formal maids. We all know what they are capable of. They are under their protection. Just don't forget that last part. She reaches out and pokes Pina on the noise. Hearing that she becomes scared but would do her best not to show it. Do they believe she just tried to assassinate him? She cannot believe that she is negotiating with an apostle. An apostle that is protecting the enemy. I understand. Can I please see him? Rory stands there thinking, toying with the princess. No. Sure. He is on the balcony. She let out a small relief. This has turned out to be harder than she ever thought. As she walks into the room, she sees everyone is asleep. Either laying on the floor, on a chair, the kid on the bed. It seems that they had fun. They all must be tired after a hard day of fighting and their interaction with the Rose Knights. She then sees Hamilton. She sent her here to apologize and try to make amends. She sees her servant laying on one of the sleeping American's arm asleep. She believes the soldier is named Andrew, but she is not sure. As she looks around, she can tell that they all had fun. As she follows behind Rory, she sees Sharp on the balcony. Rory lets her in the room and as she walks outside, she notices Rory shooting her a scary glare. A warning not to do anything funny. Seeing that look annoyed her. That Rory would assume she has no honor. But it was her own knights who broke the treaty and attacked him so she cannot get angry. She watches Rory walk away and then she stands there, looking at him. Hello sir, Major Shop. She sticks out her hand, as a greeting. Her people do not shake hands, but she has seen these people do that and decided to use their greeting. Sharp takes her hand and shakes, a bit weak hand though. Understanding though, Major is just my military rank, can call me Sharp. She nods, feeling a little embarrassed by that mistake. I did not know your kind had the same greeting as us, Sharp said, surprised. Actually no, she replied. I saw your people do it before you left the city. She notices that left an impression on him for some reason. Anyway, are you okay? I apologize for what happened. Sharp waves his hand. No worry, Lelai was able to use her magic to help smooth the pain. Magic, remarkably interesting. What Sharp just said confused her. You don't have magic on your world? No, we don't. Everything we have, we invented. Built. Magic only exists stories, never in reality. Until now, Sharp explains, still not sure on how to think on the subject. She found that interesting. Magic has been a normal part of her world since forever. A world where magic does not exist is just weird. That is when she realizes that they are just as confused as she is. What she witnessed, their metal machines, 
are so foreign to her while magic is so foreign to them, they are so different, can there be peace with such a difference? What do you mean no worry? Are you not angry? She asked him. She sees him think, clearly, he is not happy. Why are you here? Sharp asked. That question confuses her. She wonders what that even means. Ah, she stands back up straight. She is the princess of the empire who takes pride. I am here to personally apologize to you. No. Why are you here? He said again, choking a little while talking from the chest pain. But the look in his grey eyes tells her that he means business, that he will not accept a weak response. She never has been asked that question like that before. I'm here to represent the empire. To protect my nation. To keep the empire strong today, tomorrow and the future. I am here to protect my country, our values, our planet from another attack he said to her. That is when she realizes what he meant before. The biggest issue so far for her, and apparently for them too, is the lack of understanding from each other. What confuses her about his answer is that he did not mention anything about honor and glory. She wonders if he is just assuming, she already knows about those two things. In Sadra, warriors always talk about gaining glory for themselves on the battlefield going off on these military campaigns and coming back as a proud warrior he is a fellow warrior after all and what is more important than gaining honor and glory the romance of war however his answer was based on protecting his people and nothing for him to gain and that is what is bothering her what she wants is to gain personal glory and be able to talk into the imperial senate chamber respectfully that she did her duty and helped save the empire standing among all the great men of the empire who served equally she nods her head feeling somewhat more relaxed i came because i want to talk about the treaty sharp seems confused now looking at her what about it i know we broke the terms of the treaty she said yeah that was interesting but sharp said if you wish we can discuss a new treaty or something she said interrupting him she then leans a little bit forward allowing her breasts to perk out it is well known that men are visual and they cannot resist the female body and will become dumb because of it in other words she intends to seduce him to save the treaty sharp leans back confused what she is doing ah yeah the treaty is fine as it is i do not have the authorization to change it only my superiors can she tilts her head are you sure you can't she then winks her eye he places his hand on her shoulder and lightly pushes her back a little yeah the treaty is fine for now at least until a formal one can happen no need to do more paperwork she takes a step back and thinks why do you people want another treaty? Let me ask you this, why did you attack our country? Sharp asked, trying to change the subject. She is starting to feel she is being tested but failing. She tried flirting with him but that did not seem to do anything. Honestly, she has never been good at flirting or other feminine manners. Glory to myself and the empire to bring riches, new talents, and knowledge. Either we wait for our enemies to attack or we attack them first. To show strength. For survival. To show we are everlasting. She regrets saying that last part. In the past she believed that but now. Expansion might lead to the empire destruction, not survival. She sees that he is about to say something but she continues speaking, hoping to fix this. But I personally want to bring stability to our lands. To prevent attacks like what we just went through. To have my people live with pride. Sharp nods and smiles. I respect that. I want this treaty because it might lead to peace. We don't need to be at war, but we will fight. She leans against the balcony and thinks. If he represents his people, all he seems to want is peace. With so much power in their hands, it seems that they are not interested in more. That colonel from before, he could have asked for anything but everything he asked would just protect their people and allow a way for them to communicate. Maybe there is more. She mumbles. A what? Sharp asked, confused. She blushes a little, not realizing that she spoke out loud. Oh nothing. So, now what? Won't your leaders be angry for what happened? She shrugs thinking about that question, they might be upset but will probably listen to any of his recommendations, she is trying to flirt with him again, wanting to seal the deal, hoping to gain influence over him, I am not worried, Sharp said, 
he takes a step back to get away from her. According to someone on my team, I probably deserve this in some matters. Karma. Karma. Karma is. Ah. If you do something bad to someone, life will punish you. Same if you do good to someone. It is just a saying. Sharp explains. The sun begins to peek over the mountains, which are far in the distance. I better go, she said, thinking about what happened that night. She then realizes that her second attempt of flirting with him failed. Pina does not understand why her flirting has failed. She has seen men fall over backwards before like this. She has even seen the most noble of men falter to their basic instinct. She is starting to wonder if Sharp prefers men or that he finds her unattractive. However, she can see that Sharp is confused on what she is doing. She wonders if flirting or attracting a mate is different in his world. We will be leaving soon, Sharp said. First thing, they shake hands again. Both of their people are enemies but even enemies can show respect and understanding to each other. Roma Highway, May 11, 2025. As Vanguard 7 drives away from Italica for the second time, Sharp is looking out the window. Over the radio the team is another argument, this time over who was the hotter lady from last night. Who embarrassed themselves more and how Andrew lost a poker game with that Rose Knight called Hamilton. This time, he stays out of it, just tired of everything. He knows that he risked a lot and his rangers provided themselves. He wants to make sure he keeps them alive in this mess of a war. Barely getting any sleep for the last two days, pretending to be a diplomatic on these situations. One wrong move and everything goes to hell. He can only hope that he is making the right choices. Part of the time does not believe he is though. That is when he feels a pull on his jacket. He looks to his left, wondering what is going on hoping it is nothing bad again. What's up? Sharp did not see anyone that was in range, being a little confused though on who pulled his jacket. He then notices Rory smirking and he has learned that is never a good sign. He has grown to like her quirky attitude but right now, not in the mood. That is when he sees Selena sitting there, looking away shyly. She seems to be confused or in deep thought or something else. Truth is that this whole experience must have been hard on her. Hey kid feeling all right? He asked. Selena looks up at him, trying to decide on what to say. He shrugs, struggling to figure out what to say. Ah well, just to let you know, I am proud of you kid. I heard you took control back there and helped the team out while I was away. He was informed of what happened. Charles had it under control. Every leader needs someone to push back a bit. That is how you get the best plan. He is just trying to figure out what to say to cheer her up. He leans back in his chair, wanting to take a nap. That is when she leans between both the driver and his chair. I have something I wanted to show you. I found it, Selena will say nervously. He looks at her confused. Before he could say anything, he saw her pull out this wooden human figure. It will look high quality, great details. He will take it, analyzing it. He is impressed that a society like this can make figures this detailed. His name is Kesozura, Selena said. She looks back to Lelai and after getting approval she looks back to him. Lelai told me that legend said that he once formed an alliance of species against a demon invasion of this land. He united everyone to fight a common enemy. He was highly respected and brought peace for generations. And, well. Yeah, that part of what she was saying started to crackle and go quiet, getting scared. She quickly receives back into her back seat, getting hyper nervous. He looks at it at her and smiles. He knows nothing about this legend or this man, but it did turn a really bad day into a great one. He thinks and then leans back again. Thanks kid. He holds out a fist so she can fist bump it. She will do that and smile when he winks back. I officially promote you from kid to brat. Is brat a good thing? Rory asks. It sounds negative. Nope. Alicia said as she works on her radio station. It is a negative term meaning you're annoying. He then leans back, adjusting his helmet. And that is why it is great. He then gives the girls a wink with a chuckle. That makes no sense, Lelai said. All great things make no sense Lelai, he responds. But I like it, Selena mumbles. He then goes back to his chair and leans back. All right, I'm taking my nap. 
don't wake me unless we're already dead. He will put his cap over his eyes. Also, I got a new mission planned once we get back to base. What? Alicia states with confused anger. Another, after all this, you kidding? Yup, he replied, codenamed, Operation Ice Cream. Reference, https colon slash slash shim dot wapad dot com slash 112 ffb 3 f 50 f 2 a 3 b 165 c f 5 d 276 f 347 f 0 f 320 a slash 6 8 7 4 7 4 7 0 7 3 3 a 2 f 2 f 7 3 3 3 2 e 616 d 616 17 a 6 f 6 e 6 1 7 7 7 3 2 e 636 f 6 d 2 f 7 7 6 1 7 4 7 4 7 0 6 1 6 4 2 d 6 d 6 5 6 4 6 9 6 1 2 d 7 3 6 5 7 2 7 6 6 9 6 3 6 5 2 f 5 3 7 4 6 f 7 2 7 9 4 9 6 d 6 1 one six seven six five two F four hundred and forty four C six six three six two D five six four seven seven six four F two D six F five two five three seven seven three D three D two D three seven three O three four three six three O three eight three O three seven three three two E three one three six three seven three two three two six four six five three two six two three one three eight six four three one six five three four three two three five three four three two three two three 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 eight three nine three seven three seven three four three nine three two two e six a seven thousand and sixty seven gate war of two worlds part one washington dc white house mid twelfth 2025 president emily potts is sitting in the oval office just finishing the latest reports coming from the special region. It has only been a year in her administration and this situation had to drop on her. Since the gate opened in Philadelphia, it has been a political nightmare, both domestically and internationally. Finding the balance has been near impossible. All her political capital has been used just to maintain some stability. Sometimes with Americans, you need to remind them there are 192 other nations on the planet, excluding Canada and Mexico. World politics are usually a second though. A topic for podcasts or online channels but an afterthought for the average person. However, if one day they were attacked, all hell breaks loose. Pearl Harbor, September 11th. Now the gate attack. The people want results. They want to know they are winning. They want to know if they are safe again. All they want to know is if it is okay to go back to normal. Usual things like thinking the other political party is evil, watching football, and being bored online. Internationally, that has been even worse. Everyone fears the gate. It would be more normal if an alien ship came from the sky or the CIA tells the world that Area 51 hosts aliens. No one knows what it is and how it works. Most importantly, it appeared in our country, which many did not like. The only reason why she allowed NATO to trigger Article 5 of the NATO Charter 1, one of the reasons is to show an international response, giving her the ability to sideline the United Nations and other nations she does not want involved that the United States is not going to withhold the greatest event in man's history all to itself. Most of the leading countries in the world want to be involved in some matter. Many want the United Nations to take control of the situation, which the American people would never accept. The Russians, the only reason they have not nuked Philadelphia is behind the scenes guarantees her administration had to do. While most nations want access to the gate, the Russians want it gone probably because they have been invaded many times throughout their history and know the issues of it, just nuke the problem and move on, ignoring the part that would start World War III, thanks to the US Soviet Cold War II, both nations built ways to communicate with each other to prevent a crisis like the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1961, that has paid off more than anyone wants to know over the years, especially now, we can deal with them guaranteeing there will not be a second attack from the gate.
allow their scientist and all known knowledge, public and private knowledge to be shared with them, and cash. The real problem has the Chinese or otherwise known today as the Chinese Empire, thanks to the war on terror. The Chinese were able to colonize a small portion of the world without anyone knowing through debt trap policy. Besides doing it the European way and occupying the land, they just offered a good deal on loans and then hiked the interest, forcing the nation to surrender their infrastructure and other things, basically becoming a puppet state. What finally triggered the new Cold War III with China is when it was discovered that the Chinese were funding many of the cartels in Latin America to destabilize Latin America and the United States and then lying to the world and exploiting the events of the Chinese coronavirus. It nearly worked and since then, the US has been aggressively trying to push back. Only reason why the US is not in a worse situation as it is because of the amazing allies in the Pacific. One of the few regions where we did a lot of good and it is paying off now. I like this Emily. I think we have a good situation here, Secretary of State Bobby Gates said, the head of the State Department. What do you mean? All I see is a crisis. Refugees, the United Nations will eat us alive. And what happened in that city? What is the name? She asked. I think Italica, Gates said. Yes. How is this a good situation? We are not fighting for our enemies. Why are we protecting them? The online media go nuts when this comes out, she replied as she reads the report. For the past four months she has been worried of another 2020 civil unrest within the United States. She is also worried of the US looking weak to NATO and other international allies. Right now, the US Army is winning however progressive has been slow. Any show of weakness and everything could explode. That is when her head military advisor walks in, General Donald Grant. Hello Madam President, hello Bobby. Did you get the latest reports? Both looked at him, but she spoke first. About the attack? Yes. What about the treaty? Grant asked. They sit up from their seats. No, I did not get that report yet. Why not? I don't know, probably communication delay. We are still working on solving the interference that the gate produces, Grant said. What is this treaty? Bobby said. Grant sits down next to them. Nothing special, but we can establish a diplomatic post in Italica. Thanks to our involvement. Free trade between our base and that city too. Still too early to tell but it seems like the locals are happy we saved their city. How are we going to close this war, General? What is being accomplished there? Bobby asked, the world will flip out, the UN will demand a post there and to be more involved, they just gave them the door they were looking for, he takes a breath for a second, and those refugees, this is a crisis in the making, she hates the United Nations, for decades, the United States built and funded that organization up for it to betray the US, just like the World Health Organization. China took over the leadership positions where it counts and how it is a major influence in the organization. They supported communist and anarchist elements within the US in 2020. She knows if the UN gets a say in this special region, they can install Chinese influence and policy while weakening the US position. The US gains no major benefits for allowing non-Western controlled organizations into the special region. She thinks on what Grant said. He served from the very beginning of the war on terror for, so she has a mutual respect with him. She thinks about the situation and sees a golden opportunity. During her military career she wished the military brass gave junior officers more freedom on the front lines to do what needs to be done to win the war. They formed alliances with villages through Iraq and Afghanistan. The key to winning the wars and defeating the enemy was to show the local population that they are not there to destroy their way of life burn their homes to the ground but there to help. No, she said as she leans back in her chair. This is an opportunity. Who did this? Grant and Bobby look confused. What do you mean by who? Correct me if I am wrong but wasn't it the same soldier who helped those refugees and at Italica? She asked. I noticed this name in past reports. Grant looks at his report on his tablet. Major Jackson Sharp of the 75th Rangers, recently assigned to the Rangers two months before the war. He led the evacuation effort and stopped a flame dragon from killing a bunch of villagers. 
he made an alliance with the magic user and Rory Mercury, a demi-goddess, they are helping us in the war, he was the only Atitalica who helped save the treaty and forged a treaty with the city, tell me about him, she orders and then looks down at her tablet, pulling up his information, Grant looks through his file, very interesting, enlisted in the army right after high school and went to West Point, average grades but General Holland took interest in him and placed him under his wing, graduated in 2016, he read a little before continuing, skip two years and then he went to 1st Special Forces Operational Detachment, Delta, under General Holland's sponsorship, he does not sound special there General, Bobby said, not impressed, why would he pick someone like that, grades are not everything Bobby, she replied, I had C's all throughout high school and now I am president, you should be, he is highly recommended by Major General Holland, head of SOCOM 5, he was part of the unit that saved the North Korean leader right before the peace process in 2020, both of his commanding officers were taken out, he took command and mission accomplished. Grant finished. Let me read the report again, she said as she grabs her tablet. Grant sends her the 2020 North Korea mission report. Kim Jong-un and his loyalists felt that China was encroaching onto their sovereignty. China through its One Belt Initiative and String of Pearls Initiative has had them encroached or flat out invade countries' sovereignty. The North Korea peace process. A six year ago tensions between our nations ended. North Korea almost entered a civil war as different factions tried to claim power in 2020 during the global pandemic. While Kim Jong un is an evil man, he was trying to restore some relations with South Korea and the United States to prevent China from threatening his rule. The normalizations of relations were very controversial at the times, many saying the US should not ally with an evil country like North Korea. However, the US has a long history working with evil and morally objectionable nations to maintain global stability and to maintain American hegemony. When the pandemic hit in 2020 Kim Jong-un got infected and went into a coma putting all peace processes in doubt, his sister Kim Yo-jong tried to take control of the government and reverse all gains that were made. When her brother entered a coma, she started a quick purge in the country to gain power and ask her puppet master China help. The Chinese sent in a Jialong assault team special force unit to assassinate their leader, to prevent the North from going into the United States sphere of influence. They would support his sister and place her on the throne and blame the United States for his death. The only reason why the US has an informal peace with North Korea is because 33 of Delta Force troops, and 31 South Korean Black Berets died in protecting that bastard, the moment Pacific Command learned of what was going on they sent in Delta Force to protect the lead, it was a suicide mission however it was that or possible war. Almost all of the Delta and Black Berets died in that operation however the mission was a success. It was a slaughter on both sides however they were able to protect Kim Jong-un, loyal North Korean special forces came and saved the survivors, at the time Captain Sharp led the remaining US, ROC SWC-5 and KPASF-6 special forces to kill Kim Yo-jong, she refused to surrender and if she escaped to China, which would spark a hot war, Sharp killed her which he nearly lost his life, thank god it was not for nothing. Relations are still rocky with North Korea but better than the historical average, the missiles are not pointed to the US and Japan now and that is all that matters. Because of the Chinese COVID-19 both the US and China were able to use to explain Kim Yo-jong death and prevent a war and the world population never learned how close they were to World War III because Sharp was forced to take command when all his superiors were killed and killed Kim Yo-jong. He was promoted to major and given his own Delta command, from there he led missions all over Southeast Asia, that is enough, he knows what is going on, he seems to have his head to the ground, she said as pondering on that information, for the record Madam President, he does not have a clean record, there have been some mixed situations in his record, take everything with a grain of salt, Grant said, I just want to give you both sides of him, no, she replied now leaning over her desk, I think I get the picture, geopolitics is not a theory to him in a classroom, he lives it every day, 
He understands how to ready the facts on the ground and see the big picture. He provided us an opportunity. We need to take it. What is happening at Alnus Hill with the refugees? They look at their paperwork. Usually White House staff already know what is going on and have answers for their president. Everything with the gate is unknown territory. There is no rule book here so we're all just making it up as we go. We have a manual if grey or green aliens just land in the farmer front lawn but nothing like this. To help relieve resources at the base, Lieutenant General Stanford allowed them to build a small community close to the base, Bobby said, but I have issues with this. Now we must protect them, provide resources to them. They are the enemy, why are we? He was cut off by her. No, only if we say that we need to control the message here. We are not at war with everyone in that world. We can have peace, dialogue with them. This is great, we can allow the UN to establish a culture center there. With our supervision correct? Bobby asked. She nods in agreement. That should hold them off for now. That also showed that we are not going there to conquer them and steal their resources. That should be good for PR7 and deflect statements that this is another American imperialism act. Everyone agrees, now seeing the opportunity. Grant then thinks and puts down his tablet. What about the nations who want access? No. We have full control of the gate. Period. We will only allow troops from NATO and our other allies, she states. However, Everyone will be allowed to bring items that they believe will represent their nation's culture at the center. That should confuse the Chinese for a while until we get a better handle on the situation. I will get the details ready for you, Bobby said, writing down notes. Speaking of other countries, I do have a list of nations who want to get involved, Grant brings up. Like always, the US is doing most of the heavy lifting, while we complain about that, we prefer that. We do not want our allies to be strong or too weak. Currently the US has Canada, Japan, France, Italy, Australia, and the United Kingdom through the gate. The other NATO nations are mobilizing for war. These make up the major players who will be fighting at this stage of the war. What surprised them all, Japan was the first to offer military assistance to the United States, catching NATO off guard. There are many theories why they did but mainly because a new special relation is being formed between us and them. Others also think that this is a show of force that Japan is no longer this isolated tiger and willing to take a role in the world. This shocked both the UK and France. The English feel threatened by this new relationship and want to show they are still kicking, and France, they will not want to be left out. I have Czech Republic, Poland, the Baltic states on the line. Grant said. Only a small force but they want to help provide security. Approve, she said. It will still piss off the Russians and Chinese off however allowing our smaller NATO allies will help keep the international pressure off us. All right gentlemen. I think this is good for tonight, she said. Now I need to talk to Prime Minister Narayana Chitty about the recent border clashes. Narayana Chitty. The Prime Minister of India While Western media is focused on the South Pacific China over the past few decades have been aggressively encroaching into territory on their western borders, they are currently occupying territory from India, Nepal, Afghanistan, and others. Reference, 1 Article 5. The principle of collective defense is at the very heart of NATO's founding treaty. It remains a unique and enduring principle that binds its members together committing them to protect each other and setting a spirit of solidarity within the alliance. 2 U.S.-Soviet Cold War 1947-1991 Between NATO and the Warsaw Pact 3 Sino-U.S. Cold War 2020 Present, still under debate on what year it started. Common year is 2020 while others because it started back in 1997. 3 SOCOM equals United States Special Operations Command. 4 War of Terror started 2001 present. 5 ROC SWC equals Republic of Korea Army Special Warfare Command. 6 KPASS equals Korean People's Army Special Operation Force. 7 PR equals Public Relations. Gate. War of Two Worlds Part 1. Mayut's Journey. It has been eight days since arriving at Alnus Hill. This is the second time she has been to this hill. The first time was nearly four months ago.
right before the summer season arrived. The original was that they were supposed to be the second wave that was attacking the world on the other side of the gate. At first it seemed like the invasion was going well, that was what I was told by her troop leader. But then all communication from their forces from the other side was suddenly lost. The Empire sent in a small force to find out what happened to them and they never came back. After no contact with their Recon force, General Awadan decided to form a defensive formation around the gate until they found out what happened. She was not stationed on the front defensive line by the gate, she was further back in the reserves, able to assist if needed with her magical abilities. Being a siren, a humanoid bird species, she has the magical ability to create and control wind. The Imperial Army uses her kind to create wind shields, to knock arrows and bullets to off their course. There was a massive, large force here from all corners of the Empire. The Empire is massive, covering most of Falmart. In addition, she never realized how many different types of races they had influence over. While the hundred thousand strong force were mainly made up of humans, there were orcs, goblins, all kinds of hybrids, trolls, some elves, and other magic users. It has become rare to find people who are able to do or willing to do magic. The Legion was not this big in the beginning, more and more forces kept arriving after riders went around city to city calling on more forces. Again, she was not stationed by the gate but a soldier that was there brought one of these strange animals that came from the other side of the gate and came to her camp. Its skin seemed to be metal like armor, like the ones on soldiers which is weird since she never seen an animal with metal skin before. It had no blood inside, just these small colorful ropes inside it. She tried eating it, but it was not tasty. It has been a long time since they lost word from the advance force and by this point, they all assumed that they were all dead. Everyone that was sent through the gate never came back, so the generals decided to stop sending people through. There were many different ideas on what happened to the men on the other side. Some thought they went to heaven or the underworld. Others believe that they entered a land with naked beautiful women. Men. While there have been other ideas, most believe that they are just dead. She was told by one of the Volralden that a few more of these things came through the gate. They were easy to kill. They seemed to have no natural reaction like an animal would. One of the soldier's opinions was that it might be some kind of demon. Everyone though it was a stupid idea, including her. How could this weak turtle kill their people? It can barely move. That is when someone brought up a scary point. If these thing did not kill the advance force on the other side of the gate, who did? A few more days passed, and everyone is bored. She joined a few soldiers to raid a nearby village, looking for food and entertainment. While they found food, the entertainment was not very entertaining for her. Just the usual raiding. Nothing that changed the boredom. When the Empire called for recruits for this grand adventure, riches, slaves, and glory was promised. For her, she was not interested in the riches. Well she would not mind it. Magic has been on the decline for generations because today warfare is much faster. Depending on the spell and level of the user, magic can take a long time to prepare to make it effective on the battlefield. It has been harder to find an effective role for magic in large battles. She wanted to prove that magic still has a place in their world. She wants to show that it matters. They matter, she matters. The truth was that she wanted to prove that she had a place in this world. When this war was called, she was hoping to find something out there, something to make her name for myself, to be one of the greats, to have people say her name with high respect and fear. Just like Rory the Reaper. She will never fully understand what happened that night, but she will never forget. It was the middle of the night. The least likely time to be attacked by an enemy. The only creatures that would even dare attack at night would be beasts that can see at night. She instantly awakened after hearing loud noises outside her tent. After getting her armor on as quickly as she could, she rushed outside to see what was happening. There would be yelling and screaming by the soldiers, bright lights from explosions from within the camps. Not just at the camp she was at but happening everywhere. That is when she heard a lot of strong sounds and bright lights, all coming from the gate. Seeing these strange looking wagons or small armored elephants coming out of the gate, making loud sounds, 
These strange-looking soldiers would be pouring out of these wagons one, from where she was at. The battle looks intense. For a short period of time, she could not tell who was winning the battle. That was until she saw 200 legionnaires just fall dead. Their armor and shields being torn apart. All slaughtered within seconds. That was when hundreds of cavalry units rode close to where she was. He was yelling, giving orders. Soldiers would be rushing to him. Rally around. She does not remember everything he said but it was a short speech about how they were going to drive these barbarians back. She honestly had to say that for a short period of time she felt some hope and warmth. They were going to counterattack and drive the attackers away. She got into position and began casting a spell, trying to create a windshield to block their arrows. There had to be about 5,000 of them ready to charge the hill. And they all charge, some trolls and large goblins including the hobs are taking the lead at charging the hill. She remembers becoming very confused when she cast her spell, ready to blow any arrows away. She has done this spell a hundred times, but it had no effect on their weapons. She watched as the army fell apart, barely getting halfway up the hill. An explosion would appear close to B, killing a large formation. She would get blown away from the blast. If it weren't for the fact, she is a siren she would be dead. A soldier would help her get back up from the ground. As she got up, she saw everything. Everyone on and around the hill is dead or dying. Nearly a hundred thousand just gone and the sun has yet to even break. More and more of these strange metal wagons that make these explosive sounds would keep pouring out of the gate. They're strange looking soldiers pouring out of the back of these weapons, but not in armor nor carrying shields. Since then, she ended up with a large group of bandits. Most of them were soldiers from the Battle of Alnus Hill. All of them were angry, frustrated, confused, feeling like they were robbed from what they were promised. Glory, riches, none of that happened. Death is a normal part in life. But this defeat just felt different. She knew she should not have enlisted into the Imperial Legion, but she let her ego and pride get in the way. All her plans and goals and dreams are gone now. Just survival is left. She was nearly raped and taken by those men after they lost purpose. The only reason she was not enslaved and spared is because she was one of the last magic users. That just means she still had use. It was decided that she would join a raid on some nearby villages. Many of the soldiers feel like they were robbed from their promises, glory, and riches. It was only a matter of time until they decided to attack Italica too, the trade hub in the empire. Many of the soldiers were once garrisoned in that city and knew how to easily take it. She provided a windshield, covering their troops as they claimed the city. It was simple enough. Everything was going good until they showed up. Again, the battle was over in minutes once these Americans arrived in their flying metal horses 3. She froze during the battle, not knowing what to do. What spell do she use on these things? What spell are they even using? So much power, she did not even know what to do. That is how she ended up here in Elness, in an American prison. She finds the cell similar however strange. While the basic design is normal. She does not know what the walls are made of. It does not seem to be a dungeon though. The jail bars seem to be normal though, which was her clue that this was a prison. They took some of us, leaving the rest who survived the battle with the Empire. Most of them who were taken were the last few women who were fighting with the bandits. She thought her life was finally ending. Whoever these people are, she was now their slave and she could not do anything about it. She could only assume what they are going to do. For the past few days one by one of them would be taken out of their cell. When one of them left the cell, they never came back. That was until it was only me and two others left in the cell. Her once fellow comrades barely talked to each other since arriving, all too depressed about the current situation. Their minds just were racing, trying to guess who would be their master or would she just be tossed in a whorehouse. Or maybe even worse, be crucified. She cannot think what is worse being crucified or become a sex slave. That is when one of those soldiers would walk up to the cell again. He is holding something, reading something on it. He must be especially important if he knows how to read. Maybe a noble bird. Lady, please follow me, that man said, pointing to me. She is tired of fighting, so she decided to get up and follow him. 
He would not be alone as there would be two other soldiers following behind me. They would look fully equipped in whatever they wear for war, but they do scare me. She would be escorted into the room with a desk at the center. She watched him go inside and sit down on one of the chairs. Please have a seat ma'am, he said to her as he reads the documents that are in his hand. His two escorts would take her hands and uncuff them. That is when they would walk away, leaving her free. Confused, she would just walk into the room and sit down. My name is Second Lieutenant Carlson. Carlson said in a cheerful tone. I am with the 3rd Military Police Unit here in Elness. I am here to ask you some questions. Please answer them as truthfully as you can. His name and job meant nothing to her. She would just be confused on what is going on here. Is this their normal process in auctioning someone's name? Carlson asked. Ah, my Luna Sires, she said in a defeated calm voice. He looks at her and then back at his paper. He must also be a scholar if they trust him to write. How do you spell that? Carlson asked her. She never had to tell someone how to spell her name before. He would ask some more questions, like what race is she? Why was she with the bandits and attacking Italica? What were and what are her current goals in life? Who is she loyal to and other character type questions? The questions would go on for what seems to be forever. Suddenly, she is becoming more nervous. The questions would finally stop, and the man would be reading what he wrote down. She was sick of waiting, being in the dark. All she wants is to know her faith so she can embrace it like a proper slave. So, what is happening? Who is going to be my master? Are you Lord Carlson? Carlson looks at her with the strangest expression. Ah, what master? Lord, this is an interview. We are processing you out of here. Process? Interview? Why am I being interviewed? This isn't an auction? She asked in a confused manner. None of this makes sense to her. Is he just toying with her? That is when she hears a giggle as the door opens behind her. Oh, my youth, you are so silly. That voice catches her off guard. Rory. She turns around after hearing that voice and sees Rory Mercury, standing there in the room. What is going on? This isn't a slave auction. Carlson speaks first as Rory giggles. Mom, my youth. Our country does not believe in slavery or the ownership of people. That is banned under the 13th Amendment 3. People cannot be someone else's property. We value God's natural rights for all, guaranteeing freedom and liberty. Your friend found out we were holding you and she wanted to offer you a job. First we had to go through a process to see if we could allow that. She looks back at the man and then back at Rory. A job? But what happened to the others? Rory leans forward, directly at her. They are taken care over. She winks at her. The ones who qualified to stay here were released into the Alnus community. The rest was freed. They just did not want to release a criminal into the community. This world was just flipped upside down. Just seconds ago, she thought she was going to be enslaved. Now she is going to be free by the people she fought twice. What is this job? She asked, still not believing the situation. The military police in their world. The military does not patrol the streets. A civilian group enforces their laws and keeps the peace. While the MPs are part of the military here, they are meant to help keep law and order in Elness. Rory explains to her. That is when that man speaks up. That is the basic idea. We can go into the details later. Rory put in a big word for you. She has earned our trust and respect so when she recommends something or someone, we listen. We are establishing an Alnus law enforcement so the people can police themselves. Rory here is one of the civilian leaders of the unit. Rory smiles. Yup. It seems fun. I feel responsible for these people here. She walks to the table and then stops, placing her hand on the table, looking at her. So, want to join me? It will be like old times? She said that and gave her a wink. Rory then leans forward to speak in her ear. There are also lots of cute and innocent boys here. She sits there and thinks of the offer. Her face blushes bright red thinking that Rory is implying. So much has changed and so fast. But I am their enemy. I fought against them at Italica. I fought them here. Why would they help me? Or trust me? There is a lot of confusion in her voice. She did not want to ask the question scared to ruin the opportunity but it just did not seem real. The man was about to speak but Rory stopped him. I have this, 
These people, Americans, make friends with their enemies all the time. That is how I understand it. Half of their allies they have today, they once fought a war with each other, but they are now friends. If you are no longer loyal to the Empire, you can stay here with me. That is mostly correct. Right now, the French are administering the Joint Alnus Community Military Police Program or JACMP, or the AMP for short. Rory rolled her eyes hearing that. They are bad at names though. Just call it the Alnus Police. The man clears his throat after hearing that. Yeah well, basically, your job is to maintain order within the law limits. All training will be provided. Rory, I think we are done here. Carlson gets up and leaves after leaving a box of basic gear and identification bag for new recruits. Rory and she will leave the building. At first, she freaks out a little seeing all this unknown equipment driving around those flying horses flying around seeing all these soldiers that she recently was enemies walking around but what brought some warmth to her heart was seeing some children playing around nearby seeing what she believes is the alnus community in the distance seeing traders and other civilians having friendly conversations with these soldiers everyone seems to be happy wow and you live here with them she asked still shocked my everything. Rory nods her head to her question. It has been an interesting experience. Good people, a little naive but good heart. How did you end up with them? She asked as she looks around. That is a long, long story. By the way, that man who picked you back in Italica, he belongs to me so stay away. Rory explains to her laying down the law that confuses her as they start walking around rory starts to tell her the history of what happened and some basic information about the americans and their allies voltris may 18 2025 captain albert nelson is sitting by the aw 159 wildcat door around him is his fellow sas five warriors of the british army the helicopter shakes as they fly over the american and british ground forces below eight days ago his friend major sharp secured safe passage through italica while the city is still an official imperial city they have become friendly to nato forces because italica is no longer a threat nato did not need to attack the city and bypass them the town of Alta surrendered without a fight after hearing the American victory at Italico against the bandit army. The remaining Imperial forces have fallen back to the Trophils. The American 101st Division and French 27th Mountain Infantry Brigade are attacking the Trophils while the rest are making a last stand at the city of Voltris. Unlike Alnes Hill and Naktai, where the fighting ended within a day. The Troth Hills campaign has already lasted four days and is expected to last another week. The assault on Voltris has lasted for two days. Being a port city with a bridge connecting to the western regions the NATO brass has determined this city to be the most important city to conquer. Not wanting it to drag out like the Troth Hills, American Lieutenant Charles Stanford and British Major General Mason Arthur agreed to send in the SAS to take out the leadership. They hope cutting the head of the snake will end the battle, saving the strategic port city. Captain, the pilot said. ETA, three minutes. He looks out the front windows and sees Voltris. Tall buildings with long harbor pier going into the river. The river is massive, being almost a kilometer long. The city reminds him of pictures of Venice seeing all the water paths through the city, all the small bridges. He can already see the strategic value of this city. Taking it away from the empire will be a crippling blow to their economy and logistics. He looks back to his team. All right boys. First CAF and our 4th Infantry Brigade boys have been taking the city for two days. The Imperial Army is putting up a fight. As you all know. Command wants to take this city and use it as a staging ground, he continues. Because they refuse to surrender our mission is to take out the leadership. He looks back out the window as they pass the first city walls. He sees smoke everywhere. He sees where once there were defense batteries of some kind all destroyed. He sees both US, British, and Dutch soldiers fighting in the streets as they engage the Imperial forces. He sees an American and British Apaches flying around on search and destroy missions. Suddenly, 
he sees this water coming out of one of the river paths and starts hovering next to this building roof. The water then forms into a spear-like object and then freezes into an ice spear. The spear fires towards a nearby American Apache. To his disbelief the ice spear hovers in the air and then launches at the Apache. The Apache fires flares but they seem to do nothing. Two spears pass it but the third one it is the back rotor. It spins out of control and lands into the river. Fuck. Corporal Julian Barrett. I see why the brass wants to end this battle now he said. Magic man. Sergeant Connor Reed comments. They can just create their own artillery out of thin air. He then sees American artillery leveling that houses. Five rounds hit the building before it collapsed. It looks like everything was leveled, probably killing that mage. So far in the war magic is a wild card. The only thing they know about magic is what fantasy media back on earth and their new mage ally Lelila Leilina. She explained what magic one thing is, seeing, experiencing it and planning around it is another. Whoever did that is dead now, he said. They might take one of us out, but we will take ten of theirs. Thank God they make themselves a target. Normally when NATO forces attack a city or region, they make sure to bring as many assists as they can. They are trained to call in air support when needed however there are no air forces in this special region. He finds it strange that he is fighting without air support. This means soldiers have to be more careful. Helicopters are the only air support anyone can rely on until more military assistance can come through the gate. He sees the Wildcat Escort Apache RMK-1 fire its 30mm chain gun into the building, clearing the landing zone. Once the landing zone is clear the Wildcat hovers by the balcony. He and his SAS team get out and secure the area. He looks back and sees the Wildcat and Apache leave. He sees small thrown drones and helicopters flying around providing any support they can. Selective artillery hitting buildings and streets. All right, system check, Connor orders. He looks at his helmet and looks at his HUD-6. Just like the Americans the British Army has developed a dismounted situational awareness system called Fist 7. Right now, the system is just an overweight paperweight because all the communication systems like satellites that are needed to make the system work properly are on Earth. The Alnus airfield is under construction however it will take time to bring in the necessary equipment to build it, then bring in all the aircraft that is needed for it. For now, the system is only good for him, able to see his SAS through their cameras. He readies his C-8 SFW rifle and heads through the palace. They all move through the hallway. Have you noticed these hallways are bigger? Julian points out. He glances around. Noticing those two, it is because these were not just built for humans. They must design these buildings to allow their bigger creatures in. That means watch out for demi humans, Connor said. He has seen the images and videos from Philadelphia. Seeing orcs, trolls, werewolves, humans, elves, and more. As he moves through these hallways, he has no idea what he might face. As they move, he sees his soldier sergeant Philip Walsh who is on point through his HUD. He watches him go around the corner and see an imperial soldier. The swordsman grab his sword handle and Philip shoots him. He then hears more weapons fire as his SAS soldiers engage the enemy. He moves up to the front and sees Connor giving orders. He sees a plaza inside the place, and they are on the third story. His SAS are lining up on the railing firing at the large enemy force. He looks to the left and sees this humanoid standing there. It is a Neko in a maid outfit, standing there holding dishes. She looks terrified as she shakes. Run, he said. He then watches the Neko rushes away screaming in fear. He chuckles, finding that funny for some reason. He goes to the railing and looks around. He sees soldiers trying to fire arrows at them however his SAS has the better elevation. We need to keep moving. Our mission is to find the leadership, force them to surrender or take them out. He then heard a roar and saw this wolf-like beast identify as a Volral and jump from one side of the plaza to his side of the plaza. It grabs on the railing. The Volral lets out another roar and grabs one of his SAS soldiers. It takes him and tosses him off him out of the hallway. The SAS soldier falls three stories down and hits the stone floor. 
He and three others shoot their rifles at the von Raden. The bullets go through its armor easily and it falls backwards, going down three stories. He then looks down. Shit. Connor takes three and heads down there. The rest of us complete the mission. They start to move out of the plaza and head down the hallway. He can see on his hub Connor and his team rappelling down to the plaza floor to check on his fallen soldier. They head down a staircase and see dozens of people in a new hallway. Some of them Voltronites and Imperial soldiers and others are just maids, servants, politicians, and or slaves. The civilians see him and flee to the doors, trying to escape. The warriors pull out their swords and start charging. He engages them, killing the first two. The rest of his team forms up and easily takes them all out. Swordsmen boxed into a tight hallway makes them an easy target. These are Voltra's knights, he said. That means we should be close. Let's go. He sees this fancy looking door at the end of the hallway. Right now he wishes he could uplink with a Reaper 8 or Thales 9 drone to see where the enemy location is at. He signals his team to get ready to breach. He can hear two of his soldiers firing behind them. Watching their 6 o cloak, he sees his soldiers set up breach charges on the thick door. Moments later the door explodes open, and his team moves in. He sees about a dozen enemy guards everywhere. Many of them are in fancy stylized armor. He wonders if this is a style of military ranks or a show of wealth or what kingdom or count they belong to. He then sees the Imperial General with the Count of this city standing there, surrounded by guards. Engage, he orders. He takes his C-8 SFW and starts firing. The rest of his men open fire after forming a line, all six of them. The swordsmen form a shield wall, protecting their general. The ones in fancy armor charge at them. To their horror the one in golden armor dies quickly, showing that their armor is useless. A green orc in dark armor charges at him, swinging his sword. He aims and shoots him in the head before he gets close. All rogue targets are neutralized, Staff Sergeant Calvin Reed said over fist. Focus on the shield wall. Then a human man in a robe walks up while also holding a staff. Another individual, a high elf walks up and holds out his hands. He sees these four decorative pools in the corners of the chamber room. The water rises, brought controlled by the elf. The water quickly forms a wall between the Voltress Knights and Imperial soldiers. The mage staff glows, and the water turns into ice. The entire water wall turns into a thick layer of ice. For a moment he lowers his rifle as he gazes at the ice wall, unable to believe what he is looking at. Water being controlled and then being turned into ice. Holy shit, Julian said, unable to believe what he is seeing. Everyone engage, he orders. All six SAS fire their rifles at the shield but the ice shield deflects all their rounds. The bullets are chipping at the ice shield and can punch through if they have time to do it. The mage then holds out his hand and ice projectiles from the ice wall. About two dozen ice projectiles come out of the orb on the staff and head towards the SAS. They're coming like a shotgun, spraying everywhere. Take cover, he orders. He gets behind a pillar and sees his troops do the same. On his hut he sees one of his soldiers get hit by a nice projectile. His bulletproof his Osprey MK4 body armor stops one of the ice projectiles. However his arm gets hit. Fuck. Philip said as he places his hand on his arm. That is so cold. Medic. He orders them all to stop and orders Julian to fire the UGL. 10. When Julian gets ready to fire at the mage, the mage fires an ice breeze spell first. His C8 SFW rifle freezes up and the ice goes up to his arm. He drops his rifle and holds his arm. I, I cannot move my arm. He did not bring any heavy weaponry because this was supposed to be an indoor operation. He was not expecting a mage user. In the memo, Lela explained that magic is different for each mage. It is because magic is based on the user's knowledge of the world and environment, natural laws. Based on Lely explanation he can assume this mage is a high level or experienced mage. He knows how to counter NATO infantry weapons. NATO has so little information on these abilities it is hard to plan around it. He sees the balcony behind them and gets an idea. This is the royals requesting emergency support. 
he said of FIST. While FIST Network is the UK program, it can connect to the American NW network as part of NATO integration programs. While independent they can talk to each other when needed and share information. This is actual what do you need, I need a rocket or a tank round on the palace balcony, he said. Single round, single round. Actual said Abrams tank firing. Suddenly the balcony roof explodes shocking everyone but the mage. The mage remains focused on the SAS troops. He wants to distract the mage or force him to deal with the explosions behind him. That will give his unit a chance to take him out without worrying about a counter. Fire again, he said. This time two tanks around shoots at the palace, shaking the building. The mage freaks out as he does not understand what is happening. He looks at some of the collapsing rubble and stops them from falling. The rubble glows blue and hovers in place. He heard Lelai do this back at Alnus 11. This is telekinesis, where a mage can use their mind to stop and control objects. While he has no idea how it works and is amazed by the sight, he orders his troops to take the mage out. His plan worked and now he needs to remove the ice wall. Fire another grenade. Calvin fires another grenade from the ULG. The 40mm grenade blows up the ice wall and kills the mage. The rubble falls onto the ground, shaking the room. Seeing that the area is clear he investigates his hub to check on Connor. He can see his troops have secured the fallen SAS. The four soldiers he sent to recover the body are okay and in a secure position, waiting for backup however the other is dead. He sees that the room is clear and starts walking towards the leadership. The Imperial General walks forward, not scared of their presence. Stay still or you get a bullet in your skull. He orders. The general stops. He is wearing the standard imperial armor with many different designs over it. He has a red cap on him. He stands there with pure confidence. You are the world as dogs. The general said. You think you have won? The empire is enduring. Forever. Every battle you win only bolden us. We never give up. We never surrender. We will fight until we are victorious or dead. The general pulls out his sword. For the empire. He and one other soldier fires at the general, killing him. He then aims his rifle at the count. The count stands there in green robing. He looks terrified. For the record, the general does not speak for me, the counts say. He then sees knights walking up armed. Before he shoots the count holds out his hand, ordering them to stand down. I was told you spared Italica an altar. The count said, is that true? That is correct, he replied. If you surrender the city now no harm will come to your people or you. What about my family? The Count asked. Surrender and nothing will happen to them, he said again, getting annoyed. Okay, the Count said. He takes a deep breath. My name is Count Gallus Dungeradus of the city of Voltris. I hereby surrender the city to you. Reference https colon slash slash shim dot wattpad dot com slash 112 ffb 3 f 50 f 2 a 3 b 165 c f 5 d 276 f 347 f 0 f 320 a slash 6 8 7 4 7 4 7 0 7 3 3 a 2 f 2 f 7 3 3 3 2 e 616 d 616 17 A 6 F 6 E 6 1 7 7 7 3 2 E 636 F 6 D 2 F 7 7 6 1 7 4 7 4 7 0 6 1 6 4 2 D 6 D 6 5 6 4 6 9 6 1 2 D 7 3 6 5 7 2 7 6 6 9 6 3 6 5 2 F 5 3 7 4 6 F 7 2 7 9 4 9 6 D 6 1 one six seven six five two F four hundred and forty four C six six three six two D five six four seven seven six four F two D six F five two five three seven seven three D three D two D three seven three O three four three six three O three eight three O three seven three three two E three one three six three seven three two three two six four six five three two six two three 
E6 A7067 1 Chapter 1 2 Chapter 14 3 Thirteenth Amendment to U.S. Constitution, Outlawing Slavery, 4 Chapter 19 5 SAS equals Special Air Service 6 HUD equals Heads Up Display 7 FIST equals Future Integrated Soldier Technology 8 General Atomics MQ-9 Reaper 9 Thales Watchkeeper WK-450 10 British Army 40mm Grenade Launcher 11 Chapter 9 Gate War of Two Worlds Part 1 Fort Alness May 21st, 2025 Sharp is currently at his desk, catching up on some office work. None of the wounds he had received during his time as a prisoner were serious. Most of them were just superficial wounds. During his time as a special forces operator, they were trained to have high endurance, being able to push on even if they were in bone-breaking pain. Still, it is not fun to allow yourself to get your ass kicked. Thankfully, most of his work was already done. Thanks to his team's logistical officer First Lieutenant Sarah Rose. Since becoming an officer in 2016, one of the most infuriating parts of his job is the bureaucratic side of the job. He usually pushes the work off for as long as he can or dumps it on Sarah. He feels bad doing that, but he cannot stand the work. Since being assigned to the Ranger Unit Vanguard 7, she has been a massive help in that department. Transferring to the Rangers was not an easy adjustment for him, but for some reason she went out of her way to assist him and take on that extra burden for him. He doesn't understand why but he has enjoyed that. That is when he is drawn out of his thoughts by a pair of footsteps coming into his office. It is First Lieutenant Sarah Rose. Hello First Lieutenant. Enjoying the morning? Hello sir. I am having a good morning, thank you. I do wish that I had that second cup of coffee. Sarah said with her usual smile. I have these report requests for you, and please call me Sarah or Rose when we're not formal. He takes a breath and thinks on that. He knows that he usually mentions someone by their rank. More, he said after hearing that, getting a little annoyed on how many reports the brass has been wanting. It does make sense for most of these requests though, since most of them are related to the Siege of Italica 1 and Battle of Voltris, the only other major engagement since we invaded. Truth is, the Pentagon has no idea who the enemy is and how they fight. There was not a class at West Point teaching how to fight dragons, elves, defend against magic and slay Roman soldiers. Truth is, there is no playbook for this kind of war. Everyone is just making it up as they go. The United States spends about $800 billion a year in defense. That includes training soldiers, learning, adapting to what our enemies are doing and research and development. We built super complex systems to prepare for the next war but right now the military's best sources of fantasy books, films, and other shows. Most of the US's satellite guided weapons are nearly worthless in this world, at least until the US Space Force can build the infrastructure for that. NATO has found some work around like using drones for localized guidance or painting a target with a laser, but both are only so effective. Yeah, they want all the information possible, Sarah answered his question. If you don't like it, you could have just let the city fall. Based on the short time she has gotten to know him, she knows he never would do that. She just does not understand why he is willing to take that risk. And let 10,000 be raped and murdered? He replied in a distant tone as he thinks back on the battle. He takes the paperwork from her and then begins to review them. What is this? Sarah leans over, seeing what he is looking at. That is a memo for tomorrow's training. He skims the memo looking for the important parts. The subject is about ancient earth warfare. A few experts from America and Europe will be coming here to help train our officers on how they fought back in the day. It looks like it will be a two-day event. The training is a great idea, but this is going to push the other work back. More personal work. Sarah, mind doing me a favor? He said as he puts down the paperwork. That is when he sees her smile and she roll her eyes. 
I was wondering when you were going to ask, Sarah said, rolling her eyes with a smirk. Hearing that confuses him. I take it, I ask for a lot of favors from you? Sarah nods her head. She does not seem angry by his consent favors. I have a jar of favors in my quarters. She sits down on the spare chair. I'm joking by the way. What's the favor? He did not know that he had been dumping personal work on one of his officers. Never mind. Oh no. I got it. It isn't a burden sir. That is my job. Sarah said with a smile. He nods and pulls out a notepad. There are some items I need to order from Earth. After saying that he thinks about it for a moment. It is still weird saying that. Yeah. Astronauts spend hundreds of thousands of dollars getting an education and spend years training, just hoping to get that small chance to go into space, and here we are, he said chuckling at that weird fact. Sarah takes the notepad after he hands it to her. Looking over it, she notices most of the items on the list are for Vanguard 7. Three new members, Rory, Lelai, and Selena. Mostly for Lelai and Selena. After reading the list, she glances back at him. This list is bad. Why is that? He asked, confused. Question. Why do you want these? Sarah asked him in a curious tone. She knows why he wants the items on his list, but she wants him to say it. She wants him to start talking about his feelings more, to loosen him up more. He leans back into his chair. It is far easier to say what's on my mind while on the field. Rory and Lelai have been a great help. They don't have to be here or help my team. Sarah slightly nods her head, understanding where he is coming from. She has wondered why his record is heavily classified for some reason. There seem to be a lot of rumors about his record. Soldiers like to talk. To everyone's surprise he has already shown to have a lot of combat experience. One of the few within the 75th Rangers, he never went to Ranger school, which is baffling to everyone. But from the opening invasion to how he handled the Flame Dragon to refugees, and the siege of Italica she has heard that the troops have started to warm up to him and are impressed by his leadership. When he first arrived and took command of Vanguard 7 he seemed like one of those positional leaders. He was always angry, never wanting to be around the unit. It was almost like he saw everyone as below him. The events at Italica broke that image as everyone started to see a new side of their leader. She just wonders what happened to him and why he acted the way he did early on. She does find it adorable to see him open his heart. She wonders why most of the time he barricades it deep inside him. The more he opens the better of a leader he seems to be. I get it. It's just that your list sucks. Why does it suck? He asked confused. He created that list of items he wanted to get the girls, that being Rory, Lelai, and Selena, to start with the fashion choices, just no. Sarah smiles at him after saying that. Don't worry, I will fix everything. And these books? I know you like history and science. But don't you think this is a little bit much for Lelai? He groans a little. He put a lot of effort into picking those dresses and he thought he did a good job, it shows how he has no idea what fashion is. I don't, she is very smart. In the past few weeks, she has shown a good grasp of how our technology and society works. So far Sarah has only been able to spend a little time with Lelai, but in that time she has been impressed by Lelai intelligence. You are right sir. Give it enough time and she will be the smartest person on this planet. I am surprised you did not put an astronomy book on this list. I know you love space. I can see you two talking about that for hours. After hearing her say that last part about space, he shakes his head. Negative. It was decided by the State Department not to share major life-altering technology and ideas. So, Star Trek rules? Sarah asked. Already knowing what he is thinking. Also negative. Sarah is referring to the popular show Star Trek, a science fiction that takes place in space in the future. In that show, the Federation is banned from sharing technology to less advanced species. The theory is that less advanced species do not have the proper knowledge, experience, and mindset to use advanced technology responsibility. They believe the cultures will fall apart if they advance too quickly. It is like giving a nuke to a three-year-old on a cultural level. Yes, Star Trek rules, he said, agreeing with the example. 
but the Orville is another great example. God, I love that show. Seven seasons and still going strong. Anyway, I always thought that was a stupid rule but... It just makes more sense now. Sarah said, thinking deeply on the subject. Rules like that might have prevented a lot of bloodshed in our planet history. Hindsight is a bitch. Yes, he said. It is not that I don't trust Lely but it is that I don't want to overload her and the others. If you have a worldview that has been around for thousands of years and you suddenly tell them everything they ever knew is wrong, that usually does not end well. Besides, I do not want to just tell them everything. Sometimes it is better to learn something on your own, earning the knowledge. You put a lot of thought into it, Sarah replied. I am impressed. All right. Besides, because of the gate we recently learned a lot of assumptions about the universe turned out to be wrong. Can't teach what we don't know. It sounds so innocent to share our understanding of the universe, even the right moral thing to do but it could highly damage the culture of this world. For most of human history, we thought the earth was flat. Even though the world only accepted the idea the earth is round only about 500 years ago. We do not want to radically change everything they know too quickly. It is just like the teaching a man how to fish example. There is value in learning knowledge and ideas on your own. You value it. You take ownership of it. The big question here is when so you help and when do we step aside. Truth be told, everything about the gate has radically changed our own science and place in the universe. While it is unlikely, this point probably will surprise us if the sun revolves around their planet. I take it, that is why you ask me to get the residence forms? Sarah asked him. He nods. Yeah. I want to see if I can get them under some kind of legal status under our government. Make this a bit more official. Make sure we honor our arrangements. So, what about Selena? Sarah asked. When asking that question, Sarah would have this big grin on her face, clearly enjoying some thought. What about her? He asked, showing how he can be thick-headed. I understand Rory and Lely but she is just a kid. Sarah points out trying to let him figure out her question. I know. Why are you asking? He asked. She still needs some protections until something better comes along. Sarah crosses her legs, getting more comfortable in the chair. Then why not you just leave her here at the Alnus community? After hearing that, he becomes a little discomfortable. For some reason he did not like that idea. He has gotten used to having Selena around. However, he knows she needs something more stable in her life. Sarah notices that, seeing he gets nervous on the domestic parts of life, it would be the responsible thing to do but it is clear a part of him does not want to do that for some reason. I have been considering that, he said, not in a confident tone. I just haven't gotten around to looking for a family who will take her in. Sarah interjects after he said that, it probably will be best, find someone to watch over her be there every day, but I don't think she will like it. He looks at Sarah confused. He is trying to figure out why she would say that last part. While she agreed with him, her tone implied that she didn't agree. It would be better for Selena to have a guardian who can be there and provide for her. Someone from this world who understands the daily struggles, not a soldier from another planet whose only skill set is taking other people's life. Why do you say that? She deserves a good life, to be free to live her life. Grow up safe, he replied, trying to figure out what she is trying to say. He can see Sarah smirking, like she has something on her mind that she is not telling him. She adores you sir, Sarah said bluntly. She lets that statement sink in a little before continuing. I know you try to keep a distance from her, but she does sir. And I am not the only one who thinks that. She wants to be around you and I can see that you want to too. Never underestimate the knight in shiny armor fantasy in a girl. She finishes with a big smile. But Sarah spans her fingers when he said but. Up until now she has been nice, loving and positive but her attitude suddenly got serious. Sir, with all due respect but just accept it. I know you want to. I know you have not talked to God in a while. It is not my place to know why but let it go. You knew what you were doing the day you saved her and the responsibilities that came with it. She did not want to push any more, seeing that she made him see her point and she did not want to cross any red lines. When he first came to this unit, he almost never smiled. 
it seemed like he just went through a bad divorce or something dramatic intense, but he just was distant, since Selena came into all our lives. He seems happier, to his surprise, he is not used to seeing her with a backbone. He would respect that about her and even liked it. She must have seen his Chris and necklace in her drawer before or something like that. He nods, in agreement. He then leans forward, picking up that wooden figure that is on his desk. Selena got me this back in Italica. I think his name is Kesso Zura 3. Sarah grabs it to analyze it closer. Her expression shows how impressive the quality it is. Who is he? I think he is a general from a thousand years ago or something. Apparently, he saved this land from demons or some army of monsters. She was inspired by my prime toy on my dashboard, he said, remembering the memory. C Major, that is how she sees you. I know how girls think, trust me. Last time I checked I am still one. When she is done with a figure, she will put it back on his desk. You didn't have to save her, but you did. She knows that every girl wants a further figure who is a hero, to model after, to be there and protect them. A man around them so they feel safe. To know when the world is collapsing around her there is that one man that can stop it. He leans back in his chair and thinks on what Sarah said. He never fully considered the idea and had no idea that is how Selena thought of him. He finds it strange and confusing that she sees him in that manner, but the truth is that he likes it. He knows if he is going to keep the three around, he is going to start training them how to use our equipment and our ways. As he thinks about that, he hears Sarah mumbling about the list that he gave her. Clearly, she does not like his ideas of gifts. Probably a good idea. He never was good at getting people gifts. Before Sarah speaks, he would stop her. Don't need to hear it, do what you think is best, but for Lely, I'm adding a driving permit. She seems old enough and it will be good for her to learn. I think she will like it. After writing that add-on down, Sarah stands up. Will do. Don't worry sir, I got this. It is all on your credit card anyway, so all is good. Once she stood up, he stood in attention and saluted. Once acknowledged, she then begins to leave. He nods after what she said and then realizes what she just said. Wait what? By the time he realizes, she would already walk out the door. God damn it. That explains a lot. He considers that a nice break but time to get back to work. It looks like more exploration missions would be happening. With the ongoing building of the airfield at Alness Hill, both Selena and Lely are sitting on a patch of grass by a fence, watching the recently arrived aeroplanes be set up. There are all different kinds of them. She sits there looking out, amazed by all the different parts and designs of the other worlders' flying machines. She thought she had seen complex machines in Rundle before however this blew them out. She wonders how the other worlders are able to invent such beasts. What do you think that one is? Selina asked, pointing to a large one that is being built. She was able to acquire a few small guidebooks with some information on NATO equipment. She flips through the pages of the airplane book, looking for a picture that looks like that object. After finding it, she looks back up verifying that they are the same. A cargo plane, C-130 I believe. It is like a flying wagon. It is just missing its wings right now. Oh, Selena asked, what do you think that small thing is? I think that's what makes the aeroplane fly, she responds as she reads the book. She is happy most of the pages have pictures on them so she can match what she sees with the book. It is called a engine. Wow. Do you think we would ever invent things like that? Selena asked, impressed by the flying machines. If the Americans never arrived, I don't think so. She answers in her usual academic tone. Being surprised by that answer, Selena looks at her. Why do you think that? They surely did. She closes the book and thinks of her reply. From what I understand, they don't have flying beasts in their world. There were no flying animals big enough to domesticate, so they had to invent one. We have that option already so we probably would have limited our imagination. Technology is only invented if we need it. After saying that, she thinks about how to follow up her points. But now we can see different ideas there are and maybe someday we could. It won't be in our lifetime though. Selena is quiet after that, 
thinking about what she said. Ah, they watch as they see the soldiers load their flying machines off trucks and put them in their new homes called hangars. What is your favorite one so far? Selena bluntly asked, getting bored of the recent quietness. She looks up from her book and analyzes the many different aircraft. Most of them are American, she can tell by the simplest on each plane. The next largest force would be from Japan with one or two from other nations, after a few minutes. She points to one, I think I heard one of them call that an eagle. F-15X eagle. It looks like it means business. Whatever it stows. I do wonder what the X means. Selena nods her head in agreement. I like that one over there. It looks very scary. The teeth painted on the front of its noise and that really big gun under that. She quickly looks through her book until she found that Selena was pointing at. They call it a A-10 Thunderbolt. It flies close to the ground and destroys enemy armor. Cool, Selena said after eating some earth candy. After a while, Leli looks over to Selena and asked her a question. I don't believe I know where you were bored. The question would sound a bit forced but Selena was fine by it. She grew to like Leli, being someone she could walk up to and ask questions on what is happening. I was born in Edras, she said in an uncomfortable tone. The Edras kingdom lies far in the west. For centuries, the empire has been trying to conquer that land and failed multiple times. That was until recently when the Empire Legions massacred the main Edra's army after their king was murdered. Rumor has it that many of the nobles were bribed to switch their allegiance to the Empire. They sold out the royal family and the location of their army. It is believed all the royal family were killed after the battle. I am sorry, she said to her. Their lands were devastated after the massacre. Today that kingdom is just a vassal of its former glory. This is a normal story. Edras is only the latest kingdom to fall to the empire. At least until now. The conversation is interpreted by a pair of planes about to take off. They look at them and see two of these eagles taking off. A loud crackling sound followed the two planes as they went into the air. The planes take off impressed them finding it fascinating on how they fly. That is when they see Rory and someone else walk up with her. Hi Rory. Who is your friend? Selena asked after waving her hand at them. Rory walks up, waving back at her little friend. She is one of my underlings. How do they say it? Back in the day? They all chuckle at the strange sayings they have back on earth. You can call me Mayud. After introducing herself, she extends her hand for a handshake. Both Selena and she accept her handshake. She notices the military police bag around her arm. I see they let you become a police officer. Before Mayut could respond, Rory jumped in. Just recently. No one is going to ruin this town under our watch. Yup. I'm going to do my part. I think I could put my magic and abilities to good use here. Mayut added to what Rory said. Yeah, when I am out with Sharp's team. She is going to represent me here. Someone I can trust, said Rory, showing her confidence in her siren friend. That is when a helicopter flies over them, heading to the airfield to land. The three notices Mayut a little nervous after seeing that. Rory assures her, letting her know she does not have to fear them anymore. I cannot believe they have such strong flying beasts, said Mayut. Unlike the other three girls, she is still not used to them. She has been on the receiving end of their war machines a couple of times now. She stands up from the ground and brushes her robe off. Those flying beasts are called helicopter. They are not their strongest flying machine. Those are, the aeroplanes. That is when Selena holds out a small bag of candy. Would you like some double M's? They are very tasty. Selena. They are called Dem and Dems, she corrects her. But there are two M's on the bag and that just sounds boring. Selena said, determined to stick with her new name. Double M's just sounds better. After Mayut takes some M and M's, she notices that Selena and she don't have MP beggars. Wait, if you're Rory friends, why don't you have MP badges? Didn't they offer them to you? That would just confuse her since she was the enemy not too long ago and they gave me one. Why not their friends? They say I am not old enough. Selena replied bluntly. They said the same to me. They have age restriction laws and we are technically too young. They don't consider it ethical to allow children into the military, she explains. 
That confuses my aunt. She has been working, studying, adventuring since a young age. Probably the same with these three girls too. But I thought they were about freedom. That doesn't make sense. That's what I said but they are set in their ways, said Rory, freely expressing her opinion. Actually, they don't consider someone as an adult until the age of 18. Until that age, you have restrictions on what you can do from their parents. They see children as someone who needs to be protected, raised and educated while being protected from the brutality of life, she said in response to Mayut's question. Selena giggles after eating more M and Mizier. You can't get married before that age, can't get employment and can't fight. They are silly. Why do they do that? Mayut asked, wanting to understand their strange culture. Both her and Selena both look at each other and shrug their shoulders, not knowing how to answer that question. Seeing how they could not figure it out, Rory places her hand on her hide and rolls her eyes. Guys, it actually has sense. There is value in protecting children. Trust me, I have constantly learned many things over the centuries. Lelai. Imagine if you could spend 20 years just studying magic without worrying about anything else. She looks at Rory and thinks about that question. That would be amazing. I would be able to learn and accomplish so much. The other magic user, Mayut would commit to what she just said. Yeah, my abilities probably would be twice as good. Maybe they do know what they are doing. That is how they were able to create these amazing tools like those flying machines. Maybe we would create such customs when we become that powerful, Selena adds. Maybe, Mayut said back to Selena. Anyway, Rory we should get going. I really wanted to see those flags raised. Flag raising? Selena asked, interested in that subject. Yeah, apparently a few more countries arrived yesterday. It is their custom for each nation to host their flags side by side. It sounds very interesting, and she wanted to see it. Rory said to Selena. Rory continues that thought. I think there are ten countries, maybe more, she said, thinking of the number. Wow, that is a lot. We better hurry. I want to see them. Before leaving, Maya looked at the two girls. You two want to come with us? Sure, I want to see their flags. It sounds like each flag has a story behind it. I think that's pretty neat, said Selena. They all head out, heading towards the gate to witness the new flag raising. Reference, https colon slash slash shim.wapad.com slash 112 ffb 3 f 50 f 2 a 3 b 165 c f 5 d 276 f 347 f 0 f 320 a slash 687 47 47 0 7 3 3 a 2 f 2 f 7 3 3 3 2 e 616 d 617 17 A 6 F 6 E 6 1 7 7 7 3 2 E 636 F 6 D 2 F 7 7 6 1 7 4 7 4 7 0 6 1 6 4 2 D 6 D 6 5 6 4 6 9 6 1 2 D 7 3 6 5 7 2 7 6 6 9 6 3 6 5 2 F 5 3 7 4 6 F 7 2 7 9 4 9 6 D 6 1 one six seven six five two F four hundred and forty four C six six three six two D five six four seven seven six four F two D six F five two five three seven seven three D three D two D three seven three O three four three six three O three eight three O three seven three three two E three one three six three seven three two three two six four six five three two six two three one three eight six four three one six five three four three two three five three four three two three two three 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 eight three nine three seven three seven three four three nine three two two e six a seven thousand and sixty seven one chapter fourteen to twenty two chapter six three chapter twenty four gate war of two worlds part one alness community apex liberty tavern may eighteenth 2025-1. Delilah looks around in a panic. All around her are hungry and thirsty American customers. When she first came to Alness she was surprised how different the other worlders are. 
from buildings to wagons, to clothes and rules are so different. After the siege of Italia II, she talked to Momna on what her opinion of the Americans and their friends. Both agreed that they are different than the Empire however that does not mean they can be trusted. They are clearly the most powerful force on Falmart, second to only the gods. However, that power doesn't mean they can be trusted. 3. She agreed with Momina that more information needed to be gained by these other worlders and that she would come to Alness to learn more about them. Hey Jalen, I need another three burgers. The Americans are coming in waves today, she said in a frustrated voice. Since when the first refugees came to Alness, the American government agreed to build a town next to the military base for the place has grown rapidly in a short period of time. Besides being the safest place on Falmart, it has become a trading hub with the occupied cities in the region. While still small compared to Italica and Voltris, there has been many different types of industries that have been established. There is an entertainment center, blacksmiths, farm markets to help supply the growing military and civilian presence and many different kinds of textile and luxury stores. That is only some of the growth of the town, where I work is the local tavern, or as the Americans call it a bar. The British soldiers however call it a pub. Those two groups come in here and argue about the difference after a few drinks all the time. All these people have different names for the same damn thing. The owner of this bar was able to find a good menu from both worlds. I don't get to see him much, but I was lucky to get a job here as a server. I've been traveling for years moving place to place just making, day by day. However though, I am currently missing that life as the bar, known as Apex Liberty Tavern or otherwise known as Apex. Right now the bar would be unusually busy. More, where are they coming from? Isn't there a war going on or something? Jalen said, taking the order from her. He is one of the head cooks in the back that runs the back. I do not know much about him but so far, but he seems fine. USA, USA, USA. Rants and cheers coming from a crowd that just came in. It will be another wave of Americans. Acting very goofy for some reason. You usually get these soldiers someone in and relaxing, blowing off steam or acting a little bit flirty but today just seems overkill. Beats me. It has been like this all day, she said back to him as she prepares seven drinks. Looking around. She sees some of the other servers moving around in a panic, trying to serve everyone. That is when one of the Alness customers that is sitting at the front booth said something. Can you please tell them to stop yelling? Damn these other worlders. Look sir, I will get you your refill in a second. But it is their bar. If they want to act like a bunch of fertile cats, that is their problem, she said back to that customer. While most of the Alness residents are happy and loyal to the NATO forces, some are not fully convinced of their true intentions. They have shown extreme kindness and restraint on dealing with the common folk here, which is very unusual for a people with so much power. I personally agree with those people, it does seem weird, and I cannot trust them, not after what happened to my people by the Empire. However, I do feel safe here and my gut has not let me down yet. That is when she hears something break, coming from a crowd size of eight over to the left. She looks over there and sees two broken plates. Hey, you are paying for that. She said shouting at them, with some swear words that followed that. Damn bastards. See, they cannot be trusted. They are so full of themselves. The man said, grumbling again. He seems to personally hate those people. After spending much time serving food and drinks to many of the customers, it seems that more and more people keep coming in. Something must be happening for all these damn Americans to be off duty all at once. It must be the Americans because there has been some of the other foreign soldiers acting professional and on duty today. A few Alness residents walked in but they seem annoyed by the over-energetic Americans. It seems that a little tension is building up. That is something she does not what. What the hell is going on? She said again getting annoyed that she must keeps breaking up these groups. She thought this would be a nice calm job, enough to get stable again. That is when an off-duty soldier at one of the nearby front booths speaks up. It is their birthday. After saying that he takes a drink based on the flag patch on his side arm. He is part of the Italian force station here. What do you mean their birthday? 
He stands up after finishing his drink. Today is the birth of their nation. They celebrate it every year. Parties, beer, hot dogs, fireworks, everything. Today is when they declared their independence from the British Empire, a once powerful state throughout our world. That is where to celebrate your people country birthday, she replied, confused. Tribes and countries rise and fall all the time. And besides, why are they assing like it is a big deal. I don't recall the empire or any other kingdom celebrating this founding. I am not American, it wouldn't be proper. But according to them, they were one of the first free nation of the modern world. Liberty, writes all that, the Italian soldier said. It is not often when a weaker country defeats a more powerful one. Especially when you're trying to succeed from them. The other man from before would just grumble. Bullish. I don't believe any of that. You all look good on the outside but inside. He takes another drink from his mug. Never trust the outside. You're all hiding something. Expect to believe them. She looks back at where the Italian soldier was at. But he would already be gone. Guess it was just quick drink. That is when she hears the street intercom system that the other world has established. It is one of the few features that they included in the construction of the town. It allows them to speak into the town somehow. Send message if they want to. For tonight's show, please report to the Alnus Airfield, Lane 3. The show will start by 9 p.m. That is when she hears another crowd on the other side of the bar getting a little too reckless. Hey. I told you to keep it down. She then feels a slap on the ass and hands off the goods. She yells, sorry. One of them says they all laugh at whatever they were talking about. After some time in dealing with this, finally five military police showed up. Finally, I requested you guys hours ago. We are sorry. We've been busy preparing for tonight, Mayut said. What is there? Oh, she would not need to finish her question as she looks at some of the Americans. Any issues? Yes. They are being annoying. Already some small property damage. Get them out please. They're annoying my customers. Delilah said, wanting thing to get back to normal. The man next to my out points to the other three MPs, ordering them to escort them out of the bar. There would not be a problem as the current crowd leaves the bar. Once the last group leaves, the bar would finally feel clam. Finally, she said, letting out a sign of relief. Thank you. I don't understand how you guys put up with them. Good reddens, that one man said out loud. Excuse me sir? The soldier next to my youth said. He seems to take a little offense of his attitude. At first, she thought he was an American MP. But then she sees the flag on his arm, and it would look different. You heard me, Glade they're gone. Just wish for the rest of you leave as well, the man said, turning around. He would not be the only one as a few other customers overheard what he said and jump into the conversation. Sir, please be respectful. The Americans and their friends are here to help and protect us. We own them a lot, Mayut said, trying to calm that man down. Then someone else would speak up. Let him speak, that man has a point. How do we know they are not just as bad as the Empire? Any day they could turn on us. Yeah, we are powerless if they turn on us. Some person said ad and then a few others start to talk about the topic, starting a debate. Some of the customers are explaining how great things are now with their help, but others say it is just an illusion. Then Mayut would be trying to calm everyone down, telling her story on how they offered her a job. It seems that only confirmed some of the people that some people are selling out. Look, we have just accepted it. We are being occupied. You have soldiers outside walking around all the time. They even convinced some people in Alnus to occupy their own people. She said that in a convincing tone. Look, the empire went to kingdom to kingdom, promising peace and better times, acting all friendly and once we let your guard down, that is when our women being raped, your men being murdered and our children as servants. I have seen it happen many times, after saying that. It seems that point convinced some people began to doubt the good intentions of the NATO force, mainly the Americans because they are the largest force here from the other world. It definitely shows that not everyone has been sold on this alliance. The Mayut seems to be struggling to find a way to reply to that. 
It is a good point, because they saved them from the flame dragon does not mean they can be fully trusted. That is when that other soldier would finally speak. He has just been listening the whole time. My name is Miloslav Suchinik. I am a first sergeant of the Czech Republic Army. Almost everyone stops to listen, only because he has been so quiet until now. Miloslav continues what he wanted to say. When I was a kid, my grandfather told me stories about the Nazis' occupation, an evil empire from our history. Like yours right now but much worse. He would say that the Americans liberated my country 85 years ago. Honestly, I did not care. It had no meaning to me. The bar goes quiet. Everyone stopped eating, drinking, talking, even the staff has stopped working to listen to what this soldier has to say. She even notices that she was interested in what this man had to say. He would tell this story over and over. I just did not understand why it meant so much to my grandfather, 10 years ago. The Russians, one of the other great powers from my world started attacking other countries nearby. We were once brutally occupied by them to for over 60 years 5. We finally achieved freedom and liberty. My people feared that they will become a vassal again. He looks around the room, unfazed by his story or by the amount of people listening. I love my fellow English and French comrades however it was the Americans who came to our aid. I was still a kid when I saw over a hundred of their armor vehicles carrying hundreds of their troops through my country. As they passed us, my grandfather gave one of the Americans a glove from a sport that we play on earth. That glove was given to him by an American when he was a kid. They came back to guarantee my home against the Russians. My country is a small, poor nation. If we got invaded, you would barely notice it on a map. They came anyway to protect us, willing to risk their blood and treasure for nothing in return 6. Miloslav explains, they are still there today, in my country protecting us again threats on my world. Even after your world attacked them. We don't always agree but there is no other country you want behind your back. Miloslav said as he finishes his story. Once he is done, he would just turn around and walk out the door going back to his duties. The other military police would follow him, still in deep thought. Most of the other customers would remain quiet, thinking on that story. Some would leave, others would finish their meals and go back to their own business. She then goes back to work after listening to him. As she pours new drinks, she would still be in deep thought, reflecting on that story. The fall of her kingdom. The warrior bunnies hit her hard. The betrayal destroyed her home and family. But if half of what Miloslav said is true, maybe it is worth trusting in these other worlders. This could be the opportunity her and mom have been hoping for. Once she is done taking some orders, she would walk outside. Seeing some soldiers walk by, enjoying the day, she would wave them down. Hey, you look thirsty. Come on it, Alnus Airfield. There are hundreds of soldiers and Alnus residents on the pavement of the airfield that is under construction. Lieutenant General Stanford gave most of the base the day off because it is the American holiday, Independence Day. Because of the bravery of the NATO soldiers who have ventured into a new world to face the unknown wonders, he arranged a special day to show their nation's gratitude. Just like any 4th of July celebration, there is beer, grills making burgers, hot dogs and all other kinds of food and loud music. You have soldiers, airmen and civilians talking about past adventures, playing games, or talking about their families, having a good time. As Rory looks around, she sees thousands of soldiers standing around, talking, and having fun. She finds this sight strange. The only time she has seen events like this is after winning a war. This is so tasty. She said as she takes a second bit. What do you call this again? A dog? Hot dog Rory. Alicia corrects. Lelai looks at her hot dog that is right in front of her. I thought you people don't eat dogs. Randy looks at her and chuckles. It's not a real dog. It's just the name. He said as he eats. Close your mouth Serge. Alicia said to him as she tosses a piece of popcorn at him. Eat up Lelai. You don't want to eat it when it's cold. It's Sergeant Major. Randy replied. Then what is it made of? Lelai asked as she tries analyzing the hot dog. Vanguard 17 members at the table will stop and look at each other. It is Scott to respond to her question. You don't want to know, 
She looks at them confused on why they all refused to answer that question. She gives them an evil glare. What do you mean by that? Trust me, just enjoy the food. It's something you don't want to think about, Alicia said, implying to them to drop the topic. She was grown to like Randy, seeing him as a humble man. He is also well experienced as a solider. She finds his war stories remarkably interesting different. How he would patrol the streets of the Middle East during the War on Terror. Based on what Randy stories, she has learned how different wars on Earth are. A part of her feels jealous, wishing she could see and experience those wars. Alicia, she became a quick warrior sister after the siege of Italico 7. To take a man phrase, she learned that Alicia has a pair of balls and willing to fight. She gained a new respect for her. Well, I don't care, I think it is good, Selena said as she finishes her hot dog. As they talk Sharp walks up to his team and then sit down. He has a paper plate with a big burger on it. How the hell did you get that? Randy asked once he sees it, all jealous. It would nearly be twice as big as his. Easy, Sharp replied in a sarcastic tone. Become an officer and kiss ass. Kiss ass you say? She said as she looks up at him, giving him a wink. Again? Sharp replied to her horror she watches Sharp winks back at him. She hates and loves it while he counters her flirting. Her intention is to poke fun and control the narrative. How he responds prevents her controlling him. She hates that but loves the challenge he gives her. On the other hand, she was grown to like Sharp. At first she had mixed feelings with him but after properly introducing herself to him at night eight. But when he gave that speech in Italica, rallying everyone to the defense she was sold on him. He is not a traditional leader compared to the Empire. He takes control of a situation and leads however he does not do it with an iron fist. He willing to ask around and learn, seeing other people point of view. And more important, he cares about the innocent and weak which has been a rare sight for her. You have to suck up to your chain in command to get promoted. Sharp explains. That didn't sound any better, mumbling that last part, must be great being an officer. Alicia asked sarcastic. It is great expect for the paperwork, Sharp said. I wouldn't agree with that, Sarah said as she walks up. Lots of work, especially working for this lazy man. Hey, Sharp shouts, giving her a soft elbow jab into her arm. Selena laughs at him. She looks at Sarah. She is confused by her. Sarah is genuinely nice but also seems strong. She does not look like the warrior type and she stays back at base all the time. However, she sees to be very loyal to Sharp for some reason and she is always on top of everything. Every time Sharp needs something, she already has the solution or resources he needs. Once she is finished with her hot dog, she looks around at everyone. So, you celebrate this every year? On this day, they answer her question yes, that this is a special day for their country. Or just because this is the birth of your country? Correct, but it isn't just that, Johnson adds to her question. She sees the black man in the unit, Johnson. To her surprise the Americans have many different skin colors compared to other other world as nation. He seems like a reasonable man. Then what is it? That direct piece of information has always seemed fuzzy to me said Lelai, wanting to join into the conversation. She looks at Lelai. She became close friends with Lelai, mainly because she is a native like her and because she has been able to understand these other worlders easily. Every time she feels confused by something, she can ask Lelai for an answer. What surprises her the most is her views on the Empire and now negative they are. She believes this is because she was not born in Rondel, one of the Empire Crown Jewels cities. She is a nomad, so she got to see the world before being influenced by the Empire propaganda. Countries come and go, Sharp said, but what we celebrate is the founding values of our country. The people having a say in their government, having control in their own lives, without government interference. You have your own destiny, and you should control it. Yup, and to top that off, the right to bear arms and blow stuff up. Randy said in a cocky voice. Once he finishes saying that Alicia then tosses another popcorn at him. Sarah chuckles at that. Yup, America has many different cultures, ethnic groups, religions, and even political ideologies. Point is, we can all come together under a share core values. 
liberty and freedom and that is a good thing. Andrew points out, she looks at Andrew. He seems like a nice kid, a little shy but he seems to have a lot of respect for Major Shop out of all the other worlders. He seems to have the best understand of this world. She has seen Sharp go to him to explain some things about fantasy while they are driving or in downtime. So, normally you all would celebrate this day with your family? Selena asked everyone as they finished talking. Oh yeah. Usually talking about the kids and how fast they are growing up, said Randy. Still can't believe it's legal to let you have kids, Johnson said with a chuckle. Randy gives him the death clear hearing that but then chuckles. May I see your kids? Lel I asked Randy. He pulls out his wallet and show his wife and two kids to everyone. They all look at the picture, enjoy the picture. It would not be long before some others of the team begin pulling out pictures of family or other relationships. All talking what it is life back home. After looking at Randy picture, Rory looks over to Alicia. Correct me but don't you have a sister? Alicia looks over to her. Yeah, she is my younger sister. She's adorable. Is she a soldier like you? Rory asked her. Nah, I am the only military brat in the family. She trying to build up her streaming channel. She's an independent journalist. There is a short pause. Well, trying. That is cool, trying to become an independent journalist. That's not an easy thing to do. Andrew adds. If she's doing that, she must be hot. Alicia glares right at him. Hey, that is my sister. Wait, what does that mean? I am far better looking than her. Over the past five years more people get their news more from independent people than multinational corporations. It has become far more common in people trying to make a name for themselves in trying to establish a streaming brand. Fight, fight, fight. Once Alicia begins to threaten Andrew, she starts to encourage the fight. It would not be a real fight, just two teammates poking at each other buttons. As they all talk, Selena looks over to Sharp and Sarah. Major Sharp interrupts her with his hand. You can call me Sharp, it is okay. She nods hearing that. So, I don't fully understand why all of this is so important. Sharp put down his burger and think on her question. He notices Sarah and some other listening in, probably wanting to hear what his views are. More likely because he keeps his views and beliefs close to the chest. Sharp looks at her. The average person can accomplish great things. They just need the chance to do so. In our world, all the power has always at the top until that point. The kings and emperors do as they please and the people always forced to follow. She glances at her and realize she is paying close attention to what he is saying. It seems like she is more interested in an in-depth answer than just being curious. People shouldn't be attacked and harmed for what they believe. As Sarah said, people from all walks of life can bring value and ideas that a king could never think of. The foundation of our nation is based on that all men are created equal in the eyes of God, that everyone is politically equal, and no one can control or own someone else. When you are born, you have these rights and that no one, a government or a single man can justly take them away from you. Everyone, regardless of their class, ethically, rich, or poor, all has the same unalienable right, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And if anyone tried to take that away, you are justified to resist and if needed to, replace the tyrant, Sharp said. As she listens, everything Sharp said is too different than what her father told her. She was raised to believe that power rules but how that power is used determines your place in history. However, you must keep the peasants in line, or they will rebel. Everything Sharp said defy that. Johnson, the team second in command add to what Sharp said. Selena, let me give you an example. His people enslaved mine for generations until we had a civil war that ended it. Clearly. The institution of slavery transcends earth but because of that document that we are celebrating, and it established that everyone has these rights, those values alone created the opportunity to end that institution, freeing not just my people but people around our planet. We didn't become a great power because of one man but on the backbones of millions, Sharp adds. Seeing that she is listening, he smiles and pat her on the head. Besides, you never know where greatness will come from. That has been a lot of information for her to take. 
Most of those concepts are very foreign to her, to this world in general, it is almost the exact opposite on what she grew up on, where the people serve the crown, what they're walking about is so strange, but good, these people have been some of the best people she ever met, maybe, just maybe if her country adopts something like that, they could have great people too. So, the government is there to protect your people, to protect all the rights your government has and a piece of paper freed him and others. Close. We don't get our rights from the government, what is given can always be taken away, Sharp points out to her. Rory has been listening into the conversation. Selena, think about it like this. Emroy is a god. Emroy gave me my powers, they are mine. What they are saying is that their god gave them their rights and because of that, no one can take it away, just like no one can take my powers away. That is a good way of looking at it, said Sarah, liking Rory's personal example. I get it, but, what if someone is doing what you don't like? She asked, because you disagree doesn't give you right to oppress them, Sharp said. Even if you don't like it, having the right to say what is on your mind is the core part of liberty. If you cannot say or express what you believe in, then you are not free. Just remember, what you do to others can always be done to do you. That is why you should always respect other people's rights, said Sarah, adding to the conversation. She smiles at Sharp, she likes how much attention he is giving her, him trying to explain things about her world and life lessons, she feels love and safe for some reason, thinking what has been said, she looks around and then towards Sharp. She smiles, enjoying how different that view is. I think I get it. As everyone talks, Rory stands up. Okay, so is this it? Food and talking? Oh no. We still got the main show, Randy points out, smirking. Scott leans back in his chair. Yup, it is almost dark. You ladies are going to love the fireworks. Fireworks? Lel I ask, confused on what he means. They are small explosions, used for entertainment. Trust us, it is epic, said Andrew. What is up with you people in explosion? Said Leli. She begins to realize so much of their technology is related to something exploding. Either in a small scale like firing a bullet to their missiles. Everyone chuckles at that, all realizing she has a point. Everyone gets up and start heading to the other side of the pavement. I didn't realize how many people live here. Wow. Rory points out as she sees all the thousands of people around, gathering for the main event. The military is very large plus the town is nearby, so the local population is more scattered. Here, you clearly can see how many people there are on this one hill. Right then they all see these flares going up into the sky and then explodes into many different bright lights. Everyone at the airfield looks up and watch all the different kind for fireworks going off. They all begin to see many kinds of fireworks, some that makes loud sounds other with big bright and colorful explosions, others bigger and other smaller. Seeing all this she grabs on sharp jacket and holds it, so nothing could take her and feel safer. All three girls are amazed by how pretty they are. Leli, you should try doing something like that with your magic, said Rory, lightly nudging her arm. That wouldn't be appropriate. Magic is not a tool for someone's entertainment, but to be used in a responsible way. Also. I would not want to ruin everyone good time, Leli replied. She overhears that. No, Leli do it. It would be so cool. Please. Leli turns around after hearing her agreement. She then looks up at Sharp to see what he thinks. He nods with approval. This is a good time. Show everyone what you can do. Leli agrees to Rory request after Sharp's approval. She then closes her eyes and begin chatting a spell. Concentrating as much as she can, as Leli begins chanting the spell, she begins to glow a bluish color as energy forms around her. It takes a few minutes as she spends the time focusing on her spell. All around her energy begins to build up around her as she powers up and chant her spell. Her clothes begin to flap around a little like she is in the middle of a windstorm. Slowly Leli raises her staff up into the air. Once raised, she finishes her chant and open her eyes. Right then this beautiful white shaped bird that looks like an eagle comes up from the ground. 
she will be in the center of the bird as it materializes around her. And right then the spell burst into the air. Short streams of energy trail its wings as it flies around as fireworks explode around it. The white energy bird flies around and after about five minutes, it would stop extending its wings out and then explodes. 52 nine states in three different colors, red, white and blue would appear from the eagle. 52 stars to represent the 52 states in the United States. Those 52 stars would slowly fall into the audience. Everyone around would all be clapping enjoying the show. As the fireworks continue, everyone enjoys the time together. Happy 4th of July everyone, have a great time. Let's all be thankful that we live in a free nation. Be proud to be an American. Let's always remember all the people who fought so we could be free, free to blow our fingers up once a year. Reference. One holiday note. Holidays will not match the story calendar. They are considered holiday specials. The events in the chapters are canon, just the real life dates are not. It is for fun and the special moment. 2 Chapter 14 to 20. 3 Chapter 20, 4 Chapter 10, 5 Cold War 1949 to 1991, Soviet Union Occupation, 6 Baseball Mitt Links U.S. Army Generations in Europe's Defense, Military.com, the 11th of April 2015, 7 Chapter 18, 8 Chapter 8, 9 There are 52 states in the Union. Guam and Puerto Rico became states within the six years of the story beginning. P.S. The first park with the Czech Solida is based on a true story. I will put the article here. I really like that little piece of story. I love the US, we are a great nation. We have great principles, not always living up to them but it is a bar always worth pushing towards. A lot of people around the world gives our country crap, sometimes for legit reason, but I think what really matters is stories like this. HTTPS colon slash slash www.military.com slash daily news slash 2015 slash 04 slash 11 slash baseball mit links us army generations in Europe's defense. HTML Gate, War of Two Worlds Part 1 Earth, Philadelphia May 21st, 2025 Ambassador Harland Willington is sitting in the Humvee as he is bringing transported through Philadelphia. All around he can still see the reconstruction from the invasion. The death toll has reached 10,000 with thousands of more wounded. Buildings that were flattened during the battle having to be torn apart and rebuilt. The larger ones having to be studied to either be fixed or torn down and replaced. He sees the army engineers helping in the process, expanding the area around the gate. The gate appeared on a major road, surrounded by buildings. Now the military is expanding the area to maintain the defense of the gate. Two weeks ago, President Emily Potts had summed him to her office. He spent nearly 15 years working for the State Department, working with nations all around the globe. My most recent post was in Tanzania helping the Eastern African community turn itself into the long-sought Eastern African Federation in 2023. That was not an easy assignment. Taking years in work, when the State Department thinks about Africa, it usually becomes single focus, either fighting terrorists, economic trade, or countering China colonization efforts on the continent. Outside of those three things, the State Department falls far short for Africa. It is not their fault. They cannot put all your resources everywhere and sadly somewhere must give. Those Eastern African nations haven't been trying to form a federation for decades now but have failed in recent years. Those nations haven't been getting close to unification, not wanting the Chinese to swoop in and bring them into their sphere of influence. He was tasked in helping them. His last assignment was not easy he had almost no support from Washington D.C. and little influence in the larger strategy. However, that turned out to be a benefit for me since that allowed him to act more freely and be more flexible in the rules. He was able to convince Tanzania, Kenya, South Sudan, Rwanda, Uganda, and Burundi to rely on US support and use us as a base model for their new nation. It helps that we are the largest federation on the planet, 
almost 250 years. As part of President Emily Potts' 2024 presidential promise to bring unity and patriotism to the United States she promises to include U.S. territories into states. Puerto Rico became the U.S. 51st state in 2021 after a hundred years of attempting. The territory of Guam became the 52nd state in 2023 because of its strategic location in the Pacific. After the successful unification in 2024, most of my duties became smoothing everything over. That assignment has been the hardest and most rewarding in my life. His goal was to retire after this assignment. But then the attack in Philadelphia happened. When he got back to the State Department after the attack, the public view of the department looked very professional, clam, all-knowing, the usual. In private, it was in pure chaos. Everyone at the White House was trying to maintain its diplomatic and military relations with all the nations of Earth. Make sure that our enemies or allies did not take advance of the situation. Most importantly and only a few people know this. Prevent the Russians from nuking the gate and end what they see as Pandora's box. Everyone who was not trying to prevent World War III from happening was doing research on what just happened and who just attacked us. Usually, they are able to strike very quickly. Bring God's hell with us. This time thought, months after the attack and almost nothing has been learned about the gate. When the president recalled him from Africa. She and the other Joint Chief of Staff and Cabinet officials were there because of his accomplishments with East Africa. They want him to lead the diplomatic effort on the other side of the gate, currently known as the Special Region. He believes his experience in Africa will be a massive benefit in the Special Region in trying to form friendly relations with the locals. The mission the President gave him is simple but at the same time the most complex task in human history. Coordination relations with a Roman like classical antiquity era people, manage our NATO and non NATO allies, the United Nation cultural program, and maintain a prosperous town on Alnus Hill. He thinks there was a class about this back at Harvard, simple. When he got to Philadelphia, it is be cloudy and raining. The gate is guarded by a 5,000 strong garrison, bunkers, tanks, many other types of defenses mostly aimed at the gate. The gate itself is inside an artificial dome, acting as a layer of defense. Everything in the five-block radius is being converted into military facilities. Some of the defenses though, like our anti-ballistic weapons are stationed around the city. Most of the citizens believe it is another layer of defenses against a second attack, which is true, but not an attack from the gate but from us of the other countries who might decide enough is enough. He sees a battalion-sized marine force here on permanent standby. At any chance if Alnus Hill is about to fall to an enemy or for any other reason, the marines are called up as an emergency response force. The Humvee he is in stops at the last checkpoint, the one that leads through the gate. As the driver talks to the guard, getting the final clearance, he is sitting in the passenger seat looking at the amazing marvel that has defied all our science. Ambassador Harland Willington, you are clear to go, Godspeed, the soldier said as he waves to his comrades to let them through. Thank you soldier, he said. Once the final checkpoint lets them through, they drive in. It should take about 40 minutes to go through the gate ambassador, the driver said to him. That is a long time, I wonder why so long, he said back to him, noticing how dark it is. If it wasn't for the lights we established inside, you wouldn't be able to see a thing. After some time has passed, the driver speaks back to him. Sir, just a curious question, but what is your first act? He thinks on that question for a bit. That is when he decided on his first act once getting settled. First thing I am doing is figuring out a new name for this world. There is no way I am sticking with the lazy name like Special Region. Elias Forest, Vilgla Village. May 23, 2025, the village of Vilgla, traditionally very peaceful place to raise a family, to farm and most importantly, to isolate themselves from the world. Captain Bailey Robinson and his Vanguard 5 was sent to this village to negotiate with the locals so they could establish a refueling outpost nearby. The rangers has been here for three days, trying to negotiate with the elf leader with little luck. However, 
It does seem the villagers too enjoy interacting with the Americans. While the visit so far has been unproductive, it has been enjoyable. He is enjoying the high elves and all their natural ways. He walks to his JLTV to where his second in command is at. Hey John. Any news from Alnus? Second Lieutenant John Elliott gets out of the vehicle and leans against the JLTV hood, looking at him. Nothing important boss. Things still seem quiet. Looks like the Imperials lost the fight in them. By the way, command wants to know what the hold is up. He knew that last part was coming up. The mission was only supposed to take one day. Now it's day three. Tell them what I said last time, that the locals like us but not enough to kill us. John said in a sarcastic tone. Don't be a smart ass, he said as he looks to the village. Even thought that was kind of funny. The village has about a hundred elves, living a simple life. They live a natural life with nature. Their huts are built around the trees, going up five stories. There are wooden bridges connecting many of the buildings. He finds the design of this village fascinating. These high elves know how to live off the land. He then looks over to the washing area and see a bunch of half to fully naked female elves cleaning. It has been hard keeping his soldiers professional, respecting the elves' way of life. His troops and the locals have become friendly, sharing stories of each other world, culture, music. The downside of this is that some of the soldiers and villagers are getting too friendly resulting in situations like this. Even thought the peace talks have been stalled. At least we have a good view, he said with a chuckle. You are telling me, John replied. Take a look. He looks at what John is looking at. He sees two naked male elves practicing hand-to-hand -hand combat. He is impressed on how skilled those two men are. However, he knows what John means, being a black gay man, you need to come out of the closet man, he said jokingly, I will be happy to sir once you propose, John sarcastically replied, if it wasn't for the war, I might settle here seeing how much they take care of themselves, no marrying the enemy lieutenant, he replied, of course, not sir, John said, speaking freely, you think they would be cool with our help, all we want is a land route through here nothing else. This reminds him of the 2009 movie Avatar. The humans in that story needed this special ore and offered everything to the native aliens. The natives rejected all offers believing the offers a threat to their home and way of life. It ended up in a war. You would think but I get it, he replied. Being friendly is one thing, picking a side in a war is another. They allowed safe passage for the empire for generations. In return they can maintain control of their lands, why throw that away for a bunch of strangers? Best of intentions don't always mean best results. John then snickers a little. Damn, politics suck wherever you go. At least we have a good view. I am gay and I even find the elven ladies here attractive. It will be hard keeping our troops from getting too close to them. I said stop being a smart ass, he comments. He has a point though, bored soldiers. On an exotic land with people we believed were just fantasy, it has been hard keeping the men professional. I wonder if an elf and a human can have children? John asked. He never thought about that. He sees human like creatures all over the place, so he assumes they can. It is just one of thousands of questions scientists are working on back on Earth. That has been another problem here. He sees Larson with one of the younger women elves heading somewhere into the village. He knows it was only a matter of time this would have happened. The meeting with the elder begins in an hour, he said. Tell command that we will try again. We'll relay that but they won't be happy, John said back to him. Bailey just grumbles hearing that. He knows there are 5,000 soldiers from that US, UK, Dutch all gathering around Voltris, waiting to push through the Allies forest. NATO is trying to prevent another Troth Hills campaign. That engagement lasted almost two weeks and seven soldiers were killed. Since the Allies forest is a far larger region, the last thing NATO wants is to spend a two-month-long campaign to clear it out. Besides, the point of the Ranger Vanguard program is to make friendly contact with natives to turn them against the Empire and spearhead the war effort. Easier said than done. I am going to go around talking with some of the villagers he said. Before he walks away from his JLTV, the vehicle gunner,
Staff Sergeant Thomas Espina speaks up with some concern in his voice. Sir, something doesn't seem right, Thomas said, looking around carefully. That catches both him and John with surprise. Over the years, they both have learned to trust Thomas' gut. Talk to me Staff Sergeant, John orders. Thomas takes a quick look around before looking down at his two officers. The mood has changed. First time here I feel threatened. A-H-H. As he finished up his sentence, an arrow hits him in the back. That is when he realizes that they are under attack. Before he could even react, arrows begin coming out of the trees and into the village. Screams from Imperial soldiers on horseback appears out of the forest burst and into the village. We are engaged rangers, he shouts as he takes cover. He raises his rifle and begin firing at the incoming cavalry troops. He hears some weapons fire from within the village, most likely from his squad. There is three other rangers that were close to the vehicle, but everyone panics and rushes around to respond. None of the rangers were ready to be ambushed, being told that this was a safe place and at war with the Empire, as ten or twelve horsemen be charging towards them. The .50 caliber that Thomas is manning a light up killing most of that cavalry charge with that .50 caliber backup. It was able to suppress some of the enemy soldiers from getting too close. Looking over to his right, he sees two of his rangers firing at some imperialists. Get over here. Watch out. As he said that, he sees a horseman coming around one of the huts. Before the rangers could react, that horseman swung by, cutting off one of his men arms off. Captain, one of his rangers said coming from behind, that ranger has an arrow in his chest, leaning against one of the JLTV, now only using his pistol. That is when he hears someone yell behind them. Bailey turns round and see a second wave of cavalry coming out, about thirty of them. Thomas, five clock, the gunner points the .50 galloper to that direction and open fire, as he lays a rain of bullets into that incoming wave. Another arrow hits Thomas right in the right arm. Reference, https colon slash slash imp dot wattpad dot com slash 112 ffb 3 f 50 f 2 a 3 b 165 c f 5 d 276 f 347 f 0 f 320 a slash 687474707333 a 2 f 2 f 73332 e 616 d 660 17 a 6 f 6 e 6 1 7 7 7 3 2 e 636 f 62 f 7 7 6 1 7 4 7 4 7 0 6 1 6 4 2 d 6 d 6 5 6 4 6 9 6 1 2 d 7 3 6 5 7 2 7 6 6 9 6 3 6 5 2 f 5 3 7 4 6 f 7 2 7 9 4 9 6 d 6 1 one six seven six five two F four hundred and forty four C six six three six two D five six four seven seven six four F two D six F five two five three seven seven three D three D two D three seven three O three four three six three O three eight three O three seven three three two E three one three six three seven three two three two six four six five three two six two three one three eight six four three one six five three four three two three five three four three two three two three 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 eight three nine three seven three seven three four three nine three two two e six a seven thousand and sixty seven gate war of two worlds part one iuros highway may twenty third 2025 vanguard seven is back on the field after a short leave in illness they are joined by two other Vanguard teams in the region, Vanguard 5 and Vanguard 3. Major Sharp is happy to be out on the field again, finding it relaxing. He never liked too much downtime at base. NATO forces have been pushing west since Italica, pushing the Empire out of NATO western flank. The Dumar mountain range to the east of Alnus has proven to be a massive obstacle. Italica was no longer a threat. Lieutenant General Charles Stanford decided to secure the western flanks of Alnus. He is not scared of an eastern attack because of the large Dumar Mountains. 
the farming town of Nake Tai fell after a short siege. Attila quickly surrendered afterwards. Imperial forces put up a two-day fight at the river city of Voltris until British SAS captured the count of the city one. The campaign in the Trof Hills lasted a week and a half in a NATO victory. While NATO and US military technology and professionalism has been a decisive edge, Voltris and the Trof Hills has shown the Empire can draw blood. While relatively light number of casualties, it was more than expected by NATO brass. Once Voltris fell, the town on the other side of the Ro stream Atlia surrendered. Days, a small ferry town south of Voltris fell five days later. With Voltris and Days occupied, NATO Western Front became secured. Once the West was secured, Alnus Command discovered that the Greater Relies region is the heart of the Empire agriculture. According to Lelai, the region supplies the empire about 35% of the continent. It was decided to send in the range of vanguard teams to start exploring the region to see the value in the invasion or see if they can turn cities away from the empire. In addition, securing a steady flow of foodstuff locally would free up logistics with the gate. Besides a few farms near Alnus and Italics, all of NATO food brought from Earth to Alnus. This means it takes longer for other military material and personnel to come through. The 75th Rangers were chosen for this task because they are some of the best warriors America has to offer. They can adapt to new and changing environments while on the field. They are highly trained some of the best and can fight against superior numbers. Their history has been busting the door open for larger forces to follow. Fighting the British back in the Revolutionary War, climbing the cliffs of Point du Hoc during World War II and being some of the first troops in the invasion of Panama in the 1989. They are the perfect force to spearhead the US effort in this world. The team convoy will be driving along and all they have seen so far is farmlands. It has been fascinating seeing what Earth considers ancient culture and seeing that as daily life. He is sitting in his seat as Corporal Andrew drives his command JLTV. As he looks at the bright sun, an idea appeared in his head. Damn, I cannot believe I didn't ask this before. He looks into the back of the vehicle and sees Selena, Rory, Lelai, and Alicia. Selena is watching something on a tablet he gave her. Lelai of course be reading a book about natural physics and Rory will be cleaning her halberd. Ladies, question, correct me if I am wrong, you call your son Flair correct? He asked. Rory looks up at him and smiles, nodding at him. The god of the sun, yes, he nods his head, glad that he remembered that right. Lelai and Rory has explained that this world has many different gods each representing a list of jobs that are part of daily life. The topic reminded him of Earth Roman and Greek mythology gods. Interesting, he said. I had a question since we first arrived. What do you call your world? Rory looks confused by the question. She knows that he knows that these lands are called Falmart. Lelai looks up from her science book. These lands are called Falmart. You know this, sir. Alicia looks down from her magazine. No. He means what is your planet name? Like our world is called Earth. Our country is on the North American continent. Have you noticed we separate our names like that? I have noticed that myself. Lelai replied. I've been confused by that and been meaning to ask why. Both Lelai and Rory looks at Alicia and then at each other. Lelai then breaks her gaze at Rory and then back at Sharp. I understand now. I don't believe there is a name for our world yet. Most never would talk about such things and only the astronomic sages would think about that. He smiles, enjoying what he heads. I didn't know your people were into astronomy. Lelai looks back at her book, disgusted by the word astronomy. Some sages do however they are a fringe cult. A fringe cult? He asked, confused. Yes, Lelai replied. They are considered a cult by the Rondel Grand Masters. One of them hassles my sister Arpeggio to marry him. They have strange theories about how our world is round and they have this really strange theory about how there are other worlds going around Flair. You don't think there are other worlds? He asked. Of course. There are other worlds. Lelai replied. Legend said people came here through the gate over the millennia. But the idea we orbit around Flair and such is nonsense. Like, how can your world orbit our Flair? It is nonsense. 
he can see the frustration in Lelai with the topic. While she doesn't know it she is talking about the heliocentrism theory too. While Lelai has proven to be very smart and been able to grasp many complex scientific theories, she sometimes still follows the old ways and see things through her people-limited perspective. He sees Alicia about to correct Lelai and he shoots her a warning look, warning her not to say a word. While he liked to tell Lelai and the other girls the trust about the universe, he does not want to break their understand of their place in the universe. He does not want them to reply on his people too much for knowledge and become dependent. He wants them to still discover the knowledge for themselves in some ways. Something on that scale would have a god name, Rory adds. Like where Harun, the god of the forest, but he wouldn't be the name. It could be the god of Mirita. She is the goddess of fertility. She gives life to us all. Selena proposed. Why would my god be the name? Rory asked. Selena is hesitant to respond, still building up her confidence. Because there is life all over the world and Miritu is the goddess of fertility. That means having babies. Mother once said the world is like that, that we are all part of our world. The world gives life just like Miritu. He realizes that his innocent question turned into a far bigger subject than he intended. Nothing is simple in this world, at least it is interesting. He looks to Selena. I didn't know you were religious. Miritu is the core goddess we worship back in Edras. Selena replied. My middle name is Mir, to represent my goddess. Miritu has no temple here for me to worship at. Your middle name. What about your last name? He asked. I don't have one anymore, Selena said quickly, struggling on going on. When you become a slave. You lose our last name plus, all my family is dead. He sees Rory rub Selena back, showing support. He does not fully understand how someone can just take a last name just because they were a slave. Maybe the slave can forget their last name but that took years if not decades, not months. He assumes she just does not want to talk about how her family died. Rory looks at him and then asked, Why do you care? These are strange questions. Private First Class Alicia comments on Rory question, he is a nerd, he likes space, and other science topics, if you haven't figured that out yet ready, she said, hinting at the Optimus Prime figure on the dashboard, next to the Kesozura figure, it is not that it's important, it's just about knowing stuff for the sake of knowing something. I understand, Lelai replied, she goes into deep thought, pondering on the question. Next time I go to the Magic Academy in Rondel I will ask about the subject. They might have a name, Lelai has told him what Rondel is before. The reason she was in the Cone Forest was because she was getting special training by her master Kato El Altestan. He was in Rondel when his team met her. The Magic Academy is in the city of Rondel. The city is home to many magicians, scholars and what the Americans call scientists, and other professionals and intellectuals. For the everyday people, information like this has no meaning since it does not help them in anything. After hearing that, Rory rolls her eyes. I know what they are going to say. Last time I was there I remember them using the word Euros for some reason. I forget why they were talking about that, but they didn't know what God he is. They don't even know if he is real. It is a topic that doesn't get much attention though. At least since the last time I was there. She said, now pondering what that bit of information. I never heard of that name before. Lelai said, my master would have told me during my training. He is considered a false god. Rory replied, I only remembered the name because of the topic. Last time I heard that name was about 350 years ago from the southeast continent Delirif. He looks at Rory. Interesting. What do you call the moon then? Idos, that god of cosmos, Lelai replied as she reads. Rory nods. Yes. M. Roy and Idos has been competing against each other since the dawn of the world. I have faced against his apostle throughout the centuries. Hold up, Andrew said with a surprised tone in his voice. There is another one of you? Rory looks at him with a no-shed look. Of course, there are. There are dozens of us. Each god besides where Harun have an apostle that represents them. Not all of them are on flames and we travel around the world all the time. Now that is interesting, he said, taking that fact seriously. 
The idea that there are others like Rory has been talked about in the brass meetings. Currently NATO has no way to defeat or apostle then overwhelming firepower. Each meeting basically said they are happy Rory is on their side to provide that guidance and protection. Thank God you're on our side Rory, Alicia said, turning the page of her magazine, not fully paying attention. As the conversation continues, Alicia radio console goes off. She has this annoyed look on her face, assuming it is just another update request from Alnus Command. She picks up the handset and does her job. Her mood quickly changes, going from casually bored to fully professional. Sir, Alicia said as she switches her radio from private to public, so all of Vanguard 7 can hear what she is hearing. This is Vanguard 5, need back. Back now in the background there is yelling, screaming and gunfire. It sounds like pure chaos. The team automatic SOS message begin was the person on the radio just stopped speaking. As the message went on, he ordered the rest of the team to triple time it and head to their last known location. Elias Forest, Vilgla Village. May 23, 2025. It has been a few hours for Vanguard 7 would reach their sister unit location. As they pull up, Major Sharp see another Ranger team here. Vanguard 3 team. Pull up there. Steel, I want you on the point five zero California. After saying that, Sharp gets on the team radio. Randy assist in security. Do not trust the locals until we know what is going on. Johnson with me. Jerry, see what you can do with the wounded. Everyone knowledges as their three vehicles pull up. There are six other vehicles here. All from Vanguard 3 and 5. Once their vehicle stops, Sharp leans back. Facing the three girls, Leli, I could use your help in public relations. Rory, help with security. I do not want the locals wanting to do something iffy. Selena, stay here. Everyone gets out of the vehicle to do their task. Before she leaves, he puts his head through his side of the JLTV window. Selena, remember our agreement. He said in a serious tone letting her know the subject is not up for debate. Selena nods her head and grab the helmet she was given. Unlike Rory and Leli, where they can defend themselves if needed, Selena cannot. To help justify allowing her to travel with them, she had to agree to terms, like wearing a helmet while in a combat situation. Second Lieutenant Charles Johnson rushes to him as he walks to the officers of the other Ranger units. As they walk, they see dead bodies. Bullet shells, blood everywhere. Damn, what the hell happened here? Let's find out. Sharp said back to him. Once they walked to the other officers, they look at both Sharp and Johnson. Captain Bailey, the leader of Vanguard 5. Right now, he looks like he just finished a crash course from boot camp. There also be Captain Charles, leader of Vanguard 3. End of block 1.